130 years ago, the Silent Night organization first revealed itself to people. The world was mired in war and drowned in the blood of countless victims. Life turned into a nightmare, and people lost hope. And one day the Masters of Murim came together to found the Central Heavenly Alliance. The Alliance decided to create a clan that would resist Silent Night. Its leader was Bak Chin Hu, a famous person in the world of martial arts. When the Northern Heavenly Clan was formed, the Central Alliance promised to provide them with any support. The Alliance collected a huge amount of elixirs and techniques for the clan, and helped them gain strength to push back Silent Night. Time passed, and during the reign of Yu Kuang Ho, the Northern Heavenly Clan gained recognition and gathered thousands of new followers. The fateful battle between good and evil was approaching. The fourth leader, Jin Kuang Ho, a man known as the Great Wall of the North, became famous on the battlefield. The four Northern Heavens became the support of the entire clan. They were the ones who could change the course of the war with their own hands. Their weapons and skills were on a completely different level. Headlong, they always attacked enemies in the vanguard of the troops. The melee fighter was the first to rush into the battle. One swing of his fist left no chance for anyone who came within the range of his blow. His name is Zhou Chen Wu and his incredible melee skills earned him the nickname Demon Fist. Less muscular but very agile and fast grandfather. He always appeared above his enemies unnoticed and delivered such crushing blows with his long spear that the stones under his enemy's feet turned to dust. This is Kuyun Musheng. His fighting style earned him the nickname Raging Hurricane. The next fighter from the Northern Heavens 4 was an unusually fast and dexterous swordmaster who could sneak into the ranks of the enemy troops unnoticed and deal a sudden crushing blow. His name is Yong Chen Hua and his skills have made him known as the Phantom Cursed Blade. The last master did not let his enemies come close and destroyed everything in his path. Jae Hyuk Shim, known as the Master of the Long Killer Whip, nicknamed the Lord of Iron Blood. As expected of a true leader, he was always ahead and was not afraid of battle. Every swing of his blade was deadly. This was the first time the Silent Knight army had encountered something like this. Their numerical superiority did not bear fruit. Jin Kuang Ho's body was a weapon in itself. With just one kick to the ground, he caused massive destruction to the rocks on which their fateful battle took place. These four played a key role in ousting Silent Knight from the Northern Lands. On the day when the fight between Silent Knight and the Northern Heavenly Clan reached its climax, Silent Knight disappeared. But then, before the eyes of 13-year-old Jin Muon, a tragedy occurred that changed the course of history. His father, known as the Great Wall of the North, fell under pressure from his own clan. The leader faced those whom he raised, and with whom he went through more than one battle for the sake of peace throughout the Alliance. Despite his terrifying strength, he will not destroy his own clan in a battle with the strongest. Leader Jin did not know what the Central Heavenly Alliance was doing. He had to face the powerful people who ruled the world of Morim. From the Nine Heavens spoke the sage, Seo Moon Hua, who is a genius who revived his family and whose thirst for knowledge allowed him to become an advisor to the Heavenly Lord. He accused Kuang Ho of treason, but the completely honest and fair warrior never cooperated with his enemies and understood that he had become a victim of a conspiracy. According to the sage, even the four pillars of the Northern Heavenly Clan opposed him. Having examined the rows of troops that came for his head, the man was convinced of this. Those warriors with whom he managed to change the course of history were already here. They turned away from their leader with whom they fought shoulder to shoulder. Despite the common worldview and the path that they had traveled together, now the four pillars have completely turned away from the leader. None of these legendary fighters showed any emotion. They all avoided eye contact with their leader whom they had betrayed. Jin Kuang Ho considered them his brothers, he did not understand why they betrayed the Northern Heavenly Clan. Then he truly became the last warrior of his clan. Looking around, he realized that he still had something to protect. His ridiculous-looking son was still too young. Everyone was conspiring against the leader, so he knew that trying to get out of here would only be a delay of the needless. The Northern Heavenly Clan leader's incredible raging power began to spread throughout the entire palace, and he shouted that he understood what the Central Heavenly Alliance was planning. Addressing his enemies, he declared that he would submit to them. Although the man declared his submission, the Nine Heavens sensed his terrifying strength and only confirmed that the Northern Heavenly Clan had become too strong and could become a hindrance to the Alliance. Their actions were driven by fears that as long as such a strong and influential organization existed, they would never have complete control over the mainland. Admitting his defeat without a fight, the leader acted wisely and saved the lives of his charges by declaring that the Northern Heavenly Clan was disbanded and all followers must leave it and find a new home. It was the last order of leader Jin Kuang Ho that sadly spread throughout the clan palace. Renouncing everything he had achieved, he tried to save what he valued so much. Addressing his enemies, he mentioned to his son that he had lost his mother when he was a child and grew up in the barren lands of the north. His last request was to spare the life of his heir, who posed no threat to them. The sage understood that it would be nice to finally terminate the family, 
but he doubted that the crowd would allow him to do this. The last moments of a true warrior's life touched those present, and they showed respect for leader Kuang Ho. Master Seo Moon Hua had no choice but to promise to keep his word, because if he did not, the leader of the rival clan would turn against them. Next, leader Jin Kuang Ho grabbed his sword with both hands and pointed the blade at himself. As a member of the Murim warrior clan, little Muan understood what was happening. He decided not to hurt his son with long goodbyes and simply apologized. The guy with tears in his eyes lost everything he had. The Northern Sky Clan was created to protect people from Silent Night, and they fulfilled their duty with honor for centuries. But in the end, the fourth leader of the clan was betrayed by his comrades. Three years after those events, the son of a war hero lived a worse life. He was the victim of constant persecution by ill-wishers, and this time he was caught again. It seems he was already familiar with the ill-wishers standing in front of him. Peering into the eyes of those ruthless killers, he asked what they were trying to achieve. A man with a huge nose and a thick beard was surprised that the son of the former leader of the Northern Clan turned out to be a very strong fellow. Apparently, they weren't the first group to deal with him. This time, Chung Pasan came to the point. This fat man immediately declared that he was not as kind as those who came before him. He stated that they did not want to spend a few more years on interrogations, so they asked him to say directly where he hid the weapons and equipment, or they would kill him and return to their mainland. In response, the proud son of the hero Murim just began to laugh. The ridiculous villains felt uneasy when the hunted guy behaved like this. Addressing the boy, the fat man tried to explain to him the danger of the situation and continued to threaten him with slow and painful reprisals. After silence in response, Pasan still gave a sign to his ward. The man with a bald head accepted his boss's order and sprang into action. With one incredibly fast blow, he wounded the guy's bound hand. Jin Muan screamed due to the sharp pain from losing his nail. At that moment, the guy unexpectedly pronounced the name of his offenders. As it turned out, this group belonged to the Muram Alliance. Everyone was at a loss when turning to the Nine Heavens. Jin Muan even found out why they forgot about the promise made to his father. Despite this life, he continued to fight. Yet the Central Heavenly Alliance was making a great mistake. The moment Silent Night completely erased its presence, the world began to believe in their disappearance. After the first line of defense against the enemies was disbanded, a certain number of free troops appeared. The Central Heavenly Alliance decided to send these mercenaries to look after the northern lands of Murim. It was a godforsaken place, a fortress of the abandoned Northern Sky Clan. In fact, the security was just an excuse. The real reason was to keep an eye on a certain person. They feared that he would begin to study the martial arts of the Northern Heavenly Clan and set out on the path of revenge. Just three years ago, the prosperous palace turned into ruins. Only one person did not leave him. We are talking specifically about the heir to the will of the Northern Heavenly Clan. Jin Muan, at the age of 16, caused some fear in the Nine Heavens. The former clan leader, Jin Kuang Ho, allowed the boy to read only ordinary books so that he would not learn martial arts. Everything related to martial arts was taken away by the Central Heavenly Alliance and the Northern Heavens Four. And after a thorough check, they couldn't find anything else. Meanwhile, after several years of inactivity, the boy began to come to his senses. He declared that he needed to earn a living and began to learn blacksmithing. The leader of the third group of mercenaries found it difficult to believe that the heir of the great Northern Heavenly Clan wanted to make a living as a blacksmith but he was even more worried that they had not found any hidden techniques inside the building. His deputy, Seo Mu Sung, seemed to be a less talkative person. He only observed the deep anguish of the boy they were ordered to monitor. Jun himself was not going to make contact with them, knowing that they were here on the orders of those responsible for the death of his father. Severe betrayal and unexpected destruction of life turned the boy into a man. As he returned home, he knew that this new group of guards would be a headache for him. Most often, he spent time in the House of Ten Thousand Spirits. As the name says, this place stored thousands of martial arts scrolls. But the Northern Heavens Four took everything from here. Each of these traitors took for themselves scrolls of techniques from the martial arts that they themselves practiced. And almost all of the disciples of the Northern Heavenly Clan followed the Great Four of the Northern Heavens, and each of them took part in the destruction of the clan in order to take a leading position on the mainland. Jin Muan was left alone. Or more precisely, he was abandoned by those who followed the traitors. Being alone with himself, he often had to remember the last moments of his father and his words. At that moment, Jun Muan learned that he had become the new leader of the Northern Clan. He definitely didn't want this at such a young age. But due to the cruelty of the Nine Heavens, he was forced to grow up. He often woke up from such nightmares. In order not to arouse suspicion, he continued his usual boring life. Looking at it, one could say that time had stopped and the devastation of the Northern Heavenly Clan reflected the state that Jin Muan was in. He spent entire days in the forge, improving his own skills even without a mentor. Although he considered himself pathetic, he was not going to stop. He believed that he rose in order to build and strengthen his own will. He had no excuses. 
He believed that if he failed, then for him it would mean that his father tried in vain, and the life given to him was worthless. But his calmness haunted a new group of guards who wanted to get their hands on hidden knowledge and return home. That's how he ended up being interrogated by those vile masters. The leader of the detachment believed that in this way he could complete his mission and return home. At the same time, his deputy Seo Mu Sung believed that they had gone too far when they began to torture an innocent child. The guy had no choice but to ask what they forgot here. He tried to remind them of the promise to his father that the Sage of the Heavenly Alliance made. With a cold and piercing gaze, he stated that they hardly had permission to do this. When asked where the artifacts and martial arts scrolls were, the guy replied that the Central Heavenly Alliance had cleared everything out. Regarding his murder, Jin Muan said that the Northern Heaven's Great Four Disciples were only following the Alliance because they were forced to do so three years ago. He was sure that among them there were still people loyal to the Northern Heavenly Clan. And in this case, the killers will not be able to escape punishment for what they are going to do to the air. Moreover, he mentioned that the previous security was the same, but in the end, they had to wait quietly for those three years. The proud Chung Pasan considered this to be insolence and with a furious cry grabbed his blade. But the deputy stopped him from drawing his weapon and stopped the hot-tempered man. The smarter and more reasonable Seo Mu Sun said that for their good, it would be better to let the young man go, because there may be a particle of truth in his words. In addition, the argument was that they had already searched this place several times and could not find any hint of the existence of martial arts scrolls and artifacts. When leaving, the angry and dissatisfied Captain Chung ordered his charges to let the pathetic guy go. The will of the new leader of the Northern Heavenly Clan was unshakable. Addressing the uninvited guests, he stated that they had come to him without an invitation, so they should behave accordingly, after which he said that if they behaved calmly, he would forget what happened. In response, the man warned the guy that as soon as he noticed something suspicious, the Central Heavenly Alliance and the Great Four Warriors would give him permission to kill him. As a result, the deputy released Jin Muan. Addressing his charges, the leader asked to closely monitor the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. Although the guy was exhausted, even despite the trembling in his body, he stayed on his feet. Among everyone present, only the deputy group leader showed a little sympathy. He approached the guy after the torture and handed him a handkerchief to stop the bleeding, after which he asked him to forgive them for what happened. Jin Muan didn't expect anyone to actually care about him. When Seo gave the handkerchief, he silently left to fetch his comrades. Watching the fighter leave the alliance, the guy could barely stand on his feet. Stopping the bleeding, the guy thought about what he had recently said. The clan heir fell to his knees with the thought that his words about people loyal to the clan were just nonsense. It seemed to him that no one cared about his father's destroyed clan, because otherwise someone would have come and pulled him out of this hell. Despite the situation, he continued to fight, because he was sure that his enemies would only be happy when they learned of his death. Upon returning home, the guy decided to again climb to the roof of the building, which previously stored the knowledge and artifacts of the Northern Heavenly Clan. Although everything from the Northern Heavenly Clan was indeed taken away, he believed that the heart of the clan would not stop, because the greatest secret of the clan, which even the four great pillars did not know, was still not revealed. It was about the last greatest martial arts scroll. And as it turned out, this scroll was the clan itself, or rather its palace. When the sun sets in the east, the ruined walls begin to cast shadows on the ground, and the mysterious drawings on the walls turn into writing on the ground. The 10,000 Spirit Wall was built by the first sect leader and contained all of his knowledge. Four generations later, Jin Kuang Ho acquired the secret. For this reason, during his childhood, instead of training his son in martial arts, his father taught him the language of the Kingdom of the Lower Moon, in which the greatest scroll was written. For everyone, these were just old engravings on the walls, because everything was planned in such a way that only Mu Wan could read them. For this reason, it might seem to uninvited guests that he was simply wasting his time standing on the roof of the building. Jin himself hoped that the guards would continue to think so. All the teachings of the previous leaders of the clan were on these walls, and the guy had a long way to go before he mastered the last scroll of martial arts. Being under the supervision of the Central Heavenly Alliance, he could not attract too much attention to himself, so he kept everything a secret and patiently waited for the chance. At one point, while on the roof, the guy noticed how a carriage began to approach their palace. It was Mr. Huang he had been waiting for for so long. An old man named Huang Chul is a former member of the Northern Heavenly Clan. After leaving the clan, he began working as a traveling merchant and did everything he could to help Jin Muan. His gaze was filled with love, and he addressed the guy with a difficult fate as a young master. Huang Chul himself was an orphan with no talent for martial arts. While the other clans refused him, the Northern Heavenly Clan accepted him. Sect leader Jin Kuang Ho did everything to teach him the basics so that he could at least defend himself. Huang Chul never forgot this kindness. So when everyone left the clan, 
he was the only one who continued to do everything to help the heir of his savior. He visited the young master every time he had the opportunity. Jin Muwan greeted the person most dear to him with a sincere smile. He thanked the man for coming all the way to see him. During the conversation, the concerned man saw that the guy's hand was wounded and assumed that the new guards had done it. After this remark, the young master hid his hands behind his back and began to awkwardly make excuses, as if it were not them, and he accidentally injured his finger himself, which is not worth worrying about. To change the subject and not make the man worry, he drew attention to the contents of the cart and said that Mr. Huang should not bother himself and bring so many things for him. Although Muan wanted Mr. Huang to start living for himself, the man replied that he continues to try because his heart hurts because the young master of the clan who saved his life should not suffer like that. The old man's care was the most pleasant moment of the guy's life. Huang not only brought him food and medicine, but also a very expensive thick winter blanket. At one point the guy noticed some kind of stone and asked what it was. The man replied that he received it while he was in Unam. According to him, this stone fell from the sky and the whole tribe worshipped it as a deity. With a restless look and sadness, he said that that tribe had been exterminated, and therefore the stone no longer belonged to anyone. Hearing this, the guy was simply shocked that there was someone in Murum who could commit such an atrocity. According to the old man, their habitat looked like they were fighting the Broken Fist Clan. Powerless at that moment, Master Muwan could only store up his anger at those who were destroying Murum from within, starting with his father's clan. As it turned out, having destroyed the tribe, the clan of the Broken Fist decided to settle in Unnam. After the betrayal of the Northern Heavenly Clan, each of the Great Four founded their own clan within Murum. Yong Chen Hua, known as the Cursed Ghostblade, gathered an elite group of Sword Key users and settled in the West. They became known as the Protectors of the Western Skies. Kuyun Musheng, known as the Raging Hurricane, gathered a group of people calling themselves the Fluttering Skies, but they did not act. The Lord of the Iron Blood, Jae Haek Shim, having received the greatest combat power, built the Iron Castle in the North. And the Demon Fist Zhou Chen Wu, who was known for his cruel and vicious nature, created that very bloodthirsty group called the Broken Fists. Looking at the guy, Juan realized that he had become self-absorbed because of what was happening in the world without his father. To cheer up the young master a little, the man cheerfully said that since Mi Wan had taken up blacksmithing, he decided to bring some iron for him. With a smile on his face, the guy thanked the man and promised that he would use him wisely. It was already snowing outside and starting to get cold, so the guy invited his truly dear guest to come inside. At the same moment, the deputy captain was watching them. He did not notice anything unusual about the guest of the owner of this palace, but was pleasantly impressed by his loyalty to the Northern Heavenly Clan. Moreover, he really felt sorry for Jin Muwan, seeing him walking around aimlessly, wasting time in the forge, climbing to the top of the tower and looking at the sky. The man did not feel his chi energy and could not be afraid. Seo Musan was sure that the guy had nothing left but to exist, because it was his duty to his father. Remembering their recent pastime, the man believed that the guy's words were a bluff, but if he clarified his story, it would seem more plausible. What also saddened him was that he makes quite wise decisions for his age, and if he had learned his father's martial arts, he would have become a strong leader. His calm was interrupted by the appearance of a messenger hawk from the capital. After reading the letter, the captain was furious, because they had sent some respected guests to a place that was hardly full of attractions. When Chung cooled down a little, he ordered his soldiers to begin restoring one of the royal buildings to receive people. The deputy uneasily accepted the order and began to assign the soldiers to different tasks. All the things that Master Huang brought were brought into the small room of the young leader of the Northern Heavenly Clan. The guy, as usual, treated the old man to excellent tea and asked what the situation was in the world. The man replied that all the talk at this moment was about a martial artist named Dam So Jong. He became famous in Mirim and declared that he would fight and defeat 100 martial artists. Such a bright personality interested the guy, and he wanted to find out more about what other rumors were circulating. Dam So Jong is the third son of the invincible master Dam Chiok Shim, one of the Nine Heavens. At first people made fun of him, and didn't take him seriously. He had only turned 18, but every time he challenged someone, he left chaos and destruction in his wake. Now he has about 93 victories in a row, and he inspires only fear and respect among the residents of Murum. According to Huang, at this rate, that young man will become a legend in the Murum world. He also shared rumors that he is heading north, and many clans are on edge due to this news. Jin said that he thought that young warrior was amazing. After a pleasant tea, Jun Muan tried to convince his dear guest to stay for a rest, but he could not afford it. As he left, he told the young master that he would return after the winter. He did so much for the guy that he continued to thank him for the honor of seeing him at least once. 
Master Huang moved on, while his master continued to look after him longingly. Walking through his palace during a snowfall, the guy noticed one of the masters of the guard group approaching him. It was the deputy captain, and he addressed the guy with respect, calling him Mr. Jean. He said that an important guest from the Central Heavenly Alliance was going to visit them in the spring, and for this they would like to restore and use the Huaqian Palace. The guy calmly replied that they could do what they wanted, since the building had been empty for a long time anyway. Jin Muan did not want to continue this useless conversation and said goodbye. While walking around the palace, he noticed that someone was going inside their library. The guy decided to check what was inside when he suddenly noticed strange traces. At one point someone suddenly attacked him from behind and put a knife to his neck. A female voice unknown to him asked who he was. The guy calmly replied that he should ask this question. Bringing the knife closer, the girl convincingly asked for an answer, saying that she asked first. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, the guy said that he was the owner of this place. The girl was surprised and asked if the guy claimed that he was the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. But after the guy answered, silence began. She was interrupted by the sound of a knife falling onto the stone floor. After that, the guy heard a body fall to the ground and immediately looked around. It turned out that a seriously wounded girl had sneaked into his library and had just lost consciousness. Her appearance was extremely unexpected. The guy probably hadn't seen a woman for three years. He immediately began to panic, fearing that she was a criminal and why she was in such a bad state. First, he decided to find out if she was alive. Leaning over, he heard her faint breathing and chest movements. Having a kind heart, he could not pass by, so he took the girl in his arms and carried her home. When he laid her on the bed, he noticed a huge wound under the left collarbone. Taking a closer look at the wound, he realized how serious it was. By studying some basic knowledge of martial arts, he could easily learn what a deadly poison looked like, which was aimed directly at internal energy. It was worth treating this only with a protective antidote. He had one at his disposal. In fact, there was only one poison in his first aid kit that could help with such a severe wound. Huang brought this antidote along with other medicines. He probably sacrificed a lot to protect the young master from a poisonous wound. The guy didn't even know who this woman was, but looking at her condition, he thought that if he could save someone, he should do it without any doubt. Nevertheless, he donated his only antidote for the benefit of a stranger, who upon meeting, desperately attacked him with a knife. With his hands trembling, he took the needles for acupuncture. Remembering what he was taught in medicine lessons, the guy carried out the treatment. The caps were placed correctly as they were able to stop the bleeding. After such hard and precise work, the guy breathed a sigh of relief. It was obvious that this stranger was in a serious battle. Looking at her, he couldn't even imagine who she was or where she came from. As a result, he met more and more unexpected guests. A few days later, the first results of the treatment made themselves felt. When the girl woke up, she was alert and could not understand where she was. When the girl got up, she realized that she suddenly found herself on someone's soft bed under a blanket. Due to the sudden movement, she felt a sharp pain. Her wounded shoulder was making itself known. Looking around, she asked herself out loud what had happened. She began to worry that someone had saved her in such a hopeless situation and even cured her. There were old bloody bandages on the table, which indicated that the stranger even took care of the constant dressing of her wounds. Afterwards, she saw a guy who looked into her room and asked her to wait a little until he finished preparing the porridge. The strange concern and friendly tone from the stranger seemed surprising to her and she didn't even feel any danger. The last thing she remembered was sneaking inside the Northern Sky Clan's forgotten library building. While she was wandering around with the wound inside, someone suddenly came inside. Even though her strength was leaving her body, she couldn't let a stranger know where she was. It seemed to her that it was one of the killers that was pursuing her. Hearing that this was the heir of the clan, she did not have time to answer the counter question and lost consciousness. Still, she wondered why he decided to help the seriously wounded stranger who attacked him with a knife. When the guy returned, he simply shocked the girl with the words that she had been sleeping for three whole days. She felt some kind of trick and holding her wounded shoulder, boldly asked why someone like him cured her. The question was not bad, because he himself looked like someone who would benefit from some treatment, at least to remove the worms. In response, the guy said that at first he did not know whether she had been sent to kill him or whether she was a passerby on the verge of death. Still, he admitted that he couldn't just stand and watch someone die right before his eyes, so he couldn't leave her in the library. Looking away, he uncertainly clarified that at least he would not want anyone else to die in his house. The girl was shocked by his sincere words. The guy seemed simple and open to her, and therefore she did not think that he did it out of evil intentions. In addition, she noticed that she did not feel the chi energy from him. The strange heir of the northern clan really looked like a person who really helped out of his kindness. The awkward pause lasted a little longer and the guy got tired of picking his nose, mysteriously waiting for at least some word from the strange stranger. Still, he had something to do, so he turned around and carefully asked her to finally eat on her own. 
because for the last three days he had to feed her with his own hands. In response, she unexpectedly boldly, albeit hesitantly, said that in this case she would stay as a guest until she fully recovered. The guy was surprised that she made decisions herself, without even asking the lord of this palace. While putting on his kimono before going outside, he asked what the stranger's name was. The girl got a little angry and emotionally asked why he needed to know her name. In response, the guy did not tolerate such insolence, and nervously said that he not only cured her, but also allowed her to eat and sleep at his place for free, while she decided to stay for a long time, without even asking his permission. Still, the girl realized her situation and hesitantly answered that her name was Yoon Ha Sol. Having finally heard the name of the mysterious stranger, the guy decided not to interrogate her story about how she got into his palace in such a state, and simply clarified that here she could find some clothes, while there was some food in the pantry, which will last her for several months. Leaving the house, he said that he would be in the building opposite, and if she needed anything, she could come to him at any time. When the guy left, the girl again felt severe pain. She thought that first she needed to restore her internal energy and then slowly remove the poison from her body. Yoon Ha Seol thought Jin Mu Wan was a bit of a strange guy because he hardly knew who she really was. The heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan himself went to the roof of the library. He couldn't stop thinking about that unusual girl with serious injuries. He understood that he would risk it for her, even without knowing who she was or where she came from. Yet he himself allowed her to stay, and because of this, it seemed to him that this was connected with his loneliness. Remembering the girl's name, he thought that it sounded pleasant and beautiful. The group of fighters from the Heavenly Alliance still did not know what was happening. The guys were very busy preparing one of the buildings for the visit of important guests. Seo Musun also participated in this process. The deputy captain not only worked, but also gave instructions. While everyone was busy with work, their captain got drunk on sake ate too much chicken and fell asleep on his huge bed in a strange palace, whose owner was not happy to see him as a guest. Three whole days passed like this, but the girl never left her house. He was already starting to worry whether she was okay and whether he should visit her himself. During these few days, the girl was able to restore only half of her internal energy. Under normal circumstances, she should have fully restored her internal energy before attempting to remove the poison from her body. But time was running out. This was one of the most dangerous poisons for Ki. It was called the all-consuming flame of darkness. She didn't know what antidote Jin Muan used, but he was able to give her some time. Since the medicinal properties began to dry up, the effect of the antidote has almost disappeared. It was more difficult to fight the poison, and because of the danger of dying, she had to use all her internal energy, which she managed to restore in order to remove the poison from the body. The girl concentrated on the energy of her head and stomach after which she began to expand the second source in order to use it to cleanse the poisonous wound. Despite the terrible pain, she tried to focus on her goal. But at one point, the poison began to spread rapidly and suppressed her small amount of chi, and even spread to her left eye and part of her brain. The unexpected pain made the girl suffer, and she began to lose control. It seemed to her that this was the end. In her last moments, she regretted that she had not even thanked the good guy for allowing her to stay in his abandoned palace and providing such pleasant care. At the same moment, a stranger appeared in her room. It was some kind of secret warrior, dressed in black robes and a closed bandage on his face. He immediately grabbed the girl and lifted her body. After that, he began to pierce the girl's body with his fingers in different places around her wound, where the dangerous poison was concentrated. Having made several channels to her chakra, the stranger began to release his own key energy and share it with the girl. While addressing the girl, he called her young mistress and asked her to focus on harnessing her inner energy. The treatment was almost complete, and his reserves of internal energy were sufficient to finish what he started. After that, he asked the girl to direct the chi into her fingers. The veins in her arms looked full, which meant she was still conscious and able to manipulate her body. After a few seconds, some dark liquid began to seep from her fingers. When the liquid fell on the sheet, it began to burn it. The girl was barely able to open her eyes, and her savior said that he barely managed to help her remove the poison. When the man lowered his mask, the girl was simply shocked to learn that her faithful ward was able to survive in that hopeless situation. It was Sa Ren. He apologized sincerely for coming to her aid so late. Raising his mistress, he swore that he lived to serve the master and the young mistress. The girl reassured the faithful servant, saying that without his help, she would never have been able to get rid of the poison. She asked not to worry about their protection, since they were ambushed and few could do anything in such a situation. As it turned out, he was also wounded and in hiding, so he was only able to resume the search recently. The lady believed that he should have gone to look for the master first, but the servant replied that he was not someone to worry about. 
He believed that his main task at this moment was to help the young Miss fully recover. So Ren believed that using the Northern Heavenly Clan as a refuge was a wise decision for the girl. They thought it would be difficult for their enemies to believe that they were hiding in such a place. Addressing the wounded lady, he invited her to stay in this place for a while in order to restore her internal energy. At the same time, he was going to find the master. He promised that after completing his task, he would return to her with orders from the master. Meanwhile, at first glance, a carefree, lonely young man was simply going about his blacksmith business. But as it turned out, he continued to study energy sources. This time, he was studying the source of all things and how when it covers everything, the shadow can be accessed. While repeating the words from the greatest scroll, he decided to make sure he was alone. There was no surveillance, and in parallel with his work, the guy began to practice martial arts skills. Concentrating his internal energy, the guy created a kind of shadow. According to the master, the inner shadow should be the same as it exists around him. The shadow literally swallowed up everything around him, and the guy was able to use the perception of its entire area. Practicing strength, he once again made sure that there was no one around him. This first technique from the scripture of 10,000 shadows is called Inner Shadow. The sect's first leader, Park Jin Hu, was a vagabond. He became a genius swordsman who was able to create this martial arts technique after many years of wandering. The essence of this skill was shrouded in mystery and darkness. Just by looking at Jin Mu Wan, it would be difficult for most martial artists to tell whether he had internal energy or whether he knew how to control his own ki. Even after four generations, the 10,000 Shadows technique had not reached the highest point of its potential and remained as an unfinished martial art. The guy didn't plan to learn this art, but he had little choice at his disposal. So after another repetition, he concentrated to use this mysterious power. With a quick slash, he used a certain amount of chi to test his progress. Inside the building, he only hit a certain radius, slightly larger than a physical blow. The guy was hungry, so he decided to return home. He didn't even realize that one swing of his blade could clear all the snow in a huge radius that was located behind the forge of their abandoned clan. At the same time, the girl came to her senses and found the strength to go outside. Looking around, she was saddened by the state of the Northern Heavenly Clan. The guy was surprised when he saw her on the street, after which he noticed that she looked much better that day. He admitted that he was thinking about going to visit her since she hadn't come out for the past few days, and he was even starting to worry if something had happened to her while he was away. Returning to his house, he invited her to join and eat something hot. The girl could not believe his simplicity and calmness, but still could not refuse such generosity on his part. When she went inside, she stopped at the entrance and the guy realized that she wanted to say something. A little hesitantly, Yoon Haseol thanked the guy for what he did. The guy was surprised by her manners and words that thanks to him she managed to survive. Still, he was not one of those who felt like some kind of hero, so he offered to start eating. But like a real warrior, the girl restrained herself and through force said that she was fine. The guy was not very persistent, but because of her upbringing, the girl still sat down at the same table with him. While eating his rice, Jin Muwan asked his guest not to hold back as the food was not poisoned. But she was more worried about why he didn't ask her anything and calmly accepted the strange situation that had happened. The guy looked at her in surprise and asked what exactly he should know. In response, Hassal was surprised that he didn't even know who he saved and sheltered. As it turned out, the heir to the Northern Heavenly Clan simply had no intention of prying into other people's affairs. He thought it would be better this way. Mr. Jin felt that if he found out who she was, then he would no longer be able to enjoy the carefree time spent in her company. Hearing this answer, the girl was confused and uncertainly asked whether he was extremely stupid. As expected, Jin was furious at her bad manners and nervously asked her to finish the question and eat, since he was already annoyed by listening to her growling stomach. In the evening, the guy, as usual, climbed onto the roof of the library. There was another secret inside the Ten Thousand Shadows wall, and it was time to start studying the Blade of Inner Darkness. It was a mysterious sword technique designed for killing. The clan heir had already learned the basics of fencing in order to learn this sword technique properly. As before, the guy worked carefree, and without feeling the presence of unwanted guests, he trained his fencing skills. At the same time, Yoon ha -sol also did not waste time and renewed her reserves of internal energy. One day, Jin was working at the forge as usual and gaped. He didn't even notice how the girl appeared on her haunches in front of him. Her appearance greatly frightened the guy, and she said that she was not entirely sure whether the guy was concentrating well at work or whether his senses were dulled. According to her, she sat here for quite a long time and just waited for him to call her to eat. The guy was furious, because three whole months had passed since their meeting, and all this time she continued to behave so shamelessly and did not even think about returning home. But the girl did not pay attention to his dissatisfaction and once again asked him to prepare something to eat. The heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan did not understand why he was doing this, but still offered to go and do some cooking. Watching the young master of this palace, 
Hustle considered his lifestyle a mystery. It seemed strange to her that the clumsy heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan who had just fallen before her eyes not only did not know martial arts, but did not even have the basics to study them. After the fall, the guy did not lose his head and confidently stood up, heading towards the exit from the forge in which he spent all his time, making the girl sad for his fate. When he began to shout dissatisfiedly about the girl's slowness, she sped up a little. While the guys were carefree eating the food that Mr. Huang had brought them, guests were already rushing towards them. As expected, representatives from the Central Heavenly Alliance arrived in the spring. These were the children of the Four Dead Heavens. Heirs to the crimson power of the demonic king Shen Mu Wa, daughter Shim Su Ah, and son Shim Wan Li, and also the granddaughter of the So Moon family named Hyer Young. Accompanied by mighty warriors, they arrived at the central entrance of the Forgotten Palace of the Northern Heavenly Clan. The general of the Four Dead Heavens named Mok Yun Pen was not very happy that they were still not met by the wards of the Alliance. But a moment later, a trio of absurd warriors appeared and greeted the gentlemen. First of all, Chang Ba Sung introduced himself as the captain of the third mercenary group of the Central Alliance. In response, the general only asked if their quarters had been prepared. The deputy captain answered. He said that he personally prepared them for the gentlemen, because they must want to rest after a long and tiring journey. But at one moment, he crossed the gaze of someone whom he would not want to see in such a situation. A strange man in a red cape looked in surprise towards the deputy. He recognized him and asked if he was Seo Mu Sang. The warrior was clearly unhappy that he had been discovered. Recognizing his old friend, E.P. Ol began to talk about how they had not seen each other for a long time, and that he could not believe that they had met in such circumstances. The mercenaries took the dear guests inside, where they saw what the palace looks like now. The eldest among the honorary children, Heron, said that she even felt a little sorry for the Northern Heavenly Clan, because now it was in ruins. The defiant eldest son Shim Wan Li coldly replied that this is how their world works and if you lose your strength, you die. He gave an example of a hunting dog saying that after a hunt no one needs it anymore. The girl's brother was rude as always, and she asked him to behave more decently, although it was hard to say that she was a moral person. Meanwhile, Ha Seol and Mu Wan were walking inside, not even expecting to see strangers there. The girl was impudent as usual and wondered why the guy had no other food other than meat. But when the guy turned the corner, he saw that a whole crowd of uninvited guests was coming towards them. The girl followed him and continued to make faces like a child. The mercenaries hardly expected that they would meet the heir to the palace along the way. Seeing unfamiliar faces, representatives of the highest families of the Alliance stopped in bewilderment. There was exactly the same pause on the part of the heir and his unexpected guest. The most restless at this unplanned moment were the captain and his deputy. The children of the respected families of the Alliance were surprised by the strangers, and the eldest among them suggested that this was the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, Mr. Jin. Shim Wan Li watched the guys with great interest. While Mr. Jin calmly looked towards the uninvited guests, the girl was a little worried. There were a lot of people here that she didn't know, and she couldn't even feel any of them, which is why she came to the conclusion that she was too soft and her senses were dulled. Like a true warrior, the girl decided to concentrate so as not to weaken her defense while in danger. The daring guy was the first to start the dialogue. He assumed that this was the heir of the Northern Clan, after which he introduced himself. He also introduced his ridiculous younger sister as well as Lady Hyer Young, the granddaughter of the So Moon family, who stood to his left. In response, the guy began to take a short pause. He nevertheless decided not to create problems for himself and introduced himself in response. He introduced the silent girl on the left as his cousin who was temporarily staying with him. The mercenaries were shocked, and the captain asked what his team was doing if they could not see this suspicious girl, who is the cousin of their target. The deputy apologized and promised that he would find out who she was as soon as possible. With a sly and mean smile, the son of a great family asked how the guy knew who they were. The calm gentleman of this palace replied that he had heard about them, because their names were known throughout Murim, calling the north a forgotten wilderness. The impudent guy was surprised that their names were also known here. After that, he suggested skipping the formalities and postponing their conversation. At the same time, Lady Hearing whispered to Mr. Shim to be more polite. The excited fat captain began to sweat nervously because the kid had greeted someone home without their permission. He felt he needed to be taught another lesson. Continuing to bow before the guests, the captain invited the gentlemen to go to their rooms. Looking at the ridiculous guy, the girl thought that he was not as stupid as he seemed at first glance because he knew how to behave correctly and was able to lie without blinking an eye. Continuing his walk, he wondered why the stranger acted like an owner, while Mr. Jin is the rightful owner of these places. In the evening, General Mok came to meet Mr. Shim. The young warrior said that he had come to this place to enjoy the former glory of the Northern Heavenly Clan, 
But looking at the palace, he called this place wretched. The daring heir of the Shin family also said that the peace on the mainland is just an illusion created by the old people from the Central Heavenly Alliance. In his opinion, those old people are doing everything so that their system is not destroyed. He also believed that if the influential people of the Heavenly Alliance could, they would live forever to continue to use the corrupt system for their own purposes. In response, General Mok Yun Peng emphasized that he considered it his duty to do everything possible to help the future masters of the Four Deadly Heavens, which are the children of the Shim family and Mrs. Hiryong. The cunning guy replied that he would have to wait several decades before he inherited this organization. But as it turned out, he didn't plan to wait that long, and believed that this place would be his start to something impressive. With a sly and evil smile, he said that he had some unsettling things left to deal with. Meanwhile, the Northern Heavenly Clan's heir continued to work hard. During this calm process, he again lost his vigilance, and did not notice how Mr. Shin crept up from behind. The cheeky guy said with a laugh that he never thought that the sound of a hammer could be so pleasant. As it turned out, he had been controlling this area all this time, and was sure that he would not be able to miss the presence of strangers. After looking around, Wan Li said that for someone who has no internal energy, the heir of the Northern Clan can handle the heat in the forge quite well. He called this place too boring because it felt like time had stopped. Taking the blade in his hands, he asked if he could evaluate its products, and asked how the heir of a great clan could even live in such a place. The guy, tired from work, did not answer and continued to observe the impudence of the uninvited guest. Inspecting one of the swords made by the hands of a young blacksmith, Mr. Shin noticed that this blade was very good and could be sold for a lot of money. But after a moment, he caused bewilderment in the guy when he pointed the blade at his neck. The daring provocateur doubted that the heir of the northern wall had not studied martial arts. He asked not to make him laugh, and said that if he had really given up, he would have died long ago. In the past three years, Mr. Jin has never been so worried, because Mr. Shin was testing him. And if they fight, things will only get worse. Don't even mention the consequences of fighting the son of one of the nine heavens from the Central Heavenly Alliance. He could not allow his power to be revealed, because in this case, everything he suffered would become meaningless. For the first time, the situation seemed simply hopeless. With a cold and piercing gaze, the impudent son of a rich family said that if the guy wants to live, then he needs to show what he is worth. After these words, the crazy bastard pointed his sword at the guy and lunged forward. At that moment, the young master of the palace sensed his bloodlust and realized that this was not a joke at all. Unfortunately for him, there was no other choice. Concentrating his power, the guy began to release his key in order to defend himself. But at the last moment, when the enemy already felt the presence of a certain force that emanated from Mu Wan, the young master of this palace changed his mind. Even though it happened in a split second, he managed to think about the situation. The guy realized that he shouldn't fight him just yet. At the last moment, he thought that if he could not detect him earlier, then he was a martial artist, and there was even a chance that he would simply be killed for using martial arts, and for using them incorrectly. When it came to choosing, he leaned towards the option that would increase his chances of survival, and instead of his neck, he exposed his shoulder to the blow. Just for a moment before the impact, Mr. Shin felt some strange key. Before the impudent son of a great family got into trouble, several more guests of the palace came to him. Mrs. Hiran and some woman came to the scene to prevent the master from causing trouble. Jin Mu Wan himself was quite seriously injured and could not stand on his feet. Mrs. Hiran and her faithful servant stopped Wan Li and tried to help the wounded poor fellow. The guy started screaming defiantly. He did admit that it hurt, but was glad that the blow was not critical. Meanwhile, Shin Wan Li was lost in thought that the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was unable to dodge a very simple attack, which to him meant that the rumors were true, and this guy really did not know martial arts. But at the same time, he could not understand what kind of strange key he felt in the moment before he struck. He assumed that his own feelings had failed him, since he had been on edge since the moment he arrived at the palace. Horrified by the state of the heir to this palace, Mrs. Hiran excitedly asked what the son of one of the pillars of the Alliance was doing. Looking closely at the wounded Mu Wan, the heir of a large family thought that he should rest, and after that, continue to slowly and closely watch the strange young man. In response to the lady's question, he defiantly let go of the sword and made an excuse that he thought that this guy would be able to dodge something so easy. After that, he turned around and headed for the exit, calling the guy pathetic. The caring girl decided not to spare any expense and threw a spiritual restoration pill into the poor fellow's mouth, saying that this medicine was known for its restorative effects and therefore his wound would heal quickly. After this, the good-natured girl asked Master Jin for forgiveness, saying that she had no idea that Master Shim would be so cruel. The heir to the palace did not answer. He was covered in cold sweat and continued to shake, demonstrating the unbearable pain. The lady asked permission to take him outside the room and once again apologized for what had happened. 
When the guy woke up, he saw the silhouette of a girl in front of him. He was already in his room, and Yoon ha -sol was next to him. First of all, the girl with a serious look suggested that it was the guests who treated him in such a cruel way. Having not heard an answer, she nervously stated that he was really an idiot, because even if he was weaker than them, he should still at least resist, and if he couldn't do it, then he should try to run away. While she was angry, Jin gently placed his hand on hers. He thanked the girl for her concern, saying that apart from Mr. Huang, no one had reprimanded him for a long time. Hearing this, the girl froze and did not know how to answer. When she came back to herself, she reflexively hit the guy and embarrassedly asked why he was saying something like that so suddenly. After this awkward moment, he said that she had to leave this place soon. The guy was not happy to hear this. Moreover, the injury felt as if all his insides had been destroyed. Hassel had already fully recovered and could continue what she had started. This decision was made for a reason. One day, once again restoring her internal energy, the girl forgot about controlling the presence around her. At one point a man appeared in front of her, but fortunately it was Sa Ren. Addressing the young lady, he reported that their master was safe and fully recovered. Ha Sol was pleasantly surprised. The caring master asked her to get ready since it would be good for them to set off soon. Meanwhile, the master, still unknown to us, reached the wasteland nearby. He first came to the northern abandoned lands and believed that there was strong life energy here. Within a moment, he noticed the presence of uninvited guests and asked them not to kill his mood with their hide and seek. Several people began to burst out of the ground. Mysterious men with dark capes replied that the man's feelings were very acute. After this remark, they asked him to say who he was and where he was going. This warrior did not know who they were, but he was already interested. He liked their unusual weapons and the chi energy that came from him, because it was not like the one that came from the martial artists he had fought with before. The man was already mentally admiring the northern region, and the fact that there were many interesting martial arts here that he had not encountered before. Still, he was not going to answer the stranger's questions, and in response asked why he had to say anything. The stranger coldly said that he would spare him if he left quietly, but the self-confident and serious man did not take his words seriously, and said that the only one who should leave is the strange mole that burst out of the ground. Adjusting his hat, the stranger with a cold gaze called the master an arrogant fool. After these words, he waved his daggers, which were attached to long chains, and shouted that now they would think that he was here to help the woman they disliked. Rushing into battle, the master replied that he did not know which woman he was talking about, but if it was a fight, then he was always in action. Five fast fighters rushed towards the daredevil. They all pointed their weapons attached to chains towards the lone warrior. To their surprise, when the column of dust began to clear, the man still had a confident smile on his face. As soon as these guys tried to get their weapons back, they realized that their chains were tightly stuck. As it turned out, this fighter was able to withstand all their efforts with one hand. After that, he pulled the chains towards himself and prepared his right fist to strike. From the first attack, he managed to get rid of the stranger's weapons. This was the first time these ninjas had encountered someone like this. They had no choice but to draw their bloody blades. Using blood for bloody destruction, they were going to finish off this daredevil with one blow. Within a moment, the fighter focused his energy into both fists and rushed to attack. The powerful collision of the two forces created a huge column of dust. As a result, the fighter was able to defeat these so-called hidden ghosts, although he was wounded. While observing the enemy, he noticed that they were using bone flares, sacrificing their body to gain more attack power. Taking out the enemy blade from his back, the unknown master admitted that he was not facing average martial masters, because they turned out to be even stronger than he thought. He had quite a lot of experience in battle and admitted that even the fast sword master Park Sang Wan was not as strong as them. Still, he did not regret that he had entered into a meaningless battle, since he did not even think about changing the final destination of his route. A mysterious warrior was approaching the palace of the Northern Heavenly Alliance. At the same time, Mu Wan left the house to take a walk and was noticed by Mrs. Hiryong. The girl immediately came closer and asked if he was feeling better. She was just on her way to visit him to give him more medicine. Holding his shoulder, the young master replied that this was not the first such wound. The confused girl, holding medicines in her hands, asked once again for forgiveness for the behavior of the shim master and for the fact that they invaded his house without permission. The guy repeated his words that this was not the first time for him, after which he said that since they were here, let them spend their time with pleasure. The innocent girl thanked him for his kind words and expressed surprise at the kindness of the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. He also admitted that she expected Master Jin to hold a grudge against such guests, especially since their grandfather is one of the nine heavens from the Central Northern Alliance, and not to mention the fact that her grandfather was Sio Moon Hua, the sage seeking knowledge. Of course, Mu Wan knew this without her, but did not react to these words. Handing the medicine to the guy, she asked him to believe that she was not as bloodthirsty as her grandfather. 
She also kindly said that if there was anything she could do to help Master Jin, she would not hesitate to do so. This entire unusual conversation was already being monitored. Sitting on the roof of one of the buildings was the bodyguard of the So Moon family, Master Yun So Seo. That evening, as Master Shin walked through the building that had been prepared for their visit, he saw a strange shadow in one of the rooms. It was Lady here, and she really scared him as she looked like some kind of ghost. The girl with a cold and rude look asked him not to force her to repeat the words that he should not get involved with the young master of this palace. The guy decided not to pay attention to it and justified himself that it didn't matter because the guy couldn't even dodge his attack and turned out to be too pathetic. In response, the girl with an unexpectedly confident and arrogant look said that Mu Wan plays a colossal role in their plan. The hypocritical girl was going to use him as the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan as much as they could. Meanwhile, somewhere in Murum, another bloody battle ended. The terrifying warrior destroyed another fighter. It was the chaos demon Tai Mu Kang. He was disappointed with this battle, since the enemies did not even resist. After these words, his faithful ward arrived and the man asked what happened to the gang of the hidden ghost. The man reported, according to him, after transmitting the location of their targets. Those guys were waiting for further instructions. But after losing contact, they found their bodies near the meeting place. The demon was shocked that their elite force was destroyed so suddenly. His ward clarified that they were all killed by some child, and he may now be where their main target is, some girl, and most likely we are talking about Mrs. Ha Sol. After clarifying the details, Mu Kang ordered a gang of black wolves to start hunting rabbits. Inside the Northern Heavenly Clan Palace, things were still calm, but not for the vice captain. Musan was suddenly discovered by his old friend. It was a member of the Four Deadly Heavens, the elite Tiger Guard E.P. Vol. He recalled that his comrade had suddenly disappeared, but he guessed that he would find him in just such a place. As it turned out, there could be no friendship between them, because one of them stole his friend's woman. Seo Mu Sang was not happy with his luck, because that guy with the ridiculous face even became an elite tiger guard. The deputy captain of the mercenary group asked his so-called friend to focus on his mission and not appear in front of him again. In response, the fighter thoughtfully asked if Mu San was still really angry about this. He said he still feels guilty about what happened, but has made his point clear more than once. With an arrogant look, he stated that that common lady of his heart chose him, and not only that, but also insisted on getting married. Another provocation forced the deputy to act rashly, and calling on the insolent guard to remain silent, he grabbed his sword. The guard did not expect that his words would bring So Moon San to such a state, and was confused for a second. Before delivering a fierce blow, the fighter, who had lost his common sense, asked how E.P. Vol dared to lie and continue to laugh at him. But after a moment, his enemy, who seemed confused, managed to take his knife out of its sheath and make a quick lunge. He carried out an incredible attack, during which he broke the blade of the deputy captain of the mercenaries and inflicted two cuts on the poor fellow's right hand. Looking back, the brazen and cocky guard asked his old friend to cool down and said that he tried to be polite as soon as he met him. Seo Moon Sang was broken, because with the help of cruel provocation he was not only deceived, but also reminded of his past love tragedy. The arrogant and hypocritical E.P. Vol said that he would be here for a while, and they would not be able to avoid each other, so they should change their position in life. He also added that the wound is not too deep and should be cleaned up in advance. At such a difficult moment the past itself came flooding back to Moon Sun's mind. His happy life came to an end when his comrade stole his girlfriend, whom he simply took by force. Having lost to his attacker in a duel, he was broken and began to laugh in panic. As soon as Mu Wan recovered a little, he went to the forge again. When he returned home, the impudent Hasil immediately forced him to cook food. As usual, she showed her displeasure that the dinner turned out to be the same as the previous ones. After her dissatisfaction, the guy silently extended an interesting thing in her direction, a flower made of iron, which he made with his own hands. The girl was very puzzled and the guy explained to her that this was, in fact, a gift. She was surprised and confused when she received something like this. Eating his meat as if nothing had happened, the guy explained that since she was leaving soon, he wanted to give her something before they parted ways. The girl began to feel embarrassed by this gift and blush appeared on her face. She was so confused that she did not know how to dispel this silence, overflowing with pressure. The girl was loudly surprised that she received a gift on this day and year, after which she quickly noted that this time the food was very tasty. That same day she looked at this iron rose many more times. The girl thought that he was incredibly handsome, and that the feeling of receiving a gift was unusually pleasant. Her reverie was interrupted by the appearance of Saren. The girl immediately hid the gift and was surprised by its unexpected appearance. The man arrived to his mistress and said that the master would soon arrive at this place. At the same moment, his piercing gaze noticed that she was hiding something. The girl made an excuse that she didn't understand what was going on, 
Bowing his head respectfully, Sa Ren stated that the young lady was their only and last hope, so he asked her to remember this and avoid personal attachments. In response, the girl purposefully stated that she would not allow this to happen. Sa Ren replied that he would trust his mistress, but at the same moment he felt that something was wrong. Meanwhile, by the pond of the Northern Heavenly Clan Palace, a lone man was training and reflecting. This was the deputy captain and he was haunted by a conversation with his old friend. He was puzzled by what that hypocritical lad had that he didn't. He considered E.P. Vol talented enough to join the elite squad of guards of the Four Deadly Skies, while at the same time he oppressed himself with thoughts of having to work hard in a land far from the capital. His morale was at its limit, and the fact that he had studied the path of the Blue Heavenly Sword, but could not move from the initial level, did not add confidence. Memories of the bitter past did not allow him to move forward. Out of anger, he clenched his teeth to such an extent that his gums began to bleed. The man promised his enemies that he would kill them all. At one point, the man heard an unfamiliar voice. He spoke about the dark illusions of a distrustful heart, and that when a person begins to doubt himself, darkness consumes him completely, and the rage that boils inside only leads to collapse and does not solve the problem. Looking around, Musan couldn't figure out where this voice was coming from. The stranger said that one day, when the warrior calms the rage within himself, his thoughts will become crystal clear, that they will be a mirror reflecting the truth. They tried to convey to him that all his beliefs are in his heart. The guy decided to trust the incomprehensible and mysterious voice. He accepted the situation and began to focus on his feelings. The voice told him about energy control, in which it is important to keep your mind extremely clear. Hearing amazing instructions out of nowhere, Seo Musang began to move easily and naturally. After cutting through the air, the man aimed his blow at the pond. His blow raised a huge wall of water and he finally saw the result that he could not achieve, being completely worried about his past. But in the moment after the blow, he noticed some unfamiliar key, which sent trembling throughout his body. Looking around, he tried to see the one who directed him on the right path. Meanwhile, Mu Wan continued studying at the top of the library. It was quite cold and he managed to catch a cold. In order not to push himself to the limit, the guy decided to stop and return home. He calmly descended from the library and headed towards his house. But along the way, he froze in place due to the feeling of a gigantic internal energy unfamiliar to him. His senses told him that this powerful man possessing that chi was at the entrance to his palace. He had never seen such a man before and had no idea who he was. As it turned out, it was a wounded master who single-handedly dealt with a gang of hidden ghosts. A terrifyingly strong aura, reminiscent of a mythical dragon, raged around him. The strong flow of aura created enormous pressure, and the young master felt that his legs could give way at any second. At this moment, he was sure that this was a real martial artist. Moving forward, the man examined the palace buildings with interest. He was surprised out loud that the Northern Sky Clan looked quite impressive. When he saw a young man he didn't know, he stopped. His gaze became more serious than before. After that, he loudly addressed his brother. As it turned out, children from the noble families of the Four Mortal Heavens were already running to the entrance to the palace. Mr. Shin was the brother of this powerful warrior. The master was surprised that his younger sister and older brother arrived earlier than himself. At the same moment, Mrs. Hiran tried not to show it. What made more sense was that Mu Wan was indifferent to their meeting. Noticing the state of the clothes of the son of the great Shin family, one of the children asked what happened to him. It seemed that Brother Shin was still obsessed with fighting, and everyone wanted to know what happened to him. When Lady Hiran noticed the condition of the Dam Master's body, she assumed that he had received injuries from his last opponent in the trial of a hundred duels. The last opponent was the Master of Fast Blades, Bek Siong Wan. Hearing this, Mu Wan remembered Mr. Huang's story about a rising star among the masters. The man satisfied the interest of the people who met him, and said that Sung Wan was a worthy opponent, but not enough to hurt him. The guys immediately suggested that he postpone this discussion, and hurry up with the treatment of wounds and treatment. After mentioning the warrior's name, Mu Wan no longer doubted that this was the same young and talented warrior. He is the third son of the sacred pillar of the Central Heavenly Alliance. He is 18 years old and his name is Dam So Jung. With a satisfied laugh, the man clarified that those enemies of his were suspicious, but nothing more. He was self-confident, and said that he was not afraid of such tests, since at his young age he shocked the whole of Murim. Looking back, he wondered who the guy who passed by him was. His brother said that he was the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, after which he clarified that he was pitiful and not worth worrying about. Despite these words, Master Dam looked towards the young master of the palace with some interest. Wen Li could not miss this look, and perhaps it was even part of his insidious plan regarding the young master. It was already evening, and Mu Wan continued to walk around the palace in thought. Just meeting the incredibly strong warrior made his palms sweat. He didn't expect to meet this person with a terrifying aura in such a place. 
and believed that his qi power was at a completely different level among those he had seen in the past few years. The gentleman was walking alone, but one of the accompanying warriors appeared in front of him. It was the general of the elite tiger guards and he was heading towards the young master. When he came closer, he introduced himself and said that he had been asked to deliver a message to the young master of this palace. Mok Yong Pen said that Master Jin was invited to dinner at Huachan Palace. This sounded quite funny, because the guests invited the owner of the palace to dinner, but he still accepted the offer. Having heard the answer, the general offered to come to the Huachan Palace the next evening and clarified that the master also allowed his cousin to come. While restoring his body in a vat of hot water, Mr. Dam did not stop thinking about the mysterious master of this palace. He thought about how Jin Wo Mun had no key. He couldn't even feel his martial arts. But at the same time, the experienced fighter felt something strange coming from him. It seemed to him that he noticed the physical or spiritual presence of the strength and will of the Northern Heavenly Clan. He believed that this guy had probably inherited the will of his family and could not be as simple as he seemed. A little later, he decided to wait for the palace master at one of the buildings. The guy did not expect to see Dam so young in front of him. Seeing Master Jin, the man rose to his feet and introduced himself, saying that he was honored to meet him. Still surprised by such a meeting, the guy reciprocated, although he did not understand what he needed. A little shy, Jin Mu Wan replied that there was nothing to see here since the place had turned into ruins. He also spoke of the hope that his guest was not disappointed. The man firmly stated that it does not matter to him what the palace looks like from the outside. For him, the main thing was the opportunity to see the only heir to the will of the Northern Heavenly Clan with his own eyes. After these words, their conversation was over and they silently dispersed. That evening, Mu Wan and his so-called cousin arrived for dinner at the palace, surrounded by the guards of the venerable children of the Four Pillars of the Deadly Heavens. In fact, Master Jin wanted to go himself. But the girl was worried about him, and said that because of a bad feeling, she couldn't leave him alone. In addition, she was very interested in this dinner, since she could find something tasty there, different from what she had been eating for the last three months. She was excited to finally be able to enjoy fine dining. Watching Ha Sol so cheerful and joyful, Master Jin even showed his kind smile. When the door was opened for the guys, they saw that everyone was already at the table, and was only waiting for them. Jin and Ha Seal slowly walked inside. As an experienced fighter, the girl immediately noticed an interesting master who looked like a lion. Taking a closer look at Ha Sol, Master Dam remembered the words that she was the cousin of the heir to the palace, but doubted it because he sensed her unusual key. He even assumed that she was his bodyguard because she didn't look like an ordinary person next to Master Jin. The man, as befits a warrior, rose from the table and thanked the young master for accepting their invitation. Ha Sol and Master Jin slowly took their places, which were opposite the palace guests. Hiding her true intentions, Mrs. Hiran decided not to attract unnecessary attention and shyly lowered her gaze to the table. The more serious and daring Master Shin asked his comrades to get closer to the point. The lion-like master stood up and addressed the lord of the palace. He began his speech by apologizing for using Huachian Palace and saying that they had reasons for doing so. Lady Hiran also rose from the table and said that they wanted to give Master Jin their seal of approval. With incredible enthusiasm, Master Dam stated that they wanted to found the Azure Dragon Society. The girl explained that the goal of this organization would be to involve militant youth in politics so that their opinions would be taken into account by the Central Heavenly Alliance. The guy calmly asked why. Having such big plans, they decided to visit the godforsaken Northern Heavenly Clan. At that very moment, Hassal wasted no time and ate the delicious food with gusto. Hiran answered his question and said that the older generation did not like it when junior martial masters gathered in groups. After her words, Master Dam said that there was no one among them who did not respect the Northern Heavenly Clan. He stated that many of them lived their lives in honor of his exploits, studying the history of the Silent Night confrontations over a hundred years. He stated that it was out of respect that they wanted to establish their organization in this place. While eating the delicacies with both hands, the heir's so-called cousin decided that it would be better for her to stay away. Resolutely showing his fist, Master Dam stated that the message of this meeting was their oath of the Azure Dragon Society to the heavens. Therefore, they wished for Master Jin to be their witness and give his seal of approval. After the words of the strongest warrior in this hall, Lady Heron looked closely at the clan heir, waiting for his answer. Without delaying the moment, Master Jin replied that he understood their intentions and would witness this promise. With great enthusiasm, Master Dam thanked the guy for this. 
At the same time, the less respectful older brother began to yawn. Despite the celebration, their little sister tried to stay awake. As expected, the cousin continued to take advantage of the moment and simply ate, without attracting unnecessary attention to herself by inserting herself into the conversation. While something strange was happening in the Huachian Palace, on the heights around the Northern Heavenly Clan, there were guards from a group that was already tired of their work. The very model-looking guys had been busy with such things ever since their precious guests arrived. At first they thought that they would have a chance to join the Four Deadly Heavens, but in the end, they were looked at as scum. Showcasing their incredibly sophisticated looks and profile, they weren't content with being forced to watch an area where they said not even an ant could crawl through unnoticed. The hungry guys hoped that from the huge amount of food there would be something interesting left for the gentlemen. While they were dreaming about food, a huge shadow suddenly appeared above them. Looking around, they were at a loss as to what was happening. Within a moment, fear appeared on their faces. At the same time, the deputy captain felt that something was wrong. He asked who was located at the northwestern entrance. It was Chan Muen and Nam Wol, and they were no longer able to respond to the deputy's signal. The concerned man decided to check the situation alone, fearing worse events. The ward was surprised because Seo Musan moved so skillfully, as if he had recently mastered martial arts. Seeing what happened, the deputy captain could not move. A few minutes later, his charge managed to reach the security post, experiencing incredible shortness of breath. The moment he saw the terrifying picture in front of him, he froze in shock. Their fighters were destroyed without any chance of victory. There was almost nothing left of his charges, and the man understood that something terrible had happened, and it was worth reporting to the captain and their honorable guests. While the children of high ranks were preparing, the guys continued to eat the delicious food. Hassal thought that they were a bunch of idiots. At the same time, the guy noticed that she was right. But this bunch of idiots is very scary. Sighing heavily, Hassal asked the guy to stay close, and then she would definitely protect him. With a smile on his face, the guy was glad to see her words of concern. He thanked her for the offer, and the girl felt awkward, confused. Hassal turned away so as not to show her blush, and said that in this case, she would protect the heir of the clan until she left the palace. At the same moment, Dam So Jong approached them and asked Master Jin to go away with him for a while to discuss something. After that, Mrs. Hiran decided to divert attention to herself and asked her cousin how she liked the food. But she did not like all these hypocritical pleasantries, and she directly asked when they would stop annoying the young master. In response, Mrs. Hiran's face changed from innocent and shy to rude and serious. Rising from the table, Lady Yong said that there was no point in inviting Master Jin to this dinner. In response, Hiran said that they needed consent and then apologized for disturbing them. Demonstrating real anger and hostility, the girl asked to leave Master Jin, saying that his life was dull and pitiful without them. After these words, Shim Su Ah, the youngest daughter of the Shin family, also joined the dialogue, saying that Lady Yan is the only one who burdens him more than themselves. The younger sister unexpectedly boldly burst into the conversation and said that the heir of the Northern clan did not object to their proposal, so some cousin should know her place and not interfere. With a very disgusted expression on her face, she said that they were no different from each other, since they all equally enjoyed the hospitality of the heir. Even the fourteen-year-old daughter of the great family's negotiation skills were quite advanced, which only bothered Lady Yong. But after a moment she forgot about what was happening between them. She felt something terrifying coming from the direction of the palace. At the same moment, Master Dam communicated with the heir of the great clan and apologized for the suddenness, saying that Master Jin was most likely unhappy with this situation. It seems he had another sudden request to discuss. He asked him to join the Azure Dragon Society in order to try to change the world together. But just a moment later, he had no time for the young master's answer, as he felt an unexpected terrifying aura that spread from the center of the Northern Heavenly Clan. As it turned out, this impressive internal energy belonged to the so-called Chaos Demon named Tae Mu Kang, and he most likely came through Yun Ha Seol. None of the guards could resist his ferocious strength. The man didn't even pay attention to their presence, because they were no match for him. In order not to waste time with the guards, he sent his Wolfgang warriors to attack. Real chaos began on the battlefield. With one powerful and fast blow, he destroyed everything around him. Within a moment, Mu Kang noticed something from the sky rapidly approaching him. Seconds later, a powerful landing explosion sounded. Great ardor arose, covering his eyes. The chaos demon asked who appeared in front of him. Damn, so young demonstrated such a loud landing, he first of all asked who he was to cause so much chaos. Pointing his finger at the young master, the man loudly announced with a laugh that he had already heard about a child who was called the rising star of the eastern sky. He couldn't believe that this kid had taken out his hidden ghost gang all by himself. Remembering the recent battle, Dam Sojong realized that we were talking about those masters who suddenly appeared from underground. 
It was clear to him that he was dealing with martial arts masters who did not study and live in Murum. Taking a closer look at the enemy, Mr. Dam assumed that they were the remnants of Silent Night. With a sly and mysterious smile, the Demon of Chaos replied that he saw that in the guy's eyes there was not fear, but rather anticipation. And so it was, feeling strong energy. Dam So Jong rushed into battle to test himself in battle with an incredible opponent. Meanwhile, one of the guards was able to escape pursuit, although he was seriously wounded. He immediately came to the general and the guests of the palace to report what was happening. At the same time, Ha Sol was shaking with fear. She couldn't even imagine that that monster would chase her all this way. Noticing her excitement, Master Jin came closer and placed his hand on her shoulder. He asked if she was okay. The excited girl replied that they should leave, because a monster had arrived that no one could cope with. Looking around, the guy noticed that they were surrounded, so he replied that it was too late to escape. A moment later, warriors from a gang of wolves began to make their way into the building. As usual, the disgruntled Master Shin began to complain that the elite tiger guards had not taken care of the uninvited guests. Lady Hiran's personal guard was on alert to keep enemies away from her mistress. Hiran herself tried to calm down. She believed that these people could be from Silent Night, but it was not clear to her why they suddenly appeared after so many years of calm. Being politically conscious, she assumed that if people found out about this, the whole world would be thrown into chaos. The battle could not be avoided and ha -Sol took off her precious hair clip. She prepared for a fight and asked the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan not to leave her side so as not to fall into danger. What she feared most was not the warriors of the wolf band, but their leader, the Demon of Chaos. Meanwhile, the Chaos Demon himself was busy with the rising star of the Alliance. Master Dam thought he would end this quickly. Within a moment, he rushed towards the enemy with incredible speed, which he did not even expect such speed. Tai Mukong closed his eyes due to the bright light of the young master's enlightenment. The young guy found himself directly in front of his enemy and prepared for a powerful blow. First, he delivered a powerful blow to the jaw of an enemy that was significantly superior in size. After that, he offered to accept the highest reward and hit the big man in the stomach so that he flew back. Having incredible speed, the guy continued to deliver a series of blows from different directions. It seemed that he was simply playing with the enemy because he was constantly behind his back. Their fight spread to the entire palace grounds, with Master Dam continuing to strike with lightning fast strikes using the technique of three successive bursts of light. After numerous attacks, his opponent looked so beaten that the guy thought the fight was over. He did not receive a single blow in response and, carelessly leaving his opponent, began to think that he had spent more internal energy than he had planned. But when he began to return to the palace, he heard some strange crashing behind him. The guy broke out in a cold sweat when he felt his opponent begin to rise to his feet. Looking at the enemy who began to restore his body, he called him a real monster. Adjusting his battered face, the Chaos Demon recognized the power of the rising star Murim. After that, he decided to give him an answer and began to use some kind of force. Within a moment, he launched a powerful volley towards the enemy and said that using only such blows, he could not be defeated. The guy managed to deviate, but at the same moment, Mu Kang appeared above him. The monster began to fly down with terrifying force. Using its energy, it quickly rotated and was aimed at the young master. Using the technique of demonic diving of chaotic rotation, he delivered a powerful destructive blow that, like a drill, destroyed everything within a radius of tens of meters. The young warrior had no chance to evade and was seriously wounded. Looking in surprise at the defeated enemy, the demon of chaos asked if this was all he was capable of. He said that the guy was wrong if he felt on top of the world after several victories over the masters who had become greedy with glory. Leaving the guy who was on the verge of losing consciousness, Mu Kong said that he saved his life because he saw potential in him. He asked the beaten master to meet again when he became stronger, because then his death would be worthy of fun for him. In response, Master Dam, who was on the verge of death, began to try to rise. Noticing this, the Demon of Chaos began to furiously shout that he should not be a hero and refuse his mercy. At the moment when Mu Kang was finishing off his opponent who did not accept his goodwill, some impudent girl tried to stop him, turning around and looking at the annoying factor. The man furiously asked who she even was. Brash and as usual arrogant, Sua asked if the stranger knew who they were. As it turned out, the children of a noble family and the tiger guards had not yet been able to escape from the encirclement. Only Sua came to the aid of her brother. Master Shim continued to fight with the gang of wolves, and having defeated the next enemy, asked his brother if everything was okay with him. Seeing Master Dam's condition, he couldn't believe his eyes. Considering words to be great power, Sua began to threaten the enemy saying that her father was one of the nine heavens of the Central Heavenly Alliance. She threatened that if the enemies did not stop, then they would end. Mu Kang got tired of her and got rid of the girl with one wave of his hand. What happened simply shocked Mrs. Hiran. 
Having lost his sister, Master Shin cried out with tears in his eyes. He no longer cared about the battle inside the building. He rushed to attack the terrifying enemy that took away his dear person. He was so overwhelmed by emotions that he didn't even think that it would be worthwhile to adequately assess the situation, given that this monster had easily defeated his brother, the rising star of the world of Murim. Seeing this, the already wounded and exhausted general shouted after him that he must stop. Master Shin flew towards the Chaos Demon, threatening him with death. For the first time in a long time, he used one of the strongest techniques at his disposal called the Crimson King's Demon Hand. Having no interest in the pathetic emotional son of some politician, Mu Kang used a technique that was only a diversion against the damn master. Having gotten rid of the impudent guy, the man moved on, calling the place overcrowded with useless non-entities. Watching this fierce battle, where the best youth of the Alliance could not do anything, Jin was simply in shock. Continuing to fight the wolves, Hassal grabbed the guy by the shoulder and asked him to stand behind him and not let his guard down. The girl fought with all her might. Her speed was excellent and the fighters of the wolf gang were no match for her. Mu Wan was surprised by her skill because she did not even require weapons in order to defeat such enemies. At the same moment, Lady Hiran stood in deep thought while she was surrounded by enemies that her sister was fighting off. She couldn't believe what happened to her little sister. All this was not part of their plans and she could not even understand who those who destroyed their forces were. At one point, the girl realized that she should calm down and focus on avoiding death. Turning to her older sister, she suggested moving to another place. With a more serious and impressive face, which she always hides, the girl said that they would abandon everyone and take only Master Dam and Master Shima with them. Mu Wan couldn't miss the moment where Hyeryong began to behave differently than usual. He had already guessed that this girl was extremely hypocritical. Mrs. Hiran realized that it was too late to hide her true identity. Despite this awkward moment, she decided to concentrate on her plan. Together with his sister, they ran out of the room crowded with enemies. The general came to protect the exit and several bandits rushed towards him to prevent the girls from escaping. When the girls arrived at the scene, Master Shim's condition was the same as his brother's. Lady Hiran immediately began to use her technique, regretting that the value of the heir of the northern clan was not used. They were forced to abandon him here to return to the mainland and prepare a plan. She considered her main task to be to hide the fact that Master Dam had lost the battle. After that, she sent the enveloping fate of heavenly illusion towards her enemy. Mu Wan watched the events on the street and absorbed the knowledge of the battles he saw in front of him. He was simply shocked that Lady Hiran was able to spread her spiritual energy without the use of auxiliary means. On the other hand, he understood that this was some kind of secret power of the great So Moon family. Due to the use of her power, the Demon of Chaos found himself in an illusion, which he found extremely interesting. While the monster was in illusion, Lady Hiran and her elder sister picked up the seriously wounded masters and began to leave the battlefield. The girl said that they needed to hurry up because such a monster would quickly get out of her technique. Watching what was happening, Mu Wan could not believe that these guys were so hypocritical towards their guards. They threw themselves into certain death and simply ran away to save their lives, regardless of honor. At the same time, Hustle dealt with the remnants of the Wolfgang. As soon as she finished and began to think about running away, she felt a strong, raging energy. It was spreading from the street where the Chaos Demon had previously fought. The man released a huge amount of strength so as not to waste time on the meaningless illusion with which they tried to fool him. When he freed himself, he saw that those guys had run away. He didn't mind since he wanted to fight after they got stronger. Looking at the building opposite, he saw two silhouettes and remembered that his original target was Haseo. Turning to her, he said with a smile that he was glad to meet her again. The unkillable monster Mu Kang was an absolute evil. Ha Sol understood this and told the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan to hurry up and get out of this place, which would turn into ruins any minute. The furious man began to concentrate the chi in his hands, creating vortexes. He shouted that Ha Sol was the only hope for the witch whose heart he wanted to break. He wanted to see her collapse with his own eyes, so he asked that the woman he hated be blamed for his death. After these words, the furious monster sent powerful whirlwinds towards the building, destroying everything around it. From a powerful blow, everything turned into destruction, and the guy could not see anything. When he opened his eyes, he saw that the girl was floating in the air. Seeing her white hair, he immediately thought that she was the Witch of the White Knight. It is known that inside the Quiet Knight there was a ruler who had absolute authority. He was also supported by four demon lords who were trusted people and used their enormous power to protect his interests. The terror and destruction caused by these four was so enormous that even speaking their names was forbidden. Their strength was the same as, if not greater than, the nine heavens of the Central Heavenly Alliance. Remembering the stories that his father told him, the heir of the Northern Clan thought that he knew that she was not so simple, but could not even imagine something like that. 
Now he learned that Hasol is the heiress of the White Knight Witch. The technique that the girl used to protect her savior was called the Will of the Silver Spirit. Enjoying a worthy battle, the man shouted that he was surprised that the girl decided not to run away this time, while knowing that she had no chance of winning. Looking around, the girl thought that he was right, and she would not be able to hold out for long. Her only goal was to let the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan escape from the battlefield. Looking at the destruction, she thought that most likely he had already escaped. After that, she accepted her fate and accepted the enemy's blow. The incredible power of the Chaos Demon caused a huge explosion that covered most of the palace. Hassel was defeated. The seriously wounded girl was unable to use the witch's techniques and the Chaos Demon lifted her by the neck. With a terrifying smile, he asked if she was really sacrificing herself for the sake of the boy who left her without a second thought. He called her actions stupid and then said that this was the end of her. After that, Mukong began to squeeze the girl's neck harder, making her unable to resist. In her last moments, the girl thought about Mu Wan. She was grateful to him for being the first person in her life to show her love. But at the moment when it seemed that this was the end, a deep cut appeared on the hand of the Demon of Chaos, and he dropped the girl to the ground. The man was surprised and could not understand what had happened. The girl lying on the ground also could not understand why she was still alive. A moment later, a guy appeared in front of her and apologized to her for the fact that the preparation took longer than he thought. It was Mu Wan. He returned with a sword in order to protect the girl who was ready to sacrifice her life for his safety. For the first time that day, the Demon of Chaos was so surprised, he asked what happened and who he was. The first time Mu Wan looked so serious, he introduced himself as the leader of the fifth generation of the Northern Heavenly Clan, named Jin Mu Wan. The shocked girl looked at the guy's back, thinking that she could not save the nicest person she had met very recently. She suggested that he didn't actually run away but walked with his sword. In response, the guy asked her not to go far and stand behind. The girl did not understand what he was going to do in such a hopeless situation. She didn't think he knew how to fight because she couldn't even sense his key. Looking at his hand, the man said that the guy was using some strange power. He could not understand why his immortal body did not heal the wound inflicted by this man. Mu Wan had no intention of fighting until he gained impressive strength. He wasn't sure how long he could use the techniques, and wasn't sure if he was capable of it. It was the worst option, fighting his first battle against a demon like his opponent. Now the Chaos Demon was truly serious. He said that he was worried about the Qi energy of the Northern Heavenly Clan heir, so he would definitely get rid of him here and now. After these words, the man began to concentrate energy in his fists and rushed to attack. His speed was incredible and he was about to land a direct blow that none of his previous opponents would have been able to withstand. At the last moment, Mu Wan managed to dodge. Tai Mu Kang couldn't believe that this guy managed to dodge such an attack. The clumsy guy did not yet know how to use his legs correctly and simply fell to the ground, continuing to watch and surprise the actions of the enemy. Possessing incredible brute strength, the Chaos Demon swung both arms to deliver a blow that would destroy everything around it. It hit directly where Mr. Jin was, but the second time the guy was able to dodge. He sat on the ground, watching in horror at the strength of the enemy. All he kept doing was clumsily dodging blows that could destroy the Damn Master in an instant. After another unsuccessful series of blows, the Demon of Chaos was incredibly angry and shouted that Mu Wan was a pathetic non-entity. While events inside the palace were gaining momentum, So Mu San finished his investigation and was returning back. The guards at all observation posts were put out of action. Remembering the words of his comrades, he thought that it was a mistake to go to this distant and dangerous place. He did not understand what was happening but was forced to complete the investigation. Heading to the palace along the way, he saw a man who was hiding his identity. The guy stopped and called for the stranger to show himself. Hearing a familiar voice, the frightened vice captain crawled out of the hay. The deputy did not expect to see him in such a place and immediately asked what was going on. The frightened man began to look around, saying that some masters in wolf capes had started a fight with them. He told his deputy that there were a lot of them here and it was worth hiding. Hearing the words of the cowardly captain, Musan asked what he was doing. The guy wanted to avenge the death of his comrades while the pathetic Zhang Bai San tried to escape and suggested that he do the same. Filled with anger, the man said that the dead comrades were loyal warriors, that they trusted their captain and were even ready to give their lives. He believed that Bei Sang should fulfill his role as a leader and respect feelings by acting with honor. The frightened captain replied that he had nothing to do with their lives and said that they could take revenge later, but first they should just survive. Hearing such pitiful words, Musan kicked the fat man in the ribs. After that, he said that their captain turned out to be a real scum. Musan ran further to help his comrades, while his captain shouted after him that he would do everything possible to survive. The pathetic bastard declared that he would crush everyone who looked down on him. The battle continued. Hassal could not get to her feet and she could only watch the battle. Looking at her friend, she couldn't believe it was true. 
Previously, he seemed like an ordinary poor fellow whose fate was under the control of people stronger than him. All this time he behaved awkwardly and now she realized that, most likely, Mu Wan deliberately hid his strength so as not to attract unnecessary attention. Despite the fervor of the battle, she still could not sense his qi energy, and because of this, she wondered what kind of martial art he had learned. Meanwhile, the battle continued, and the demon of chaos gave it his all. He took the matter seriously, and created demonic wings for himself, after which he flew into the sky, releasing enormous power. Directing the demonic reign of destruction towards the air of the northern heavenly clan, the man shouted that he would completely erase his existence. A huge number of blows with terrifying destructive force were aimed at a guy who had no experience of fighting. Mu Wan found himself in a very difficult situation. He thought that if he checked this entire area, he still would not be able to avoid being hit by the enemy. A huge number of attacks were visible from any point in this area, and Mu San could not miss it. Looking at the palace, the man saw that all the buildings were completely destroyed, and this place was no longer different from a battlefield. There is nothing left at the site where Hua Chin Palace was located. Moving forward, he saw a wounded soldier lying on the ground. Recognizing this man, the deputy captain stopped. It was E.P. Wool, and he was seriously wounded in the battle. Mu San immediately rushed to his side and tried to bring him to his senses. He shouted that his old friend could not die, because in that case, the anger inside him would have no meaning. But it was already late and the guy didn't answer. Fighting a gang of wolves took everything he had. The moment before encountering enemy attacks, the guy looked towards Ha Sol. He thought that first he should take her away from the enemy attack zone. But at the same moment, he saw behind her a part of the surviving wall, on which the greatest scroll of their clan was engraved. The guy tried to read what he had not yet studied, by concentrating on the letters, he began to recognize the words of the teaching. It spoke of a dark blade that destroyed heaven and hell and a shadow that kills both gods and demons. At that moment he realized the truth of the blade of eternal darkness and began to use the devastation wave technique. So Moon said goodbye to his old comrade. After that, he decided to take his comrade's sword as a souvenir. It was an item that he did not want to leave in these ruins. Everything around him was crumbling under the terrifying power of the enemy leader. This defeat was inevitable and he momentarily resigned himself to the fact that he was unable to do anything. But at one moment he noticed a strange silhouette. The vice captain of the guard recognized Mu Wan that he looked like a shadow when he dodged the enemy's attacks. Ha Seol covered her head while being hit by a hail of rocks falling from the sky. Mu Wan came to her defense. He had already comprehended a new power and could fight back. Releasing his energy, the guy powerfully created a kind of shield from the shadow of his sword. The huge pillar of his shadow was able to stop the enemy attacks that were directed in their direction. Seeing this with his own eyes, the deputy captain was simply shocked. Their enemy, the demon of chaos, was in the same state. Before his eyes, the guy who showed no internal energy moved the sword incredibly smoothly and quickly, creating shadows. With the help of his strength, he was able to protect himself and Hassel from many enemy attacks that were directed towards him. Having finished with this, the guy prepared for the next step. He quickly rushed towards his enemy, catching him by surprise. The heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan unleashed the power of the Blade of Eternal Darkness and prepared to launch a powerful attack. His blow was a moment before reaching its target. The Demon of Chaos felt fear and cold sweat on his face for the first time in decades. At that moment, he felt that this blow would kill him. Realizing that this was not an ordinary child, but a real tiger, the heir of the Northern Sky Sect, Mu Kong directed an incredible amount of energy at the guy, forming a powerful attack. Not having enough experience, the guy did not have time to dodge this and take everything upon himself. A powerful enemy attack knocked him out of action. After that, the exhausted guy fell to the ground while the chaos demon landed on his feet. Addressing the enemy, Tai Mu Kong stated that he was infuriating him with his techniques, which he had not previously encountered despite his battle experience. Within a moment, a huge cutting wound appeared on the monster's body. He couldn't even understand when he managed to miss such a dangerous blow. The wounded guy could not get up and felt terrible pain. He could not breathe normally and realized that he was already at the limit. The enemy was approaching, and there was no longer any opportunity to resist. Due to the eternal flames of chaos, Mu Kang was the closest to immortality, but he could not understand how it happened that his wounds did not heal on their own. Addressing the wounded and exhausted guy, the demon of chaos said that he was different from the children who attacked him earlier. He was infuriated by the enemy's hidden abilities, and he called on the guy to confess what martial art he studied. With a terrible smile, the monster admitted that the fights he liked depended on opponents who could put his life on the line. At the moment of his meaningless speech, he missed an unexpected blow. This was all that Hassel was capable of, but she was ready to spend all her energy in order to give the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan a chance to be saved. The Demon of Chaos turned his attention to her. He was clearly unhappy that he was being disturbed. The girl's attack did not bring any results. To save himself from unnecessary trouble, the demon launched another attack. 
which threw her towards the destroyed palace buildings. After that, he prepared to finish her off with a follow-up attack and said goodbye. Hearing this, Mu Wan regained consciousness. He shouted the name of the only person dear to him, Yun Ha Seo. After the attack, a huge column of dust rose towards the girl, and the demon of chaos returned to the idea of finishing off the air. But at the same moment, he was swept away by a huge wave of a powerful snow attack. Among all this dust, a man in a white cloak appeared. He was able to protect Lady Yun Ha Seel. It was her loyal subordinate, Sa Ren. He did not manage to arrive on time, but still saved the girl from the last attack of the chaos demon that was hunting her. As expected, the chaos demon quickly recovered from this attack. Looking ahead angrily, Mu Kang saw the woman he had long wanted to see. The White Knight Witch joined them. She is also known as the Dark Knight Demon, Lord Seo Gyum Han. First of all, the woman with chilling inner energy turned to Ha Sol. The girl who narrowly escaped her death did not expect her witch to come to her at the last moment. Addressing the enemy, Seo Gyum Han said that the Demon of Chaos should not have appeared in this world. With a sly smile on his face, the monster replied that the people of the Quiet Knight were the ones who created him. Meanwhile, Sa Ren apologized to the young lady and began to analyze the situation. He remembered that the will of the Silver Spirit requires calm reasoning from the young lady. In other words, she must renounce the five worldly desires and the seven human emotions. However, because of the guy who accepted her, she began to develop her emotions, and this causes everything to fall apart. He was filled with anger at the state his mistress was in. He believed that the most dangerous people in the Murim world were scum like Mu Wan who hid their abilities. Looking at the guy, he angrily thought that he was the mortal enemy of the Quiet Knight, since he was the leader of the Northern Sky Sect, although it was believed that it was completely destroyed. Considering him a ferocious beast that hides its claws, Sa Ren decided to end his life in order to protect his mistress from danger, which would only increase many times in the future. But noticing the hidden dagger, Ha Sol grabbed him by the clothes. The wounded girl begged not to kill the guy, who had done nothing wrong. She told him that everything that happened was her fault, because she came to this place and stayed here without his permission, while he showed mercy without expecting anything in return. He admitted that for the first time in his life, he received so much kindness and love from someone. In response, Sa Ren shouted to the young lady that Mu Wan is a terrible beast that hides its claws and is a great threat to their future. The girl tried to do everything to save the guy. Holding her protector, she named the heir of the Northern Clan as the one who saved her life. Sa Ren could not argue with his young mistress and was in a difficult situation. He decided to walk away from this conversation and asked her to take a divine recovery pill, which would help with the healing of her wounds. But the girl did not pay attention to her at all. She continued to look at the wounded guy who was trying to save her from a monster that he was unable to destroy. Meanwhile, Himukang was about to fight the White Knight Witch. He was not in the best shape because when he was touched by the strange energy of the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, his wounds stopped healing. Lady Seo Gyumhan was ready to fight, and two sparkling rings appeared above her. Addressing the enemy, she said that the last time he succeeded only because she was taken by surprise by his cowardly ambush. She believed that, under normal circumstances, his pitiful chi that used the eternal flame of chaos would not stand a chance against her. The White Knight Witch was not going to lose a second time, and began to release her inner energy using the rotation of the moonlight. Before fighting, the chaos demon turned to Seo Gyum Han and said that he was created for the sole purpose of hunting people like her. After that, he began to release a huge amount of destructive power and shouted that it was because of this that he was called the Demon of Chaos. With a furious and terrifying cry, he went on the attack. The witch's ice power and the chaos demon's destruction collided, creating a bright light that caused the wounded Mu Wan to lose consciousness. A powerful explosion forced Sa Ren to take the young mistress away. When he woke up, he saw the witch of the white knight in front of him. Severe wounds did not allow him to even move. The woman looked down on him, which only emphasized her high status. Knowing who she was, the guy began to fear the worst outcome and tried to crawl away, but he had no chance to escape. At the same moment, he looked around for the chaos demon he had fought before the White Knight Witch came. He couldn't see him anywhere, not even his body if he lost the battle. The witch said that the chaos demon had escaped. Looking at the lord of this palace with a stern gaze, she assumed that he was the last living blood of the Northern Heavenly Clan. She believed that everyone perceived him as a tiger cub without fangs and claws. But in fact, it turned out that all this was not true. And not only was he still alive, he turned out to be a very adult and dangerous fighter. She believed that he would be a real threat in the future. Strengthening her palm with ice energy, the witch decided to get rid of the guy before he became a real threat to Silent Knight. But a moment before she could finish off the helpless guy, a student tried to stop her. The wounded Yun Ha Sol began to slowly approach her. The witch asked why she was doing this. The girl stood right in front of the guy, protecting him with her body. 
Seeing this, the teacher asked the student how she dared to protect the heir of the sect, which is their mortal enemy. With tears in her eyes, Haseol replied that he was the one to whom she owed her life. She had to beg her mentor to spare the guy, remembering that she always listened and unquestioningly followed all the orders of the White Witch. She was right, because she never approached the witch with requests. But the woman was worried that this guy would not only become a real threat in the future, but also change the soul of her ward, who must shackle all her feelings. Having no other choice, Hasol bowed her head to the ground, sincerely begging for her comrade's life. Seeing the girl in such despair, Jin tried to stop her. Saren knew that something like this could happen, but he had no right to stop the young lady. Looking at her student, memories came flooding back to the witch. Once she had to be in a similar situation, most likely she was also protecting someone who was dear to her, even though it was contrary to their creed. Such memories gave her a headache. Still, she agreed to save the guy's life, but in return she had conditions. She said that in that case, Haseol will begin to learn the ultimate silver light ice crystal technique. Hearing these words, Saren realized that the time had come. Their master did not dare teach the girl this technique due to the fact that it was extremely dangerous, but still decided to speed up the process of completing the will of the silver spirit. Without raising her head, the girl agreed to go through these difficulties. After that, for the last time she turned to her friend, who treated her with such kindness despite the fact that she brazenly broke into his house. She held out her hand with half of the healing pill and asked him to eat the medicine. In response, the guy admitted that he was sorry that he showed such an awkward side of himself. But she didn't care, despite the fact that the witch and Saren were nearby. She hugged the guy, which is the biggest threat to their organization. The guy couldn't believe it was time to say goodbye. With tears in her eyes, Hasiel said that she was returning home. Master Jin didn't mind and also let a few tears slip away. The White Knight Witch and her ward left in an unknown direction. Master Jin Mu Wan sat among the destruction, thinking about what happened. Before leaving, the witch warned the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan that if he appeared before Hasol a second time, he would not be able to escape punishment. After the battle with an incredible monster, the guy was severely exhausted. But looking at the sky, he made an oath. He swore to the heavens that he would become stronger. At the same time, the deputy captain of the guard was watching him from behind one of the stones. The man could not believe what happened before his eyes. He suspected that Mu Wan was not an ordinary person, but he never thought that he was so strong. He got goosebumps from the battle he saw. Never in his life would he have thought that this guy would learn to wield a blade by training outside the eyes of the guards. He no longer doubted that the will and spirit of the Northern Heavenly Clan had been inherited by their last member to become a leader. At one point he came to the realization of events that changed his life. It was about the moment when he heard an unknown voice that put him on the true path. Now he was sure that it was Master Jin who enlightened him at the moment when it was hardest for him. He didn't understand his motives but he thought he was still worth watching. The wounded guy got to his feet and began to walk. Mu Sung thought about where this wounded guy would go and what his plans were. Master Jin suddenly looked in his direction and said that if the deputy was going to kill him, then this was the right time and there was no point in his doubts. The deputy captain was discovered, although he did not want to show it. He still had unfinished business. Putting a mask on his face, the man decided to pay his last respects to those who fought in that horrific battle. It was about his comrades, whom he could not just leave on earth. At that moment his life changed. He was again left with nothing. With him was the sword of his old comrade, to whom he had to say goodbye. Looking up at the sky, he sighed heavily. Even though the palace was destroyed, Seomusan remained. He watched the actions of the strange guy and wondered what he was going to do. Five days passed before he finally went outside. But the guy didn't answer anything and just went to carry some stones. The master asked what he was looking for, but in response he never heard anything. Mr. Jin picked up a stone and began to examine it. After that, he wrapped the thing in cloth and took it with him. Still silent, the young master began to walk away from his house into the distance. The man asked if he was going to leave the palace. The guy replied that it was time for him to leave this place. Seo Musang was sure that the Central Heavenly Alliance would soon send several people to check this place. In his opinion, they will learn about the existence of this monster, as well as the reappearance of Silent Night. He was afraid that the Central Alliance would not take this situation lightly. It was clear to him that even if he was not directly involved in this situation, he would still be somehow connected to it. Before leaving, the guy asked what the deputy captain was going to do, since he was left without a squad. The man replied that he would have to return to the Central Alliance, as he had some work to do. Mu Wan replied that if he left this place, he would be the only survivor of this incident, and the authorities would try to extract as much information from him as possible, which would cause him to face a lot of difficulties. Hearing these words, Mu San replied that he was right. He asked the young master not to worry and promised that he would never tell them that he survived, after which he swore on his life and all the gods. After thinking for a while, he decided to speak out to the end. 
The man admitted that he also regretted his actions in the past, after which he said that he sincerely respects his ancestors, and therefore was extremely disappointed to see his pathetic side. He could not accept the fact that he was the heir of a sect that he sincerely admired. In response, Mu Wan said that it was normal because anyone in his place would feel the same. After that, the man also thanked the guy for helping him that time. Mu Wan was embarrassed and said that it was not that important. After thinking a little, the man became more serious. Within a moment, he fell to his knees and declared that from now on he would serve Jin Mu Wan as his master. Such an unexpected oath surprised the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. Kneeling down, the man swore by all the gods and heavens that he would live and die only for his master, after which he declared that from that day forward, he was his only master. By doing this, Xiao Mu Sang was confident that the Northern Heavenly Clan would be revived with the help of this person. In an age when conspiracies and betrayals are so common, he knew that it was impossible to find another person like him who had spiritual strength and was guided by an unbending will. Sincerely addressing his new master, the man humbly asked for his consent, saying that he would become his blade and kill his enemies. In response, the guy calmly asked him to get up. As expected, Mu Sung treated this as his first order. Putting his hand on the man's shoulder, Mu Wan said that he heard his wish. Seo Mu Sang was accepted into the ranks of the Northern Heavenly Clan. It became the blade of the fifth leader of the legendary organization. Some time later, together with his faithful comrades, Mu Wan burned the remains of the fortress. There was no doubt in his eyes and the attentive So Mu Sun enjoyed his spirit and will. Mr. Huang stood next to them. Seeing how the palace in which he had been given hope for life was disappearing, he could not hold back his tears. The man turned away so as not to show himself in this form. When he saw from afar the state of the Northern Heavenly Clan's palace, he rushed towards the young master at full speed. At that moment, the guy was just lighting a fire, with which he was going to erase the remnants of the existence of their palace. The worried man wanted to know what happened in this place. Previously, he had heard that the descendants of the Nine Heavens had come to the Northern Heavens sect. Examining the young master, the man shouted that the arrogance of those scum knew no bounds, after which he continued to ask if the heir of the clan was all right. With a kind smile, Mu Wan calmly replied that there was no need to worry about him. He was grateful that Mr. Huang came to visit him. Despite what had happened to the Northern Heavenly clan, the old man was truly glad that his young master was still alive. The young master decided to go along with the old member of their clan. Seo Mu Sung intended to stay at this place until the Central Alliance troops arrived. Finally, he turned to his master. He respectfully asked him to stay safe and healthy until they meet again. Master Jin replied that he still did not know how long it would take. The man replied that it did not matter to him and that he would wait for his master to return. In response, Mu Wan asked him to be careful. Seo Mu Sung didn't want him to worry about his life. Yet he truly admired the life of the heir to the Northern Clan. The time has come to say goodbye because a different path awaited them. Lastly, the man should ask Mr. Huang to take care of the young master. The old man replied that it had been his duty for many years, so there was no need to worry. After these words, Mu Wan finally left his ruined palace. Looking at his master, the faithful follower thought that he reminded him of the dragon that had gone to spread the wings on his back. He had to wait for his return and prepare for the future. After that, he simply sat down on the ground and began to meditate. His main duty was to serve the true master. A few days later, a huge army appeared on the horizon. Seo Mu Sung felt the ground begin to vibrate from their horses. He did not have to wait long for the moment when they arrived at the scene of recent events. Based on the quick response time of the Nine Heavens forces, the man guessed that Mr. Sim and Miss Hiran had gone to the western fortress of the Central Alliance. Approaching the lone warrior, the army stopped. Their captain said that he had heard that Silent Knight had appeared in this place, after which he boldly asked the stranger to identify himself. Seeing this general, Mu Sung assumed that he was Yang Manjo from the western fortress. The determined warrior took out his ID and said that he was a member of the third group of mercenaries sent here by the Central Heavenly Alliance. Having learned about the group of mercenaries, the man asked where the rest of the guys were. So Moon replied that he was the only one who survived. The general decided to repeat this news and the man calmly confirmed his words. Pointing his huge sword towards the former mercenary, the general asked what happened to the heirs of the sect. Hearing that he was dead, the man asked in disbelief whether the guy had seen it with his own eyes. So Moon replied that he was last seen locked in a burning room, but could not confirm whether he escaped or not. The general peered thoughtfully at the suspicious guy. After that, he replied that they would soon find out and asked his wards to arrest the stranger and send him to the western fortress for interrogation. Addressing his army, he asked them to split into two groups, after which he appointed their leaders. The first group was engaged in searching the area and recovering bodies that had been burned. The second group was engaged in protecting the surrounding borders. Seo Mu Sung was captured and knew that when he was taken to the Western Fortress, they would question him about the appearance of the Quiet Knight and how he survived it all. Most likely, they will also try to find out the truth about the Master, and if his innocence is proven, he will be able to return to the Central Alliance. 
But if they suspect him to the very end, then he will be imprisoned forever. The man was confident and was going to remain collected until the very end. Wasting no time, the general began an investigation and asked to find everything that had to do with the appearance of Silent Night. Despite his scream, Seo Mu Sung was sure that no matter how hard they tried, they would not be able to find anything. He only thought about how his master would cope with the trials that he would encounter along the path of improvement. The road was long and Master Jin remained on his horse even at night. Over time, they arrived at the northern mountains called Geokum, which their sect considered terrible because they were not suitable for ordinary life. Huang asked if the young master was sure that he wanted to stay here. The guy answered without any doubt that everything was fine. From now on, he intended to practice only martial arts, considering this place to be ideal for immersing himself in training. Now he was dead to the whole world. He knew that at first people would doubt, but soon all this would pass, as they were cruel and heartless. Addressing the young master, Huang said that he would bring him food and supplies every four months. Before saying goodbye, Master Jin took his faithful comrade by the hand and said that he was truly grateful for what he was doing for him. The man asked him not to say such things. He considered his actions a sacred duty that he must fulfill. In response, the master asked to excuse his words since he wanted to continue to rely on his support. Huang replied that he just wanted the young master to fully focus on his training. After examining the eerie surroundings, they began to remain silent. The cold and gloomy rocks around were what tempered the young master's spirit. His path to the top will begin from this place. The following events take us to one of the ten largest trading troops in the country, whose power of wealth is able to force even the imperial family to listen to their demands. The White Dragon has numerous branches scattered throughout the mainlands, thanks to which they have gained enormous influence over the entire country. Each of their branches is large enough to operate independently, however. If they had a place that they could call their main headquarters, it would be in Nanju, a city that they completely control. It was almost impossible for the White Dragon Merchant Troop to find anyone who had nothing to do with them. The woman who founded the White Dragon Trading Troop is the retired leader, Ro Tay Tay. But this was the first time she had appeared at the meeting in many years. Her youngest daughter, Yoon Soin, kept thinking about what a great man her older brother was who did everything to help her mother build this troop from scratch. In her opinion, he is the one who cares about the White Dragon Merchant Troop more than anyone else. It was about the eldest son named Yun Human. This man was already the leader of a troop of merchants. It had been a long time since this woman had appeared at a summit, and it seemed quite unusual of her. It was clear that something important had happened. Turning to her son, she became convinced that the situation in Unnam did not look good. Upon learning that we were talking about the city of Unnam, Yun Soin remembered that seven years ago, when everyone wanted to leave that city because it was too far from the main headquarters, a man appeared who put everything on the line to create there the basis of their branch. This was another older brother, the third son of the family. His name is Yun Jaomin. He stated that if there were problems in Unam, then he would immediately be the one to go solve them on his own. In response, the leader stated that if Jaomin left his position here to go to Unam, they would inevitably suffer some losses. He thought it would be better if they sent someone else to Unam. The younger brother considered this a personal matter, since he founded a branch in the city where problems arose. He stated that there is no one who knows more about that city than himself. With a calm look, the troop leader thought that he understood his brother's feelings. He was sure that Jamin was capable enough to go there, however. They had no idea how difficult the situation was and what dangers might await them there. Their mother was here to make sure they made an unbiased decision, so he was going to refrain from making harsh remarks. Turning to the head of the family, all members of the summit began to discuss several candidates, but it was difficult to decide among them, because some were quite smart, while others were more advanced in martial arts, which guaranteed them a safe visit. After listening to all the opinions, the woman turned to her son, who founded that branch. Jamin was attentive to the speech of his respected mother. The woman wanted to hear if he really wanted to go to Unnam. In response, he stated that she knew very well that he was the one most suitable for this. She agreed that it was natural that he would want to go to his branch but she wondered who he was going to take with him. The man replied that he planned to take the deputy general. He was confident that Na Mingol and his people would be able to help avoid any difficulties and dangers. Hearing his answer, the woman said that in this case, nothing would change if he took one more person with him. It was about bodyguard Huang. Hearing the mention of Huang Chul, Jamian didn't mind. The founder of the White Dragon Group believed that bodyguard Huang was a reliable person, and in case of emergency, he would help contact their main branch. Before sending her son to solve the problems of the branch, she asked him to take care of himself, because the situation in Unam is not easy. After the summit ended, only Mrs. Thay Thay and her son Human remained in the hall, who inherited the family business. The woman asked if he was worried about his younger brother. The man replied that this was true, 
but he was more worried about the fact that they did not have reliable information about how things were now in that city. In response, the woman agreed with his words, but clarified that just because it is dangerous does not mean that the main family should not intervene. She believed that at such times their family had a responsibility to take the initiative and set an example for others. She believed that her son would be fine. She wanted Human not to worry, and then asked him to send bodyguard Huang to her. The man responded to her request with a smile. It seems that for them he had some special value. He knew that Master Huang was not talented in martial arts and did not particularly stand out among others. Therefore, it was a mystery what he did to earn his mother's trust and favor. The training of young masters took place in the inner palace. The guys gave their best. The teacher tried to set them on the right path and taught them to focus on internal energy. According to the mentor, the children did not give their best and did not behave seriously. As it turned out, this mentor was bodyguard Huang. The head of the family took him by surprise. At the request of Lady Tay Tay, he went to meet her. The woman invited him to sit down and asked how he was doing. The man confessed that thanks to the generous kindness of his lady, his life was blessed with ease and comfort. For the founder of the merchant troop, this was pleasant to hear. The bodyguard asked why he was called to a personal meeting. The woman informed him that his third son wanted to go to Unam, and since this place was his special interest, he considered it his duty to regulate the situation there. She said that she wanted her faithful subject to go with him. She also said that seven years ago her eldest son managed to escape an extremely dangerous situation, and then five years later, she herself found herself in a critical situation and only miraculously survived. Looking back, she believed that the person who helped them get through the difficulty safely was Huang. As it turned out, she believed that he was blessed with great luck and had the power to allow people to escape dangerous situations. The woman believed that this was a talent given by God, so she asked if she could entrust her third son to him. As a result, he had a trip to Unnam planned in two weeks, so he had to rush to fulfill his previous plans. He was also worried that young master Munjung might come with them, who is quite a clumsy guy and could end up getting hit by a sword, which would make it worth spending a lot more time on his training. As the man moved forward, he saw the destroyed cart and remembered that due to the great influence of bandits in the area, the Imperial Army began to manage his security with special attention. But to his surprise, no matter how many times he had passed here in the past, he had never met them. Heading towards the mountains where he left the young master, Huan thought that he must really be lucky if no Tai Tai was sending him with his third son. Meanwhile, Mu Wan grew stronger. He had already become accustomed to this difficult place to live. The mountains were covered with snow, but he made a place for himself in the rock, to which he carried a small supply of wood. Inside, many destroyed swords were evidence that he was not sitting idle. In an instant, he heard someone come to his door and ask him to come out. The guy recognized Mr. Huang's voice and happily ran towards him. Not even a year had passed since they last saw each other and now Jin Mu Wan looked like a completely new person. Turning to the young master with tears in his eyes, Huang Chul thought that if he died on this journey, he would no longer regret anything. As expected, Master Jin was very grateful that Mr. Huang reached him at such a cold time of the year. He invited the man inside. Inside his cave, there was a very good dwelling. Although the guy had changed noticeably, he believed that he still lacked a lot and should be more diligent in his training. Taking another look at the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, the merchant said that he was simply amazing. Every time he saw his young master, he seemed to be a new person, which was quite mysterious. The guy sat down to drink tea. Mr. Huang said that he arrived earlier than usual because he was being rushed to Unnam. The guy asked what was going on. He hoped it was nothing serious. The man replied that he doubted that it was dangerous. According to him, even if something bad happened, he is more than capable of protecting his own body. After that, he asked what kind of mysterious large blade was in the corner of the room. The young master replied that it was a blade that he forged using the stone that Huang gave him. It took him a lot of time and effort to curb something like this. Taking a closer look at the blade, the man stated that a rather ominous vibration was emanating from it. Next, Mr. Huang decided to talk about the events that have happened recently. It has been seven years since Mu Wan was forced to leave his palace. The four pillars of the northern heavens had gained enormous power in the world, and the Central Heavenly Alliance was trying its best to keep them in check. They struggled with each other which meant that the quiet night had not yet returned. Because of this, even the Central Heavenly Alliance was in complete confusion and seemed unstable. While saying goodbye, Mr. Huang Chol convinced the young master that he should not worry, because until the world again sees the glory of the Northern Heavenly Clan, he will never get sick or die. He also said he would be back by early spring in about three months. Mu Wan wished good luck to his faithful comrade and asked him to take care of himself under any circumstances. After these words, Huang looked at the clan heir with a smile and said goodbye. The young master took a closer look before he set off. 
Yet this was the only person whom he saw once every few months for seven years. Looking up at the sky, he wondered how Hassal was doing. Three months later, Mr. Huang still did not come to the young master. The guy understood that something had definitely happened to the old man. After many years of training, he was no longer the same person and was ready for any challenge. His blade could even cut through stone. These mountains, which terrified the masters of his clan, were cut by his blade. Mu Wan continued to train and his skills in using eternal darkness reached a completely different level. There was an unshakable will in his eyes and now he was ready to show everyone the heritage of the Northern Heavenly Clan. With one powerful blow, he created a huge destructive wave of eternal darkness. The result of his training was simply amazing because he managed to easily destroy a mountain range against which he looked like a small and helpless ant. He believed that there was no point in waiting any longer and it was time to find the master who is one of the three members of his clan. Master Mu Wan went to the city of Nanju in the Orchid region. First of all, he went to a local hotel. Looking at the guy in some old and dirty raincoat, the man thought that he was a beggar and it would be better if he said that they had no numbers left. But a moment later, the guy covered his table with gold. The hotel owner's attitude immediately changed and he happily greeted the guest and said that he would take him to their best room. According to him, that room made even noble families covet it because it had everything and even a private bathroom. When Mu Wan walked inside, he thought that he had spent too much time in solitude and his memories of the locations of the cities had become foggy. He was surprised that he was somehow able to reach Nanju. It was difficult because the journey took more than 10 days. He had to go to this place because all he knew was that the old man worked as a bodyguard for the White Dragon Merchant Troop. He didn't know much about the new world he had returned to, so he felt it was a mistake to be overconfident the moment he let Huang go into danger. Because the guy was focused on learning martial arts, he had to act too late. Leaving his things in the hotel room, the guy went to the palace of the White Dragon Merchant Troop. He introduced himself to the guards as Master Jun and said that he had arrived in search of a boy named Kwak Mun Jeong, who was the pupil of bodyguard Huang Chul. Hearing this name, the man asked how he knew the bodyguard student. The guy replied that he didn't know the student personally, but his uncle said that he was close to the guy. When asked who his uncle is, Mu Wan replied that it was Huang Chul, Mrs. No's bodyguard. Hearing this name, the man reacted with a smile and assumed that this was their dear brother's nephew who liked to show off his family. After a short period of joy, he became tense and said that it had been six months since they last heard from Mr. Huang. The main entrance guard agreed to take the guest to the place where Munjung was located. He said that since that student never had any talent with a sword, now he is just doing a bunch of random tasks here. Among the local bodyguards, there were those who looked extremely hostile. Despite their piercing gazes, Mu Wan was not worried at all. The guard asked the young master to wait while he talked to the mentor. The man walked up to the man with gray hair and whispered something in his ear. After that, the old man turned around in surprise to look at bodyguard Huang's nephew. His name was Khan Jinsen, and they greeted the young master as befits. According to him, Munjung is still busy, but he can return at any time. Next, Mu Wan asked what was known about his uncle and where he might be. The man thoughtfully replied that he heard that there was a problem in the city of Unam. So the deputy general and the third son of the founder went to resolve the situation. In addition, he also knew that Lady No had specifically asked bodyguard Huang to accompany them. In response, the guy asked for what purpose she sent his uncle on such a dangerous mission. He was worried why those guys were missing and why the founder didn't assemble a rescue team for them. Hearing this, Mr. Khan sharply replied that the young master's words were rude if he thought that Lady No was a heartless person. According to him, Everyone was worried not only about the disappearance of Huang, but also about the rest of the expedition members, and this is a big problem for the White Dragon Merchant Troop. That is why Lady No is hiring many experienced mercenaries and plans to send them to Unnam in the near future. Until now, the White Tiger Merchant Troop acted independently and did not receive any help from the Furious Fist Squad, which is the most powerful group in that city. Due to this incident, they asked for their cooperation but the mentor did not know what their response was. According to him, they probably tried to use quite a lot of supplies and items to bribe them. The man asked the guy to believe that Mrs. No was also desperate and was doing everything possible to sort out this situation. After these words, Munjong came running to them and the mentor decided to leave them alone, while he himself was about to go to meet the mistress. The young master wondered if there was a possibility that he would be allowed to join the people heading to Unam. He said that he was ready to work at any job just to get to that city. The man replied that he looked like he could wield a blade, so he promised that he would try to help him with it. After this, Mr. Huang's student turned to the young master. The ridiculous guy asked why he needed it. The meeting of the White Dragon Troop has begun, and it is worth mentioning the events that are natural. Every year, numerous talents pour into the world of Marim. People choose masters whose skills soar so high 
that they become worthy of becoming part of the seven lower heavens. The person who is directly opposite Kong Jin Sung failed to qualify for the seven lower heavens, but his ability to think and analyze is unmatched among all the people. He is known as the Eternal Mind, a master named Mu Huan. Afterwards, a woman appeared who is capable of single-handedly destroying several dozen strongmen. She is known as the Violent Force of Che Yakran. There is a martial sect that consists of only a dozen traveling mercenaries. They concentrated their forces around a martial artist named Yang Musan. At the right price, these guys will do any job and are known as the Iron Dozen. Your talented young guys are known as the Vice Leaders of the White Dragon. Looking at the youth, the mentor admitted that their aura was simply amazing. The girl's aura shocked him the most. He thought it was truly amazing and couldn't look away. Meanwhile, the most important document of this summit appeared on the table. Mu Huan signed a contract with them. The White Dragon leader said that they would now be under their care. With a smile on his face, the guy stated that he had successfully received the White Dragon merchant troop's request and was ready to go to Onam. Excited from the difficult negotiations, Tay Tay thanked them for their cooperation. The guys continued to show off saying that they should be thanked again after they saved the third son of the great family. The woman asked if they would go just the two of them. The great intelligence replied that they would also be accompanied by the last breath hunter named Lim Jin M, the setting sun arrow named Tam Jin Hong, and the blade of the seven paths named Kong Xiong Chang. He stated that the five of them would be leaving the next day, while the rest of their iron dozen were busy having followed their clan leader and were currently working on another mission. He stated that they planned to reunite in Sashin on their way to Unnam. Holding her head, the woman replied with relief that she now felt less worried. A satisfied and joyful smile appeared on Mentor Khan's face, because he was sure that if the entire Iron Dozen were there, the chances of saving the Third Master would increase significantly. After concluding cooperation and clarifying all the details, representatives of the Iron Dozen decided to bow out and leave to prepare for the trip. When everyone had left, Master Khan approached the founder and leader of the White Dragon and announced that the nephew of Huang's bodyguard had arrived. He shared the news that that young master was asking permission to go to Unnam with the rescue team. The woman replied that she did not see a problem with this and allowed him to do whatever he wanted. The caring son noticed his mother's fatigue, so he invited her to return to the room and rest. Meanwhile, a commotion began inside the White Dragon Palace due to the fact that the youngest daughter of the Soin family decided to go with the rescue team. The determined girl stated that she studied martial arts at the Kuntun Monastery and was able to protect her own body. The leader of the White Dragon and also her brother tried to stop the self-confident girl who insisted on putting herself in danger. But she only did this because Jamin is a member of her family. Loyalty to each other was their strong trait, so Yun Human could not dissuade her and understood this very well. The next day, everyone was ready to begin the mission. Young Master Mu Wan also arrived at the meeting place. He found it strange to feel that nothing would go according to plan. While the heir of the Northern Clan was enjoying the journey, Huang's disciple tried to start a conversation with him. He admitted that he was very worried and could not sleep. As expected, Mu Wan was very quiet. Taking a closer look at his teacher's nephew, he thought that they were not alike at all because the older brother was calmer and more reserved, and moreover, silent. Trying to continue the conversation, Kwak Munjong admitted that this was his first route. His father was also a bodyguard, but had died a few years ago during a similar route, so he was more nervous than usual. With a not-so-cheerful tone, he remembered his mentor's words that he would be the first to die if something went wrong. So he personally taught him some cultivation methods, and also nagged him a lot, and told him that he shouldn't relax during training. Hearing this, Mu Wan asked what cultivation technique Huang taught him. As the dialogue progressed, the guy happily stated that it was a three-step technique, the key aspect of which was that if he was patient and stuck with it to the end, it would help set him on the path to becoming a martial artist. He admitted that even though everyone said that he was untalented and should stop studying martial arts, Mr. Huang was the only one who understood his feelings and cared about learning. So he trained as hard as he could. Taking a closer look at the student, Mu Wan noticed that they were somewhat similar to Mr. Huang. Master Jin told him that if something happened, he should stay close. Kwok Moonjong wondered if his older brother was truly a strong and reliable person. He was worried about whether to listen to his words. After all, it was logical to assume that it would be safer to stay with the Iron Dozen, because they are known as one of the strongest mercenaries. At one point, Che Yakran distracted her comrade. The guy looked at her and said that apparently she also noticed that guy. According to him, the person who caught their attention was on a completely different level compared to other bodyguards. Experienced warriors felt something strange in the qi energy of Huang's nephew. It seemed to them that it was not there. The Furious Force was very interested in finding out what mystery that young master was hiding. Meanwhile, the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was thinking about how he should now live further. He dedicated his entire life solely to studying martial arts, and now the only thing he wanted to do was find Huang and Yun Ha Seol. 
He thought about what he should do after he achieved these goals. He was faced with the question of whether to take revenge on the Heavenly Alliance or continue to live as if it did not exist. On the other hand, he was sure that his father would want him to give up the resentment and start living a normal life, free from all worries. Despite understanding these things, he was not sure that he could live the way his father would have wished. Mentally turning to his father, he said that his blood was boiling with rage and he really didn't know what to do next. He was distracted from deep thoughts by a cry that the vanguard had stopped. They arrived at the river and planned to cross in about four hours. Until this time, it was planned to divide into two groups, which would take turns resting and standing guard. This plan was agreed upon between the White Dragon's bodyguards and a group of mercenaries they hired to help them. There was a small establishment near the river where they were happy to see them. Addressing the waiter, Master Mu Wan asked to bring something simple and satisfying for two. The girl replied that in that case they would like their signature roast pork. It seems that the young student Kwok fell in love with her at first sight. Master Mu Wan noticed this and smiled, after which he put the guy in an awkward position, noting that he liked that waitress. Kwok tried to lie and told his older brother that this was not so but his ridiculous expression gave him away, causing him to visibly blush. Meanwhile, the mercenaries also entered and behaved somewhat rudely. While the mercenaries took their seats and thought about what kind of drink to choose for the meat, the waitress brought the guys their famous roast. Addressing the student, she said that her name was So Ren. The guy answered hesitantly that his name was Kwok Munjung. As it turned out, the girl immediately realized that he was a bodyguard, so she asked if she needed protection. Then maybe she could come for him to the White Dragon Merchant Troop. The girl's cunning manipulation worked, and the shy guy replied that she could count on him. Children's love conversations began, hearing which, Mu Wan began to smile. Meanwhile, ascetics from the Kuntun Monastery arrived at the tavern. The great mind noticed that the boy between the two bodyguards must have a high status. He understood this because their monastery usually does not release young students into the outside world, and the only exception is when they have achieved high skill in martial arts or if they are a first-generation student. Noticing his younger brother's reaction, Mu Wan asked if he felt jealous, but he replied that he was not at all jealous. As it turned out, he liked being a bodyguard, and remembered his father's words that although they are paid to do their job, their duty is to protect the lives of their masters, as well as their property. He believed that because of this, people have great faith in their abilities, and cannot help but rely on them because their lives are built on honesty and modesty. The young master could not even imagine a more magnificent job for the one he does himself. Sincere words interested the heir of the northern clan. He replied that his father must have been a noble man. During their calm and peaceful meal, one of the monks suddenly rose from the table and began shouting that he wanted to see the cook of this tavern. Loud cries of dissatisfaction forced the establishment to stop fulfilling orders. The worried cook, wiping his hands on a towel, decided to check what happened. Seeing the visitor, he realized what was happening. As soon as he entered the hall, a plate of his famous roast pork flew into his face. Seeing what happened to Dad, the little girl screamed. An angry and arrogant man shouted that because of this food, their genius named Saul Gun broke a tooth. This monk believed that this was the cook's way of taking revenge on the great family of the Kuntun Monastery. As it turns out, a local chef named Ham Thaifun had a past connection with Kung Tung Monastery. He believed that the visitor's dissatisfaction was due to the fact that he had left them, but the rude monk shouted that his words were just excuses. In response, the excited chef said that he does not make excuses, and always checks the quality of the dishes before serving them to customers. Turning to his older brother, he assumed that he still held a grudge against him. In response, the martial artist remained silent. What we are talking about happened 15 years ago. Every three years, fighting competitions were held in the monastery. After another friendly battle, Master Ham, as usual, emerged victorious but did not become arrogant and tried to help his comrade get up. A student named Muhe knew that while this guy was in the Kuntun Monastery, he would not be able to reach the highest peak of their glory because together with this comrade, he was destined to always be second. He considered defeat at that fighting competition humiliating. He saw other masters discussing that battle and harbored a deep grudge against his comrade, who was superior to him in skill. Despite this, Master Ham Thapeng found himself embroiled in some kind of scandal a few months later, and as a result, his career was forcibly destroyed, and he himself was expelled from Kuntung Monastery. Even though that guy had lost his status, Muha still remembered the humiliating defeat and the rage continued to burn in his heart. Recalling those events, Chef Ham said that the only thing his comrade lost that day was his pride, while he himself was unfairly accused and eventually lost the ability to practice martial arts. He couldn't understand why his comrade still held a grudge. Addressing the visitor, the chef asked to clarify whether he really broke a tooth while eating his food. The genius student replied that it should be obvious that his tooth was clearly broken and it hurt like hell. As expected, it was all a vile lie. A few days ago, 
Sol Gun was training with his older brother Muhei, and according to him, he tripped over some roots and broke his tooth. In response to his statement, the cook said that the future of Kuntung Monastery looks quite gloomy, because there is no trace left of Master Thay's teachings and beliefs. He was dissatisfied with the fact that the followers of the monastery resorted to such lies. Hearing this, Muha began to feel angry and shouted that he could no longer bear to look at his arrogance. Filled with rage, the man hit the cook in the stomach with his palm overflowing with chi energy. The man flew into the wall and blood began to flow from his mouth. The excited daughter, with tears of panic, asked why they were doing this to his father, who was not guilty of anything. Seeing this, one of the bodyguards worriedly said that he was losing his appetite. His comrade replied that they just needed to focus on their task, since there was no need to get involved in other people's affairs. The little girl ran up to her father's abuser and shouted that his words were a lie, because she was the one who prepared the ingredients and therefore their words could not be true. As soon as she hit the man with her fist, he shouted that she was stupid if she dared to raise her hands on his sacred body after which he hit the defenseless girl in the face. Seeing this, Che Yakran couldn't bear it and broke her chopsticks. She was furious at what the monks allowed themselves to do. But at the same moment, the great mind asked her to cool down and said that the Kuntun Monastery belongs to the nine great clans and their interference could cause some problems. He believed that if they became enemies, the Iron Dozen would be in a difficult position. Things started to get out of control the moment Quok's bodyguard volunteered to defend the waitress. Despite the trembling in his body, he decided to negotiate and introduced himself properly. Having learned that this was a student of the White Dragon Merchant Troop, the man asked if the boy knew about their relationship. Looking at the unconscious girl, Quack asked them to grant them their mercy at least this time. He asked the monk to close his eyes to this incident. In response, Muse began to laugh arrogantly at the noble boy's words. He then began to manipulate the facts and said that the bodyguard's words sounded like they had done something bad. He asked how dare a humble bodyguard who receives money to train martial arts, stand in the way of an ascetic of the Kuntun Monastery. His words hurt the guy, and with tears in his eyes he asked not to speak in such a tone about his work, saying that the duties of a bodyguard are something more, which is why this work is honorable and has no equal. In response, the man, filled with anger, shouted that he had stood in his way and dared to lecture him. The arrogant ascetic decided to draw his sword to prove that he was right. He said that he would show the guy mercy and take only one of his hands. The situation was extremely hectic. Master Jin could not allow his faithful ward student to become a victim and decided to get up from the table. Mu Huan noticed this. He was very interested in the identity of this guy, but he was afraid of the consequences. Turning to the master, Mu Huan asked him not to be stupid and to restrain his anger, because that guy decided to intervene, although he knew that he should not have. According to him, Kwok's disciple will be punished for his ignorance, and there is nothing they can do to stop it but at least only his body and pride will be hurt by this situation. In response, Mu Wan asked if the student should be happy about his body being mutilated. According to him, when a martial artist loses his arm, it means the end of his life, while even a dog has pride. Mu Wan stated that true pride is enduring the hardships of complete loneliness while doing your best to fight for your beliefs. Looking into the face of the great mind, the guy said that people like him were unable to understand something similar that was inherent in true warriors. In response, the wise guy said that Master Jin looks at this superficially. He couldn't believe that he was really going to become an enemy of Kuntun Monastery with such a stupid and irrational belief. But as it turned out, Mu Wan thought it was wonderful that there was at least one such idiot in this world. A moment before the ascetic struck, the young master found himself directly in front of the bodyguard and stopped the sword with his bare hands. The guy was simply shocked when he saw that at the last moment his older brother came to his aid. Seeing this, all the mercenaries were shocked by the dexterity and amazing skills of the master unknown to them. Not only they, but also the monks of the Kuntun Monastery could not contain their surprise. Master Muhe couldn't believe that a sword block was used against him with bare hands, but he was sure that highly advanced fighting techniques were no match for his skills. The man was furious. He didn't know where the impudent man had come from, and how he dared to block the blade of a respected martial artist with just the fingers of his dirty, ignorant hand. His rage burst out from the fact that the guy opposite him didn't even flinch. First of all, he asked who he was dealing with and how he dared to stand in his way, and whether he knew who he was. Mu Wo replied with a serious and piercing gaze that he could be considered the elder brother of the boy who was targeted by that blow. He suggested ending their conflict at this point. But the arrogant master shouted that he was not seeing the eyes of the one who was asking for a favor. At the same moment, he filled his left palm with key energy and used the rising cloud's palm technique. Noticing this, Mu Wan calmly repelled his attack with the sheath of his blade. Looking into the eyes of the ascetic who began to panic, 
Mu Wan said that the duty of a child is simply to enjoy life, while the duty of a parent is to raise him. While the man tried to snatch his sword, which the master held only with his fingers, he continued to listen to the lecture. Mu Wan reminded him that the duty of an ascetic is to cleanse oneself of one's worldly desires, including anger, hatred, and envy. When the arrogant ascetic tried to twist his blade, Mu Wan clenched his fingers even tighter and the blade was destroyed. Addressing the impudent man, he declared that everyone has duties that he must fulfill, while those impudent guys dare to disgrace the rest of the ascetics of their monastery. Master Mo, who held in his hands the destroyed sword, which was part of every ascetic, was in confusion. Seeing this, two more followers of their great clan rushed to attack the unknown young master who was trying to teach them about life. They shouted that the insolent person should shut his mouth, since he had no right to address them in such a tone. Before facing fools like this, Mu Wan asked Mun Zhong to take the waitress and her father away from this place. The guy was shocked by what was happening, but found the strength to accept the order of his older brother. Two martial arts masters simultaneously attacked the guy who didn't even hold a blade in his hands. Mu Wan was on a completely different level and easily dodged the first sword strike. The genius disciple of the monastery struck in the air, but the young master defended himself with the scabbard of his blade. No matter how they tried, even together, they could not break through the defense of the master, who was much faster. Mu Wan had no intention of resorting to killing these ill-mannered members of the big clan, so he sent Seal Gun flying with a strong kick. As he lowered his foot to the ground, he also hit the senior monk hard. Just a moment later he felt another hostility. He easily dodged the sharp object that was flying towards him. As it turned out, it was a broken blade that flew into the wooden wall of the tavern. Mu Wan had to teach Master Mo a lesson the right way. Filling his palms with internal energy, the man directed his blow at the young master, threatening to destroy him for his insolence. But Wu Man, possessing incredible speed, managed to quickly close the distance and hit the enemy in the forehead. Having destroyed the pride of the clumsy monk, the guy grabbed him by the clothes. After that, he freed his other hand and attached the scabbard with his blade to his clothes. Having his other hand at his free disposal, the young master delivered several instructive blows to the insolent person's face. The enemies did not give up until the very end. The genius of their monastery, the toothless Saul Gun, approached him with a fragment of a sword and boldly asked how the stranger dared to attack the ascetics. He tried to stab him in the back, but as expected, nothing happened to him. Mu Wan grabbed the blade of his broken sword so tightly that no matter how much effort the monastery disciple made, he could not escape. A moment later, a loud crunch of bones was heard. Looking around, Kwok Munjong saw what had happened. Seal Gun's arm was broken and he started crying because of the pain. Watching all this, the mercenaries were completely shocked by the strength of the stranger and the situation that was happening in this tavern. The brilliant ascetic on whom the monastery had pinned its hopes was defeated and lost consciousness. Mu Huan was simply shocked. He understood that all this was bad because in this place there were members of the Iron Dozen who were probably noticed by those ascetics. He knew that if they interfered, they would face consequences because the people of Kuntun Monastery would harbor a deep grudge against them. They could no longer turn a blind eye to this incident but the great mind could not think of a way out of this situation. The young master continued to hold Mo by his clothes. The arrogant ascetic continued to talk nonsense about insulting the monastery and the fact that the guy could forget about his sense of security. Hearing the threat, Mu Wan wondered if he was worried that they might do something. The beaten man replied that the whole monastery was one, and that was their strength. He shouted that without knowing this, the guy should not dare to attack them. Mu Wan was not going to listen to these screams and decided to answer the impudent man. He whispered in Mo's ear that if the monastery was full of such bastards, then he should just get rid of them. Hearing the threat in his direction, Mo thought that this master had gone crazy. Mo Vin replied with a smile on his face that he could afford it. At that moment, Soin came to them. She was in a good mood, since she heard that her brother Mo was in this tavern. Seeing the state of her brother and his comrades, the girl was surprised how the bodyguard's nephew managed to do this. After this meeting, Mu Wan became involved in a not very pleasant conversation, in which the girl scolded him saying that because of his actions, the relationship between the monastery and the White Dragon merchant troop had deteriorated. She did not understand why he did this, because their families are closely related to each other. The daughter of the organization's founder wanted to hear his answer. She thought that Mu Wan should be grateful that they allowed him to go to Unnam together, so she couldn't believe that he acted like that. In response, Mu Wan apologized for the inconvenience and then asked if their first priority was to find out the exact details of the situation and check the safety of the people involved. Turning his attention to the student, Master Jin said that although Kwok is young, he serves as a bodyguard in the White Dragon Merchant Troop, so they are obliged to take care of people like him. In addition, he mentioned that due to the actions of the ascetics, a young girl in the tavern almost died, 
and the boy only tried to prevent this and almost lost his arm. Mu Wan stated that just because Kung Tung Monastery is highly respected does not mean that such actions by their students should be justified. It turns out that he knew that Mrs. Yun was a student of the Kung Tung Monastery. He asked to behave not like a student of the monastery, but like the leader of the dragon merchant troop that is in charge of this journey. That's why he thought it would be wise for her to listen to her people before making any decision. The guy's words put the girl in an awkward position. Still, she agreed with him and admitted her mistake. Despite this, she stated that the fact that Mu Wan brought those ascetics to such a state is not a small problem. Mu Wan replied that he would take this responsibility upon himself, because he was ready for this when he intervened in the conflict. After that, he said something strange regarding how the Kuntong Monastery of the Nine Great Clans is not something eternal, just like anything in this world. The girl asked to clarify what they were talking about, and Mu Wan replied that although the Great Kuntung Monastery has a solid foundation, they will not exist forever. Hearing this, Soin was worried about what was in this master's head. In order to relax the situation, the master again mentioned that he was ready to take responsibility for this situation, and stated that if this satisfied Lady Yun, then he and student Moon Zhang would leave the White Dragon Merchant Troop and begin to act on their own. Mentor Khan intervened in their conversation. He suggested that everyone calm down and postpone the solution to this problem until the morning. Mrs. Yun didn't know how to respond. When she left, she accepted her mentor's offer. Returning to the young master, the mentor asked what he would do now because he had created a rather large problem. Mu Wan replied that he would be waiting for them. The man was surprised by his intentions, but understood that Mu Wan was absolutely serious. It seemed to him that this guy was just crazy and not at all like his uncle. When they returned to the camp, Mun Zhang began to awkwardly apologize but Mu Wan replied that there was no need to worry about it, and asked him to prepare a place to stay for the night. The boy listened to his older brother's request, and went with the things. After that, Mo Huan approached the young master and said that it was his turn to talk, but Mo Wan did not want to listen to the reaction of the monastery and replied that he wanted to take a break because he was tired of all this talking. The great mind was simply amazed by his answer, and shouted that he still did not have the opportunity to explain the situation to him, after which he asked for just a moment of attention. Mu Huan stated that if they acted together, the current situation would be more favorable than the one they are currently in. In response, Mu Wan only asked if the great mind always calculates all its actions in advance. The captain of the Iron Dozen replied that this is so because calculating actions is the only way to survive in the treacherous world of Murim. He said that a master should act based on his strengths and weaknesses. It is thanks to this strategy that the Iron Dozen has existed for so long. The calm master Jin replied that he understood all this and asked him to understand it correctly. He believed that there was nothing wrong with his action. Mu Wan believed that there are times when a person should listen to his heart more than his mind, and this day seemed like a perfect example to him. The rest of the mercenaries were also watching their dialogue, ready to help the leader if something went wrong. Mu Wan stated that everyone believes that compassion and kindness have disappeared from this world, because people with power will continue to take everything from the weak while the poor souls will have nowhere to go to complain. The words that martial arts were abusing their power in the world shocked everyone nearby. Mu Huan was in a cold sweat. He understood that this was an extremely dangerous person in front of him, because in the future his beliefs would become a great threat to the entire Murim world. Trying to somehow influence the amazing master, the excited leader shouted that one person cannot change the whole world, because the world is not as simple and forgiving as he thinks. In response, the guy with a smile asked if he really thought so because even one candle can drive away the dark one. Therefore, Mu Wan could become a light that leads people to the truth. Master Jin said that this was the reason why he learned martial arts and why he should continue on this path. This ended their conversation. When the young student Quan returned, he continued to apologize to his older brother, feeling guilty. He said with regret that if he had not intervened, they could have avoided such a situation. In response, Master Mu Wan said that his only mistake was that he did not take into account his weakness. He believed that anyone can get into trouble, so the only thing that matters is how well you can fix the situation you're in. According to him, Kwok simply found himself in a situation that he could not cope with himself. Mu Wan was sure that the student had already learned that the world of Murim is a cold and unforgiving place where the weak die and the strong survive. Therefore, he asked the student to do everything in order to become stronger. Listening to all this, Kwok was very tense and lost in his thoughts. To give the poor fellow some encouragement, Master Jin put his hand on his head and said that he should be proud that he had the courage to stand up to enemies who were stronger than him. Mu Wan considered his action to be correct, because he saved the lives of two people. Hearing this, the boy began to cry and promised his elder brother that his words would remain in his memory forever. After the boy saw his older brother fight, he was well impressed. 
The inspired guy asked what kind of training he needed to undergo to become as strong as his older brother, to be able to break a blade with only his fingers. He talked about blocking the blade with his fingers. Mu Wan remembered that he had been trained in blacksmithing since childhood, and because of this, he learned not only to forge, but also to understand swords. Spending countless hours working in the forge, he was able to see flaws in the blade, although this would not have happened with the thin blades forged by master blacksmiths. At that moment, the guy remembered Mr. Huang and the black stone that he gave him. According to the man, this stone fell from the sky and a certain tribe worshipped it as an object from the heavens themselves. But this tribe was destroyed, after which the mysterious stone lost its owners. At that time, even two years later, the guy could not cope with him. He continued to work with the hope that the steel would accept him. One day he still managed to subdue that ore. The blacksmith's skill level increased, and he was able to forge a good sword. It was the same long black blade that he carried with him. The guy could see his reflection in the blade of the sword, but its edges were still dull and no matter how many times he tried to sharpen them, his whetstone would not hold up. At one point, the guy realized that his sword just wanted to see which of them could last the longest. Pouring his chi into the sword, the master continued to work on making his weapon truly sharp. The hard work was worth the results, so the guy didn't stop. Looking at his creation, he was able to call it truly beautiful. Remembering Hasol, Mu Wan decided to name his blade Snowflower, because the girl's name means snow. The blade he forged was neither divine nor demonic. He found himself enchanted and filled with sinister chi energy. The master felt that if he was not careful, the snowflower would swallow him. Looking at the master, the guy noticed an amazing energy emanating from his blade, which was simply captivating. While they were hanging out, the vice leader of the Iron Dozen came to them and brought food with her. She also had a drink in her hands. Mu Wan looked at her side with interest to understand her intentions. Che Yakran invited him to take this food as dinner. The guys didn't refuse and started eating, which seemed pretty good to them. Kwok asked his older brother why the violent force personally brought them food and then assumed that they were trying to convince him to join the Iron Dozen. He continued to think out loud, and said that in that case, she would not have given them the food without saying anything. Mu Wan noticed something strange and asked his younger brother to be quiet. He noticed something among the grass not far from them. The student did not understand anything, and asked his older brother what was happening. In response, Master Jin asked him to return to the tavern. He asked the guy to hurry up, after which he picked up his sword. Mu Zhang sped up, although he was worried about his mentor's nephew. Master Jin noticed that enemies were approaching him, so he approached them. An unknown warrior who was moving from the side of the tall grass, accompanied by his team, noticed that Master Jin possessed an excellent blade. After that, he asked who he was. Mu Wan replied with a serious look that he was just a swordsman from the north. The elder brother of the Kuntung Monastery, named Mu Guan, replied that the swordsman from the north was arrogant for attacking his disciples. As it turned out, the mentor of those three ascetics came to him as well as a dozen more fighters. Mu Wan stated that he did not attack anyone, unlike the ascetics. He guessed that Mu Guang still hadn't heard the truth. After these words, the dissatisfied Mohi shouted that this guy was insidious and should not be listened to. Sol Gun supported his comrade and also impatiently shouted that their enemy not only uses strange martial arts, but is also cunning, so he should be taught a lesson in politeness. The naive man had no honor and did not even doubt the words of his vile subordinates. So he declared that the master from the north dared to lie to him and tarnish the honor of the Kuntun Monastery, while disgracing the names of their ascetics and the fate of the Sacred Blades. Pointing his finger at the swordsman, he said that he would be punished for his actions. Mu Wan understood that a fight could not be avoided, so he began to take out his sword and said that this conversation was useless, since the ascetic had planned to attack him from the very beginning. Releasing the power of the Blue Flower Sword, Master Jin suggested that they hurry up and begin the battle. At the same moment, Eight ascetics of the Kuntun Monastery attacked him simultaneously. Without any delay, Mu Wan released his Bankai, or more precisely, the energy of eternal darkness, and directed it at the insolent people. The ascetics did not even have time to land on the ground when they encountered a force that none of them could cope with. They were all thrown into the air even higher than they were before their stupid outnumbered attack. The monastery master was worried, because he only noticed a simple movement of the enemy's blade. He even naively assumed that the wind was strong enough to blow away all the first-generation disciples. Still, he could hardly believe his own nonsense. While the first generation was floating in the air, another group of great family fighters rushed to attack. In response, the master decided to deal with them with one blow. His attack covered a huge area and all the enemies were thrown back in an instant. Ahead of the master, there were no more people willing to launch a frontal attack. At the same moment, a brave man appeared behind him, confident that he could stab the swordsman from the north in the back. 
But when the blade was close, Master Jin used his crushing fingers. With one precise move, he completely destroyed his opponent's sword. After that, without even turning around, he aimed his blow at the poor guy who hoped to become the hero of the evening. At the last moment, Mu Wan turned his weapon around, so that fighter received a solid slap in the face with the blunt side of the snowflower. But even such a blow turned out to be so impressive that the poor guy flew several tens of meters and his landing turned out to be very hard. Having taken a good look at the enemy's movements, Mentor Mu Guan noticed that the swordsman was using only the sheath of his blade. At that moment, he realized that they were dealing with such a powerful martial artist that, out of boredom, he was not even going to kill the pathetic ascetics. One of the students shouted that that master was going to destroy the entire monastery. The mentor tried to stop them, but the ascetics were confident in the strength of their numerical superiority. The man shouted that they were no match for him, but it was too late. The movement of the master from the north looked as if he was gliding along the ground. His speed didn't even compare to his enemies. Mu Wan simply mocked the enemy fighters, and instead of finishing them off with one blow, he hit them with his scabbard, and they began to spin around their axis. Mo was simply shocked. Previously, he thought that their weakness was in numbers. But when he brought many ascetics and saw the same result, all his expectations from the battle were destroyed. Mu Guan looked quite angry as he took his sword out of its sheath. He stated that the swordsman from the north was simply playing with his charges. Turning to the guy and simultaneously releasing his energy, the man stated that he easily recognized another martial artist. He believed that Mu Wan was not capable of anything else, so he was confident of his easy victory. The determined old man shouted that he would no longer delay the logical conclusion of their battle, and would finish off the enemy with one blow. After that, he closed the distance with the enemy and dealt a crushing blow using the technique of spreading destruction. Having released a huge force that was supposed to incinerate his enemy, Mentor Mu Guan exhaled heavily. But after a moment he realized that the battle was not over, as his opponent dodged and even moved behind him. Turning to face the swordsman, he quickly launched another killing blow called Moonlight Sky Slash. Mu Wan decided to make him understand that there was no point in this battle, so he easily stopped even such an attack. The mentor was furious at how helpless he was against the master he had previously threatened with death. Somewhere from a safe distance, people from the White Tiger Merchant Troop watched that battle. As we already know, Lady Yun was previously a disciple of the monastery, so she knew that the first generation of Kun Tong disciples were very dangerous enemies. She was shocked that when they all attacked the mysterious master, they could not even touch his clothes while the guy simply blew them away like a gust of wind. No less shocked by what was happening, the mentor replied that in the world of Marim there are people who hide their true powers. According to him, such people are known as revered beings. He knew that truly powerful warriors focus their beliefs on the pain of this world. They also strive to be like ordinary people without causing too much attention from the public. According to him, this was the reason why Miss Tay always paid closer attention to people who never stood out. Hearing his story, the daughter of the White Dragon founder assumed that this was the true identity of Huang's bodyguard's nephew. At that moment, the mentor wondered where bodyguard Huang himself was from. Watching the battle, the great mind assumed that the master, who joined their squad of his own free will, intended to destroy the Kuntun Monastery himself. Hearing his words, the archer standing behind him expressed a desire to join the battle. But the muscular man said that this was impossible. Among them, only Che Yakrin felt calm. The girls said that those fools reveled in the glory of their families rather than their own merits, so they would never match the person they were fighting. She was annoyed that they were not on their level, and only their leader could cope with the first generation of the monastery. The great mind thought that if that person is so strong that even the proud elder sister shows respect to him, then perhaps he can change the world. They were in trouble, so the guy thought they should hurry up and regroup with their leader. Meanwhile, the duel of the strongest continued. Mu Wan didn't even make much effort to fend off the enemy's blows. The man was furious that the battle looked like the enemy was just toying with him. The ascetic master was very angry that Mu Wan was simply blocking his attacks and not even taking the fight seriously. Releasing a huge amount of energy, the ascetic unleashed the single blade of heaven and shouted that the swordsman from the north must fight him with everything he had. Hearing these words, Mu Wan apologized, saying that he must have looked disrespectful to the ascetic's personality all this time. With a confident and piercing look, the master said that it had been a long time since he had a real fight. After these words, the guy's movements changed sharply and he asked to be allowed to show his full strength. The Blade of Eternal Darkness was released. Master Jin resorted to using the Spirit of the Fallen Star, and because of this technique, a huge amount of energy appeared above him, which looked like a hurricane. The incredible power made the man think that this was his end. He no longer even resisted in the face of such a terrifying force that he had never encountered before. Seeing the enemy's blade in front of him, he completely forgot about his weapon and fell to the ground. 
At the last moment, someone asked the Master Swordsman to stop, so Master Jin stopped the effect of his technique at the very neck of the enemy. It was the cook, together with the boy, they ran to the battlefield. The mentor immediately recognized Master Tafin. When they met, the cook told how everything really happened. All the ascetics felt guilty because they attacked the swordsman, who was not guilty of anything, and did not even intend to kill them. Recalling the past, the mentor mentioned that during that time, he was isolated and focused only on training, while the Taipeng energy meridians were destroyed and he was expelled from the clan. Taking a closer look at the pitiful students, he could not believe that this was not enough for them. The man said that Mo and the others were so vile and treacherous that they resorted to such terrifying methods. Addressing Taipeng, Master Mu Guang revealed that he thought that he had killed many of their brothers because he was suffering and was consumed by demonic energy. This is exactly the version of events he had when he thought about why the great master was kicked out of the monastery. Now everything made sense to him, and he was convinced that that story was not just strange, but artificially created. It was indeed difficult for the mentor to believe that a person who had earned the title of the highest peak of the Kuntun Monastery would resort to such things. He sincerely apologized to the former master for accepting that lie, calming down and even believing that his brother chose a terrible path to become stronger. Mu Guan stated that he felt remiss for allowing this to happen, and then stated that if Tai Ping had informed them of what was happening, he would have talked to the elders to find out the circumstances. In this case, the guy who possessed incredible strength could have avoided a similar fate. But the master unexpectedly replied that at that moment he decided to resign himself because he was tired of his life. The cook said that his previous position in the monasteries had exhausted him. As he became more and more respected, he began to realize how many people disliked and envied him. So his life in the monastery became miserable. As a result, he was left completely alone as soon as he reached the pinnacle of fame. However, during this time he met his wife, who never stopped supporting him and always remained by his side. It was then that he realized that there was no point in staying in the monastery anymore. The man decided to give up everything for the peaceful life with his wife and daughter, which he now enjoys. Despite this, the ascetics refused to leave him alone and the cook was in despair as he did not know what else he needed to do. Addressing his mentor, Saul Gunn continued to lie and shouted that he never wanted to harm that person or his family. There was even a grain of truth in some of his words, because he stated that all this was planned by elder brother Muha. The stupid ascetic was betrayed by one of his comrades, over whom he had great influence. When everything was revealed, Muha stormed out and called his mentor an ignorant bastard who was drunk on martial arts. That impudent guy said that the man knows nothing, what hatred he feels for all those whose achievements overshadow his glory. That's why he did everything he could to get rid of Ham Taipeng. In addition, he found room for lies and even stated that he did this so that mentor Mu Guan could become the next head. According to him, he was a devoted ascetic to the very end and defended the interests of the monastery in every possible way. The excuses continued to pour out of his mouth. When Muhe finished, the mentor did not know how to answer. After a few seconds, he began to laugh loudly and said that he could not even imagine how rotten the Kuntun Monastery had become. He said that his student is absolutely right, and he really doesn't know anything other than martial arts, which is why he became just a puppet for this whole farce. Pointing his finger at Muhe, the man shouted that he couldn't even imagine how much he wanted to cut off his head at that moment. But he couldn't do it, because it would be more of a blessing than a punishment. The man said that the culprit would suffer the same fate as Taipeng. With a piercing and cold gaze, the mentor declared that from that day on he would exterminate all the rotten ascetics in the Kuntun Monastery in order to prevent something like this from happening in the future. According to him, anyone who dares to object to his will will be torn to pieces, so he asked the ascetics to be prepared for the consequences. Returning to Ham Taipeng, Mu Guang admitted that after everything that happened to him, a simple apology would not be enough. The mentor stated that from now on, the Kuntun Monastery will do everything in their power to support his family, who have suffered from the actions of those ascetics all this time. Although the cook tried to calm the man down by saying that all this was in the past, the mentor believed that it was his fault, since he was ignorant and stupid. The former brothers from the great family continued their conversation, while Master Jin and his younger brother watched from the side. Taking a closer look at the guy he fought with, the man thought that his belief that he had reached one of the highest ranks was only a deception to himself. He dedicated his entire life to becoming a great martial artist. But when he fought with a guy who was about 20 years old, he realized that he was not a worthy opponent. At that moment, Master Mu Guan admitted that the heavens were indeed unfair. After he saw the seven lower heavens, he found it hard to believe that people like him still existed. He believed that Master Jin could even rise to the top of this world. When he approached the young master, he said that because of their ridiculous ascetics, 
a big man like Mu Wan had wasted the day. Yet he admitted that thanks to his actions he was enlightened about the corrupt nature of their monastery. For everything he had done, the man was ready to provide the master with someone who could help him. Mu Guan said that as soon as Master Jin arrives in Unam province, he should look for a scholar of the three thoughts named Ha Jin Wol, who is his longtime friend. According to him, Ha Jin Wol stands out a lot, so it shouldn't be difficult to find him, and he will definitely help him with the task. Master Jin thanked the monastery mentor for his help, and then asked why he was doing this for him. The man replied that he was in debt, and his intuition also told him that Master Jin and Ha Chin Wol must definitely meet. Bowing respectfully before the monastery master, Jin Mu Wan asked for forgiveness for the disrespect he showed him during the battle. When they said goodbye, the mentor thought that the name of that swordsman from the north seemed familiar to him. At one point, he remembered that he had already heard something similar. Looking closely at the back, he couldn't believe that this was exactly the guy he was thinking about. After some time, a ship arrived on which the squad was going to continue their journey. While Kwok was saying goodbye to the girl he liked, Mu Wan noticed that the other fighters were not behaving the same way as before. He realized that this was due to the fact that he was too impatient and showed the level of his capabilities, causing others to become wary of him. Sighing heavily, the guy thought that things had become less pleasant than before. When the guys finished swimming, they again mounted horses and carriages. Mu Wan couldn't rest properly because Kwok was literally trying to pierce him with his gaze. The boy said with admiration that he respected his tough older brother and that he had shown amazing skills in battle. He again wondered what he needed to do to become as strong. Mu Wan is not used to such obsession because he lived for a long time as a hermit. It was tiring, so he explained to the guy that the three-step technique that Mr. Huang taught him was not an ordinary cultivation technique. Although it was much worse than a normal technique, Master Jin believed that when a student reached a certain stage, his rate of progress would increase significantly, so it was worth mastering it thoroughly. He also had advice. He believed that Kwok should use a heavier blade. Master Huang's words were similar, looking at the disciple's physique. He said that he could become bigger and stronger with enough training, and also that a heavy and long blade would suit him better than the one used by the White Dragon's bodyguards. Kwok Munjung was determined as never before. He stated that in this case he would use the kind of blade that his older brother spoke about. Meanwhile, the detachment reached the province of Seichen, in which the Iron Dozen was going to unite with part of the detachment with which their leader was traveling. The team decided to stop here for the day and rest in one of the taverns nearby. In their free time, Mu Wan and Kwok walked around the city where the boy found a blade that seemed suitable for him. The merchant approved of his choice, but Mu Wan did not agree with them. After this, Kwok Munjung suggested another option, but it was also not what was discussed. When they walked a little further, Mu Wan became wary when he noticed a silhouette nearby that seemed suspicious to him. His younger brother noticed a strange interest in the alley and asked what he wanted to find there. As it turned out, there was some kind of trading shop where an old bored merchant was sitting. Seeing the incredible blade in the hands of the young master, the man assumed that he himself was engaged in its manufacture. The man with the red nose asked why Mu Wan chose the enchanted blade. Mu Wan was surprised at how he was able to identify the type of his blade so easily. The man replied that he could see this from the master because his hands had done a lot of work in the forge. Taking a closer look at his knife, Master Jin said that he did not make such a blade on purpose, and believes that most likely it is due to the material he used. The master mentioned that the material he used for the blade was a stone that some tribe worshipped as a sacred object. But since the tribe was destroyed, the stone was tainted by the sinful will and desire of those people. In response, the man cryptically said that there is something called a god weapon. Those blades are made from the will and desire of a master blacksmith, and depending on who that person is, the weapon can become divine or demonic. This is why master blacksmiths, who can create anything, must always be careful when crafting their weapons. He believed that if anyone else had had this blade, he would have been in big trouble. He asked the guy to be careful, because one mistake could make him go crazy and be consumed. After these words, the old blacksmith rose from his chair, stretched, yawned, and invited the guys inside. He believed that Mu Wan had the skills to become a master blacksmith, so he was probably not looking for a blade for himself. It was logical for him to assume that the blade was needed by the young man who stood behind the master. Mu Wan confirmed the old man's guesses, and said that he was looking for a long and heavy blade for the boy the weight of which should be about 3 kilograms and the length of about a meter. He reported that the cultivation method that his brother was learning allowed him to use a long blade that would help him master the sword of domination. Taking a closer look at his things, the man remembered that he had a blade that he had made when he was young and more energetic. The old man poured out his heart and soul to make it, but since it was very heavy, no one wanted to take it. Trying to pick up his weapon, the man admitted that he was no longer as strong as before. 
When Master Jin took the sword and raised it up, he said that judging by the faint red glow, hematite ore was used. The blade was perfectly balanced and really well forged. While Quack was yawning in admiration of the blade, the old man asked him to try a new weapon. The guy was born with a strong body and was confident that it could cope with a long and heavy blade. But once the sword was put into his hands, it turned out that he was overly confident in himself. Even with both hands he was unable to support the weight of this weapon and the blade quickly fell to the ground. Mu Wan tried to hold back his laughter because he passed this sword with just one hand, while the old man was indignant that children these days are too weak. Quack began to make excuses and, with an incredible trembling in his body and arching in his back, barely raised his new weapon, declaring that he had not dropped it, but simply lowered it to the ground. Mu Wan suggested that he take familiarization with new weapons as part of his training. After that, the young master reached into his inner pocket and asked the old man how much it would cost him. His younger brother didn't want Mu Wan to waste money on his weapons, so he tried to stop him. But to their surprise, the old man replied that he did not need money, and this sword was gratitude for the fact that they came to his dirty forge and had a little fun. Just as Mu Wan was about to offer something in return, the blacksmith stopped him and said that if he really wanted to repay him, then he could buy him a drink the next time he came. His attentive gaze noticed that Mu Wan had already faced many difficulties in life. With a smile on his face, the blacksmith said that with a master like Jin, he could spend the entire night drinking and talking about many things, especially blades, which he could talk about for ages. After this, the man began to tell something about his work, since he hardly had anyone to share with him about how he lived his long life. When he was tired of talking, Mu Wan chose the right moment to say goodbye and promised that he would come to him again. Lastly, the blacksmith asked Quack to take care of the red-toothed one. In response, the guy asked the blacksmith to stay healthy so that they could meet again. Turning to Master Jin, the young bodyguard thanked him for what he had done for him. As it turned out, the student was already thinking about how he would start training. Hearing the name of the blade, Master Jin noticed that it was very cute. When the guys were returning to the tavern where their squad was staying, they noticed that a whole crowd of onlookers had gathered in the middle of the city. The guys decided to go closer to find out what was happening there. As it turned out, several bandits attacked defenseless old people who were shopping. At one moment, a huge man appeared behind the master and his younger brother, who was indignant at what he saw. It also bothered him that everyone had gathered around just to watch, but none of them were going to help the poor souls. He knew that the clans of the Blue Hills and Mountain Peaks were protecting this place, but he could not understand where they were looking if such madness was happening during daylight. At one point, he intervened in this unpleasant situation and grabbed one of the offenders by the hand. With just one squeeze of his hand, he broke the robber's fist. After that, a huge and strong man sent another bandit flying, hitting him in the jaw. While the armed men tried to find out who he was, another attacker was sent flying by an unknown fighter. In addition to his strength, he also had incredible speed. When one of the fighters tried to pierce him with his sword, the man managed to miss the attack under his arm and grab the attacker. With one mad click, he sent the bandit flying. The problem was solved and Mu Wan suggested that they return to the tavern. Quack never ceased to be amazed at how the unknown doer could get rid of the attacker with just a click. When the guys returned to the rest of the squad, they saw how the entire Iron Dozen began to greet them with respect. But Mu Guan turned in their direction, greeting his leader. Quack was confused because he did not understand what he was talking about. Looking back, Mu Wan saw that they had not come alone. The leader of the Iron Dozen, the same man who dealt with the bandits in the square, also entered the tavern with them. First of all, Yang Musong asked whether his team's trip was safe. The great mind immediately made a report, and the large and muscular man noted with a laugh that they had done a good job. After that, he introduced himself to the young master and said that he had heard that Jin's personality was quite terrible. In response as befits, Mu Wan introduced himself to the leader of the Iron Dozen. The leader embarrassed his deputy the moment he repeated his words that dealing with the young master was not an easy task. Having met, Mr. Yang invited him to join their meeting. It seems that Mrs. Yun, who was responsible for the trip, did not fully understand why he was inviting the troubled young man. The man replied that this master was directly related to their mission, since his uncle had gone missing. He believed that in such a case, Master Jin had as much right as any of them to attend the meeting. The bodyguard mentor was excited and tried to convince the leader of the Iron Dozen, but the man stood his ground, saying that Master Jin was rumored to be damn strong and should be a good addition in order to successfully complete the dangerous mission. Looking at the excited meeting participants, he suggested forgetting about the small details reminding them that they were in a situation where anyone with power would make a difference. After these words, the crazy man began to show off his muscles and laugh loudly. The incredible pressure of strong people around told the guy that he did not belong here. By saying that he needed to train, Quack justified his departure from the meeting. When everyone took their seats, Mr. Young announced the beginning of the meeting. Addressing the members of the White Dragon Party, 
he said that since they were already familiar with the people who had accompanied them from Nanju, it was time to get acquainted with the part of the party that had arrived with him. He started with a crazy guy with blades hidden in his sleeves. His name was Shredder and no one was sure what his real name was, but it was clear that he was a real psychopath. The next fighter with a large scar on his neck was known as the main womanizer of their squad. It was a swordsman named Mansochin. Last but not least, a man with a long spear named Chi Sionel. He was very hot-tempered and nervous, so the leader urged the guys to be careful with him. As befits him, Mu Wan introduced himself to those who did not yet know him. Having looked closely at the young master, Master Yang was convinced that he did not feel any Qi energy from him. He wondered what Jin was going to do next, and whether he would hide his skills until the very end. Mentor Khan decided to continue the discussion, and asked to allow them to pay attention to the fact that in the city of Unam there are not many clans with a good reputation, with the exception of the Blue Swords clan. He believed that this was why the Furious Fists were able to easily seize power and settle in that city. Hearing the name of that guild, Master Jin remembered that he had already met their leader before his father died. According to the bodyguard, they managed to create a large clan and become one of the largest and most influential people in the city. Because of this, they are constantly at war with the Blue Sword sect. Under normal circumstances, the Central Heavenly Alliance should mediate these disputes. Turning to the map, the man clarified that for some reason, the authorities are not going to intervene in that conflict, and that is why the situation in Unam province is getting worse every day. For these reasons, not only the White Dragon Merchant Troop is affected, but also many other merchants. In the past, their organization sent a large amount of money to the Furious Fists to ask for their help, but this gesture did not help them come to an agreement, and all this makes many merchants doubt whether to visit the province of Unnam. As a result, the doubts of the Furious Fists destroyed the entire economy of their region. After hearing these details, Yong Museong concluded that someone was trying to stop the flow of money in Unnam province. His deputy suspected that both Blue Swords and Furious Fists were involved in this. Hearing this option, the muscular man wondered if there was a possibility that there was actually a third party involved. According to Che Yakrin, they cannot rule out this possibility, but they did not have any evidence. Picking his nose, the leader of the Iron Dozen admitted that their mission was troublesome, and the White Dragon had given them an extremely unpleasant job. Master Jin believed that this whole situation, as well as his uncle's disappearance, would only be resolved when they came to Unam and took action. The Great Intelligence was sure that sooner or later they would have to solve these problems themselves, but he had already sent a spy in advance to gather some information for them. By the time they get to the province, they will already know something around the problem. What is happening? At that moment, the leader realized that the disappearance of his tracker was due to the actions of his deputies, who did not inform him of their plan. The girl justified herself that Mu Huan did this himself, believing that the ranger was a weakling and would never be useful to them in battle. Wiping his snot on his ward's shoulder, Master Yang laughed and praised him for a job well done, after which he said that he would leave the rest to the vice leaders, since it was time for him to finish one recently started task. Rising from the table, he asked his comrades not to forget to inform him of the final decisions. He already had a basic idea of the whole situation, so he was going to figure something out from his side as well. Without even hearing the opinion of the White Dragon representatives, the leader of the Iron Dozen left the meeting. On the way, he suggested that Master Jin do the same and invited him to take a little walk. Along the way, the man said that his deputy Mu Huan is a real thinker, so he is in charge of all the internal affairs of their mercenary group. The leader truly trusted his mentee because he was sincere and honest. According to him, Mu Huan understands that his actions decide the fate of all his comrades. He has a deep sense of responsibility because of the heavy burden that he has to bear, and it is because of this that he lives this life, calculating all his actions in advance. But at the same time, the leader believed that understanding his ward becomes difficult at the moment when it is necessary to make comparisons or stop. Still, he treated his brain of the organization with understanding, since anyone can doubt when more and more responsibilities fall on him. He hoped that Master Jin would be able to understand a little better what kind of person he was after some time. Continuing to walk, Mu Wan asked why Master Yong was leading him to some kind of dead end. The man replied that the guy shouldn't worry about killing him. In response, the calm Master Jin addressed the leader by name and asked if he really thought he could do it. Hearing his confident words, the man began to release his fierce inner energy and said that he could find out after they exchanged blows. In response, Master Jin also began to demonstrate his strength, although he was probably holding back. Their fierce energy and cold glances began to heat up the situation. The clash of chi power seemed equal and the battle was a moment before it began. But at that very moment, Master Yang suddenly stopped releasing energy and laughingly said that they would have to leave it for another time, since now they had more important things to do. 
After these words, he walked up to some nondescript door and began knocking on it with a certain rhythm, saying that first they should collect some information about the situation in Unam province. The door opened and an old man appeared and said that they were closed. In response, the man introduced himself, but the old man began to act as if he did not understand what his visitor was hinting at. Next, the leader of the Iron Dozen winked at him and said a code word. Hearing this, the old man checked to see if there was any surveillance on them. The old man invited them to enter and Master Yong hurried his cautious comrade. When they got inside, they were asked to wait a little. When asked what this place was, the leader replied that it was one of the branches of the Black Moon. The person they were about to meet with might even be the leader of the entire organization. This place provides valuable information to martial artists who are of the same rank as them. This is why it is extremely difficult for normal people to get in touch with them. Mu Wan asked why young Mu Sung decided to bring him to this place. The man replied that he just wanted the young master to know about it, because he should always remember that such places exist throughout Murim. Addressing his new comrade, Mr. Young said that Murim is much larger and more mysterious than it seems at first glance. Hearing this, Mu Wan thought that he was trying to warn him that he should be careful with how he behaves. In response, the young master said that he would definitely remember Leader Yang's advice. After this, a representative of this branch came to them. He apologized for the weight on the part of the guests and said that it was an honor for him to meet the leader of the Iron Dozen. The origins of the Black Moon organization remain a mystery and nothing is known about who their master is. The purpose of their creation, as well as the number of employees, is still unknown. They really inspire fear. However, one thing is for sure. They can get absolutely any information before others. The leader of the Seishin branch of the Black Moon named May Walren came out to them. He recognized their regular customer but asked who he brought with him. The smiling man replied that he was my friend. Mu Wan introduced and heard in response that if he is related to leader Yan, then he is an incredible person. The leader of the Seishian branch of the Black Moon asked what information Mr. Yan needed. Handing over an impressive amount of money, the man said that he wanted to know more about the situation in Unnam province. Seeing the money, May Walren replied that Unam was one of those places that they paid special attention to, but they were not able to collect the required amount of information, but they managed to understand something important. According to them, the dispute between the Blue Swords and the Furious Fists is currently being organized by a third party. Leader Yang replied that he guessed that most likely the merchants who went missing in Unam province were being held hostage or killed by that third party. But May Walren did not agree with his assumption, since he believed that if they had been killed, their bodies would have already been discovered. It seemed that a third party would not be able to get rid of the large merchant group without leaving any traces that the Black Moon members could find. Still, they were unable to find out who exactly the third party was. So the leader said that if Mr. Yong had come later, then perhaps they would have found some clue for him. In response, the muscular man shared rumors that the Central Heavenly Alliance was doing nothing to resolve this situation. But as it turned out, according to May Walren, in fact, the Central Heavenly Alliance had recently sent a group of inspectors. This news made sense because Leader Yan was confident that there was no way the government would sit quietly and watch the province's economy collapse without their knowledge. Rising from the table, Mr. Yang was about to leave, saying that this time they had gotten into a whole series of troubles. Seeing the truly impressive amount the client came with, Leader Mi decided to share something else interesting. In order for it to be a fair exchange, he offered to give them one more part. The leader of the Black Moon branch said that a man named Nong Wanpen seeks to harm the Iron Fist group as well as its leader. As it turns out, that ill-wisher is walking around looking for hired killers. As soon as the negotiations ended, the Dark Elder called his ward, Grandpa, who let the clients inside. Taking off the mask, it turned out that it was a girl. She asked her ward to start spying on the client from the moment he set foot in Unnam province. At first, the old man accepted this order regarding Mr. Yong, but as it turned out, it was Master Jin who was interested in the girl. She requested that celestial rank hidden moon fighters be used for this mission. The man was surprised that we were talking about a man who came with the leader of the Iron Dozen. He seemed very unattractive to him, so he could not believe that they were planning to use the strongest among their fighters for this mission. Still, without waiting for an answer, he humbly obeyed his lady's order and declared that he would soon convey the order to the heavenly rank group. The girl was extremely interested. She probably did not feel the chi energy from the young swordsman, but she was sure that there was something in him. Nevertheless, the assumption that a third party was involved was confirmed. On the way back, Mr. Yong said that the young master may think that this information is of no value, but in fact, this confirmation will turn the potential threat into a real danger for his group. He also said that in addition to the task, he had another unpleasant matter that he needed to deal with. It was about some madman named Nung Wanpin. 
When asked who he was, Master Yong replied that he was a man of high status in Sachin province. That madman was the one who hired him shortly before this job. They were tasked with guarding his route between the provinces, and all he knew was that they had found some kind of treasure. Leader Yan was asked to keep this a secret, but apparently he was never able to trust and, out of greed, decided to get rid of the witnesses. The man could not believe that that scoundrel decided to sign their death warrant because he felt mistrust. His words sounded extremely tense, and a short pause began in their conversation. After this, the cheerful Yong began to laugh and asked the young master not to worry, because he would make sure that nothing happened to them during their journey to Unnam province. The leader of the Iron Dozen still had some work to do, so he invited the young master to return without him. Young Musung went in the other direction, and Master Jin wondered what the man was planning to do late at night. Meanwhile, Student Kwok continued to train, and by looking at him one could say that he was making some progress. Mu Wan watched his younger brother train his body and spirit, but at one moment he noticed that the Iron Dozen detachment had left the tavern. In full force, they took weapons with them and headed somewhere. Mu Wan understood that their actions were connected with the plans of their leader. And most likely, we were talking about the person who entered into a contract with them earlier. The next day, the guys set off again, and the young bodyguard considered it a mystery why the soldiers of the Iron Dozen were so tired. They slept in the middle of the day because they were tired the night before when they left on a mission. Leader Yong Musong slept on the roof of the cart driven by Master Jin. The guys who were driving nearby began to discuss the morning news. They heard that Mr. Noon died last night. Some noisy killers broke into his residence and ended up getting rid of not only him, but also all his guards and workers. Therefore, the Imperial Army was sent to Sachan to catch the people behind this incident. The night turned out to be eventful. Since the Iron Dozen was behind this case, Mu Wan asked their leader if they really needed to kill even the innocent people who worked for that gentleman. The man thought for a moment before answering. His answer turned out to be very logical. He believed that when you leave someone alive, their group will be reborn and will take revenge on you with even greater hatred. Yan said that he had to learn to dull his feelings towards the pain of others because even the smallest threat could harm his people. Hearing this, Mu Wan wondered if this was really the faith of the Iron Dozen with which they had earned their reputation. In response, the man said that Mu Wan should not follow their example. He admitted that at some point in his life, he had a stage where his passion for justice burned as brightly as the young swordsman's. Although he shed blood, it was Nong Wanpen who planned to kill them because of his distrust, so a fight could not be avoided. According to the leader of the Iron Dozen, his position forces him to prioritize the lives of his subordinates. So if he had not thrown the first blow, it would have been dealt to them. He believed that this was the sadness of the shitty world of Murim. Hearing this, Mu Wan felt some anger and seriously called them cowards. Despite the personal insult, Leader Yan took his words for granted. A few days later, they arrived in Unnam province. As soon as they entered that zone, Leader Yang mounted a horse and asked his charges not to let their guard down. Immediately after these words, he felt something strange. Mu Wan also couldn't miss this energy that was nearby. Master Jin looked into the forest next to the road. Someone was approaching them as if they were running from danger. He felt some tension and began to prepare for the meeting of strangers. A few seconds later, two wounded martial artists appeared, a young girl and an old man, whom she was dragging on her shoulder. To understand who they are and how they ended up in this difficult situation, it is worth going back to recent events. Next, we will talk about one of the most famous cities in the entire country the place where the Tang clan lives and where they practice their poisonous arts and murder. Their leader, the 10,000 poison emperor named Tang Gongwu, asked his nephew if they had completed their preparations. Tan Kimun, the one who comes closest to being the living embodiment of poison after the emperor, he replied that there was no need to worry, because everything related to poison was a petty matter for them. This time they fulfilled the request from the Central Heavenly Alliance, and it did not make the old man very happy. Speaking to a family member, he warned him that if they felt that the situation was heading down a dangerous path, they should do everything to leave and save their lives. Addressing his granddaughter, the man asked her to take care of her uncle, who does not know martial arts. Tang Meyer assured the emperor that she would cope with the task. After these words, the head of the family sent his nephew and granddaughter on a mission from the Heavenly Alliance. A whole team of fighters also went with them. The old man prayed for the safe journey of his family members. Representatives of a large family from the city of Saishion arrived in the outskirts of Unum province. Mire watched with a smile as her uncle, as usual, studied various types of poisons even while traveling. The girl was already tired from the journey, but thought that she should be on the alert. A moment later, a surprise attack was carried out on their squad. Some of the fighters who were behind came under attack. It was an ambush and they had to flee, since they were not able to take the fight. Another enemy attack frightened the horse on which the uncle of the girl who knew martial arts was sitting. 
The man could not resist and fell to the ground. He was filled with anger and shouted that they would regret daring to attack the Tang family of Seixian. But at the same moment, one of the killers rushed at him. The old man was lucky because Muha was nearby and managed to protect him from the attacker. The man understood that they would not last long like this. He turned to his niece and asked her to focus on getting out of the encirclement. The remnants of their team grouped together in order to allow the nephew and granddaughter of the family leader to escape from the encirclement. Turning to her uncle, the girl reached inside her bag. The man immediately understood her plan and put on the mask. He also opened his vessel, which contained poison. Tan Ki-moon directed his poison forward and filled the girl's daggers with it. After this, the girl asked her team to get out of the way and directed the attack towards the enemies that were pursuing their squad. Tang Meyer threw her daggers towards her enemies, spreading poison. The explosion of a powerful attack covered everyone behind them. Despite this, the heavily poisoned killers continued to pursue. The Tang family fighters could not believe that they were willing to continue even after being directly hit by poison. But for the girl, everything was obvious. These warriors are used as murder weapons, so they don't care about their own lives. The enemies began to break through the poisonous curtain and immediately headed towards the weakest fighter, who had knowledge only of poisons. Even though the man had not studied martial arts, he was ready to take the fight. The moment the enemy approached, he changed his stance. The man knew that if his enemies were within reach of his poison, it would be much more terrible than any martial art. As soon as the enemy was within attack range, the man directed a concentrate of his poison at him. The enemy fighter fell to the ground within a moment. The master of 10,000 poisons could fend for himself. But at one point Mira saw something was wrong. A huge man with a trident in his hands appeared behind her uncle and the girl shouted to her uncle that he needed to run. Since the man had never studied martial arts, his speed was not enough to react to the threat in time. He received a heavy blow from enemy weapons. Within a moment, Mire rushed forward to avenge her uncle's injury. The man was in extremely serious condition and barely remained conscious. But as soon as the emperor's granddaughter approached the enemy, she saw that he had swung an advance in her direction. She miscalculated and came under enemy attack. At the moment when the enemy was ready to finish them off, the rest of the survivors from their squad came to the rescue. The Tang family warriors distracted the terrifying enemy. Meanwhile, the girl with a wounded arm reached her uncle. The man was lying on the ground and could not get up on his own. The situation was worse than ever. Trying to escape, Mira raised her uncle. Looking around, she silently said goodbye to her faithful charges. The loyal warriors understood what was going on. In response, they shouted that the young lady needed to hurry up, since they would not be able to hold off a monster like this opponent for long. After some time, they managed to leave the battlefield. Seeing the first oncoming detachment, they asked them for help. Their appearance was unexpected, and the great mind of the Iron Dozen did not know how to act in such a situation. Mu Wan only watched what his colleagues would do in search of the missing merchants. Mu Guan took responsibility and asked the strangers to stop and introduce themselves. The injured girl replied that they were from the Tang family, and then said her name and the name of her uncle. She also said that they were ambushed and wounded. She begged for help, and promised that their family would definitely repay the debt. Hearing the mention of the Tang family, Leader Yang was surprised that they were also involved in the situation surrounding Unam province. But he was more worried about what kind of ambush could bring the detachment of the Great Tang family to such a state. Based on such events, the man was sure that their enemies were not ordinary bandits, and since they were most likely pursuing these members of the great family all this time, they must be somewhere nearby. He understood that their meeting was unlikely to be pleasant. Addressing his deputy, the man asked Yakrin to take one of the guys with him to check the area from which the injured Tang family members came. He asked to thoroughly search the area. Mu Guan began to analyze the situation. He understood that this great family not only repays its debts, but also does it a hundredfold because there is no one better than them in this regard. But he did not know what to do, because if they became their allies, they could find themselves in a dangerous situation. Alternatively, he was thinking that they should simply focus on their original task of finding the third young master of the merchant troop and simply ignore the Tang family. At one point, he began to doubt that they were truly from the Tang family and thought that this might be a trap. While he was thinking about options for getting out of a difficult situation, one of the members of their squad began to act disagreeing with the plan with the rest. It was Mu Wan. He picked up the wounded Tan Ki Moon and asked his niece to follow him. Mu Guan was infuriated by the rash actions of the swordsman from the north, so he shouted that he should not act on his own, since it was not for him to make the decisions of the entire squad. In response, Mu Wan said that they were already surrounded, so they should prepare for battle. He was surprised by the young master's words. At that moment, the leader approached him to calm the ardor of his deputy. Leader Yan said that Master Jin was right. They were indeed surrounded. In addition, there were quite a lot of enemies. They even took up positions in the trees. Taking a closer look at his ward, the man thought that he had taken too long to make a decision. Because of this, 
he began to doubt whether the great intelligence was truly the one who should be in charge of this mission. Moreover, he also made a mistake and was too focused on the situation, so much so that he didn't even notice how they were surrounded. The man thought that even if he had known in advance, helping the family would not have made any difference because a collision would have been inevitable. Most likely, Master Jin sensed the presence of enemies in advance. The swordsman brought the wounded poison master and asked his younger brother to make room for him. Master Jin decided to entrust the guard of the cart to a young bodyguard, believing that this would be the safest task for him. Addressing the guy, he said that there is no better training than fighting in a real battle. The girl wanted to thank the guy for saving them, but a moment later enemy shelling began. Mu Wan went to the vanguard. The mercenaries prepared for defense. The strongest of the enemies appeared first and, addressing the travelers, said that they had taken his booty and would pay for it. He said that as long as he asks politely, it would be better for strangers to simply hand over the people they agreed to help. Mu Wan, who was already ready for battle, volunteered to answer. He said that if they were planning to give away the injured Tang family members, then there would be no reason for them to help them. Pointing his long spear at the swordsman, the enemy fighter said that the master would soon pay for his wit. Yet he admitted that even if strangers handed over members of the Tang family to them, they still would not be able to avoid death. After this, the captain of the Bloody Ghost Squad gave the team the order to attack. At the sight of the enemies, Quok began to worry, but next to him was Mirai, who, although she was wounded, was good at martial arts in order to support the young bodyguard. The White Dragon merchant troops suffered from the enemy's welcoming attack, but they were already grouped in order to defend themselves. The Iron Dozen also prepared for battle. All mercenaries used different martial arts, so they worked together to level out the disadvantages of their techniques. The Shredder took over the battle at close range. A strange guy with a sword, who was already fighting with the enemies, came to his aid. The archer controlled those who attacked them from a distance. In the vanguard was the same strange guy with whom the leader asked not to get involved. Using his huge blade, he could deliver devastating blows over a large area. The mentor was not afraid to fight. The experienced bodyguard not only repelled attacks, but also managed to interrogate his enemies, as he suspected that they were involved in the disappearance of the third son of the merchant troop. During the battle, Sian, despite being a graduate of Kuntun Monastery, continued to tremble. At one point the girl began to panic because there were too many enemies. Having gotten rid of another enemy, she felt a presence behind her. The huge man with the sword was already aiming at her, and she was afraid that this was the end. But at that same moment, a girl whose strength is considered frantic intervened in their battle. She shouted that if Miss Yun was planning to die, then she should not do it in front of her. Turning to her, she shouted that every time they go out into the real world, it becomes their battlefield. So this is not a place for thinking and doubt. Within a moment, the vice captain of the Bloody Ghosts burst onto the battlefield, destroying several of the White Dragon's bodyguards at a time. He shouted with a terrifying cry that there was no one who could compare with him. Oddly enough, he hurried to conclusions, and a moment later the leader of the Iron Dozen appeared above him. Master Yong's powerful attack destroyed everything that fell under his blade. Landing on the surface, the leader turned to the vice captain of the enemy squad and urged him not to move. He was surprised that he couldn't kill him with one attack. An enemy warrior from a squad of bloody ghosts was able to block his crushing blow. This was the first time Yang Musan had heard of such a unit, so he assumed that they were not from the mainland. Within a moment, the enemy's mace was aimed at the leader's head. The man managed to dodge and even carry out a quick attack. After the lunge, he realized that the battle would not be as easy as he expected because the cut was shallow since the enemy's armor was thicker than he expected. Trying to strike back, the big man declared that his opponent was even more agile than he looked. Yong Musong understood that in this case he should aim for the enemy's neck, but first he was going to disarm this vice captain. With a quick jerk, he managed to damage the bones of his opponent's right arm. As the huge fighter tried to figure out what was happening, leader Yan was behind him. After that, he shouted furiously and used the scaled dragon blade technique. The powerful attack caused a massive explosion. After this, the enemy was stuck into a rocky surface, which was destroyed by the force of the blow from the leader of the Iron Dozen. Looking at the lying enemy, the man thought that he should have left one of them alive to interrogate him later. But he never managed to do this, because they all attacked without caring for their lives. In this case, he wanted to attack the leader. But at the same moment he felt that the vice captain of the blood ghosts was still alive and had even risen to his feet. Meanwhile Mu Wan encountered the enemy leader. Throwing an incredible number of quick strikes the man was surprised that Mu Wan knew about their ambush even before they arrived at this place. Calmly defending himself, Master Jin suggested that their detachment was behind the disappearance of the merchants and all the troubles that were happening in the province of Unam. As he struck again, the enemy leader said that he was just a tool used to kill and capture people while there was someone else who was running all this madness. Dodging a strong blow, Mu Wan did an epic backflip, 
Having landed on the surface, Master Jin decided to stop playing. Inflicting a long-range strike with eternal darkness, the guy asked the enemy to name who was behind the situation in the province. The experienced fighter barely had time to dodge this unexpected attack. He was concerned about his opponent's skills. He thought not only that he couldn't sense the young master's key, but also that he was experienced enough to detect their ambush before the clash. The leader of the Blood Ghosts was surprised at the young swordsman's abilities that he could stand up to such an experienced master like him. Respecting his opponent, he introduced himself. Nam Ganwi stated that he would have to deal with him before he could find out the answers. After these words, the usual exchange of blows turned into a serious battle. Within a moment, Nam Ganwi disappeared from the master's field of vision. He appeared from above and Master Jin managed to feel it and block the blow. While in the air, the enemy decided to kick, but Mu Wan blocked it too. Swinging before the next blow, the man expressed dissatisfaction with the fact that he promised to tell everything if he lost. But despite this, his opponent continued to hold back. Delivering another furious blow, he shouted that he wanted the swordsman from the north to show what was so sinister he was hiding. Mu Wan was in no hurry. He was focused on the battle and managed to dodge every attack. A moment after the enemy strike, the guy again made a cut with eternal darkness. Nam Gonvi dodged and said displeasedly that he had seen this movement before. As he struck back, he noticed that his opponent had managed to escape. Mu Wan moved and his opponent realized that this was his way of trying to close the distance. Dodging another blow, he thought that the Blade Master was in this way trying to exploit the shortcomings of the spear techniques. But as it turned out, the experienced fighter miscalculated and within a moment Mu Wan was behind him. The young swordsman's speed was incredible, and the Nam leader barely managed to dodge. While moving to a safe distance, the leader of the enemy group was wounded in the right arm. Just a moment later, Mu Wan sent another blow of eternal darkness at him. The man was forced to change strategy, and went into the forest where they had previously attacked the Tang family. Moving deeper into the forest, the man analyzed the situation and came to the conclusion that his opponent was definitely different from the mainland martial artists he had faced before. Mu Wan kept up with his speed, and the man couldn't believe that someone like this guy really existed. Taking a closer look at his opponent, the leader of Nam Gongwi stopped. Releasing a huge amount of energy, he furiously shouted that he would fight with everything he had, after which he used the primordial dragon spear technique. A powerful blow aimed at the young master caused a powerful explosion that destroyed a section of the forest. Having completed this blow, the man considered that the matter was over. He said out loud that he couldn't believe that he had come this far, and was forced to use the flaming fire dragon spear. He thought he had torn the young master to pieces, but within a moment he was staring at the sky with a shocked look. High in the sky was his opponent. Mu Wan was extremely angry. His clothes were damaged due to the enemy attack that that blood ghost leader was so proud of. With an angry and serious look, Master Jin turned to the enemy and said that these clothes were a precious gift from his dear Master Huang. After that, the guy pointed his blade towards the enemy. The powerful attack from the eternal darkness caused an incredible explosion. Noticing this from afar, the leader of the Iron Dozen was simply shocked by the strength of the guy who had been hiding his potential all this time. The vice captain of the Bloody Ghosts was worried, as he understood that their leader had a hard time. Due to Master Jin's furious blow, the trees around him were destroyed and his enemy was injured. Throwing off the destroyed armor, the disgruntled man who had leaned against his spear asked who the swordsman he was fighting was. Turning to the young swordsman, he stated that their duel was still not over. Watching this entire battle from the carriage, Mrs. Tang could not believe her eyes. She was shocked by the strength of the swordsman who was part of the squad that agreed to help them. Addressing her wounded uncle, she said that they were being helped by an incredible person. But Poison Master Tan Ki-moon did not answer her. He could hardly remain conscious due to the severity of the wound. Bodyguard Quack continued to shake next to the carriage. He felt a rapid heartbeat from the excitement of the first battle. He prayed to the sky that no one would come to them, but it seems that several assassins noticed the carriage containing their target. Within a moment, the guy with the big sword noticed the enemy's gaze. One of the soldiers of the Bloody Ghost Squad finished off another bodyguard and found his next target. Quan was frightened, he was filled with fear, and mentally begged the enemy not to approach. But it was obvious that it was too late. The guy tried to move because he understood that he would not be able to withstand the enemy attack. But his body did not obey him and he simply froze in place in fear. Remembering his training with his older brother, he thought about how much work he had done before facing his first enemy. The enemy had already begun to approach and Quak felt his terrifying thirst for blood. The young bodyguard began a dialogue with himself. Out of fear of the enemy, he called himself pathetic and doubted that he could protect anyone this way. Remembering the people dear to him, he struck a powerful and furious blow with his heavy blade. Despite his best efforts, he missed, and even his opponent was surprised by what happened. As soon as the enemy fighter realized who he was dealing with, he decided to rush into the attack without any fear. But at the same moment, his head was thrown back from an unexpected attack. 
The man fell to the ground and Quack could not understand what happened. As it turned out, his enemy fell from the dagger. Looking around, the frightened guy saw Mrs. Tan. She said that he shouldn't worry too much, because suddenly she would cover for him. Meanwhile, the fierce battle between the two monsters continued. Mu Wan repelled all the attacks of the huge enemy spear, while the leader, Nam Gongwi, realized that even the terrifying person whose instrument he became could not have guessed the existence of such a master as the one he had to meet. Trying with all his might to defeat the swordsman from the north, he realized that if he left him alive, he would become a huge threat to them. The furious man began to twirl his huge flaming spear above himself before delivering his next blow. Picking up speed, he shouted that this was the end, after which he used the mad dragon flying technique. But this did not bother Master Jin at all. The guy even used his sword. He stopped the enemy attack with his bare hand. His enemy was simply shocked that his terrifying attack was stopped without using a weapon. Holding the enemy's spear, Mu Wan decided to do something that his enemy clearly did not expect. He suddenly hit it hard with his sword, and the spear broke into two pieces. After that, he asked the enemy, who was no match for him, how long they would continue this senseless fight. Addressing the enemy, Master Jin said that it was time to tell everything he knew. Trying not to show his fear of the enemy's terrifying strength, the man hesitantly replied that he could still fight. But just as Mu Wan began to slowly approach, the inattentive leader of the Blood Ghost tripped and fell to the ground. As soon as he said that this was not the end, the furious Mu Wan stabbed him in the shoulder with his own spear. Master Jin was completely serious when he said that his next target would be the neck. Continuing to press with his broken spear, he asked the enemy to hurry up with answers. In response, the leader shouted that the young swordsman was right, and they were indeed the ones who made the White Dragon Merchant troop disappear. Meanwhile, Yang Musyong decided to speed up and rushed into the attack with a more serious technique. He used the Fire Dragon Fang technique and a huge terrifying aura targeted the vice captain of the Blood Ghost squad. With a powerful and quick attack, the leader once again knocked down the enemy. Addressing the clumsy but resilient opponent, the leader of the Iron Dozen admitted that he tried to be gentler until the very end. But looking at the enemy, the man noticed something that shocked him. The enemy was defeated, but at the same moment, poison began to come out of his body. Leader Yang Musong understood that this was a threat to the entire team. He shouted to the members of their expedition that they should stay away, because the defeated enemy had turned into a poisonous bomb. Meanwhile, Mu Wan's interrogation continued. Having heard the obvious answer to his question, he asked to tell about the customer. But immediately after that, he felt the approach of an enemy arrow. Master Jin immediately jumped back, leaving the enemy in place. Taking a closer look, he noticed a bag of poison. Mu Wan realized that his opponent was well prepared. The fog of poison limited his field of vision. The leader of the enemy group used this to escape. Even though the enemy had thought through everything down to the last detail, Mu Wan couldn't just let him go. The young master jumped up to look around. There was a dense forest ahead of him, so it was not easy to see the enemy. Using his sense, he was able to track the movement of the enemy key. The enemy was already far away, but Mu Wan was not going to stop until he got answers. He realized that he still had time to catch up with the enemy and therefore rushed forward. As soon as he entered deep into the forest, he felt the presence of other masters. Within a moment, an enemy attack was aimed at him. Mu Wan acted quickly and changed his trajectory, pushing off from the tree. Landing on the surface, the guy saw arrows flying at him. To avoid enemy attacks, he began to move unpredictably and continued to move through the trees. He was fast enough to evade all enemy arrows. At one point, he stopped to assess the situation. He managed to calculate the location of the enemy archers. They were on one of the trees and did not even expect that their enemy would be behind them in an instant. But instead of a crushing blow, Mu Wan landed next to them and asked them to answer his questions in order to avoid bloodshed. Despite the fact that he had no bloodlust, the mad archers decided to capture him. At first, Mu Wan didn't understand what they were doing, but within a moment their bodies began to swell from the huge amount of poison they had swallowed, shouting that this was the beginning of the end. Master Jin managed to return to the surface moments before those madmen exploded. He could not believe that those fighters did not regret their lives. Having encountered such enemies, the guy began to worry about whether Mr. Wang had been hurt. Then he decided to return to pursuing the leader of the bloody ghosts, but realized that he no longer felt his presence. Based on the situation, he decided to return without learning more details. Returning to the others, the inattentive guy wondered where his scabbard had gone. The battle ended, and representatives of the merchant troop and the mercenary group of the Iron Dozen began to deal with the wounded. Mu Huan began to apologize for the fact that he had been thinking about a way out of the situation for a long time. But putting his hand on his shoulder, the leader reassured his deputy and said that everything was okay, because in fact, he himself had made a big mistake. The experienced fighter told his ward that they will always have problems, so the only important thing is how they solve them. After that, he suggested forgetting what happened and starting to deal with the consequences of what happened. Before they began, they silently looked at the ruins that remained after their battle. 
Leader Jan remembered that his team might have been hurt, so he asked if everything was okay. As it turned out, none of the Iron Dozen were injured. The cart in which the wounded man was located was partially destroyed, but Quack, although very tired, was able to survive, like the Emperor's daughter. Hearing the appeal, the man looked around and was surprised that it was the group of the Iron Dozen that saved them. He replied that he was pleased to meet them, after which he introduced himself as the owner of 10,000 poisonous poisons named Tang Gimun. He apologized for the trouble they had caused the travelers. Tang Gimun mentioned that he would make sure to pay back the White Dragon Merchant Troop and the Iron Dozen ten times what he owed. Hearing this, the guys were embarrassed as if they didn't know what awaited them. The second person in the Tang family said that the niece told him everything the two of them did to save them. With a smile on his face, he declared that he would never forget the courageous actions of his new comrades. The great intelligence began to apologize for the fact that, due to his incompetence, they could not immediately help. The man replied that there is nothing to regret, because this is the true essence of this world. In turn, the leader of the Iron Dozen asked the Elder for forgiveness, saying that if they knew that they were from the Great Tang family, they would not hesitate to put their lives on the line to help them. According to him, the Iron Dozen were not sure whether they should intervene in this situation. Hearing this, the old man said that their squad was like those who value a person's life based on his status. In response, Yong Musong with a sly and malicious smile said that this is the true essence of this world. The man was surprised that the leader took his words that way. Then he began to laugh loudly and said that Master Yong is absolutely right because this is really how this world works. He admitted that he learned a valuable lesson thanks to his words and thanked him for his frankness. The cunning old man said that in this case, the Iron Dozen should not expect anything in return because they must always adhere to the true essence of this world. Young Musong began to realize his mistake and replied with an awkward laugh that just the fact that the Tang family did not hold a grudge against them was enough as a reward. So, the man was wounded. He asked to postpone this conversation until later, at the same time thinking that the leader of the Iron Dozen, Young Musan, was far from being the person to mess with. Turning to the White Dragon's bodyguard, she thanked him for his help and suggested they go and rest elsewhere so as not to be affected by his poisons, with which he planned to cleanse the ones that still remained around them. Addressing his niece, he asked her not to worry about his health, since thanks to her treatment, he managed to avoid death. After thanking Mire for her hard work, he decided to repay another favor and asked the girl not to let anyone near him while he was working. Next, Old Man Tang released the poison from his vats and began to cleanse the area. He used the exchange of white toad venom for the poison that gives life. The Great Intelligence was surprised that the old man was treating his wounds using poison. Leader Yan turned to his ward and said that the owner of 10,000 poisons had reached the level of poison not only for killing, but also for healing. Previously, he only knew the title of the second man of the Tang family, but now he saw his strength in person. The lack of information regarding the Tang family members was due to the fact that those people are quite special and prefer to live only with their clanmates. Absorbing the poison, the man began to neutralize its effect. At the same time, he managed to improve his health. At the same moment, Mu Wan returned to them. He was glad that he had found his scabbard, while Mirai noticed him and turned to her savior. The old man also noticed him and introduced himself, thanking him for his help. Tang Gimen said that he planned to go and meet his savior, but they met a little earlier. He had just finished treating his wounds with poisonous ki, so he was temporarily unable to move. In response, Mu Wan said that anyone would do the same if they were in his place. After that, he asked how the poison master was feeling. The man replied that he had already managed to recover, after which he promised that he would repay the debt to the master. Watching their conversation, Yang and his deputy realized that they had missed their prey. Not only he, but also the rest of the team understood where this would all lead. Deputy Che Yakran was sure that from now on, everyone in Marim would only talk about him. After some time, their detachment reached the province of Unnam. Master Meyer and the young bodyguard were riding in the same carriage, and the girl took the opportunity to thank him for his courage. Kwok replied that all she did was block one attack. He was sure that if it were not for the help of his older sister, he would have left this world long ago. Old man Giman looked at his savior and realized that the guy was not in the mood at all. He was sewing up his clothes with an extremely dissatisfied face. The master of 10,000 poisons decided to start a conversation and said that they had arrived in Unnam province and should already be close to the trading district. He asked why the young master didn't buy new clothes there. The old man was even ready to buy it at his own expense. 
The young master thanked the second man of the Tang family for his concern, and then politely declined. He said that he actually takes great care of his clothes, since they were given by someone important to him. And naturally, he was talking about Mr. Huang. The old man was surprised by his sincerity, and the fact that Mu Wan is a person who knows when to be grateful and when to be modest. Continuing to demonstrate his manners, Master Jin once again inquired about the well-being of the Master of Ten Thousand Poisons. As it turned out, the man had already fully recovered and believed that this was the merit of his savior. Continuing to work, Mu Wan said that the elder recovered on his own and that he had little to do with it. Watching the young master, the man was surprised at how difficult it was to find such people in their world, not to mention the fact that he mastered his martial arts terribly well. The old man assumed that the young man had studied with a famous master or in a famous family. He admitted that he noticed Master Jin's small wound on his left shoulder and then reached into his pocket. Mu Wan asked not to worry, believing that it was a scratch that would stop bothering him after a good sleep. But despite this, the man handed him healing pills and said that a young man should not behave like that, because if he takes care of himself in his youth, it will be much easier for him in his old age. After several decades of research, the old man managed to create these medicinal pills that have an instant effect. They are also known as sacred scarlet pills. According to the old man, they can provide an instant antidote effect and can also improve health for 10 years. Mu Wan was disturbed by such generosity and said that these were quite valuable things and too expensive a gift for someone like him. In response, the old man agreed with the value, adding that they were valuable because they were made by his hands, the owner of 10,000 poisons. However, he believed that this was a small reward for saving his life. Mu Wan accepted the gift, and Tan Gim Wen advised him to use it when he was in a life-threatening situation. This was all he could do to thank the young master now. Young Mirai seemed to like Master Jin. With a blush on her face, she asked if Master Jin would continue to travel with the White Dragon Merchant Troop. In response, the guy with a look that was unusual for him replied that he had already reached the right place, and therefore it would be better for him if he stopped traveling with those people. Hearing this, his younger brother began to become extremely nervous. In response, the girl asked why he made such a decision. Continuing to sew up his clothes, the young master said that there was nothing special about it. It just became obvious to him that he was causing inconvenience to the people of the Iron Dozen, which meant that he had become more of a burden to them than a support. After such words, the girl had hope and she asked if he would mind joining them. They were just planning to stay with the Furious Fists group. They needed to team up with the martial artists from the Central Heavenly Alliance. Hearing the mention of Furious Fists, Mu Wan began to feel furious. The nine unattainable ones that currently rule the world of Murim are referred to as the Nine Central Heavens. These are martial artists whose strength is equivalent to the personalities of the four pillars who once proudly supported the Northern Heavenly Clan. Of the four, there was one person who had a very close connection with the Master's father and was the one he called his uncle in the past. He was the first person who betrayed his father on that fateful day, Zhou Qian Wu. With his betrayal, he gained support, Central Heavenly Alliance, and settled in Unum Province to create a squad of Furious Fists. Master Meyer was confident that if Master Jin asked the Furious Fists for help, then they would find his uncle after all. It shouldn't be too difficult a job for fighters like them. Putting on his sewn clothes, the guy thanked the Emperor's granddaughter for the offer, but refused. The girl was surprised that he did not want to take advantage of such a good offer. Mu Wan explained that he needs to do something first, and once he finishes, he will definitely find the Tang family members. Concerned Mirai responded to his words with understanding. She handed him the amulet, saying that with this item, he would be allowed into the clan of Furious Fists. In the Tang family, only a small number of people have this jade tablet. With this, even the Central Heaven Alliance would not be able to question his authority, so he would have free access. The young master was very grateful to her for her care and rewarded her with his kind smile. Looking at the girl, the old man said in a whisper that he saw her gaze in love. In fact, he thought they were just the perfect couple. Noticing her uncle's behavior, the girl began to feel shy and blush. While Master Mirai shyly tried to avoid being seen by her uncle, Mr. Tang asked the young master to be careful, because even their family was worried that the Central Heavenly Alliance had attracted them to such a risky business. He assumed that the situation in the province was really difficult, so he should behave carefully. A few minutes later, they arrived at the entrance to Unam. Mu Wan understood that in this place he could meet the squad of furious fists that he hated so much. At that moment, it was time to say goodbye. The young master set off separately from the others. Master Meyer, with the hope of a new meeting, said that they would wait for his arrival. As befits a well-mannered person, Master Jin wished them good luck on the road. After that, the Iron Dozen detachment left along with the representatives of the Tang family. Worried about the fate of the young, attractive master, the girl looked around in his direction. 
Mu Wan was unshakable because he had interest in this place. When he approached the bodyguard mentor, he thanked him for everything he had done for him. He said that since they had already arrived in Unam province, it would be better if he acted on his own. In addition, he apologized to the merchants for all the trouble he caused them during the journey. Looking around, Leader Yang noticed this conversation and heard the guy's words. In fact, he was surprised that Master Jin decided to work on his own. It was truly a great loss for him. He believed that although the young master's character was far from being the most suitable for their squad, he valued his enormous strength, for which he would like to invite him to his mercenary squad. Still, Yang Musong had no doubt that he would not be able to tame such a beast. Despite this, he had a feeling that they would meet again someday in this world where even your closest friends can betray you. Leader Yang Musong hoped that they would never see each other on the battlefield as enemies. He sensed the enormous power that was hidden within the young master. At the same time, the mentor also understood that traveling with the young master would ensure their safety. But on the other hand, he noticed that his bodyguards were afraid of that swordsman from the north. He believed that even the detachment of the Iron Dozen, which, according to the agreement, is engaged in their protection, feels that their pride is hurt. They were all on edge and were closely monitoring Master Jin. Mu Wan was unlikely to be convenient for anyone because he is not one of those who will adhere to the rules, since he does not act relying on profit. In response to the young master's words, he treated him with understanding and said that he was glad to cooperate, after which he stated that he would do everything possible to find Huang. He also asked if the guy could find out anything about the disappearance of the third gentleman. But unexpectedly for both masters, Kwok approached them to say goodbye to their mentor. Captain Khan was surprised that Munjin was going to follow a man whose path would be quite difficult. Kwok proudly replied that his elder brother was the person who gave life to his dream, and that is why he wanted to see his limit. Hearing this, Mu Wan was sincerely surprised by the mature words of the young bodyguard. Turning to his older brother with an uncertain smile, he admitted that he hardly seemed like a reliable person. Despite this, he was familiar with the local streets and a good map maker, so he was confident that he would not become a liability. Besides, he was confident that he could protect himself. The man believed that this situation was very logical, since Kwok spent all his time with a person from whom he really should take an example. He respected the young bodyguard's decision and said that the troop of merchants would always keep a spare room in order to take him back. Hearing the conversation, Master Soin was surprised that two people were leaving their squad at the same time. Still, she understood that they could never gain the power of a master from the north. The girl remembered well the identity of the man who saved them during the battle with a squad of bloody ghosts. Meanwhile, the Broken Fist Clan was already receiving their guests. Old man Tang Gimun informed their leader that he was ambushed on the way. The clan leader replied that he had already sent fighters from the investigation department in order to find out the identities of the criminals. He spoke of justice and how their enemies would not be able to escape their sight while they were in Unnam province. While in the same room with Zhou Qian Wu, Tang Gimen felt a shiver throughout his entire body every time he heard the words of a member of the Great Four of the Northern Heavens. He couldn't believe that those masters were always so terrifyingly strong. In addition, he felt some disappointment from the leader of the Furious Fists and understood that this was due to the fact that he was never able to become the leader of the sect. Hearing claims of justice, the old man shared speculation that their enemies were not ordinary bandits from the mainland. He admitted that they managed to get help, without which they would not have been able to get to this place. In response, Zhou Qian Wu stated that the savior of the Tang family is also the savior of the Furious Fists. He asked to know the name of the one who helped them, because he wanted to adequately reward him for his courage. The concerned old man replied that he could not find out the name of the person who helped them. Still, he admitted that he was a wonderful young man whom they were still destined to meet. In response, Cho Cheon said with a loud laugh that he couldn't wait to meet the one who saved their dear guests. This was the Demon Fist, the terrifying leader of the Furious Fist Clan. At the same time, Mu Wan and his younger brother are located in a tavern, which the bodyguard believes is one of the best places in the area. Hearing the praise, Quack was very glad that he had met the expectations of the respected master. Addressing his younger brother, Master Jin said that he should find one person. He said it would take a few days, so he wanted Moon Zhang to stay at the tavern and get back to his training. He asked him to focus on accumulating as much qi as possible so that their training together would be more productive. In response, bodyguard Quack asked his elder brother to be careful. While going down to the first floor of the tavern, Mu Wan noticed a local worker. He told him that he was trying to find someone and would like to hear where he might be. Mu Wan mentioned a scholar of three thoughts named Ha Jin. The hotel worker was surprised and called Ha Chin a crazy psycho. It turns out that everyone calls it that in this province. According to him, he was considered a genius for a very long time. But one day, he suddenly went crazy 
and has not recovered since then. Having taken a closer look at the client, the man began to assess his solvency. After thinking for a moment, he extended his hand to the side and showed his inside pocket, demonstrating that it was worth paying for. Mu Wan handed him a fairly large amount of money, which greatly interested the hotel employee. He remembered that if an incredibly generous client wanted to find a mad scientist, he should take a carriage on the main road and head south, where he could find the slums. There is a place called the West Wind Tavern, which is actually a gaming house. While saying goodbye to his client, the hotel worker asked him to be careful, because the residents of those slums are not the most kind. As soon as Mu Wan arrived at the previously indicated place, he met some bandits who called Hua Jin Wool a crook. One of them, who was sitting behind, said that if a young guy came to them in search of someone they hate, then he probably has a lot of guts. Master Jin was surprised by his words and asked if everything was okay and if anything strange had happened between them. Rising to his feet, the bandit said that now everything would be much easier for him. Addressing his team of not the most kind people, he said that a crazy psycho had sent them a young guy who should be captured immediately. Mu Wan replied that he still didn't understand what he was talking about. Still, it was going to be a fight, and using only crushing fingers, the guy proved that beating is incredibly effective in obtaining valuable information. The instant the bandit leader saw the deadly finger in front of him, he realized that they had attacked a martial artist and made a terrible mistake. But at that moment, the confident Master Jin stopped and asked the leader of the bandits if they had any other problems. The frightened man replied that there were no problems, and that he was ready to happily tell everything that the master wanted. According to him, he is Madden, the owner of the gaming house. One day, out of nowhere, a crazy man named Ha Chin Wool appeared and emptied the gaming house, which brought them a good income. According to him, there is usually a limit to how much you steal, but this is not the case with the mad scientist, because he stole a huge amount of money from them. These bandits still wanted to take them back to run their gaming house and make a living. Therefore, in order to take back their money and prevent the insolent man from deceiving more people in the future, they planned to cut off at least one of his hands. But he didn't stop laughing as he pointed his finger up. At first they thought that the psycho was simply crazy, but then suddenly their minds became clouded. Looking up, they could not contain their feelings. The next thing they saw were the most beautiful women who looked like goddesses. They were so seductive that the guys couldn't resist. At that moment, Crazy Hajin Wall realized that people are more interested in their carnal desires than in their brains. It seemed to him that those bandits were no different from animals. Hearing the story, Mu Wan assumed that they had been deceived by an illusion. While all this was happening, Ha Jin Wall stole the bandits' money and running the gambling house became impossible. Their image was destroyed and the business was doomed. All this snot was not in the interests of Master Jin, so he directly asked where he could find that psycho. The frightened bandit replied that he tried his best to find him for the purpose of killing him, but was unable to do so. The last thing he heard was that Ha Jin Wall showed up at the cattle market at the end of this city. When Mu Wan arrived at the market, he learned that Ha Jin Wall had bought ten strong bulls a few days ago and driven them to another city. On the way to that city, the guy found out that that madman had organized a bullfighting competition, and it was thanks to him that they managed to make a good profit. They earned enough to throw a big banquet. Moreover, Ha Chinwal even gave the oxen to the townspeople and left in another direction. The next witness said that a crazy wanderer started a fight with their chief monk. His master lost the fight and ended up having to isolate himself to learn the ways of asceticism. Each subsequent witness redirected the young master to another distant place, and he was already tired, realizing that at this rate, he would not have time to search for Mr. Huang. Master Jin, wandering around the province of Unam, could not even imagine where the scientist of three thoughts was now. As he moved on, he wondered why the senior disciple of the Kuntun Monastery advised him to find such a strange person. He couldn't say that the actions of that mysterious master could be called normal. It seemed to him that Ha Jinwal was trying to understand the true nature of man. All these stories created a feeling of affection for Ha Jinwal in him. He was very curious about what he really was. At one point, Master Jin noticed a strange stone that was located nearby. He was sure that he had seen him at the entrance to the forest. Looking around, he noticed that the forest looked cyclical. The stone was always near him. Master Jin was simply shocked that he fell for the illusion. He couldn't even say exactly when he hit it. Even though he was observing the entire area with the help of Qi, the illusion was not ordinary at all. At one moment it began to change. At that moment, a predator appeared in front of the guy, most likely created by that crazy master. Seeing this, Mu Wan realized that the strength of the person he was looking for was not something to be laughed at. In order to get out of this situation, Mu Wan decided to concentrate and calm down believing that he should not worry in the face of the illusory technique. 
Realizing that this was a mirage, Master Jin remembered that in the Battle of Wits, the winner is the one who is wiser. However, he did not neglect to use brute force to force the Three Thought Scholar to show up. Within a moment, the illusion technique was destroyed and Ha Chin Wall appeared in front of the young master with a most surprised look. For a pleasant conversation in the depths of the forest, a strange man invited the young master to have a cup of tea. After hearing the story from Master Jin, he asked in disbelief how he managed to defeat the monastery's senior disciple. The guy only replied that he wouldn't lie about something like that, and then continued to enjoy his tea. Mr. Ha looked at his guest with some suspicion. It was difficult for him to believe that he had defeated such a skilled master, but he could confidently say that Mu Wan was clearly not a weakling. Analyzing Master Jin's appearance, he felt that he could not be extremely strong, but still admitted that he could be at the highest level, breaking the silence. The strange man mysteriously called his guest a naughty boy. As it turned out, his strange words were due to the fact that he noticed how the young master carefully concealed his true strength. Mr. Ha turned out to be quite shrill, so Mu Wan laughed politely. Master Jin explained his behavior by saying that he wanted to live as long as possible. The guy's answer turned out to be extremely unusual and really surprised the scientist of three minds. Still, he agreed with his words, remembering that those who like to show off their strength die first, while those who hide their abilities live longer. At one point, his former tension returned and he asked the young master how he managed to break out of his illusion. At that moment, he began to imagine countless possibilities as to where the security gap was in his technique. He completely forgot about the previous conversation and drew on the stone a diagram of the distribution of energy to use and strengthen the illusion. Watching this, Mu Wan did not fully understand his interlocutor's train of thought. He was surprised with a smile at the unexpected change of topic and thought about whether all geniuses are so crazy. To prevent the poor fellow from racking his brains, Mu Wan clarified that, in fact, he could only rely on his feelings. As it turned out, he did not think about the illusory technique, but simply using his senses was able to understand where he should attack. Hearing this, the genius began to silently look into the eyes of the young master. Throwing his chalk on the stone, he was pleasantly surprised by his statement. But in defense of his illusory technique, he said that the guy must have noticed that one mistake could cost him his life. In response, Master Jin asked why that illusory technique was so powerful and suggested that Ha Jin Wall was going to take over the heavens or something like that. The guy's words amused the strange scientist. He replied that it would be great if he could do it. Then for the first time, he decided to ask who he was dealing with, after which the guy said his name. But Ha Chin Wall wanted to hear not this, but who the master really was. Still, Mu Wan couldn't just reveal his mysterious identity. He replied that it did not matter because at the moment he did not have any personality. Hearing this, the genius again called the guy a naughty boy and said that with such behavior it was not worth looking for him. Master Jin explained that he did this because senior student Mu Guan advised him to meet the genius. Therefore, by searching for a genius, he simply satisfied his curiosity. Ha Chinwal was surprised that this master was so trusting of his feelings. Nevertheless, his proud nature took over, and he boastfully invited the young master to ask questions, for example, regarding the secret of youth of such a genius like him, or how he was able to keep his skin so smooth and healthy. As expected, Mu Wan was serious, and asked if the genius knew about the man who went missing about six months ago. The genius suggested that we were talking about a troop of white dragon merchants, since Mr. Ha immediately understood what was going on it became clear that he knew something. The man thought about whether to share his observations, so he asked whether the young master was related by blood to the man who had gone missing. Mu Wan answered briefly that no. Hearing this, Mr. Ha said that in that case it would be better to give up. When Master Jin refused this option, the genius wanted to make sure that the guy was ready to move on even if his own life might be in danger. Mu Wan said seriously that the person for whom he was ready to sacrifice his life has disappeared. Hearing such purposeful words, Mr. Ha realized that there was simply no other option. In this case, he invited the guy to go to the Jade City. He didn't know all the details, but he noticed that strange things have been happening there lately as the market turnover is not looking good. He was willing to bet it had something to do with the people who had gone missing. The mention of that place made the guy think about his plans for the coming days. With a sly look, he persistently invited the genius to come with him. The proposal took the brilliant scientist by surprise and he nervously replied that they didn't even know each other well enough to solve problems together. With a sly smile on his face, Mu Wan said that his heart told him that they should try together. Ha Jinwal was really puzzled by the young master's logic and said that all this talk about feelings and the heart shows that Master Jin is a dreamer. In his defense, he said that he did not understand why he should interfere in other people's affairs while his life was very comfortable. Mu Wan understood what was going on and directly said that this was due to the fact that Mr. Ha was afraid of it. In response, the man with a piercing gaze thoughtfully stared at his interlocutor. Mu Wan revealed his cards and said that while he was trying to find the scientist, he talked to many people, 
and they all said that he was a crazy psycho. But the master himself believed that in fact this was not characteristic of his nature, and there must be something that led him to such a state. He believed that the actions of a truly crazy person are quite illogical due to the fact that his mind is clouded, while a scientist acts naturally. Master Jin believed that Ha Jin Wool sincerely wanted to understand the true nature of man, wanted to see how people would react when they went beyond their limits, and how they could gain the ability to reason in such a situation. After this, the young swordsman asked the scientist if he had made any mistakes in his assumption. After all this speech, Mr. Ha was, to put it mildly, surprised by the insight of his interlocutor. After silence, he began to laugh loudly and called the young master a really funny and interesting person. Having finished laughing, he said that in any case he was not ready to travel yet, so he could only bet on the luck of his interlocutor. Going into the forest, he said that between heaven and earth, a person remains alone, and his existence maintains harmony. He believed that a person's existence depends on circumstances, and without his presence, the world loses its reasons for existence. The scientist's mysterious conclusions made the young master a little tense, and in response he only awkwardly thanked him for the tea. When the old man went into the forest, the last thing he said was that if they were truly connected by fate, they would definitely meet again. Meanwhile, inside the Broken Fist clan, one of the fighters prepared a report to the leader that the White Dragon Merchant Troop had sent them a sixth request for help. According to him, recently there have been six incidents of missing merchants in Onam province. Hearing this, the fist demon named Zhou Cheon Wu thought hard. The eldest son named Cho Yongkin came to him with a report. He asked his father to listen to the requests of the merchants. The man coldly replied that he would take care of current affairs in Unnam province. Despite his clear answer, Cho Yunkin asked if everything was okay. The experienced and incredibly formidable warrior never answered his question, but simply asked his son to deal with the troop of white dragon merchants and allowed him to go. The faithful follower respectfully said goodbye and carried out the order. There were several more followers nearby, discussing the presence of their guests in the meeting room. The leader of the Broken Fist asked a gentleman named Penn to come to him. A faithful subordinate immediately came and inquired what the conversation would be about. First of all, the man mentioned his son and said that he was quite good, but had a weak heart. The experienced leader believed that in order to become a dominant ruler, the heart must never experience the slightest compassion. Next, he asked the leader of the investigative department of the oracles for his opinion about his son's competence as an heir. Mr. Penn replied that his son was respected as he was quite smart and could handle all tasks well. In response, Cho Chion Wu unexpectedly said that his son Yong Kyong would not inherit the family business. He was worried about how he would take this news, so he asked his ward to resolve this issue, since he understood that if Yunkin found out the truth, he would not wait quietly. Pen accepted the order and asked not to worry, as he believed that his son would gradually learn about what was really happening. Having huge ambitions, the man said that only the province of Unam would not satisfy him. Feeling the strength in his hand, he said that if he were satisfied, then there would be no reason to attach the elder brother, sect leader Chin. According to the hypocritical leader, his brother, known as the Wall of the North, who was the father of Master Jin, was satisfied with his duty to prevent the invasion of the Silent Knight, and had no ambitions despite having the strength and power to conquer the entire world. Having an extremely limited mindset, Master Cho had no idea why his brother chose to live a life dedicated to only one single noble goal. He believed that if a person has great power, then it is normal to want more. After these words, he mentioned that the Central Heavenly Alliance had made its move and even sent the Tang family. Before they made any more moves, the man was going to finish his business before them. Leader Pen replied that there was nothing to worry about. He swore allegiance and asked the head of the clan to focus on the upcoming affairs, while he would take care of all the minor concerns. Still, he warned the master that they would have to deal with quite a lot of bloodshed, with perhaps even thousands of victims. In response, Cho said with a malicious look that in order to achieve results, one must make sacrifices. He did not feel pity for the future victims of his actions, so he stood firm on his path. Under the terrifying lightning, he declared that he had already forgotten the taste of real battle, because a long time had passed since he shed the blood of the infidels. Meanwhile, the son of the evil provincial leader met with representatives of the White Dragon Merchant Troop and their escorts from the Iron Dozen. Leader Yang Musan introduced himself and also introduced his first deputy, known as the Great Mind. To his right were White Dragon Troop Captain Khan and Lady Yun. Mr. Cho's son seemed to be a good person. He greeted his guests with a kind smile. It seems that Leader Yan was interested in this mysterious youth, who is known as the eldest son of the Demon Fist. Cho Yunkin invited the dear guest to sit down at the negotiating table. Analyzing Venerable Yonkin, Leader Yang noticed that unlike his father, he did not look like a strong man at all. 
but he had a strong character, not to mention the fact that he had dignity in all his speech and even in his movements. Yunkin's eyes seemed bright to him, and his actions were truly graceful. Yet the blood of a famous family flowed in his veins. Addressing the leader of the Iron Dozen, the young master noted that he had heard stories about his fearless actions. He guessed that the White Dragon Merchant Troop hired him because of his good reputation. Leader Yong agreed with the young master's assumption and said that their mercenaries are trying their best to find the people who went missing in Unam province. With a smile on his face, Yunkin called the leader of the Iron Dozen a reliable person. Looking closely at the look of this young gentleman, Yong Musan noticed that this look reminded him of his father. It seems that Yong had a very good pedigree. In order not to delay, he apologized and suggested getting straight to the point. With a big smile, he was frank and said that he was confused, which is why he came to ask them for help. According to him, they have been in Unnam province for about four days, but so far have not been able to find any leads or information regarding the missing people. Even the person they sent earlier had mysteriously disappeared. The meeting with the bloody ghosts made them understand that many dangerous encounters still await them, to overcome which they need the help of furious fists. His deputy supplemented the leader's report. He clarified that by helping the White Dragon Merchant Troop, which is one of the greatest organizations in the entire country, the furious fists will be able to strengthen their relationship which is a very profitable deal. In response, the level-headed and intelligent Yunkin inquired about the nature of the help they needed. He was frank and immediately warned that information was a problem, because at first they believed that these attacks were organized by robbers, but it turned out that everything was much more serious. Hearing this, Captain Cohn became worried. He decided to join the conversation and said that the young lady was responsible for their journey, and also added that she was the younger sister of the missing third son. That is why they were ready to do anything to solve this problem. Young Ken understood their situation and said that in that case, they would do everything in their power to help the young lady find her missing brother. From such pleasant words, a blush appeared on Soin's face, and she thanked the man for his honesty. Taking a closer look at Yun Soin, the young master believed that she was not the person with whom he should negotiate. He believed that the people who would bring the most profit were the mercenaries from the Iron Dozen group. Having learned all the details, Young Ken suggested moving on to the main topic of conversation, namely strategy. His wards confirmed his words and that they would come to a solution to the problem. The young master hoped that they would find a solution that would suit them all, and then suggested that they begin the discussion. Yet his convictions haunted him among all these people. The young master understood that justice and honor are something that no longer exists in the world of Morim. All that is left in his opinion is small privileges and money, since they estimate the cost and value of people's lives based on their status. Peering out the window, he remembered that it wasn't always like this. Previously, the northern region looked completely different, despite the fact that in those days they lived in harsh and barren lands. Looking into the past, he remembered the sincerity and honesty of the people who surrounded him. Then he was truly the happiest, in those peaceful times when he was not limited by anything. Of course, he could not remember those sincere and pleasant conversations with his cousin, who constantly begged him to teach him martial arts, since he had long been tired of reading books. Remembering little Mu Wan, he sincerely regretted what happened to him. However, he had already chosen a path that he could no longer refuse, and even if it led him to the abyss, he still could not give up his intentions. He didn't even expect that Mu Wan was still alive and even in the same province as him. The young leader of the legendary Northern Heavenly Clan recalled the words of the so-called madman that if he got involved in this story, he would certainly become a part of it. In fact, Master Jin felt that Ha Jin Wall knew a lot more than he said, but at least he managed to find out about the Jade City. At the same moment, he remembered the leader of the bloody ghosts, and how he was just a tool, while some mysterious person controlled everything that happened in the province. Remembering the good martial arts skills of that man, Mu Wan thought about who he would have to fight with if he were to use such power as a consumable. There was a high probability that the man who hired the bloody ghosts was the true organizer of all the incidents. Moving further, Master Jin heard a mysterious sound. It was the sound of a lyre, an ominous melody as if calling him to itself. Master Jin decided to find the one who called him to him. He was a very rare master and Mu Wan understood this. After all, instead of becoming a master of a blade or a spear, that unknown person became a master of creating sound, which is something much more complex in terms of martial arts. Thanks to this, finding such a master is truly rare and very lucky. Moving towards the sound of the lyre, Master Jin was able to see where that stranger was. As he approached, he was surprised at how terrible the sound art of that unknown master was. As soon as Master Jin arrived to him, he was surprised by his reaction. The mysterious master of sound called the heir of the northern clan by name and said that he was waiting for him. Mu Wan said that he only came because he was called. He still didn't know who he was dealing with, so he politely asked to introduce himself. 
The soundmaster apologized for his rudeness and said his name was Gyum Dan Yup. As it turned out, he learned about the young master from some person, whose name he did not mention at first. The sound master believed that Mu Wan was an amazing fighter, because he was the first to answer the call of his divine sound of a thousand steps. Mu Wan was ready for anything, and in order to understand whether he was a friend or an enemy, he asked for the name of the person from whom he learned about him. Gaeum Dan Yup was sure that Jin had already met him before, because we were talking about his close friend named Nam Gun Wee. Hearing the name of the leader of the Bloody Ghosts, Mu Wan assumed that this was the person who was responsible for the events in Unam province. In response, the sound master admitted that he did not expect Ganwi to tell him so much. On the other hand, he understood the motives of his ward, because this was the first time Ganwi found himself in such a pitiful state. It was because of the young master's success that he was interested in him. Still polite but cunning, the man asked which combat school Master Jin belonged to. Mu Wan replied that he does not belong to any martial school because his martial arts are something that was left behind by his family. Master Sound replied that in that case, his combat school should be quite impressive. Mu Wan clarified that in fact, a long time has passed since they were destroyed and forgotten. Jim Dan Yup decided to be honest and admitted that his plans never included the possibility of such a person as Master Jin existing. He wanted to know why he came, and whether he was connected with the Heavenly Alliance. The young master replied that he had nothing to do with the Central Heavenly Alliance because he came to Unnam province in order to find a person who disappeared here six months ago, working with a troop of white dragon merchants. In response, the soundmaster said that those guys were still alive. Hearing this, Jin asked the soundmaster to release the prisoners and promised that in this case, he would calmly leave the province of Unnam and would not interfere in their affairs. Despite the request of the young and talented master, Gyeom Dan Yup could not do it and said that it is not as easy as it seems. In response, Mu Wan silently waited for an explanation as to what the problem was and whether they needed to fight. Putting his hand on his snowflower, he still asked about the reason for his refusal. The soundmaster asked him not to rush and said that everything was complicated and he should explain the situation in more detail. He wanted Mu Wan to understand that freeing those merchants would put him in a difficult position. He swore on his own name that after he finished his business, he would calmly return the merchant to the talented master who appeared before him to free them. The mysterious master with a rare martial art was very pleased with this meeting, but as it turned out he felt that they had some kind of problem. The man said that they were destined to shed blood. Mu Wan didn't understand what he was up to, so he asked directly and took his blade out of its sheath. Addressing his dear visitor, the master began to play the liar and said that he was sorry, but they were destined to fight in another place. Despite his answer, Master Jin was serious and directly asked the villain to answer where the missing people were and what they planned to do with them. Finding the right moment, he struck his first blow with eternal darkness. The sound master did not expect to encounter such an attack. Fighting her off, he called the situation unfortunate and said that recent events were very sad. Just one light touch to the instrument created a strong shockwave. Turning to the young master, he apologized. But a moment later, Mu Wan rushed to attack again. His opponent did not want to fight and only avoided the attack. While chasing the master of sound, the swordsman from the north tried to hear the answers. Inflicting the next blow, he asked not to hesitate, but his opponent once again used the sound martial art technique and repelled the attack. Additionally, his blows could reach Master Jin and cause him minor cuts. At the same time, he reported that those people who still remain a mystery to them say that the world consists of two parts. Reality and illusion will become one as soon as the mind chooses what it wants to see. Continuing to run away from pursuit, the sound master continued to talk about some riddles. It became clear that he was trying to warn the young master that the secrets of the night would inevitably awaken. Before the next attack, he called people unknown to us the sad people of the abandoned lands. All of his attacks could reach the young master, but they were not serious. The guy received only shallow cuts. The sound master ran away, saying there was no time to waste. Mu Wan was left alone. Meeting this man was not the most pleasant, because his clothes were damaged again. But he was sure that he would return it for a long time, and that they would soon be able to meet. This short journey took him longer than he expected, so upon returning to the tavern, the master was worried whether his younger brother was all right. But as soon as he walked inside, he was very surprised. The younger brother followed his advice and did not stop training. In addition, he even noticeably changed in appearance. Mu Wan was surprised and simply said that the result of the training was quite good. He had previously heard that children develop quickly, but he did not even expect that it was so much so. Disciple Kwok was glad to see his older brother. He admitted that due to the fact that Mu Wan did not return for a long time, he even thought that he had been abandoned. Although he was a little worried, every time he had these thoughts, he translated them into training, 
While the representatives of the Iron Dozen and the White Dragon were conferring inside, the deputy mercenary captain was suffering from the rain outside. They were forced to accompany the Trade Association's bodyguards to the infirmary. One of the fighters suggested relaxing the situation and advised them to go to a tavern. He was even ready to treat his comrades at his own expense. Inside the infirmary, a vile atmosphere reigned. The wounded soldiers were groaning because of their wounds. As the doctor passed by, one of his patients grabbed him by the clothes. He begged him to help, fearing that he did not have much time left. The dissatisfied doctor replied that nothing would happen to him. He was surprised that bodyguards who lived to do their duty showed their weaknesses. After that, he threw some kind of bag of medicine and said that the poor fellow could use this ointment internally or smear it on the wounds. Having looked around, he moved on because he still did not find the one he was looking for. But a moment later, another doctor with the same appearance came. He began to politely apologize to the patients, saying that he had many patients to take care of. Addressing the patient, he asked him to tell him what complaints he had. In response, the surprised man said that he had just given them some medicine and left. The doctor did not understand what he could be talking about, because he came running here only after he had finished working with other patients. Hearing this, the bodyguard asked what kind of medicine was provided to him. When the doctor examined the bag, he replied that this was not used in their infirmary. As it turned out, some spy was here who had the ability to transform. He felt some sadness that he had simply wasted his valuable medicine on a poor fellow from the infirmary for the sake of a mission. After these words, he returned to his true appearance. It was a member of the Hidden Moons from the Dark Moon organization, a heaven-ranked fighter named Chun Ying. The man was extremely dissatisfied with the violation of labor standards. He was already tired of working for a long time and thought that when he returned to the office, he would complain because he should be given proper time to rest. Once he completes his mission in Akian City, he will be sent to another mission in Unam Province. Even if the mission was of exceptional importance, he was still concerned about the working conditions and even complained about the low pay. There were so many tasks for this master that it seemed to him that his superiors thought that he knew how to create clones. At the end of his dissatisfaction, he was ready to accept the circumstances, because he could not expect more from those who never stuck their head out of the meeting room. A moment later, a raven named Dancer returned to him, who apparently had already delivered a message to the office. He praised his bird for its efforts and the crow answered him happily. Then they were joined by a black dog named Earth. It seems he found something. The dog began to bark, and thanks to this the spy in some incomprehensible way realized that his target was heading to the Jade City. In fact, he somehow enjoyed such hard work. Master of Ten Reincarnations, Chun Ying thought with anticipation about what kind of disguise he would use to track down Master Jin. Master Jin and his younger brother left the tavern and hit the road. Kwok boasted that he had learned a lot during that time. He was looking forward to the long journey and spending the night in the open air, even though he complained about his lack of camping experience. He assured his brother that he would do everything possible not only not to become a burden, but even to help him. Mu Wan was not sure that the young bodyguard was truly ready for their dangerous mission, but the guy asked not to worry, and said that he had lived his whole life on the road, and was incredibly glad that he would travel with his older brother, thanks to whom he had become much stronger. But it still seemed that his emotions were slightly unnatural. The guy directed his gaze forward, and with a tight smile began to confidently step forward. At that moment, Mu Wan decided to support him, and placing his hand on his younger brother's head, said that Mun Jun was a bright and courageous boy. Such care was something rare in relation to the young bodyguard, and he sincerely enjoyed this moment. Remembering the past, he thought that shortly after his birth, his own mother abandoned him. His father was busy working as a bodyguard, so he couldn't visit him often. He was forced to live on his own for quite a long time, so he was very lonely. But his father still loved him, and Kwok felt it. Addressing his son, he apologized for acting like an irresponsible father who could not properly care for his child. He promised that a little more time would pass and he would have enough money to open a dumpling shop for the two of them. With a pleasant smile on his face, he asked him to be patient a little longer, not to be upset and to take good care of the house. Putting his hand on his son's head, the man asked him to be brave, respect his elders, and always smile, because this would give him more strength to complete his missions. The boy promised that he would always listen to his advice. Shortly after this sweet moment, his father died in an incident during another mission. Having learned about this, Mr. Huang came to him, which is when they met. He introduced himself and said that Kwok's father was his close friend. The man invited him to live together and promised that he would make sure that his childhood was happy. After that, the man asked Captain Cohn if he was against it. The man replied that everything was fine. The trembling boy was glad that he would not be left alone. The people who allowed a child abandoned in this world to live in the White Dragon Trade Association 
were Mr. Huang and Captain Gon. His sword skills were still poor, so the guy was worried about how the mission would go. In addition, he noticed that as soon as they reached the next city, he felt how the weather changed and became more pleasant. Mu Wan agreed and explained that this place is on a plateau, so it is much cooler here than other places. He also told his younger brother that if they set out early in the morning they could arrive at the Jade City by evening. As soon as it got dark the guys set up camp and started preparing dinner. The young bodyguard continued to train in his free time. As soon as they finished dinner, Mu Wan sat down to rest while Kwok continued to train. Watching him, he remembered that previously he had no idea that his life was so difficult. Mu Wan believed that they were somewhat similar, especially since his time when he had to train alone on Mount Jok Am. Quack's age is about the same as Master Jin's when he was left completely alone. In order not to watch him in vain, he decided to help the young master a little. Master Jin asked his younger brother to come closer. As soon as Quack saw the wand in the hands of his older brother, he did not understand what he wanted to do. It seemed quite strange that Master Jin wanted to fight him using only a bamboo chopstick. The guy was excited that he would soon receive personal training from a master he looked up to. But after a moment, he felt that he was so scared that he could not move forward. His sparring opponent simply held the chopstick, but the boy could already feel the pressing energy, which seemed simply incredible to him. Thinking about how to carry out an attack, Kwok did not notice how Master Jin appeared behind him, hit him on the back of the head with his wand, and asked if the guy was going to be afraid, and stand on the defensive for the rest of his life. The pressure of his wand seemed incredibly terrifying. Mu Wan said that Kwok can't do anything with passion alone, so he should become more cold-blooded. As a result, Mu Wan only touched his student a little, but with the same movement he sent him flying. The younger brother understood that now everything was different and he was on a completely different level compared to those guys from the bloody ghost team that he had encountered recently. After exchanging a few swings, he thought that he had become a little better at wielding the sword. But looking at it now, he realized that he had simply blocked the enemy's attack back then. Plus, his older sister helped him take care of the enemy. The incredible strength of his older brother made him think that despite hard training, he was still weak or simply afraid to demonstrate strength. Rising to his feet, the determined boy decided that he would soon find out. He understood that this chance could not be missed. He was going to give it his all, as this would be a good combat experience for him. He didn't even have time to notice how the enemy again stood point-blank towards him and hit him on the hands with his wand. Mu Wan gave him another piece of advice, telling him that when a swordsman holds his weapon in his hands, he should extend them slightly forward, as this will allow him to have more power when swinging. Disciple Quack fell face-first onto the ground with a crash. Master Jin's upbringing came with blows. The experienced fighter explained to his younger brother that he was still tense, and therefore his reflexes were too slow and his eyes were losing concentration. As soon as the guy stood up, he received a blow to his lower limbs and learned that his feet must always maintain a position on the ground. Throwing the poor guy into the air, Mu Wan advised him to take deep breaths before lunging. The young bodyguard was never able to demonstrate his skills. He lost the sword in his hands and learned that he should first understand his weaknesses while understanding the basics will come to him over time. Despite the trembling all over his body, the determined young man replied that he could still continue. After breaking his chopstick, Mu Wan refused to continue and said that it was time to rest, because this was also an important part of training. For the future, he advised using three fundamental cultivation techniques to properly circulate qi within the body. Looking at the student with a smile, Master Jin decided to support him so that he would not think that he had shown himself poorly. Looking up at the stars, he said that his little brother had done a good job. Munjin was very happy with this praise, and thanked his mentor for the valuable lesson. Meanwhile, in some creepy temple, one of the recently wounded soldiers was recovering. Remembering his battle with the swordsman from the north, he called him a ferocious beast. Nam Gongmi had been circulating Qi non-stop for the past few days, but his wounds were still not healed. He believed that he was in this state because he had weakened his defenses. He wasn't going to make his mistake twice and was ready for their rematch. Turning to his enemy, he wished him to prepare for a real battle. As soon as Master Nam left the temple, he saw someone's silhouette. It was the Master of Sound, Dong Yelp. Turning to his ward, the man noticed that the leader of the Bloody Ghosts was feeling better. Master Nam replied that he had not yet fully recovered, but was ready to move forward. He admitted that his opponent was very dangerous, and he should be grateful to fate, because he thought that his head would fly off his shoulders. At one point, he noticed that his friend was twirling the leaves in his hand, which meant that he was worried about something. Gonmi assumed that Don had personally met the one he had to fight. Dong Yup replied that this was true and their plans had become even more difficult to implement. The leader of the Blood Ghosts was surprised that even such an amazing master was alarmed by meeting with the strange swordsman. In response, Dong Yup stated that their enemy was abnormal. It seemed to him that Mu Wan was an impenetrable wall. 
This is exactly the impression he left, because those guys didn't even think that such a person could exist. What worried him most was that they would never be able to come to an agreement with him. Hearing such hesitant speech from the boss, Ganmi asked what their plan was, and whether they were going to just give up their ambitions. Dong Yup replied that they couldn't do that, and even though they didn't take such a person into account when they made the plan, they couldn't just give up. Despite the gravity of the situation, the leader of the Bloody Ghosts was not against revenge, and said that although he could not win, he would at least protect the life of the Soundmaster. He asked him to trust him, and in this case, they would be together until the end. They've come too far to just give up. Rolling up another sheet, the Soundmaster said that even though they had poured their heart and soul into preparing their master plan, an unexpected variable was just bound to appear. He believed that this is why they say the world is worth living in, because anything can happen. In any case, he was sure that now all this would be a little more interesting, after which he began to laugh, which caused some confusion in his ward. He believed that the situation should be like this in order for the sleeping Silent Knight to awaken. While the enemies planned the return of Silent Knight, Mu Wan and his ward continued to move towards the Jade City. A large detachment suddenly appeared past them, moving in the same direction as them. As one of the carriages passed them, Master Jin saw a familiar face. It was Mr. Tang. The master of 10,000 poisons asked his squad to stop. Together with their niece, they were glad to see their savior in good health. It turned out that they were also heading to the Jade City. Master Jin was surprised by this as he believed that they were going to meet the members of the Central Heavenly Alliance in the Broken Fist Clan. The man replied that the Alliance had changed their plans and asked them to hurry up to a meeting in the Jade City. Although he was dissatisfied with this news and considered the Heavenly Alliance to be arrogant scoundrels, he was glad that the Broken Fist Clan provided them with some bodyguards. At that moment, the one in charge of the trip approached them. Mr. Tan apologized for the sudden stop and said that he had met Mr. Jin, who was his savior. General Im So Guan, known as the Eight Arms of Heaven, was in charge of safety on the road. The heavily armored man was one of the five clan masters who was well versed in the fist style. With a smile on his face, the general introduced himself and said that according to rumors, Master Jin was quite skilled for his age. Mu Wan replied that he was simply experienced enough to protect himself. In fact, he knew this fighter well. He was surprised that the one who happily carried him in his arms ten years ago could not recognize him as he grew older. Mr. Tan invited a fairly experienced guy in martial arts to join the escort detachment. The general did not object. They had little room in the carriage, so Mu Wan and his younger brother had the honor of traveling with members of the great family. At that moment, the general experienced a strange feeling that he could not explain to himself. Not wanting to fill his head with unnecessary thoughts, he ordered his people to prepare for departure and continue on their way. They were already near the Jade City, so Mr. Tang suggested they rest for a while. Having prepared a delicious porridge, the general almost remembered the old days in the north, but stopped in time, not daring to touch on a sore subject in the world of Murim. Quack was very surprised because he was prepared the same dish that his older brother had prepared at night. The general was interested in whether the young masters liked what he had prepared. The well-mannered young master replied that everything was delicious, and thanked the general for the food. Taking a closer look at the young master, the man thought about his surname, because the guy very much resembled the son of the leader of the clan in which he once belonged. He understood that if Mu Wan were alive, he would be about the same age as that guy. But his doubts were dispelled by his memories that the fourth generation leader of the Northern Heavenly Clan had never taught his son martial arts. He recalled that Jin Kuang Ho forced the heir to read books instead of teaching him his skills. Therefore, he was sure that this was not Mu Wan, because he could confidently say that the young master knew some martial arts. Feelings took over and Im So Guang felt discomfort due to the memories that he tried so hard to forget. They appeared out of nowhere just by looking at the master, which reminded him so much of Mu Wan. The general believed that that child was forced to live independently in the barren lands of the north, endured a lot, and eventually died. Ten years had passed since that moment, and the man believed that he had made a mistake that no martial artist should make. At the same time, he thought that he had no other choice at the moment when even the great four of the Northern Heavens turned their backs on the defenseless heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. In fact, he was afraid, so he did not have the courage to defend his loyalty. He was gripped by fear, and if he had resisted and not done what others were doing, he would have been killed. He considered himself sinful to heaven, because with each passing day he felt more and more guilt and shame. When he thought that he had finally begun to live, despite the past, a man appeared in front of him, who stirred up the memories that he tried to hide deep in his soul. When he thought that if it was really Mu Wan, he would not be able to ask this question. He believed that because of what had happened, he was no longer allowed to face it. Denying this, the man began to think that this was impossible. 
At one point, the general simply could not stand it and left. Mu Wan noticed his nervous behavior, but his thoughts were not at all about what happened in the Northern Heavenly Clan ten years ago. In fact, he was thinking about those enemies who took away one of the most valuable people in his life, namely Mr. Huang. The young master did not understand what the purpose of that third party in the incident in Unam province was. Moreover, he did not even understand who those masters were who were clearly not from the mainland. At that moment, he was even bold enough to suggest that they were representatives of the Silent Knight. At one point, the general was called to look at something strange. A trace of the battle was found not far from their camp. The smell in this place made the young bodyguard feel nauseous. The general suggested that these people might have been caught in some kind of ambush that they did not know about. As soon as Mu Wan heard the general's words, he realized that there were similar cases in the past that the Broken Fist Clan decided to keep silent about. Moreover, the Central Heavenly Alliance usually takes such incidents quite seriously. At one point, the young master in front of the general went forward to examine the bodies of the victims of the ambush. He was sure that there were no signs of teeth or claws on the wounds of those people, but at the same time, the injuries were not inflicted by weapons. Old Man Tang was surprised that the young master could tell just by his appearance. It seemed to him that someone had torn the bodies of the victims with their bare hands, as they had incredible strength. But Mu Wan denied such an assumption, since he knew that this was not an easy task. Master Jin suggested paying attention to one more thing, that the poor fellow was not attacked by someone who mastered martial arts, because the masters use a clean and effective method of killing. Based on what the young master said, Mr. Tang assumed that the person who created the chaos here has incredible strength, but apparently is insane and lacks common sense. Taking a closer look at the horrifying crime scene, the general decided to strengthen the defense. Since they were already close to the Jade City, he asked his comrades not to relax and carefully monitor their surroundings, after which he asked them to monitor the possible presence of enemies. Mu Wan was sure that after strange incidents an unfortunate event would occur, so he was on alert. As a result, their detachment moved further towards the city. Luckily nothing happened along the way, so they headed to the nearest tavern where the hotel was located. Addressing the general, Mr. Tang said that Master Jin had some unfinished business, so he would need to go out often. He said that he would most likely choose another place to spend the night, because there he would be able to get in and out without hindrance. Im So Guang understood this and said that he would pray for his safety and success. After thanking their squad for their help, Mu Wan decided to say goodbye. The Mad Master of Ten Thousand Poisons wished them luck and said that he would like to meet again. Excited Mirai asked them to be careful because this city is dangerous and full of secrets. The general was unable to say anything on his own and only looked thoughtfully towards Master Jin, who reminded him of Kuang Ho's son. As soon as the guys moved a little further, Kwok said that he saw no reason to leave their squad, because while in that hotel they could count on the help of the Broken Fist Clan. From his older brother's reaction, he could understand that this was clearly not what Mu Wan wanted. The master asked his younger brother where the White Dragon Merchant Troop would go. Hearing the question, Kwok began to think that most likely they would stop at the largest tavern, because they always move in a large group. Within a moment, the guy realized that his older brother was planning to look for clues, starting from that area. It became clear to him that since the Jade City is not very big, there are not many places where Mr. Huang could have stayed in the past, even before he was kidnapped. As soon as it got dark, they reached the so-called Priceless Tavern, which was the largest in the Jade City. Kwok knew that large groups mostly stopped here, so he directed his brother inside without hesitation. As it turned out, the place was empty, and even the hotel owner was surprised that visitors came to him. He immediately said that they were quite empty due to the unpleasant rumors that were circulating in this place. Even after six months, his tavern looked like it was abandoned. First of all, the owner asked how long the travelers planned to stay here. Mu Wan replied that they were interested in renting a room for about four days. As it turned out, the man was already planning to close his tavern. But thanks to these visitors, he could work a little longer. He sincerely thanked them for their visit and declared that he would accommodate them in the best rooms and provide them with the best of the dishes that he prepared. In addition to the clues, the young bodyguard was able to find out that Mu Wan expected people from the association and the Iron Squad to also arrive here. Master Jin really didn't doubt it since those guys moved in groups, so they were doomed to bump into each other. The roads of all the detachments they knew were aimed at this city. Kwok asked who else they might meet here. Putting his blade aside, Mu Wan replied that he was not sure who else would be here, but he believed that this was just the beginning of something bigger. Meanwhile, the hotel owner knocked on the door and brought his only visitors a treat. This was the best food of the priceless tavern, a dish of stewed carp that immediately made Kwok's mouth water. As he said goodbye, he once again thanked them for their visit and wished them bon appétit. The guys immediately started dinner and Kwok noticed that the broth was very tasty. But after a moment, the guys fell asleep right at the table. 
The hotel owner mixed some kind of poison or sleeping pills into the broth. As soon as he could no longer hear the dialogue of his visitors, he opened the door inside and made sure that they were not conscious. As it turned out, it was not the owner of the tavern at all, but a spy from the secret organization of the Black Moon disguised as him. He used sleep pills and was once again convinced that their action was reliable. As he passed by, he decided not to pay much attention to the bodyguard from the White Dragon Merchant Troop, as he felt that he was not very important and was more like a servant of the young master. The person he really had his eye on was Master Jin. He had heard that he was a peculiar guy who hid a lot, while little was known about him. The spy was confused due to the lack of information, so he planned to find something interesting. He didn't have any information about the young master's martial arts, status, or age, but he knew that he had joined the White Dragon Trade Association's mission. After looking around, he found something that interested him very much. As expected, it was a snow flower. This mysterious blade radiated some kind of unusual energy which attracted the spy. Seeing this sword, the man began to become interested in learning more about it. As it turned out, the energy of the blade simply attracted the spy to itself. Sometime later, Mu Wan woke up to the feeling that someone was whispering in his ear. When the guy regained consciousness, he realized that he had been careless and had fallen under the influence of sleeping pills during dinner. He couldn't believe that he had let his guard down, even though not much time had passed since he entered the world of Murim. He still had room to grow, so he focused on his surroundings. At one point, the guy noticed a strange man in the corner of the room and realized that the sleeping pills mixed into the food were his doing. As soon as Master Jin came closer, he realized that the strange spy was possessed by the aura of a snowflower and could not move. At that moment, the guy wondered if his enchanted sword was the one that brought him to his senses. When Mu Wan came closer to the spy, he felt that his key energy was the same as that of the tavern owner. Mu Wan assumed that the stranger was using the art of disguise. He wondered if he had lowered his defenses since he was unable to sense the sleeping pill and understand that this was a martial artist in front of him. The celestial rank spy was conscious, although he could not move his body. Master Jin asked who he even was. Chun Ying introduced himself as a member of the Dark Moon organization and admitted that the head of the Sachal Tavern ordered him to follow a man named Jin and find out everything about him. The young master realized that Chun Ying could not answer himself while in such a state, but due to the influence of the enchanted qi, he revealed all his secrets. Hearing the spy's words, he realized that Mei Wu Ryong's dark moon was behind his actions. Taking advantage of the moment, Mu Wan decided to ask how much the dark moon knows about the fact that near the Jade City, several people became victims of an unknown incident. According to the spy, a few days ago, abnormal people appeared in the city of Gong Min, who lost their minds and became much stronger than an ordinary person. They attacked everyone. The Central Heavenly Alliance and the Broken Fist Clan determined the cause of the madness. It was an unusual type of poison, so they called in the elite members of the Tang Clan. Someone deliberately spread this poison, and the Dark Moon was sure that that stranger was behind the disappearance of people in Unnam Province. At one point, mysterious animals that had previously worked with Chun Ying rushed inside. Mu Wan immediately took his blade from the spy's hands and jumped to a safer distance. Chun Ying regained consciousness and began to feel uneasy that something unpredictable had happened. Seeing the master in front of him, who should be unconscious, the man immediately asked in confusion what was happening. Addressing the hidden moon member by name, Mu Wan suggested that they have a clean talk. The spy's anxiety increased due to the fact that he had been found out. He couldn't remember what happened after he picked up Master Jin's sword. Within a moment, the man was furious that his secrets had been discovered and he had disgraced the hidden moon. He prepared to attack his target and shouted that after killing him, he would commit suicide, because only death would atone for his sins against the organization. In response, Mu Wan began to stretch his hands and asked if the spy was sure that he would not regret this decision. The crazy member of the Hidden Moon shouted that he never regrets what he did, and then rushed to attack. Despite the seriousness of the enemy, Master Jin did not even intend to use his sword and dodged the attacks without any problems. He moved extremely gracefully and did not make any mistakes. The fight could not consist only of avoiding the enemy's weapon, so Mu Wan found the right moment and struck the enemy with an unexpected uppercut with his elbow. After this, Mu Wan decided to demonstrate his superiority in a more impressive manner. He delivered a crushing punch to his opponent's stomach. The end of his combination of punches was a high kick to the poor guy's head. A separate punch sent Chun Ying flying and he crashed loudly into the wall. Seeing this, the animal masters of transformation did not even think of poking their noses into such a dangerous matter. The younger brother Kwok woke up a little later because a black dog began to lick him. When the guy woke up, Mu Wan asked how he was feeling. Kwok Munjong replied that he was fine. He was worried about what happened in their room while he was sleeping at the table. Chun Ying, beaten beyond recognition, 
joined their carefree dialogue and asked Master Jin where a monster like him came from. When he saw that his animals decided to join his goal, he called them traitors. Leaning on his knee, he sighed heavily and said that he could not believe that he was in such a deplorable state. His heart as a spy was destroyed, and he asked the terrifying master to hurry up and finish him off. Feeding the raven named Dancer, Mu Wan replied that he was not going to kill the spy, after which he asked what would happen if the Black Moon found out about what had happened. Although Dark Moon wanted to get more information regarding his identity, Mu Wan replied that he had no desire to know anything about her. He said that he was interested in only one thing, the names of those who were behind the disappearance of people from the merchant troop. Hearing this, Chun Ying asked him to say directly what he wanted. In response, Mu Wan unexpectedly invited the spy to go with him, and said that if he helps, he will allow him to collect information about his identity in the required amount. He proposed to form some kind of alliance until they received from each other what they came to the Jade City for. Meanwhile, General Im So Guan and Mr. Tan saw with their own eyes one of those who had gone mad due to the action of an unknown poison. According to the general, they were able to capture it only with the support of martial artists. Before completely losing his mind, he was able to reveal his identity. As it turned out, it was an informant from the Iron Dozen. They still had not confirmed whether this was the case, so they wanted to know the opinions of the 10,000 Poisons senior master. Taking a closer look, the old man said that this was not a typical case of madness, although the symptoms were similar to rabies. In order to find out more, he needed to look closer, so he asked the general if they could put the man to sleep. The general replied with concern that they had already injected a sedative into the blood of the insane poor fellow, but it had no effect. Hearing this, the old man suggested that if the sedative did not work, then this informant's veins were damaged. Since he had no other option, the man decided to take action and asked General Im to step back a little. For his next actions, he decided to use poison extracted from the blood roots on the southern islands. According to him, it not only reduces bloodthirst, but also slows down a person's brain activity. According to the master of 10,000 poisons, this gas is the highest quality sleeping pill. As expected, as soon as the infected person inhaled the gas, he immediately fell asleep and fell on his back. When the old man entered inside the cage, he asked the general not to approach because he was planning to use his art of poisons. After the first sample, he did not notice any reaction, which meant that the poison that struck the informant of the Iron Dozen was not made from an animal base. The general was surprised by the old man's knowledge and asked how he managed to find out. Mr. Tan replied that the poison he used only reacts with animal-based poisons. As it turned out, the poisons with which he was familiar could be divided into several categories. After the animal base, the man checked for the presence of poison in the flower base. Lastly, there was a test for the presence of mineral-based poison. When using the last specimen, a clear reaction was detected. Watching the actions of the owner of 10,000 poisons, the general was surprised by the incredible abilities of the Tang family. But at one point, the old man became worried that something had gone wrong. The infected man suddenly regained consciousness. As soon as he saw the old man, he immediately grabbed his hands, but Meyer managed to intervene and kicked him in the neck. She was excited by the terrifying power of the maddened man and what he could do to her uncle. Seeing what was happening in the cage, the general immediately ran inside. Mire couldn't do anything to him, so she grabbed him by the neck. She screamed for the monster to stop resisting and let her uncle go immediately. At the same time, the old man urged her to loosen her grip and not kill the infected person. At that tense moment, the general ran inside the cage and, preparing his fist to strike, called on the young mistress to move out of the way. After that, he hit the infected man hard and he flew to the side and let go of Mr. Tan's hands. The worried young lady immediately ran to her uncle to make sure everything was okay with him. Luckily, his bones were not damaged. He came to the conclusion that even if the poor guy was poisoned with a mineral-based poison, his behavior was too strange and raised questions. While the captain held the distraught informant against the wall, Mr. Tan said that the mineral-based poison usually sucks the life out of the person infected with it and slowly kills him. But this one, on the contrary, increases the person's strength and makes him plunge even deeper into the abyss of madness. After some time they saw something very sudden. The infected person no longer showed signs of life. Mr. Tan understood that this was not due to the fact that the general would be very rude. He theorized that it was due to the man's sudden surge of power causing his body to give way. They planned to take his body to another location and conduct a thorough investigation. The poison master wanted to know the origin of this riddle. He warned the general that something incredibly large and certainly dangerous was happening. No one could say for sure what was happening in Unnam province. In the morning, Master Jin and his younger brother went to the market of the Jade City, which, due to recent events and supply problems, looked too empty. Local sellers looked destitute, their work was no longer profitable, and their goods were not as good as before. Mu Wan felt some sympathy for the people who worked here. 
Together with them, a man with a strange mustache was looking for clues. It was a member of the Celestial Rank Squad from the Hidden Moon who had acquired a new appearance through the transformation technique. He was worried that not only had he failed the mission, but he was also forced to travel with his target. He was nervous that if the Dark Moon found out about everything, it would be a shame that simply could not be described in words. Now he understood why the head of Mei Wol Ren called his target an unusual guy. Chun Ying believed that there were not many young martial artists who could become his opponent, because only the Seven Lower Heavens were capable of this. But when he met this guy he realized that he was too self-confident. Noticing Kwok's gaze, the spy became furious and asked him to stop staring at him as if he were a circus monkey. Kwok Minjong apologized and pointed his fingers at the spy and asked if this was his real face. After that, the man changed completely and began to look like some kind of old man. He stated that he could completely transform his appearance, and to prove this, transformed himself into a sumo wrestler. This also applied to his clothing, because using the technique, he could look like a monk with a staff. After finishing his introduction, Chun Ying said that his title was not for show. With a sly look, he declared that he was a master of ten transformations. Kwok was simply delighted and called it incredible. At the same time, Chun Ying felt some tension due to the young master with whom he had to form an alliance. Ever since Mu Wan was able to recognize his first reincarnation, he immediately knew that it was Chun In, and he didn't care what form he was in. The master of transformation found himself in a sticky situation. He came to keep an eye on Master Jin, but ended up becoming his target. He believed that the snow flower, the blade of the young master, who acquired the consciousness of the spy, was to blame for everything. Thoughtful, Mu Wan continued to walk forward. At one point he was distracted from his thoughts and paid attention to a strange feeling. Taking his sword in his hands he wondered why the snowflower was reacting again. Still it was an enchanted sword that no one but him could hold. Master Jin admitted that Chun Ying is a martial artist with whom he should be careful, because he has considerable mental strength. But at the same time, he was surprised by the fact that he was easily captured by the snowflower's aura. The blade made by his hands turned out to be terrifyingly powerful. Ever since they arrived in Unam province, the blade had become more restless, and its chi power had increased significantly. Mu Wan assumed that his sword reacted this way because it was close to the material it was made from. At that moment, the guy thought that it would be nice to visit the lands where the tribe that Mr. Huang was talking about existed. The enchanted chi became more and more powerful, and Master Jin assumed that because of this, he might lose control of the sword. After all this thinking, Mu Wan stopped. Disgruntled spy Chun Ying immediately asked why they stopped after wandering around the market for hours. It turned out that Mu Wan was interested in the items of one of the weapon sellers. Taking a closer look at the weapon, he noticed a good blade, but noticed that it needed to be improved. The seller said that the choice was good, after which he named the price, which seemed too high to the young master. Chun Ying continued to mutter dissatisfiedly under his breath, and said that such an inexperienced slacker could not know anything about swords. Unexpectedly for him, Kwok reported that his older brother had learned blacksmithing, and therefore forged his own sword. Hearing this, the man was simply shocked that such a hated master was able to forge an enchanted sword that absorbed the consciousness of a martial artist like him. Since Master Jin said that it was expensive, the seller decided to manipulate the situation, and said that in this case there was no point in looking at it. Mu Wan accepted his words and said goodbye, wishing him successful trading. But as soon as the master stepped aside, the seller immediately rushed towards him and said that he was ready to sell the blade at half the price. Hearing this offer, Mu Wan said that if he found out where the seller got that sword, then he was willing to pay three times the last price for it. The man was simply shocked by such an offer, but decided to take advantage of the moment and said that several months ago he had visited the black market, where rare weapons became available to the public. Most merchants from the Jade City get things to sell there. After hearing the seller's words, the spy was able to reveal something very unobvious to himself. As it turned out, he knew where that black market was and informed his alliance comrade about it. While Brother Kwok was surprised that Master Jin paid such a large sum for that strange sword, the spy noticed that the blade was unusual for Unum province. Mu Wan agreed with his words and said that it was most likely made somewhere in the northern parts of Honam province. After exploring the market, he noticed that almost all the weapons were from the mainland. It was difficult for merchants to enter Unnam province, so the fact that there were a lot of foreign weapons in this market seemed rather strange to him. Hearing the young master's logical conclusions, the spy admitted that Mu Wan was an amazing person, having been able to figure this out when he was wandering around the market earlier. When Kwok asked why the older brother decided that this was so, Chun Ying intervened in their dialogue and asked the young man to turn on his brain. He asked his opinion what it could mean that weapons from outside appeared in the province of Unam which does not have adequate trade. 
With a smart look and instructive gestures, Chun Ying stated that the local merchants took the weapons from another place, and most likely they belonged to the missing bodyguards and merchants. He explained to the young student that in this case, it was logical to assume that the people responsible for the disappearance of the dealers had taken the weapons and sold them on the black market. Thanks to this campaign, the spy was able to find out that Mu Wan is not only incredibly experienced in martial arts, but also has well-developed intuition. Having learned more details, the guys decided to go look for new clues. Without wasting any time, they headed to the black market of the Jade City. At the same time, regular trading was held on the market. Local sellers presented the weapons and said that the price had not changed, but the new weapon was in excellent condition. The local leader invited interested parties to take a step forward. One of the visitors, wearing a cape that hid his appearance, asked whether the weapon was really of good quality, and then asked where they got it. The manager began to suspect something was wrong, and said that if the buyer was bothered by this, then he did not belong here. In response, the man who was hiding his identity concluded that the weapon was obtained illegally. His words greatly infuriated the leader. After that, the stranger took off the hood from his head and said that he had finally caught them. Seeing this man, the leader shouted to his wards to kill everyone and run away. The fighters began execution and attacked the poor fellows who were not at all involved in the conspiracy. Having destroyed the witnesses, the leader shouted and asked who he was dealing with. The mysterious man opposite him responded by asking if he had ever heard of the oracles from the Broken Fist Clan's reconnaissance squad. Hearing this, the man began to worry. Still, there was a reason for this. The representative of the oracles began to laugh and said that it was not entirely normal to do such things on their territory. Within a moment, the underground traders were surrounded by fighters from the strongest clan in Unnam province. The leader didn't even notice how they appeared here. Within a moment, he tried to escape, but with one movement of his hand, he was stopped. The Broken Fist Intelligence representative sent the black market executive flying. Addressing the defeated enemy, he asked him to stop beating around the bush and asked him to report to him everything he knew. But the leader did not lose hope of escaping. Seeing this attempt, the mad leader of the oracles called upon his fighters to pursue him. The cruel man clarified the order by saying that if the fighters cannot understand who is on their side, then they should kill everyone indiscriminately. All his wards rushed in pursuit without fail. The head of the oracles had no intention of letting anyone go alive. The situation looked like the representatives of the Broken Fist could not distinguish between civilians and martial artists. Mr. Penn, observing this bloody operation, could not understand when they managed to penetrate into the province of Unam and how they dared to plot intrigues on their territory. For them, the situation in which merchants entered Unnam province and lost their own things was not a big problem, but since their reputation was at stake, they could not stand by. Because of this, the Central Heavenly Alliance announced a visit to Unnam province. Mr. Penn called the province a sacred place, which he and his master received after they betrayed the Northern Heavenly Clan. They did their best to keep the alliance away, but now everything began to fall apart. Cho Cheon Wu gave him orders to find out who they were dealing with before the alliance arrived. He wanted to solve the problem himself, even if it meant they would completely destroy the Jade City. The head of the Oracle's pen promised his ruler that he would do everything possible to restore honor to their clan. At the same time, Mu Wan and his comrades arrived on the scene. Everything around them indicated that there had been a battle here and that they had arrived too late. There were both crimson ghosts and civilians here. Mu Wan was simply beside himself with anger when he saw the cruelty that happened here. Without any hesitation, he rushed forward in search of those who were responsible for this tragedy. The spy was immediately confused. He tried to bring the young master to his senses so that they could catch up with the leader of their squad. Meanwhile, in the Azure Hotel where Mr. Tang and his escorts were located, the general was drying his armor and thinking about life. He doubted that he should have followed his master to this terrible province for the sake of the silver scale gloves. Since they settled in the province of Unnam, the master he trusted had changed and became even more cruel beyond recognition. Im So Guang needed time to think, so he silently accepted the order to guard the Tang family on their way to the Jade City. But all this time he was worried about whether he was doing everything right and what his future would be in the clan of the Broken Fist. He was distracted from his thoughts by one of his subordinates. His ward burst into his chambers shouting that several unknown martial arts masters were causing chaos in the Jade City. The general did not understand what was happening, so he asked to be shown the scene of events. When they arrived at the place where the black market was located, the man first of all asked who started all this horror. He gave the order to protect the Tang family, while he himself was going to deal with those who staged the battle in which many civilians died. Seeing what was happening with his own eyes, he shouted that he would never forgive the culprits. At one point, he saw some master killing another person. Using the eight fists of the gods technique, he charged with a shout, calling for the villain to stop immediately. 
After this, the rage-filled fighter used the Silver Dragon's enlightened palm and easily defeated his opponent. The enemy was defeated, General Im. So Guan grabbed the wounded man by the clothes and asked who they were. But after a moment he realized that he had mistook an active member of the Broken Fist clan for the villain. Even the beaten fighter himself tried to justify himself and address the general as a senior comrade. General Im So Guan realized that this was Jan O oh from the Oracle Reconnaissance Squad. He asked furiously what they were doing here. His answer is simply shocking, because killing these people turned out to be the desire of their master. The fighter said that they had finally found those who were behind the problems associated with the reputation of their clan. Therefore, the master ordered the complete destruction of everyone who stood in their way. According to Leader Pen, the enemies disguised themselves as ordinary residents of the Jade City. Filled with rage, they shouted that no matter who their victims were, ordinary citizens or disgusting enemies, they could not kill everyone indiscriminately. According to the wounded Jan O, oh, while they were chasing their enemies, they were suddenly attacked by an old man, and he was helped by a nanny who had a child behind her. Showing his panic, he said that they had no way of figuring out who was who. So that the clan would not suffer anymore, they were ordered to kill everyone. After these words, the general decided to give him a rest and hit him on the head so that he lost consciousness. Now he understood that their actions were due to the incompetence of their superiors. Observing all this horror with his own eyes, General Im So Guan could not even imagine how far the bloodthirsty leader would go, even if all this chaos was his will. As the general approached the scene, several fighters were about to execute another frightened civilian. But at the same moment, they were blown away by a powerful shockwave from an unknown warrior with red key energy. As it turned out, this was done by the owner of the Convincing Spear, the leader of the Bloody Ghosts Nam. He thanked the members of the Broken Fist Clan for creating the chaos and all the conditions for it to continue. At the same time, he dissatisfiedly asked how the fighters of the Broken Fist dared to decide who should live in this prosperous place and who would be expelled to abandoned lands. As expected, the clan fighters sensed a strong aura and incredible strength from their opponent, but none of them had any idea who they were dealing with. The Blood Ghost General declared that he had returned from the lands of death. He was going to show them who the real monster was and was going to tear his enemies to pieces. His intentions were connected with the Order of the Sound Master, who asked him not to hold back and create the greatest chaos, because the harsher he dealt with them, the better it would be for their plan. As Dan Yup wanted, the Bloody Captain began the battle with incredible enthusiasm. Events were gaining momentum, and Mu Wan could not hesitate. Moving forward, the Hidden Moon member was quite worried. It was the first time in his life that he had seen something like this while on the battlefield. In turn, Master Jin understood what a terrible world the Heavenly Alliance had created who sacrificed his father for the sake of their ambitions. A moment later, he met the eyes of the Oracle Squad soldiers. Those cruel killers were surprised that there were survivors among the population. One of them displeasedly asked the Mu Wan Squad how they dared to pull their muzzles out of their holes while the masters of the Broken Fist were working. They were arrogantly going to show all their power in order to clear the city to the very end. The agent of the Dark Moon organization clearly did not expect to see the Oracles here and understood that the amount of information he had obtained was simply inestimably huge. After this, Chun Ying, using telepathy, turned to his comrade and asked him to listen carefully. He said that before them were oracles from the reconnaissance squad of the Broken Fist Clan. According to him, they are a shadowy organization that specializes in collecting information for the Broken Fist Clan. Yet the spy could not say exactly why they killed all the innocent inhabitants in the vicinity of the market. In response, Mu Wan, filled with rage, said that most likely this is due to what a terrible person the leader of their clan is. Considering all the people in the Jade City to be their enemies, the fighters of the Broken Clan began to prepare one of their joint techniques for attack. Taking a closer look, Mu Wan realized that they were using the Fist of a Hundred Days, an ancient technique of the Northern Heavenly Clan that was created when the war with Silent Night was on the brink. Mentally turning to his Uncle Joe, he wondered why killing innocents was not enough for him and he even decided to provide his subordinates with equipment that makes them vulnerable to high-level masters. He didn't know how far they wanted to go, but he was going to stop them before it was too late. As soon as the enemies began to approach, the guy took his blade out of its sheath. The use of his eternal darkness was so powerful that it did not even give any chance for enemies to get closer. Powerful energy did not allow even his comrades who stood behind to stand confidently on their feet. The entire area of the battlefield felt a powerful shaking of the ground from the incredible amount of power. With one swift attack, Mu Wan defeated the three fighters who were carrying out the terrifying order. They didn't even notice how the master defeated them in an instant. Watching this, Kwok realized that he had never seen his older brother so angry. Filled with rage, Mu Wan destroyed all his enemies without a drop of regret. Watching this, 
The Transformation Master couldn't believe that a swordsman of such incredible caliber existed in this world. What worried him most was not his talent with the sword, but the rare aura that he gave off, which certainly could not be called normal. Seeing the terrifying aura of the master he was forced to follow, Chun Ying felt as if the energy alone could tear his soul into pieces. He had not felt such fear for a long time. The mysterious swordsman did not give him peace. This was the first time the younger brother had seen Mu Wan kill someone. He couldn't understand what happened between him and the Broken Fist Clan since he was willing to kill his enemies without a second thought. At the same moment, several more soldiers from the Oracle Squad arrived at the scene. Using the same technique as the previous fighters, he charged with a shout. The comrades standing nearby rushed with him. Without an iota of doubt, Mu Wan got rid of these cruel villains too. Addressing the young master, Chun Ying noted that this was the first time he had seen this side of his older brother. He suggested that Kwok keep his distance and slowly follow their comrade, realizing that such behavior makes him dangerous to everyone. The worried master of transformation feared that the worst could happen, and Master Jin was consumed by the power of his enchanted sword. Addressing his animals, he said that he would follow the master from a distance. He asked them not to lose sight of the swordsman, and warned them that if they felt their lives were threatened, then they should forget about the mission, and immediately flee the battlefield. Approaching the center of events, General Im so Guan began to sense a strange chi, realizing that something terrifying was happening there. At one point, he saw another assassination attempt on the part of the Broken Fist Clan fighters. Approaching him, he shouted to all the oracles that they should immediately stop their cruel and inhumane actions. A fighter named Mac Guan immediately recognized his older comrade. As Master Im approached, he asked what the hell he was doing. In response, the man said that there was nothing to be surprised about, since his sacrifice was a threat to the entire clan. Shocked by what was happening, the general shouted that this was not a reason to torture his enemies. After that, the man silently got rid of the enemy. With an arrogant look, he turned to the elder and stated that he did not understand when his path led to a dead end, because he did not pay attention to his own surroundings. The Oracle Squad member believed that the general was too absorbed in his ideals. After that, he asked why such a righteous person would take part in the betrayal even though he knew that Jin Kuang Ho would never collude with Silent Knight. After these low and pathetic words, he began to show feigned awkwardness due to the fact that he said too much. After that, he rudely stated that their master considered General Im a pain in the ass, so he forced him to be a bodyguard and sent him to this place, which was a premeditated plan. At that moment, General Im realized that Mr. Cho had been trying to get rid of him from the very beginning, and so it was. Within a moment he found himself surrounded by soldiers from the Oracle Squad who were going to get rid of him because he was too righteous. The honest general came to the realization that he had become a hunting dog who was no longer useful to his master. At the same time, while on an abandoned rocky mountain, the head of the oracles named Pen was discussing a plan to build a white pavilion. His ward, who had been skipping dentist appointments, said that the martial artists from the Central Northern Alliance had not yet reached the scene. This was luck for them, because if they had arrived there before them, then their plan would have been in jeopardy. Leader Pen himself understood this, so he said that this was the reason why they had to deal with this incident before the Central Alliance arrived. He was sure that even the slightest mistake could be disastrous for their master. The man thought that now they know who was the reason for the appearance of crazy residents. He believed that once they dealt with that problem, the foundation of their clan would be stronger than ever before. At the same time, he assumed that saving the merchants would make them even stronger. With a terrifyingly malevolent look, he was even grateful to the bloody ghost for coming into their territory and causing a mess. He knew that a crisis could always become an opportunity if you were patient enough. Leaving the scene, he suggested that his deputy take further action. Meanwhile, Mu Wan moved closer to the epicenter of events. At one point, he saw the place where the battle had recently taken place. As soon as he arrived, he noticed some injured Broken Fist Clan fighter sitting alone. As he approached him, he realized that it was General Im So Guan. As it turned out, the man was seriously wounded, but was able to deal with all the traitors who attacked him at the same time. Turning to the wounded general, he heard his heavy and deep breathing. As soon as the man heard his name, he began to look around. He was surprised when he saw Master Jin. At that moment, he no longer doubted that they knew each other, so he assumed that he was the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. Mu Wan looked at him with contempt, because he himself was to blame for what happened to him. In response, Master Jin said that it was indeed him, and to confirm this, he remembered that when he was little, Im So Guan was the one who taught him the basics of martial arts. Hearing this, the mortally wounded man began to remain silent. Gathering his strength together, he said that he was right when he felt this way earlier. With tears in his eyes, he thanked God that the heir of the Northern Clan was still alive. With trembling all over his body, 
he could no longer contain his emotions and began to cry. He admitted that when he heard that the heir was killed, he felt unbearable guilt that a small child who had done nothing wrong was trying to cope with everything alone. He asked the young master's forgiveness for everything that had happened and also begged him to stop the terrible destruction that Cho Jong Wu had planned. He hoped he could figure it out on his own, but he couldn't. Within a moment, he lost consciousness. Mu Wan approached Big Brother Im to check on his condition. As it turned out, Im So Guan died from the severity of his injuries. Mu Wan said goodbye to him as a warrior of the Northern Clan. Everything that happened made his mental pain even stronger. Mu Wan was going to personally deal with those who created all this terrifying chaos. Meanwhile, one of the organizers of the Dark Market was able to escape from the battlefield. He was being pursued by several people from the Oracle Squad. The man understood that they were too careless and therefore the remnants of the bloody ghosts were destroyed. He was sure that their general, Nam Gonmi, was a man of terrifying strength. But he was afraid that he would soon be at a disadvantage. To avoid the failure of the plan, the fighter went to his master in order to report what had happened. As soon as the man entered the master's chambers, he immediately turned to the master of sound with a panicked cry. He told him that they were found even though they tried to act with extreme caution. In addition, he clarified that it is the oracles of the Broken Fist Clan that are hunting their fighters. In response, the Soundmaster said that he was already aware of the situation, after which he apologized for putting the members of the Bloody Ghost in danger due to his ambitions. Hearing his words, the fighter asked the Master not to speak like that, because they all believed that the Master of Sound was the one who saved them and gave them hope. For them, his wishes were law. At the end he shouted that Mr. Guillaume Danyap is the only one who can awaken Silent Night. On behalf of the fighters he said that if their lives could speed up this process even a little, then they were ready to sacrifice everything. But on the other hand, he was afraid that their general might not be able to withstand the battle alone against an entire detachment. He asked the gentleman to leave this place because he believed that it would soon be too dangerous here. The calm Mr. Guillaume replied that Silent Knight is a giant who has lost his strength, which means he has lost both his goal and his will. Therefore he could not leave this place and considered it his true destiny to succeed in the mission even at the cost of his own life. With a terrifying look, he said that they no longer had any reason to run away and so they should prepare. As soon as the Oracle's troops entered the lair of the Bloody Ghosts, they were shocked by an unexpected sight. Behind bars were many merchants and bodyguards who had disappeared earlier. Now it became clear to them that their enemies were kidnapping them in order to turn them into crazy killers. Master Pen understood that their task of rescuing the merchants was becoming more difficult due to the fact that he still had not obtained a medicine that could return the infected to their previous form. He had hoped that this would not be a big problem. But now it became clear that he would have to hurry before the Central Heavenly Alliance arrived. In addition, the leader of the Oracles had a bad feeling. Addressing his charges, he stated that the enemy leader must be nearby, after which he repeated the order that they should not leave anyone alive. As soon as they opened the door to the chambers of the gentleman who commanded the bloody ghosts, they were surprised that such a place could exist. They were shocked by what was inside. It was a huge spherical room inside a cave, on the ceiling of which there was a hole through which moonlight fell on the master himself. The head of the Oracle Squad suggested that the one who is behind all the incidents and the one who is responsible for turning people into madmen is in front of them. Jim Dan Yup did not expect that the head of the Oracles himself would personally come to greet him. But he was not surprised, since he made it clear to them where he was. Afterwards, he congratulated those who had worked hard to reach his lair. Filled with anger, Master Pen asked how he dared to think that he could remain unharmed after what he had done in the territory of the Broken Fist Clan. In response, the cunning Soundmaster asked since when the Unam province became the territory of the Broken Fist Clan. Without any doubt, the cruel Master Pen replied that ten years ago, they gained power here when their clan was created within the province. In response, Guillaume Dan Yup suggested that it was a reward from the Alliance for betraying the legendary Northern Sky Clan. Filled with anger, the leader of the Oracles impatiently asked the enemy to watch his words, after which he threatened to kill him in a brutal manner and make him regret his foolish decisions. In response, the Soundmaster said that he had not given up yet, after which he asked whether his opponent was sure that he had planned all this in order to die just like that. He declared imperiously that he never intended to leave this place. After that, he said that there was a misunderstanding because the members of the Oracle Squad are the ones who never had any rights. When he thought through this plan, he was so afraid that he did not sleep for months, but he continued to bring his idea to life. He had no choice but to do this, or to humbly accept death. The world made them suffer for years, and they did everything they could to repay it in full. So they decided to awaken Silent Night and release it into the outside world. This is how Guillaume Dan Yap saw his fate. Hearing that this mad master was trying to awaken Silent Night, Master Pen was simply shocked. 
After this, the Master of Sound asked whether his dear guests had seen those brutal people who were in the corridors leading to his hall. He said it had been several days since they last ate. After these words, the man announced the beginning of the feast. In the corner of this room was his last charge of the bloody ghosts. The Sound Master nodded to him, which meant that the signal for action had occurred. The soldier nodded in response as a sign that he accepted the order. After this, the soldiers of the Oracle Squad heard the opening of cells and the bestial growl of people who had become crazy after being infected. Addressing the warriors of the Broken Fist doomed to a terrifying battle, Mr. Gayum declared that now they are nothing more than a snack. According to him, he was planning something grander. In fact, Master Jum Dan Yup had planned to serve the main dish, a former member of the Great Four of the Northern Heavens named Zhou Zhang Wu. But this plan had to be postponed since he did not arrive on the battlefield. The Oracle Squad was surrounded by countless brutal bodyguards and merchants. The Soundmaster enjoyed the spectacle and thought that it would be too greedy to witness the destruction of the Oracles and the leader of the Broken Fist Clan at the same time. The intelligence deputy was simply shocked by the situation, because among the distraught people were those who belonged to the ten great trading families. Master Pen replied that they had no choice but to kill everyone, because if they retreated, then the massacre in the Jade City would lose its meaning. Having accepted the order, the deputy turned to his charges and shouted that they must get rid of all the brutal traders and bodyguards. The infected people rushed to attack. The Oracle Squad Masters had no other option but to accept this fight to the death. A terrifying battle began, and the room was filled with screams and bestial growls. Watching this, Master Jin remembered the basic principle of the world of Marim, which sounded like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Looking at the moon through the hole in the ceiling, he thought about the past and the number of lives that had fallen at the hands of the Central Celestial Alliance. He believed that his actions were completely justified and everything would be okay. But after just a moment, the Master of Sound felt the appearance of a terrifying aura. Another person appeared at the entrance to his hall. His incredibly powerful energy began to spread inside, and most of those present felt a trembling that could cause them to lose consciousness. The Snowflower appeared first, and the bloody ghost fighter pierced by this blade began to apologize to his master for not being able to fully carry out the order. Filled with rage, Mu Wan showed his lust for blood. The Sound Master recognized Mr. Jin, but did not think that their meeting would happen so early. Moreover, he felt that his aura was completely different from the past. The fighters of the Broken Fist were excited by his appearance and thought that he was with their enemies. At the same time, Mu Wan was looking around for Mr. Huang. The angry heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was serious, and addressing those present, said that they should not move. Hearing his words, the bold members of the Oracle Squad began to show their pride and asked who he was and how dare he threaten them. But within a moment, they were destroyed with one imperceptible swing of the blade. After this, another daredevil, the deputy head of the Oracles, Mac Gwen, rushed to the attack and shouted that he would be an opponent of a master unfamiliar to him. It was the one who ordered the death of General Im But after a moment, he lost the ability to fight. The man fell to the ground and started screaming. Mr. Pen was simply shocked by what was happening, calling Master Jin crazy. He asked his ward to deal with him. Shouting furiously, the fighter with nice teeth declared that in front of them was the true organizer of the tragedy in Unnam province. Releasing his strength and demonstrating his muscles, he called the young master unknown to them an arrogant idiot who arrogantly dared to attack the Broken Fist clan, thereby bringing death upon himself. He believed that he could teach him a lesson, but after a moment his head flew off his shoulders. Mu Wan reminded them that Murim is a world where people kill each other. Believing that they were the oracles who wanted a bloodbath, the young swordsman, with all seriousness, furiously declared that if that was the case, then they would have to fight him first. Even the Master of Sound, who had previously demonstrated calm under any circumstances, was visibly alarmed. What bothered him was that Master Jin had completely changed and was no longer the same as before. All the soldiers of the Oracle Squad were in despair, because their Captain Yule was killed without even having time to use the techniques of the Thirteen Fists of Death. Master Pen, frightened beyond recognition, could not understand who they were dealing with and how the Broken Fist Clan could have offended him so much. He assumed that he was one of those who belonged to the groups consumed by their hands in order to take control of the Unnam province. Having no other choice, he stated with a trembling voice that they were from the Broken Fist Clan, whose leader was Cho Chen Wu. He couldn't believe that knowing this, the unfamiliar swordsman was going to continue fighting them. He asked the master to tell him his name before doing anything rash. In response, Mu Wan thoughtfully said the name of one of the four pillars of the Northern Clan and wondered if the Broken Fist Clan was as powerful as they say. The confused Mr. Pen did not understand what they could be talking about, since he believed that their strength was undeniable. After this, Mu Wan asked if the Great Clan had to resort to killing the innocent people of Jade City in order to capture their enemies. 
he asked how many had died because of this. At that moment, Master Pen was shocked to realize that the terrifying swordsman was not a member of the group that had brought them unnecessary trouble. He was so frightened by the sudden appearance of such a powerful martial artist that he could not move. At one point, he began to feel a strange feeling as if they had seen each other before. But despite this, he decided to deal with it later, because he should first find a way to survive. Addressing the incredibly powerful swordsman, he declared that for the sake of a great goal they had to commit such a terrible crime, after which he shouted in his defense that they would not have resorted to such measures if not for the action of their enemies. The soundmaster, remaining calm, only said that Mr. Jin was much stronger than he expected. In response, the evil Mu Wan said that he, Mr. Goon, is more cruel than he previously thought. But the master of sound did not agree with his words and said that a person who thinks so is nothing more than an idealist. According to him, using all possible measures to achieve the goal is the basis of Morim's life. He believed that people who are able to survive to the end are the winners, because they can justify their actions. Mu Wan simply took his words as an excuse for the countless innocent lives he had taken. After a short silent pause, Mr. Goon replied that he would not hesitate, and stated that if Master Jin really wanted to put an end to this madness, then it would be better to kill him right now. It would be an honor for him to die at the hands of a man like Mu Wan. With a cold look, he said that he spoke from the heart. But just a moment later, another terrifying master appeared here, and shouted that he would protect Dan Yup no matter what. As expected, it was the captain of the Blood Ghosts, and he managed to survive despite the difficult situation. He apologized for being late, and said that fighting the broken fist fighters took him too long. Mu Wan recognized him, but said the warrior's name incorrectly, which caused him indescribable anger. The situation became even more tense. Master Pen could not believe that the oracles, who were personally trained by his master, were killed in an instant by the captain of a previously unknown detachment. He thought only about how to get out, believing that only his master could cope here. Calling the swordsman from the north a demonic blade, Nam Gumwi said that they had an unsolved matter. He admitted that Master Jin was quite skilled, but stated that he only screwed up because he underestimated his opponent. The man was about to take the enemy seriously, but at the same moment, he noticed that the guy was not following the conversations and was looking at the people in the room. All this time, Mu Wan tried to find Mr. Huan, but since he was unable to do this, he assumed that he was being held in another place. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Nam Gamwi rushed to the attack, being extremely dissatisfied with the enemy's behavior. As expected, Mu Wan easily dodged even such a sudden and powerful attack. After that, the fighter with the spear struck another blow, but Master Jin parried it without any problems with one swing of his blade. Rushing to attack, the captain of the Bloody Ghost tried to find out who he was and why he was standing in their way. While parrying the blow, Mu Wan said that he was only here for his uncle. Mu Wan was inattentive and the enemy caught his leg. The reason for this was the thoughts that made Mu Wan not serious. Throwing the Swordmaster to the ground, the Captain of the Bloody Ghosts shouted that he should find his uncle and get away, since their problems are much more serious than his. Mu Wan managed to stay on his feet and minimize the damage from the attack. Furiously rushing to the attack, Master Nam revealed that their previous generation was overthrown and forced to live out their days in complete poverty, while they were completely different and returned to return the anger and hatred to their enemies. As the terrifying battle continued inside the chamber, the leader of the oracles continued to speak the name of his master in a trembling voice. But after a moment, he felt that his enemy was behind him. The master of sound silently approached him and looked arrogantly at the coward. Repeating the name of his master, he began to grimace, considering the master's behavior pathetic and unworthy. It was disgusting for him to watch someone who destroyed peaceful people, and when he found himself in a difficult situation, he began to cowardly think about escaping. Addressing this terrible man, the Master of Sound declared that they were Silent Knight and had come to the outside world to awaken their former power. The man was simply shocked when he learned that Silent Knight was really on the verge of returning. Noticing the reaction of the pitiful Master, Mr. Goon only confirmed his guesses that Murum had long forgotten about their existence. As soon as the Master of Sound began to play his instrument, the man felt incredible pressure. He decided to run away. It was already too late. The power of sound technology destroyed not only him, but also the brutalized people and the rest of the oracles. Not far away, Mu Wan also felt this tension. He realized that Guillaume Dan Yup was using the cave to amplify the frequency of sound. Feeling incredible pressure, this was the first time he had encountered such madness. Mu Wan decided to hurry up and use the Thousand Shadows to close his key circulation areas in the body. But the captain of the Bloody Ghosts did not let him relax and continued his ferocious attacks with a spear. Taking a closer look at the enemy, Master Jin noticed that Nam Gongmi had become stronger than before. He was surprised that sound attacks had no effect on him. Taking a closer look at his opponent, he recognized that he was a fighter with incredible skill. 
Before him was a new generation of Silent Night, which was engaged in the return of their powers. The mention of Silent Night reminded him of Eun Ha Seol. The pressure from sound technicians became even greater. These attacks were aimed at the young master. Their destructive power was so incredible that the cave could not withstand the pressure. In addition, Nam Ginmi did not stop attacking and was as serious as possible as he resorted to using his strongest techniques. Mu Wan was a little annoyed that he had to fight two inconvenient opponents. He understood that the longer this went on, the worse it would be for him. The situation was serious and the guy decided not to hold back in order to finish everything quickly. Within a moment, he disappeared from the enemy's field of view and found himself right behind him. Using the fifth right of the Shadow Blade of the End, Mu Wan performed a blood dance, which turned out to be multiple lightning attacks that caused horrific damage to his enemy. Seeing the fall of his close comrade, the Soundmaster was simply shocked. Continuing to use his sound technique, he furiously shouted the name of the Blood Ghost Captain. Within a moment, the swordsman from the north began to close the distance incredibly quickly. Worried by his strength, Mr. Gon decided to dodge the attack and tried to jump back, but something very unexpected happened that he could not predict. He could not move because the captain of the Oracle's pen, lying at his feet, grabbed his clothes with all his might. Moments before colliding with the enemy's blade, he thought that this was an end he could not predict. But at that moment he was not destined to die. His wounded faithful comrade, Captain Nam Ganmi, was exposed to Master Jin's blow. When the death of the Master of Sound from the demonic blade was inevitable, his comrade lay unable to even move. As he watched the battle, he realized that Master Jin had cut the nerves of his body and because of this, he could barely move a finger. But even so, despite the trembling he resisted, he could not allow the death of the person he loved most. Gathering his remaining strength, he rushed to the defense of his comrade, who had become his master. In the past, they had to live in a wasteland where there was no happiness or joy. When Gyun was a child, he was hated by the other children, because the adults gave him most of the food. Among all of them, there was only one guy who came to his aid, and that was Nam. Running up to his comrade once again, he wanted to find out if everything was okay with him, but GYN, as usual, lied that he was safe. Raising the beaten guy from the ground, Nam did not understand why such a strong warrior allowed himself to be beaten every time. Because of this, it was difficult for the future captain to understand how this child would become their hope if he continued to behave like this. But Goon thought there was nothing wrong with it since they were all angry about the situation. The smiling guy did not worry for his life, knowing that Ganmi was always there and would protect him from threats. At that time, such an appeal to a future captain was rare. He was confused by this treatment and tried to talk his way out of it. Still, he believed that Gaon should behave more courageously, because in this case, he would stop being bullied. In response, Gaon asked his comrade for his opinion regarding why the elders cannot leave the place that only causes them problems. Nam reminded him of the words of his elders that as soon as they leave here, evil people will immediately kill them. Despite his age, Gyun was already asking quite adult questions about hunger and lack of medicine. He asked his friend why no one is trying to change their lives, despite the fact that now it is even difficult for them to live until the next day. Looking up at the sky, he didn't understand why he was considered hope and the future. But he could tell for sure that they all needed a chance to live this life profitably. Even then, he planned to awaken their people, who had plunged into the abyss of despair. He believed that the meaning of his existence was to pull Silent Night into the outside world. Upon hearing this, Nam admitted that he had no idea what he was talking about. But still he began to rejoice and laugh, stating that Dan Yop should focus on the mission while his brother will always protect him. As Captain Nam had said in the past, he kept his promise. Mu Wan was about to destroy his opponent with one blow, but Gimwe exposed himself to the attack. Within a moment, shocked by what had happened, Mr. Goon moved to the side, avoiding his opponent's attack. After that, the man, filled with rage, grabbed his musical instrument as tightly as ever. With great anger and a sense of sorrow, he used the sonic attack for the last time, because after it the instrument was destroyed. The incredible force of the attack threw the northern swordsman away, and Gaon himself returned to his dear comrade, who was on the verge of death. Nam Gimwe said that he just wanted Dan Yop to smile until the very end. Addressing his comrade for the last time, he asked him to smile and not make a face sad with grief. His spear was left without an owner. It stood alone on the battlefield. Saying goodbye to his comrade, Mr. Gyun thanked him for everything he had done for him. Mu Wan has already returned and said that the despair he feels from losing his loved one is the result of his stupid plan. He asked him to think about the fact that while they were talking, hundreds of people were experiencing these emotions. He asked to say what was the point of turning them into madmen. Despite the sadness of the situation, Master Gyun agreed with the words of his worst enemy, believing that he too should know what the consequences of his actions were. 
At one point he suddenly suggested that Master Jin's sword art was a collection of ten thousand shadows. Noticing the young swordsman's surprise, he took this as an answer and said that his master had once mentioned this. The master of sound said that when his student sees the user of this art, he will feel as if a strange darkness is slowly enveloping everything around him, and the soul will feel as if it is being torn into pieces. This was exactly what Mr. Gion himself felt and saw live. Realizing the situation, he said that rumors could not be trusted, because now standing in front of him was Jin Mu Wan, the heir to the Wall of the North, the master who died ten years ago. Mu Wan replied that this was true, after which he suggested that he had the honor of fighting someone who could compete with the strength of the Four Lords of Silent Night. He said that Gyun is the heir of the Thousand Sounds of Death. His assumption turned out to be correct, and Gyun Dapyong was indeed a follower of the Master of a Thousand Sounds of Death. Now this title belonged to him. Now he began to see how everything made sense. Using his next technique of playing the flute, he connected events. He understood that the sudden appearance of the mysterious martial artist was due to the fact that he was the head of the fifth generation of the Northern Heavenly Clan. Cutting through the enemy's sound attacks, Mu Wan rushed to the attack again. He struck incredibly quickly, but his opponent managed to escape. While chasing the sound master, Master Jin was incredibly focused. He asked the enemy where else he was keeping prisoners. In response, the master of a thousand sounds of death remembered that when he heard that the heir of the Northern Clan was killed, he felt nothing but despair in his heart. Gyun believed that due to the disappearance of their arch enemy, Silent Night would be forgotten forever. They were slowly withering away in the lands forgotten by heaven, and he despised their inaction towards what was happening in the world. While he shared his memories, Mu Wan continued to evade enemy attacks. Dodging another attack, he suddenly appeared behind the enemy and aimed his blow at him, but the skilled soundmaster was able to dodge this attack. Turning to his opponent, Mu Wan wanted to know why he was doing all this. He didn't believe that Gyun wanted the world to remember him as someone who brought them pain because of his hard life. In response, Gyun said that there is something more complex in this world than the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan can imagine. He stated that the world is not so simple as to look only at actions and their consequences. In this case, Mu Wan decided to assume that this had something to do with the Four Lords from Silent Night. Hearing such words from the heir of the Northern Clan, the surprised Gun asked how much he knew. Mu Wan asked him a question regarding whether they were alive or not. Creating incredible pressure with his flute performance, the Soundmaster replied that all the overlords were still alive, but had been doing their own thing for a long time. While defending himself from enemy attacks, Mu Wan realized that if he was telling the truth, then Ha Seol was safe. Continuing the battle and dodging the enemy's attacks, Gyun noted that it was funny that the world believed that Silent Night and the Northern Sky Clan were completely destroyed, without even imagining that their descendants were fighting at the same moment. After a moment, he reminded his opponent that he was looking for his uncle. He apologized to him in advance if it turned out that he had turned into one of the crazy people. Unfortunately, he could not help in this case. In fact, the Soundmaster was hoping that Mr. Jin would ensure the grand finale of the plan that he had prepared especially for the Central Heavenly Alliance. But as it turned out, everything had gone too far. After that, he finished his preparations and used the destructive sound of the falling end. A powerful blast wave destroyed everything around, but the Master of Sound could not see where the swordsman of the Northern Clan had gone. As it turned out, Mu Wan ran upstairs, preparing for a retaliatory attack. Master Jin, with a serious look, asked one last time where the rest of the prisoners were. In response, Mr. Goon suggested using force to find out the details that interested him. After these words, he again used an incredibly destructive sound technique, from which the cave began to collapse before our eyes. The ceiling began to collapse, but Mu Wan managed to dodge this attack. The Demon Blade Master was heading to the side. He avoided all subsequent devastating attacks from his opponent, moving even faster than his opponent could notice. While avoiding the enemy's attack, he remembered the words that the destructive sound of the falling end is one of the strongest techniques in the art of sound. Because during the Northern Clan War and Silent Night, there was a rumor that this technique was used to destroy countless people. Under incredible pressure, Mu Wan had no doubt that this was the truth. But despite the terrifying danger, he was going to end everything with one blow. At one point, Mr. Gyun felt a sharp pain and realized that he had used too much chi energy in a short time. Meanwhile, his opponent had already descended to the surface. Mu Wan continued to close the distance to strike while simultaneously dodging sound attacks. He was furious that his opponent was not going to admit to him where the other innocent people were. Approaching the enemy, Mu Wan was ready to strike a crushing blow. Continuing to play the flute, Mr. Gyun began to create defensive techniques and noticed that Mr. Jin was demonstrating quite impressive skills. As soon as Mu Wan struck with his blade imbued with eternal darkness, his opponent began to use a sound defense technique. Despite his efforts, Master Jin made every effort to ensure that the blow reached its target. Sighing heavily, 
Master Jin looked at the huge cut in the rock where his opponent should have been after receiving a powerful blow. But as it turned out, the Sound Master managed to avoid the full impact of the attack, although he was hurt. Mr. Gundin Yup said that he had previously heard that the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan had never studied any martial arts and was always lazing around. But after fighting with Master Jin, he realized that their clan had not lost its monstrous power. Returning to the center of the cave, he noticed that if he had been even a little slower, he would have left this world long ago. He was surprised that Mr. Jin managed to hide such power from the whole world. He felt that their fate was somewhat similar, but within a moment, Mu Wan managed to rush past him and strike with lightning speed. A moment after the impact, the rock on which the Sound Master stood was destroyed into small pieces, and Mr. Giyun's body itself was seriously injured by cuts. Mu Wan did not relax until the very end. Maintaining his concentration on his opponent, Mu Wan said with a fearsome gaze that the Sound Master should not relax during the fight. Approaching the heavily wounded enemy, Mu Wan said that the Northern Heavenly Clan was created because Silent Knight was the first to attack and plunder the mainland. But at the same time, in a quiet and weakened voice, Mr. Goon replied that this was not true. After many decades of bloody war, Silent Knight was defeated. Mu Wan did not understand what was unfair about this. He wondered what kind of warning the heir to mastery of sound was trying to send to the Central Celestial Alliance. Not knowing all the details and how far Silent Knight would go, Mu Wan asked his honest opponent if war was really the only way to resolve their conflict. While the Master of Sound tried to get up despite the trembling in his body, Jin asked why he needed all these innocent victims. Addressing the enemy, Mr. Gyun Din Yap said that Master Jin was probably tired too. He tried to stall for time and told the young master that they were not different at all but you should understand that there is more hidden in this world than meets the eye. Despite the trembling in his body and the low amount of chi reserves, the Sound Master did not stop trying to continue the battle. At the same time, he said that the heir of the Northern Clan is probably interested in what is actually true. But after a moment he shouted that he did not receive answers due to the fact that his plan was not yet completed. He stated that Mr. Jin was not part of it at first, but he was inspired by the fact that the appearance of such an opponent was an addition to the plan allowing him to gain a more perfect form. But the moment he finished his nonsense and decided to carry out the final attack, his weapon was destroyed in an instant. Although the battle was difficult, Mu Wan did not lose his speed and was able to carry out another lightning attack. After that, he decided to return to the words about whether he was tired during the battle. Mu Wan said that at that moment when he was drowning in despair and suffering, there was only one person who supported him. Naturally, he spoke to Mr. Huan, who was taken from him by the Master of Sound and his charges from the squad of bloody ghosts. Finding himself unarmed and powerless against his opponent, Mr. Goon said that he still doesn't know what Master Jin's uncle looks like. He was surprised by the cruelty of fate, because by some miracle Mr. Huang was drawn into his plan. Having thoroughly enjoyed the battle, he invited his enemy to put an end to this performance. Hearing his words, Mu Wan felt some anger knowing that his enemy was going to remain silent until the end. Out of respect for his enemy, Master Jin used his technique to fulfill his last request. Having finished what he started, he said that if there was even the slightest chance that Mr. Huang would end up in a brutal state, then he would never forgive the heir to the Master of Sound. As soon as Mu Wan sheathed his demonic blade, the technique came into action. A huge number of cuts of eternal darkness formed around them. Looking back, Mu Wan was convinced that it was all over. The battle with the heir of the Quiet Knight was not an easy task. But as it turned out, even though Master Jin used one of the techniques, Jun could still breathe and move. Despite the trembling in his body and the lack of feelings, the Master of Sound moved towards the enemy. As soon as he got close, he gently punched him in the face, demonstrating his strength of will. He called Mr. Jin peerless and acknowledged the awesome power of the Northern Heavenly Clan. In response, the vile Mu One hit him on the leg so that he would finally end his resistance. He could not accept his enemy's senseless attempts. But Gaon, who was lying on the ground, continued to try to get up. Looking at his opponent, Dan Yup was surprised that his facial expression spoke of pity for the enemy. He asked not to think that their deaths were useless. Gyun believed that this was a small price that they had to pay in order to achieve a great goal. As it turned out, he got what he wanted, because his ultimate goal was his own death. Pan Yup stated that it was grandiose, after which he added that the fate of Silent Night and the Northern Sky Clan was sealed. All this was because it was a quiet night to wake up after his death. That is why he had no regrets and instead of hatred, he only thanked Mr. Jin for his actions. He planned to end things by fighting the former member of the Great Four of the Northern Heavens, but a more suitable opponent appeared before him, the new head of the Northern Heavenly Clan. With the appearance of Master Jin, his plan became even more perfect, so he could not answer the question. 
but continued to provoke in order to prevent the battle from ending prematurely. Gaon apologized for the fact that the uncle of the heir of the enemy clan became part of his plan, and then named the place. With his last words he said that there are many more merchants and bodyguards on the Mountain of Sorrow, and they are all their prisoners. He sincerely hoped that Mu Wan would actually find his uncle. After these words, Gyun Dun Yup met his end. Mu Wan wondered what the last thing his enemy told him was. Within a moment, he felt unexpected weakness and sat down. This was due to the fact that he had used up too much internal energy in the battle. He felt unbearable pain, which only became stronger. At that moment, he remembered the divine pills that Mr. Tang had given him. According to the old man, they produce an immediate effect and can become an antidote, as well as extend life by ten years. Mu Wan took the miracle medicine without delay. After that, he decided to look at his enemy one last time. He was surprised that the master of a thousand sounds was so similar to him, believing that the so-called ideal was more valuable than his own life. But Master Jin believed that in fact, by trying to achieve something, coming up with a terrible plan, he only brought himself to a terrible end. Within a moment, a terrifying shadow of a man with a spear appeared. She was very close and Mu Wan felt it too late. He couldn't even move from the incredible pressure he felt being next to such a terrifying warrior. It seemed to him that fighting such a person would inevitably kill him. At one point, Master Jin realized with horror who he was dealing with. A long black cloak that resembles the wing of a large bat was a well-known attribute of one of the most terrifying enemies, as well as a silver spear with the seal of ghosts engraved on it. Looking at the face, he also saw a pale glow in the eyes, which could frighten anyone upon whom their gaze fell. Master Jin guessed that this was one of those he had previously heard of, namely a member of the four demonic lords of Silent Night. The name of this fearsome warrior is the Spear of Black Wings. Even though Mu Wan had taken the Silver Scarlet Sacred Pills, he had no chance against such an enemy. Before him was a truly legendary figure. Addressing the heir to the Silent Knight organization, the Spearmaster apologized to him for being late. He remembered that Dan Yup was considered the hope of their organization. He was an amazing child who shone brightly like a star. He could not imagine that such uniqueness would put the Master of Sound in such a position. Lifting his body in his arms, he sadly said that Dan Yop knew the truth of the world at such a young age, but still said that he wanted to bring them into the light, yet his method of waking up the rest of the quiet night brought about death. After that, the terrifying master looked at Jin Mu Wan and said that he was surprisingly still alive. Feeling incredible pressure, Mu Wan asked in surprise how he knew who he was. The spearmaster replied that he simply could not help but recognize the sworn enemy of their organization, the young tiger of the Northern Heavenly Clan. He reiterated that Dan Yup was the figure of the quiet night that shone brightly even in the darkest days of their lives. Taking the spear in his hands, he said that since their light had gone out, those who had been in darkness for so long would have no choice but to seek the light outside. After these words, he launched a lightning-fast strike towards the young master. The enemy was too fast. Master Jin could hardly escape from his attack. But within a moment, the enemy's spear was aimed at his heart. Mu Wan was shocked because he believed that he was out of range of the enemy and not within the radius of a possible spear attack. A powerful blow sent him flying, during which he destroyed all the stones in his path with his body. As it turned out, he only miraculously managed to survive such an attack. He was protected by an item given by the daughter of the Tang family. It was previously speculated that he would use it to access the Heavenly Alliance buildings, including the Broken Fist Clan. As he retreated, the Jade Amulet was able to block the terrifying attack. If it weren't for him, Mu Wan would already be dead. As soon as Mu Wan rose to his feet and began to draw his blade, he assumed that his enemy could extend the spear because its attack radius was too large. He couldn't deny the fact that the ghost spear's nickname was true. Meanwhile, Chun Ying was already watching them. He was shocked the moment he saw one of the legendary demonic lords of the Quiet Night, known as the Black Wing Spear. Moreover, he now knew that Master Jin was the last heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, which meant that the revival of the Northern Heavenly Clan and Silent Night was happening before his eyes. He was horrified by the realization that he was witnessing the beginning of a great war. Meanwhile, in one of the taverns of the Jade City, attempts continued to cure one of the infected people. Mr. Tan was able to reduce the effects of the poison, but needed more time to figure out what he was dealing with. His niece was next to him. Mirai tried in every way to help him. She wondered if her uncle was able to find out what turns people crazy. The man replied that he assumed that the poison, which was formed from simple substances, was to blame. In his opinion, whoever created this poison is an extraordinary genius. The more important thing was to find an antidote, but again, this took time. At one point visitors came to them, the bodyguard tried to stop them, but as it turned out, they were representatives of the Central Heavenly Alliance. Looking around, Mr. Tan and his niece were surprised that those guys appeared so early. The men in white cloaks were indeed a detachment from the government. Seeing them, Mr. Tang immediately went out to meet them. 
The man held out a letter and introduced himself as Chok Mu, a member of the Central Heavenly Alliance Investigation Bureau. In his hands was confirmation from his older brother named Quan Da Xiong. While reading the letter, Mr. Tan remembered that Mr. Quan was very busy, as he had to manage the Nine Heavens alone while they were away from their posts. After that, the Bureau representative said that from the moment they arrived, all issues related to the situation were taken under their complete control, so the presence of representatives of the Tang family did not make sense. The Master of Ten Thousand Poisons was surprised, because he believed that the Heavenly Alliance asked them to investigate this incident. In addition, he was surprised that the Bureau was going to take over everything, even though they had only recently arrived and did not know the whole situation. In response, Chuck Mu admitted that in fact they had arrived in Unnam province a long time ago. He apologized for being forced to withhold information. All Bureau fighters remained undercover and conducted an investigation, but after seeing the cruelty of one of the clans, they took action. Mr. Tang did not understand why, in this case, they did not appear earlier, while his niece asked to clarify what exactly the terrible cruelty was on the part of the Broken Fist clan. The Bureau representative realized that they did not yet know what was happening outside, so he replied that they would soon see it for themselves. Moreover, he said that with the appearance of the famous poison master from the Tang family, those behind all this began to worry, which forced them to speed up. The Alliance wanted Mr. Tan to steal the spotlight while the Investigation Bureau continued to gather information. The 10,000 Poison Master was shocked by the audacity of the Central Heavenly Alliance to use them as bait. In response, Chok Mu apologized for their behavior, but clarified that only because of this, their actions were not discovered, and they were able to calmly collect information regarding the crazy. He stated that the Alliance will be in their debt and they will not forget it. The situation was quite complicated. So the man with the incredible chin asked the Tang family to put aside personal feelings. He also asked them to leave all their investigation materials and research results, so that the Alliance could save time to solve the problem. Holding his descendant in his hands, the Spearmaster raised his weapon high before the next blow. An aura of a beast appeared above the spear raised high, describing the incredible power of its strength. Within a moment he aimed a blow at the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. The crushing power destroyed everything in its path. Mu Wan realized that he could not dodge, so he prepared to parry the blow. With the help of Eternal Darkness, he managed to protect himself from being hit over a huge area. A moment later he was behind him, and said that with the death of the young Master of Sound, the quiet knight that had been sleeping for many years would finally awaken, and the whole world would once again plunge into the abyss of chaos. After these words, the legendary warrior with a terrifying silver gaze dealt another crushing blow. His technique was again accompanied by the appearance of a terrifying aura that was about to swallow his enemy. Mu Wan did not have time to escape or repel the attack, so he defended himself as best he could and covered himself with a sword. Powerful enemy energy threw him aside, destroying everything in its path. As soon as the ardor set in, Mu Wan, while in flight, realized that he would not be allowed to relax in battle. The enemy, possessing incredible speed, had already caught up with him and was ready to strike a blow that was impossible to dodge. Mu Wan did not give up and decided to ignore the restrictions on the use of key energy, because in this battle his life was in danger. The legendary warrior was surprised that his opponent continued to resist and even demonstrated such terrifying skills despite his young age. The Northern Heavenly Clan swordsman released a huge amount of chi, and using the Eternal Darkness technique, created enough energy to delay the enemy's attack. The expanding spear aimed at the swordsman, exhausted from heavy fighting. The clash of powers between the two monsters caused an incredible explosion. Surprisingly, the Spear Warrior decided not to finish off his opponent, but only said that the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan should witness their actions. Before losing consciousness, Master Jin heard that this war would be the price that Silent Knight would exact on him and the mainland for what happened to their organization. The cave turned into ruin, and Chun Ying, wandering through the stones, was finally able to find a snowflower, the blade of the heir of the Northern Clan. A moment later, the hand of a seriously wounded master broke through the stones. Thanks to his comrades, Mu Wan was saved and he was sent to the infirmary where he began his treatment. When he woke up, he thought about the words he heard from the mysterious and experienced people he met after returning to Morim. They talked about a large and mysterious world that Master Jin still did not understand. It was still a mystery to the guy what the world in which he lived was like. Additionally, as a result of his battle with the Sound Master, the plan to bring the Silent Knight organization back into the light was realized. Master Jin was able to learn firsthand that the four demon lords were still alive. In his twenty years of life, he had already seen with his own eyes the strength of two of them. All these events told him that Yun Ha Sol, so dear to him, was still safe. The recent meeting with members of the Northern Heavenly Clan, whom he had not seen for over ten years, also served as a lesson for him. 
he managed to learn from his lips that hatred breeds even greater hatred. Based on this logic, he understood that from the moment he returned to Murim, he himself became part of this cruelty. He had to take the lives of other people, even though they were villains. All this cruelty made him smell blood, which he considered disgusting. Master Jin has finally entered the real world of Murim. He hated to admit that this was his fate as the sole heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. After these thoughts, he noticed the presence of the aura of his blade, the Snowflower. At that moment, he remembered the words of the blacksmith about the weapons of the gods, which were made from the will and desires of the blacksmith. Recent events and emotional instability only confirmed the old man's words that if the master made a mistake, the demonic blade would swallow him whole as soon as it sensed the weakness of its owner. Mu Wan was planning to go in search of Mr. Huang as quickly as possible. He had spent too much time looking for clues, but now he knew that it was about the mysterious Mountain of Sorrow, in which the Cave of Despair is located. Although the name of that place seemed like some kind of metaphor, Mu Wan had not thought about it yet, because all that was in his head was the hope that Mr. Huang was still safe and could be saved. Then a girl with pigtails came to him and in a pleasant voice asked the master how he was feeling. Mu Wan didn't answer and just looked at her awkward behavior. She said that the master fainted on the street, so she brought him to the infirmary. But in response, Master Jin still stared and remained silent, making her think that something was wrong with her. Then the guy asked what the hell Chun Ying was doing. The Master of Disguise was a little furious that he had been seen through once again. The moment the Spear Lord struck his final blow, the entire battlefield turned into chaos and the spy was caught in a blizzard of dust. He understood that finding the injured Mr. Jin was the most important task. Heading towards the destroyed hall of the Sound Master, Chun Ying asked his animals to drag Quok behind him. His crow dancer had already noticed the place where Master Jin was located. The crow led the Master of Transformation to the place where the Snowflower, the blade of the swordsman from the north, was located. Once safe, Mu Wan thanked his savior for helping him survive. Hastily grabbing a chair, Chun Ying replied that he did not need thanks, because his target turned out to be a more significant figure than the Dark Moon organization thought. Because of this, all the information he collected regarding Master Jin was useless. Therefore, the man displeasedly said that he needed to reinvestigate. He insisted that it was only because of this that he had no choice but to save the swordsman's ass from trouble. In fact, he was quite alarmed by what he saw. Master Jin, who continued to amaze him with his incredible skills, fought and survived a battle against one of the great demonic lords called Black Wing Spear. Still, he did not understand how the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was able to pass off false information about his death as the absolute truth, which the entire world of Murum still believes in. The spy suspected that someone was secretly helping him. Assuming this, Chun Ying had no doubt that this could be true, because due to the status of this swordsman and the fame of his clan, it was possible. The spy was forced to start all over again, and the first thing he decided to do was investigate the people who surrounded the swordsman. He understood that Dark Moon would undoubtedly want to be the only organization that knew that the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was still alive. But due to the recent bloodbath in the Jade City and the conflict with the Broken Fist and the representatives of the Quiet Knight, all this will be impossible to hide. Chun Ying even assumed that the fact that the young man had dealt with such a serious incident alone might already be spreading. In this case, the Central Heavenly Alliance will soon learn about the existence of the Master, who is the heir and leader of the clan so hated by them. And in this case, the head of the Dark Moon Division, Mei Wol Rin, will no longer be able to change anything. The matter was so serious that Chun Ying thought that he should report everything directly to the leader of their organization. Until then, he was forced to stay with the leader of the fifth generation of the Northern Clan, and also find evidence that all this was true. The appearance of a quiet night was no less alarming news. His head was already pounding from all this responsibility. While Mu Wan and Chun In were sitting in silence, a noisy quack rushed in and first of all said that he had mended his older brother's clothes. With a smile on his face, he said that he remembered that these clothes were a precious gift from Mr. Huang. Such a pleasant gift made Mu Wan even a little confused, and sincerely thanked his younger brother. Taking a closer look at the young swordsman, Chun Ying thought about the pressing issue. He wondered whether the northern swordsman would become a terrible disaster, or a light that would lead this world. Meanwhile, the male bird with a letter in its paws was already striving for its mysterious owner. A man with two swords on his back, who was in the territory of the Central Heavenly Alliance, dozed while sitting on a chair. The arrival of the bird brought him to his senses. The mysterious master with long black hair, mustache and beard yawned after a nap. A letter arrived to him from the province of Unam, which he was eagerly awaiting. While taking the letter, he remembered that Masters Chokmu and Hei Dong were sent to that zone. As he read the news, he learned of horrifying, world-changing events. The last time this master saw the incident with the appearance of the knight with his own eyes was about ten years ago, but all the information was classified. 
He also had information that a few months ago in the region ruled by the monastery, countless first-generation followers and their elder brother, Mu Guan, were defeated. According to witnesses, the person responsible used an unknown sword-fighting style. Then, to save the Tang family, he fought the bloody ghosts and won a stunning victory. The report stated that the one who dealt with the problems of the reappearance of the Quiet Knight and the destruction in the Jade City was none other than the young swordsman from the north. Mention of the Northern Blade appeared several times in reports. The next report only said that this information was not rumors. The master who received the letter said out loud that his assumptions turned out to be correct. He thought that the man who would change the world had finally returned. This master was a loyal follower of the Northern Heavenly Clan, Seo Musan. With a determined look in his eyes, he concluded that his master had already made his move. Meanwhile, one of the most terrible enemies of the world, Murum, the Lord of the Spear, was returning home through the deserted wasteland. In his arms, he carried the body of the Soundmaster who was the light of their organization. Remembering his recent meeting with the heir of the Northern Clan, he recognized his power, despite such a young age. A few days later, a detachment of the Iron Dozen, along with the bodyguards of the White Dragon Merchant Troop, arrived at one of the taverns of the Jade City. Mu Wan finally recovered and was able to leave the room. Having looked around, the brothers were surprised by the unexpected guests of the Forgotten Hotel. The leader of the Iron Dozen squad greeted his comrades and said that he didn't even know that they also lived here. Despite his respectable status, the man began to fool around, saying with a crazy smile that fate had brought them together again. The leader's behavior put his deputies in an awkward position, and they thought about how not to die of shame. Captain Can and his mistress were also here. Strange behavior and excessive attention from hotel visitors did not allow the master to clearly understand what was wrong. Everything became clear after those present began to talk about how Master Jin was much more impressive than they thought. While he was undergoing treatment, he gained quite a lot of fame. Mu Wan didn't understand what he was talking about, so he asked about fame. Leader Yon was surprised that the youth still didn't know this. Pointing his finger at the guy, he said that he had now acquired the nickname of the Northern Blade. What was on everyone's lips was that there was finally a new rising star. Yet the Dark Moon Spy's worst guesses turned out to be true. Information about the recent incident spread too quickly and he could only guess how far the news of the appearance of the Master from the North had reached. Looking at the big, muscular Master, Chun Ying had no doubt that this was the head of the Iron Squad, a famous group of mercenaries. Since Yang Musan already knew about this, the spy guessed that in this case, the Central Heavenly Alliance also knew something. True, he doubted that information regarding the likelihood of the appearance of an heir had time to reach them. Leader Yang no longer paid attention to formalities and greeted his young comrade in a friendly manner. Mu Wan first asked if they were able to get what they wanted from the Broken Fist clan. Grimacing, the leader answered displeasedly that due to the chaos caused by that clan, they were practically driven out of their territory, and they could not find out anything. A few days after Master Jin left, they were about to finish the meeting, but the Central Heavenly Alliance Investigation Bureau suddenly appeared. They then learned that the incident in the Jade City was the work of the clan. Additionally, Leader Yan shared his opinion that things would get even more complicated later. Analyzing the situation, the spy Chun Ying decided that since Leader Yang was unable to get help from the Broken Fist Clan to deal with his problems, he decided to quickly defect to the other side and came to the Northern Blade. The Master of Transformation recognized the cunning of the leader of the Iron Squad, realizing that for them there was nothing more important than the final result. However, Mu Wan himself also understood what would be discussed. Meanwhile, the second representative from the Investigation Bureau was inside the Broken Fist Palace, complaining that the room was too hot. Although he was a man in body, compared to the clan leader, he looked like a child. The huge master with a terrifying aura wanted to make sure whether the Order of the Heavenly Alliance was really the inaction on the part of the Broken Fist clan. Haidong replied that he didn't say anything like that. He tried to maintain subordination and asked the leader to relax. According to him, the number of people who died in the Jade City is more than 300. Addressing the leader of the Broken Fist clan, he directly said that they had crossed the border subjugating the entire province of Unnam. He dared to say that greed never brought anyone any good. In response, Cho Chian Wu stated that their actions deserved reward, because by doing so, they were able to reveal the truth about the Quiet Knight. But as it turned out, Ten Heavens had a different opinion. Raising his index finger instructively, he addressed the leader of the Broken Fist Clan and declared that brute force alone cannot be used in politics. According to him, overdoing it leads to inevitable destruction. Hearing the speech of the representative of the Central Heavenly Alliance Investigation Bureau, Leader Cho was beside himself with rage. He could hardly contain himself as the power and influence he had spent decades trying to gain disappeared overnight. 
Due to the recent failed plan, he felt shame as his clan's strength was reduced by half. He was furious that his boastful charge ping was the cause of such a high-profile fall for the Broken Fist clan. The useless ward assured him that he would sort out all the minor problems himself. But in the end, he made a mistake and led them into a difficult situation. He had to look up high to notice where the lords of the world of Murim, known as the Nine Heavens, were located. Leader Cho, with great greed and immeasurable ambitions, did not understand what more he needed to do to reach such heights. The fat but reasonable representative thought about how this even happened. In fact, he guessed about a similar outcome. Recently, the Broken Fist has relied too much on strength and has stopped being afraid of the Heavenly Alliance. He believed that this was not so bad for their government, since now they had the opportunity to further control one of the troublesome Great Four of the Northern Heavens. Cho Chan Wu understood that his situation was difficult, so he decided not to hesitate and asked what task he would be given. In response, Hei Dong asked him to forget about the Broken Fist Clan for a while. Hearing this, the man was angry. He asked furiously how dare the Alliance say something like that. He could not come to terms with the fact that he was being called upon to destroy his own clan. The mere scream of such a terrifyingly strong man was enough to make the Bureau of Investigation representative barely able to stay in his chair. Addressing the troubled head, the worried Hai Dong asked him to think about how the quiet night would soon prove itself, and when that happened, he could erase his shame by achieving great victories. He tried to convince him that it shouldn't be difficult for one of the great four of the Northern Skies a warrior who had personally fought against the Silent Knight for decades. Although he tried with all his might to calm the violent and dangerous warrior, it was not an easy task, and the Bureau representative understood this. Turning to Master Cho, he said that this should not be a difficult task. Trying to relax the situation, Hai Dong suggested using this opportunity so that the whole world begins to create legends about the Broken Fist Clan. But all his deceitful speech was not something that an experienced battle-hardened warrior could do. His son Yunkin, who had been listening to the entire conversation, was devastated that his father had given a reckless order without consulting him. The sensible guy understood that he was still perceived as a useless heir. He couldn't accept the fact that his father still thought he was the best in the world. And that's why he chose a terrifying path of destruction. At the moment of his thoughts, Ha Dong suddenly asked the leader of the Broken Fist to send his son to the Central Heavenly Alliance at the first opportunity. When it came to his son, Cho Chion Wu became even more unbalanced and shouted that the Heavenly Alliance was planning to use his heir as a hostage. In response, Hei Dong assured that nothing like that would happen. He also said that the Heavenly Alliance had already begun preparations to confront the terrifying organization. They began to gather strong martial artists to form a group of conquerors. According to him, the members of the conquering party will be endowed with powers beyond their wildest imaginations. This will be an army of young heroes from all regions. According to him, those who perform well will have a chance to personally rule the continents. It became clear that he was hinting that Mr. Yunkin would be able to receive a worthy reward for his participation in the war. The nervous Zhou Cheon Wu believed that these words were just an embellishment of the truth, because the Heavenly Alliance planned to keep his son nothing more than a hostage to protect themselves from the actions of the Broken Fist. The Demon Fist was so enraged that he could not restrain himself and destroyed the railing of his throne. He was ready to show the Central Heavenly Alliance and the Nine Heavens his true rage, because after betraying the Northern Heavenly Clan, he was willing to go to the very end for his goal. But before demonstrating his strength to the Heavenly Clan, he was going to personally see the martial artist who was involved in the problems related to the Jade City. Because of the Northern Blade, they felt a disgusting shame as their plan suddenly collapsed. While Cho Chong Wu was drowning in his own rage, Master Jin, his student and the spy Chun Ying set off. Behind them walked the Iron Dozen squad, as well as the bodyguards of the White Dragon Merchant Troop. Turning to them, Mu Wan asked how long they planned to follow on their heels. The daring leader Yang showed feigned confusion at the question and assured that this was just a delusion and that in fact they were simply following the path. Hearing such words, Master Jin suggested that they go ahead, but in response he heard that the Iron Dozen did not want to do this, because they liked to watch the rising star walking ahead. According to the leader, they are pleased to watch Master Jin's broad shoulders. At the same moment, the more conscientious Master Mu Huan apologized for the behavior of his head, which he considered undignified. He admitted that they were ashamed that their squad had no one else to rely on except Mr. Jin. According to him, their work in the Jade City was disrupted due to the incident. Not only was this a waste of time, but they also didn't get any leads. Therefore, the Iron Dozen came to the conclusion that Mr. Jin had the necessary information and it would be better for them to follow him. In addition, another argument in favor of such actions was that, from their own observations, they saw the power of the Northern Blade. 
Apologizing for past misunderstandings, he asked Mu Wan to help them with a task from the White Dragon. Master Jin was surprised that among them there was a really smart person, who found the determination to admit how everything really is. Taking advantage of the moment, Leader Yang pounced on those two guys and said that they should forget about the past and help each other, because together they went through a difficult battle and now can be considered comrades. Trying to get the master to cooperate, Leader Yang Musan mentioned that the reputation of the Northern Blade was growing rapidly and would soon become even more famous, so in the future he would need the help of reliable guys. He said that the Iron Detachment would not remain in debt. In a quieter and more cunning voice, he mentioned that he should join forces, because in this case, Master Jin would be able to receive a good monetary reward from the White Dragon, which would be enough for long travels and comfortable living conditions. Not embarrassed by Lady Yun's presence, Leader Yang invited the Northern Blade to take full advantage of the merchant troop's bottomless purse. Such a bold and frank speech did not even surprise Captain Khan, because he knew what to expect from the mercenary Yang Musan. After all this sickening speech, Mu Wan sighed heavily, as he understood that it was impossible to get rid of them. Mu Wan walked forward and asked the mercenary squad to hurry up since they had already wasted a lot of time. After this, he announced that they were heading to Mount Sorrow. As the young master walked forward, Leader Yun was left behind and a young girl was next to him. The talkative and cheerful man tried to get to know her. Having introduced himself, he asked what common cause the young mistress and the cold northern blade had in common, since they decided to walk together on such a dangerous road. Taking a closer look at the girl, Leader Yang began to sincerely envy the young master, as he believed that she was a very enviable beauty. But after a moment he saw that the girl had a very impressive secret. Leader Yang was simply shocked by the young master's preferences. He immediately asked the attractive girl what he had to see, because that thing was a little larger than his own. Meanwhile, in one of the canteens of the Heavenly Alliance, it was time for dinner. This place belonged to the government and everyone who was here worked for the Alliance. In a separate room was the head to whom his ward came. The head of the Secret Intelligence Department of Pursuit and Capture was Seo Mu Sung. The ward came to him with a report and said that he had delivered their reports to the management department of the Central Heavenly Alliance, and in response received a letter from them. Seo Musang learned that the Broken Fist Clan had suspended its activities. Looking closely at the map, the Master was surprised that the Central Heavenly Alliance was somehow able to neutralize the rogue member of the Four Great Pillars of the Northern Heaven so easily. The head of the department thanked his ward and asked him to continue to monitor the province of Unnam, and also make reports on even the slightest changes in affairs. After that he asked if everything was all right with his ward. The man looked tired due to the great amount of work, so the caring head of the department threw him a bag of coins and asked him to have a good rest. This unusual attitude towards his wards always worked to his advantage. Becoming the head of the intelligence department was not easy. Musang was forced to go through very difficult times in the Seening branch of the Central Heavenly Alliance. Seven years ago, he was a victim of torture by local workers who were trying to find out accurate information regarding the heir to the Northern Clan. The persistent guy kept repeating the same thing for a long time despite the fact that he continued to be brutally beaten. The same story was repeated every day. Master Seo convinced the Heavenly Alliance that he had seen it with his own eyes and was sure that the heir of the Northern Clan remained in the building that burned to the ground. One of the agents who interrogated him recalled that that night, the first person to come to the Sunning Guard Post to request reinforcements was none other than Chung Pasan, the captain of the squad in charge of guarding the palace of the destroyed Northern Sky Clan. Through him, they were able to find out that the four dead heavens were able to escape. The three descendants of the nine heavens were in danger, but thanks to their brave actions, the Shini were able to save many warriors who had received terrible injuries. On the other hand, it still seemed strange to their unit that Seo Musang not only managed to survive, but also remained unharmed. During the next interrogation, Seo repeated the same story countless times that he, as the deputy head of a group of mercenaries, was patrolling the surrounding area. While checking the area, he was unable to receive a response signal from one of the observation posts. He discovered something strange was happening with the guards, so he went to check on them. But when he arrived at the right place, a terrifying sight awaited him. When he returned to the Northern Heavenly Clan, the battle was already underway, but he was unable to join as he lacked the skill and strength to achieve results. Each time, he stated that as a member of the Alliance Mercenary Group, he had only good intentions when making decisions. Moreover, he mentioned that Chung Pasan, despite being the leader, decided to abandon them and ran away as a coward. The next severe torture, which led to the same result, forced Chin In to believe in the words of the mercenary. Remembering the past, Master Seo thought about how rotten and corrupt Chung Pasan, the leader of their mercenary squad, was. His anger towards that bastard knew no bounds. But at the same time, he found a ray of light in the form of a new master. 
Seo Mu Sang witnessed with his own eyes how Master Jin went through many challenges at a young age and did his best to master the martial arts. He couldn't believe that such crazy guys existed. This is how he became a low-ranking warrior in the Sinning branch. In fact, he was under surveillance all the time, so he was no different from a slave who did menial work. However, he did not give up. Instead, he persistently worked hard to become a worthy servant of his master. So he spent three years. At night, he continued to hone the martial arts skills that were bestowed upon him by his master. And throughout the day, he did everything to perfectly serve the head of the Zinning branch, Master Yang Man Chok. Without any rest, he shed blood, sweat, and tears every single day for three years. And eventually, they became less suspicious of him. Moreover, over time, he was recognized, and he was able to become the right hand of Master Yang Man Chok. One day, while working with him, the Central Heavenly Alliance sent a message requesting help in special reconnaissance. Without any doubt, he offered them his help. As expected, Yang Manchok did not just let him go and said goodbye to his faithful servant with tears in his eyes. Thus, Mu Song began his journey as the lowest rank in the Special Intelligence Service of the Central Heavenly Alliance. And after some time, he again achieved recognition. As a result, he was quickly promoted to a senior position in Special Intelligence. Special Intelligence this is one of the places where many secrets and internal information of the Alliance are kept. It is a group that is responsible for disclosing and collecting secret information about the movements of enemies. Because of this, he did his best to spread the news of his master's death and continued to spread these rumors to the best of his ability. Although he could not visit Nanju City as often as he wanted, he kept an eye on Mr. Huang whenever possible to make sure nothing happened to him. Watching his master's uncle, he became convinced that everything was fine with them and that the Central Heavenly Alliance did not learn from its mistakes. The government became intoxicated with security and power, becoming too arrogant and confident in the steadfastness of its power. But this played into their hands. Thanks to the overconfidence of his enemies, Mr. Huang did not fall under their suspicions, which allowed him to avoid unnecessary problems. Having made sure that the gentleman's uncle was not in danger, he believed that there was no longer any need to worry about his safety. At this point, it had been about a year since the last time he checked on Mr. Huang. Master Seo could not even imagine that he would be involved in the Unnam province incident. On his desk was a map showing the young gentleman's supposed movements. He already knew that Mu Wan had gone in search of Mr. Huang and was close to solving the problem. Master Seo felt a certain heaviness in his soul, because the call of his heart said that he should leave the Special Intelligence Service and immediately return to the Master to help him. But despite this, Pure reason suggested that the time had not yet come. He wasn't sure whether the master had finished his training, but he knew for sure that his entourage was still weak. Therefore he believed that until the master was strengthened, it would be his duty to protect Master Jin from the attention of the Alliance. All these events told him that a difficult era was approaching, because Silent Knight and the Central Alliance were already collecting information about each other, which meant that a bloody war would soon begin. But despite these events, he only had one master to answer to so he was going to continue doing his job to keep Mu Wan safe. Meanwhile, the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan arrived at his destination. The place that looked terrifying and uninhabitable was the very Mountain of Sorrow, in which, according to the Soundmaster, the rest of the captive bodyguards and Uncle Huang are located. As soon as they arrived, Leader Yan noticed that the place was very ominous, and a frightening aura emanated from the mountains. He believed that this was not a place where an ordinary person could enter. Addressing the head as a bodyguard, he shared his opinion that from now on it would be better for them to separate. According to him, the energy emanating from the mountains is abnormal, so it is unknown what danger awaits them next. Out of concern for the safety of the White Dragon Trade Association, the mercenary leader asked them to return back. Addressing them, he promised that he would do everything possible to save every prisoner. He wanted the bodyguards and the great family's daughter to return to the tavern and prepare for their return. Captain Cohn trusted his words and accepted the advice, but asked them to take care of themselves and assured them that they would pray for their success. The first group, consisting of Brother Im and Hong, were in the vanguard because they are very good at searching and tracking. Seo Jin and older brother Gon were going to protect the flanks. Sang Yul and Shredder undertook to cover their rear, while leader Yan was pondering how a girl could possess such an impressive instrument. Chun Ying asked Kwok not to relax. The spy was sure that these mountains were not simple and that something dangerous was hidden in them. While Mu Wan walked forward with a sour face as usual, the only real girl in the squad approached him. Furious Power Che Yakrin called the Northern Blade an interesting person in all seriousness. She noticed that the young master on the one hand is stubborn and straightforward, but at the same time, he is familiar with the concepts of mercy and understanding. According to her, the guy does not look special, 
but he has art strong enough to deserve the title and such sudden fame. Turning to the master, she warned him that most likely he would become even more famous than before, so perhaps he would be consumed by fame. With a serious look, Yakrin asked him not to let fame cloud his mind. She wanted him to remain the way he is now, because otherwise he would hurt not only himself, but also those close to him. When the girl went further, she shared her opinion that Mu Wan would be fine and cope with all the difficulties. Mu Wan thanked Deputy Che for her kind words. After some time, they arrived at the Cave of Despair. It lived up to its name, and everyone present felt that the ominous aura of the mountains had become even stronger. Mu Wan noted that even though the Mountains of Sorrow are known for being shrouded in yin energy, this place is much more dangerous. While examining the area, Mu Huan noticed that the clouds were unusually concentrated in one place. He guessed it was some kind of illusion. Hearing the mention of the illusion, Leader Yan wondered if his deputy could break through it. In response, Mu Huan said that this is some kind of mixture of the illusion arts of the universal labyrinth and the shadow of energy. He believed that if his theory was correct, then they would need to disperse the people in the northwest and northeast and force them to look for an object that could act as a key. After this, they needed to use a strong counter-illusion. Trying to carry out his plan, Mu Wan began placing his charges in places where they could weaken the enemy's defensive equipment. His older sister was nearby, holding a huge stone with her bare hands, which she was supposed to use after receiving a signal from the commander of this operation. When all the preparations were completed, Mu Huan began to perform the ritual. Mu Wan did not take part in it, but only watched from the side. The illusion turned out to be more complicated than he thought at first glance, so it took longer. Remembering the mysterious and slightly mad scientist, Master Jin was confident that he could destroy this illusion without much difficulty. He had a feeling that they would still need his help, so he thought about what he was doing now. A few minutes later, Mu Wan was distracted from his thoughts. He heard the high-pitched cry of the leader of the operation to destroy the enemy illusion. Still, they managed to complete it and the entrance to the cave was open. When they walked inside, they felt incredible pressure. The place caused some horror even in the experienced leader of the Iron Dozen. Looking around, they could only see darkness and the tall pillars that supported the cave. Moving forward, Leader Yon asked his charges not to let their guard down. When they walked a few hundred meters forward, they noticed a strange place. Naturally, having noticed him, they moved further. After looking around, they assumed that there had previously been a Buddhist temple here. Some members of the squad believed that spirits lived in this ominous place. At one point, Leader Yang stopped because of what he saw. In front of them was a cage containing people. Mu Wan realized that these were the people who were kidnapped by enemies from the Bloody Squad. Before his death, the Master of Sound said that there are many more merchants in the Cave of Despair than they might realize. As expected, the missing merchants and bodyguards were in front of them, and Mu Wan noticed that they were still alive. Leader Yan asked what was happening to them. Mu Wan assumed that at this moment the process of turning into madmen was going on in their bodies. In response, Leader Yan said that he had not met them yet, but he had heard that these madmen were cruel and attacked like beasts. But it was noticeable that the prisoners had not yet completely turned into so-called madmen. But the number of people who suffered from the actions of the air of the quiet night haunted him. He couldn't believe that there was a monster who did this to innocent people. Among them was Master Huang, who was able to slow down the spread of the poison with the help of three fundamental cultivation techniques, but was barely conscious. When he opened his eyes, he saw in front of him the heir of the Northern Clan, who extended his hand in his direction. The man was able to contain the spread of the poison only on half of his body, but retained his mind and recognized the young master. As soon as Mu Wan heard his answer, he immediately hugged the person dear to him. Hugging Mr. Huang, he apologized for having to wait so long. Master Jin apologized for being so careless all this time while someone dear to him was in danger. When asked what he was doing here, Master Jin replied that he could not help but come for Mr. Huang when he learned of his disappearance. Standing in front of the young master, the Northern Heavenly Clan's loyal follower couldn't believe his eyes. At this moment, Mu Wan managed to save the silver scarlet pill that was made by the master of 10,000 poisons from the Tang family. Handing the medicine towards his uncle, he said that it was a famous spiritual pill that could strengthen his qi energy and cure most existing poisons. After that, he asked if he knew what happened here. Unfortunately, Master Huang was the only one who was able to retain his sanity. In fact, Mr. Huang didn't even know how much time had passed since that incident. All he could remember was that they were ready to enter Unam province, but then they were suddenly attacked and kidnapped by some unknown bandits, among whom the most terrifying force was possessed by a huge warrior in heavy armor with a long spear. Afterwards, he watched as all the captured merchants and bodyguards were forcibly injected with poison. Those who became completely insane were immediately released. 
and those who were still in the process of transformation were left in this chamber. Due to the fact that Mr. Huang did not completely lose all senses, he was able to forcibly block the blood flow, which allowed him to slow down the spread of the poison. However, he understood that if he moved even a little, the blood that had been stopped would immediately be released, and the poison would instantly spread throughout the body. So he had no choice but not to move. All he could do was diligently use the three fundamental cultivation techniques, which helped him stay alive. Mu Wan remembered that these techniques belonged to the Taoist techniques of the Kinzhen clan, which specialized in anti-demonic energy. It was true, and that was why his uncle didn't completely turn into a monster. However, after some time, which seemed like an eternity to him, he was ready to give up, as he had reached his limits. He didn't even expect that one day a young master would come to his aid. The old man believed that a member of the Jin family saved his life for the second time, so he confidently declared that he would not regret if he died that day. But his young master said that it was too early for him to think about death, and asked him to hurry up and use the spiritual pill. Master Huang listened to him and started taking the medicine, but a moment before swallowing the pill he remembered something more important. Hidden behind him was the third master of the White Dragon Trade Association, Yun Yamun. The old man did his best to transport the young master to this place, avoiding the gaze of their captors. The man still resisted, but it was clear that the poison would soon consume him too. Carrying out his duty to the very end, Mr. Huang also blocked Yun Yamun's blood flow and hid it behind him. Now he was ready to share with him the pill that the young master provided him. In response, Mu Wan called him amazing because despite the worst circumstances, he continued to do amazing things. Within a moment, Mun Zheng pounced on his precious teacher, happy to see him alive. The old man was incredibly happy to see his student. He noticed how much Kwok, the son of his dead comrade for whom he took responsibility, had grown. When Kwok saw the third son of the Tay family, he immediately shouted throughout the cave. Hearing this, Leader Yong looked around in surprise and headed towards the technical guard. Addressing his comrades, the mercenary leader stated that although the third master was suffering from poison, it was still possible to save him. As for the remaining prisoners, he ordered them to be identified by uniform and divided into groups of bodyguards and merchants. The Iron Squad has almost completed their mission. Leader Yong was confident that the reward was already in their hands, so he asked his comrades to hurry up, promising them a generous feast at the end of the work. As it turned out, thanks to the wonderful pill that the young master brought, Master Huang noticed that most of the effects of the poison disappeared. Mu Wan asked him not to thank him, and assured him that they would be able to heal the others as soon as they left this ominous place. He said that he knew someone who was quite good at poisons, and that he was currently developing an antidote in the Jade City. Mu Wan was confident that with the help of his medicine, Uncle Huan would be able to fully recover. While the old man could not describe in words his gratitude for such an unexpected rescue, Mu Wan asked his younger brother to give him the sword that they bought in the Jade City. Seeing the sword, Mr. Huang asked what kind of weapon it was. In response, he learned that his young master was able to find this very good item while they were looking for information in the Jade City Market. A master with the skills of a blacksmith said that he would improve this sword when the opportunity arises. Master Huang was indescribably grateful to everything the young master did for him. As they walked towards the rest of the group, Chun Ying came up and asked the young master to step back for a second to look at something interesting. As it turned out, in this place he found the cause of madness. As Mu Wan approached, he sensed a rather poisonous qi energy. According to the spy who had already closed his nostrils, when ordinary people are exposed to this intense poisonous qi, they immediately feel dizzy and weak. Mu Wan was sure that this was the poison with which people were poisoned and became crazy. Since they were not entirely sure of this, Chun Ying was going to take a piece of this substance and bring it to the Dark Moon. He hid it in a leather bag and said that he would be careful with it so as not to accidentally get infected. Since this substance was extremely dangerous, the guys could not leave it in place and took the box with them. But at one moment, guys in white cloaks appeared in front of them who were members of the reconnaissance squad of the Heavenly Alliance. Mu Wan did not expect them to appear and could not even imagine how they got to this place. In addition, among them was the eldest Tang, as well as his niece Mirei. Noticing the bustle, Leader Yang came out to them and immediately asked what was going on. Mr. Tan began the conversation by saying he was happy that Master Jin was okay. Chok Mu, who led this squad, introduced himself as a member of the investigation department of the Central Heavenly Alliance. Mu Wan briefly replied that his name was Jin. Rumors of his fame have already reached the Heavenly Alliance. Master Chok Mu said that he was honored to meet the rising star of the mainland. On behalf of the entire Alliance, he thanked him for the fact that with his help the situation in the Jade City was quickly resolved. After these pleasant words, his unpleasant face became more serious and he persistently asked to let the Central Heavenly Alliance handle this matter. 
Without waiting for an answer, he called Mr. Jin an incredible person, but warned that this was not a matter that could be handled alone. Likewise, he was not sure that this was a task for the Iron Dozen mercenaries. Assuring that the Heavenly Alliance would never forget the feat of the mercenaries, he asked to be allowed to deal with everything to the end and urged them to return home. As expected, the squad was unhappy that the unexpectedly appearing reconnaissance squad decided to take responsibility for the situation, even though they were not the ones who did most of the work. In response, Mu Wan suggested that if they were going to finish the case, they would already know how to treat crazy people. Chakmu, who does not have the most charismatic chin, replied that even before they requested the Tang family's help, they were already looking for an antidote themselves. The arrogant words, as usual, offended the master of 10,000 poisons, who had this title for a reason. With an unpleasant look, Chakmu stated that they could be trusted, since they were already close to creating an antidote. After that, he asked what kind of strange box was in their hands. A fairly experienced master and the head of this intelligence unit immediately felt a large amount of poisonous energy. He understood that the substance inside was associated with the symptoms of crazy people. After these words, he convincingly asked them to leave the poison in place so that they could analyze it themselves. Mu Wan was extremely cautious after hearing the hypocritical master's proposal. At the same moment, he turned his attention to his fellow Tang family member. The master of 10,000 poisons showed that this was nothing and the poison could be left behind. Confiding in his comrade, Mu Wan replied that he would leave everything to the representatives of the Heavenly Alliance and would pray for their success. In response, Chok Mu stated that there was no need to doubt the abilities of the mainland's highest authority. Speaking on behalf of the Iron Dozen, the deputy leader, Mu Huan, known as the Infinite Mind, expressed his gratitude and honor that the Central Heavenly Alliance would be in charge of this matter, after which he declared that they would follow their words and humbly leave the scene of the incident. But he also added that their squad was forced to take the third master from the White Dragon Trade Association with them. He admitted that in fact their mission was to save everyone, including the bodyguards, but the priority still remained in relation to the third master. The deputy hoped that the authorities would make an exception for them and allow them to take the third gentleman with them so that the Iron Dozen could confirm the completion of their mission. But despite his words, the unpleasant Chakmu refused their request. At that moment, the master of 10,000 poisons stepped forward and said that he would take Mr. Tay under his responsibility. According to him, their mission as the Tang family ended in the Jade City. The only reason they didn't leave and followed the Alliance was for personal reasons. He wanted to take a closer look at the crazy people. Since the Alliance representative continued to remain silent, Mr. Tang dissatisfiedly asked why they, after doing an excellent job according to them, using the Tang family as bait, were not going to satisfy at least this request. In response, Chok Mu said that he would be sympathetic to the situation and then stated that if they needed medical attention, they could not hesitate to send him to the Central Heavenly Alliance. But the proud old man replied that most likely they would be the ones who needed help, based on the knowledge and skills that the Tang family possessed. After that, Mu Wan walked by and said goodbye. In response, Chok Mu said that due to the fact that this was an urgent matter, they would turn a blind eye to all arbitrariness on the part of the Master of the North. However, he asked him to participate in the investigation regarding the Jade City. After these words, he not entirely sincerely wished the Northern Blade a good trip home. As soon as the Iron Dozen left the cave, Chakmu looked around to see for himself. Realizing that they were left alone, he shouted to his charges to hurry up and find all possible evidence. Without any delay, the soldiers of his squad began to carry out the order. When there was no one left around him, veins appeared on the unpleasant head of the investigation department's face, with tension and anger, due to the fact that the mysterious swordsman was one step ahead of the Central Heavenly Alliance dealt with the person from the quiet night, and even saved the kidnapped people. Still, he understood that they could still take responsibility for the safe recovery and care of the captives. Since the northern swordsman had greatly spoiled his plans to spread the good glory of the Heavenly Alliance, Chok Mu was going to carefully delve into his past. Of course he was also unhappy with the actions of the quiet night which played a nasty joke on them, putting the Alliance in a difficult situation. Meanwhile, one of the terrifying lords of Silent Night arrived at his destination. He came to the old man that he sensed Dan Yop's presence. The Lord apologized to him for arriving at the scene too late. The child who was the light for all of them died in battle, so the old man wanted to know whose hands it was. Blackwing Spear replied that the last heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, named Jin Mu Wan, was responsible for the heir's death. Hearing this, the old man was not surprised that their ill-fated relationship had gone so far. As the Elder of Silent Night and the one who was nicknamed the Thousand Sounds of Death on the battlefield, 
a blind old man named Yan Zhang Hak requested a great meeting and asked to make sure that all four great demons would appear before him. Meanwhile, assassins unknown to us tried to escape persecution, but they had no chance against the power of the icy sparkling rings of the girl in the white dress. Having no chance of winning against a mistress with terrifying power, the poor fellows tried to escape and called on their still living comrades to do the same, but after a moment they were finished. One of the fighters managed to move away from the dangerous girl and thought that he could escape, but with slight movements of her hand, the mysterious lady created another ice ring. The silver light ice crystal technique was aimed at the poor fellow. Naturally, this fighter was unable to escape. The mortally wounded man said that their Blue Flower clan had been hired to kill the young apprentice of the Silent Night Witch. Once he realized that she was an opponent they couldn't handle, they gave up and tried to escape. He asked the mysterious girl not to go that far and give them a chance to escape. In response, the young student asked that regardless of whether the enemies attack or flee in fear, why should she let them go alive? Without any human feelings, she got rid of the last mercenary. Having finished her work, her cold gaze did not even flinch. Within a moment, she felt the presence of a man. Saren appeared behind her. She immediately realized that these were the killers who had been sent for her by him. Remembering their previous conversation, she asked him to hire someone stronger. In response, her bodyguard said that most likely it was that the young mistress had simply become too strong. He came to her with a message that she had an appointment with the mistress. Lady Seo Gyumhan was waiting to meet her student under the light of the full moon. When the student arrived, she respectfully asked the master what the conversation would be about. When Ha Seol arrived, her mentor said that it was only a matter of time before the student refined the ice crystal's silver light. Lady So believed that now the title of Mistress of Silent Night was more suitable for her. After these words, Yun Ha Sol became the Mistress of the Silent Night organization. About twenty years ago, the Master of Sound and the White Knight discovered two children in a village destroyed by their hands. The blind man could not see them, but he felt the energy of the little girl and boy. He was surprised by their strong will, but doubted that they could survive in such a terrible place. Moreover, the master of the thousand sounds of death felt that the eyes of these children were as deep as the abyss. He understood that these children had nothing but the desire to survive. He felt compassion for these poor creatures. In response, Lady Seo Gyumhan said nothing. The old man continued, saying that they, the adults, should be ashamed because the children did nothing wrong and were simply unlucky to be born in such difficult times. After that, he asked if they would mind going with him. But hearing his words, Lady So Gyumhan only silently turned around to walk away, because she did not experience human feelings, like a true ice mistress. But at one moment, she felt that someone was holding her dress. Little Unha Sol turned out to be so fearless that she brazenly grabbed the hem of the mistress of the quiet night herself. Addressing Jumhan, the master of a thousand sounds of death asked her to remember that nothing in this world lasts forever. He said that she would need someone to pass on her ice crystal silver light technique too. As an example, he himself decided to take a child in order to teach him the technique of the thousand sounds of death. Of course, it was little Gyum Danyup. Saying goodbye to the lady, the old man asked the boy to follow him. Realizing that the master of sound was right about something, the woman without any feelings called upon her faithful servant. Even at that moment, young Sa Ren instantly appeared in front of his mistress. Lady Gyumhan asked him to check the little girl and see if she had the right meridians. She said the more painful the test, the better it would be for them. After all, if she can hold out until the end, then she will take her as her student. She also asked her subordinate not to pay attention to the fact that the girl's memory was clouded, but to make sure and erase all her memories of this incident. It was at that moment that she received her name, Ha Sol, like a snowflower. Being alone with her student who had reached heights similar to hers, Lady Gumhan asked if she despised her. In response, Ha Seol firmly said that she, as a simple student, could not even think about something like that. Hearing her words, Gyumhan said that everything was fine because she also walked this path and despised her teacher, who trained her mercilessly. In addition, these trainings made them lose touch with their feelings and desires, which made it difficult for them to understand who they were. Despite this, she encouraged Ha Seol to never doubt herself just because she can no longer feel anything, because it does not mean that she is no longer human. She also asked her not to forget that she was now a witch of the White Knight. Ha Seol coldly answered the master that she would always remember this. After this, Lady Gumman reported that the order for a great meeting had been given. The master advised that the great meeting could only be called when the fate of their organization was decided, and due to the nature of this event, it could be months before she could return. Lady Gyumhan believed that they would soon plunge into chaos. The order would take about three months to complete, so she encouraged the student to enjoy her free time. According to her, after the meeting, all of Ha Sol's personal freedom will completely disappear and to her allies she will become known as the Mistress of the Quiet Knight, and to her enemies as the Witch of the White Knight. 
This will be a life she will have to put up with. Despite the lack of human feelings, Jumhan praised the student for diligently studying her technique without interruption over the years. This was the first and last time she would give anything to Ha Seol, so she asked her to think of this free time as a gift from her master. When Ha Sol was left alone with the full moon, she thought about what her temporary freedom should be like. Besides Sa Ren, ice crystal silver light training and fighting, she didn't know anything else, so it was hard for her to figure out what else she could do. She also thought about the fact that she didn't have many memories of when she was younger. Ever since she started honing her ice technique, she couldn't remember anything, even if it happened just a few years ago. But from time to time, it seemed to her that she had some distant, vague memory. She couldn't understand what it was, but it was about the time when she met the heir of the Northern Clan, whom she had long forgotten. Despite the strange, vague memory, she decided that it didn't matter, and thought about the fact that the Master should send more assassins after her. She thought the battles were quite interesting, but she couldn't imagine how else she could enjoy her time besides that. The task turned out to be too difficult. Remembering the words that they would soon plunge into chaos, the ice-cold Hassel came up with a task for herself. She decided that she should take one last look at the mainland. Hassel understood that this was her last chance to see it inhabited and alive, because in the end she would have to destroy it. At the same time, Mu Wan also enjoyed the sight of the full moon. He retired to breathe a sigh of relief after everything he had to go through to save the person dear to him. But while he was on vacation, he was greatly distracted by the noise that came from the tavern in which they were located. Although the White Dragon Trade Association's youngest daughter Yun was happy to see her older brother alive, it quickly turned into despair. However, after Mr. Tang, the owner of thousands of poisons from the great Tang family, promised to cure the poor fellow's symptoms, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. He also informed them that bodyguard Huang Chul was able to successfully block the blood flow of the eldest son of the Tai family and allowed him to eat the silver scarlet sacred pill, thanks to which his condition improved significantly. Under normal circumstances, getting help from the 10,000 poison master is very difficult, but surprisingly, he himself offered it. Still, he needed to obtain the original source of this poison in order to create an antidote. But that box was taken by representatives of the Heavenly Alliance, who were not going to share it with him. With tension, he said that although he promised to cure the third master, it would be incredibly difficult for him to create an antidote in time if he did not have access to the poison in that box. Hearing his reasoning, Mu Wan looked at Chun Ying, who had a small amount of the substance with him. The confused master of transformation said in a whisper that he could not help, because he really needed to take the sample to the main headquarters of the organization. In response, Master Jin's gaze became even more intense and intimidating. Despite this, the spy held out until the end and said that Mu Wan could stare as much as he wanted, but he would not be able to give away the poison. He had a job to do. Master Jin had no choice but to take the poison by force and give it to the master with the hope that it would help. No matter how much Chun Ying was dissatisfied with what happened, he could not do anything to oppose the terrifying power of the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. Hearing that Mu Wan was able to take such an important substance with him, Senior Mr. Tang once again called the Northern Swordsman an amazing person. Taking the bag in his hands, he was surprised by the intense poisonous aura that emanated from it. He asked Miss Yun to give him some time to analyze the composition and make a suitable antidote. Mu Wan once again surprised the daughter of the Tan family. Her heart completely belonged to this lady, and she once again thanked him for his help. After this, Mr. Tan awkwardly informed the Iron Dozen that one of their charges, who was a ranger, was among the madmen and, unfortunately, could not survive the effects of the poison. After some time, Mr. Huang noticed that Mu Wan left the tavern again and went outside to be alone with himself. He admitted that after months of being locked in the cave, all he did was meditate, so now he wanted to enjoy the fresh breeze outside. The old man already felt good, and all this was thanks to the action of the sacred pills. While walking through the Jade City, Mu Wan told his uncle about what had happened since he left the mountains and entered the free world. As expected, the polite and loyal Master Huang continued to apologize. He felt bad that his negligence had caused the young master to interrupt his training and return to the world earlier than he had planned. As expected, Mu Wan replied that all this was not his fault because Mr. Huang was much more important than training. Hearing these words, Zhang Wu replied that he had known this for a long time, that the heir of the Northern Clan had always been a noble and respected person of high rank. He believed that the young master had grown even stronger since their last meeting. A little embarrassed, Mu Wan thanked him for his nice words. After these words, Mr. Huang suddenly began to look around to see if there was anyone nearby. After that, he decided to whisper into the young master's ear the question that interested him so much. He never asked this because he didn't want to pry into his affairs. But in the past, Mu Wan said that the entire territory of the Northern Heavenly Clan of this great martial arts scroll 
Years had passed since the palace was destroyed, so he did not understand how Mu Wan continued his training in the mountains, and even alone. Hearing such a question, Mr. Jin was surprised and said that if he was so interested in it, then he could have asked about it before. As it turned out, he simply remembered the entire territory of the clan and the scroll that was depicted on its walls. Mr. Huang was simply shocked by such an unexpected answer. Still, Mu Wan studied every day for three years, so one day he realized that he remembered everything, even if he did not fully understand what was said. Therefore, when he isolated himself in the mountains, he was able to continue his training, which allowed him to strengthen what he had previously learned. And as for the basic foundation, which he never fully understood, he constantly remembered what he had learned by heart, which is how he actually laid the basis for mastery. This is how he spent the last seven years, relentlessly practicing the scroll techniques he had memorized. The amazing story amazed the old man so much that he didn't even know what to answer. He was amazed at how strong the young master was. The existence of his young master is truly the last legacy of the Northern Heavenly Clan. After that, Mu Wan remembered the conversation he wanted to have when meeting with his uncle. Master Jin reminded him of the stone his uncle brought from the tribe that destroyed the Broken Fist Clan. As it turned out, Mu Wan planned to visit that place in person. To clarify his motive, Mu Wan clarified that his sword was forged from this stone, and his screams are getting louder. As it turned out, this was due to the fact that the place where that tribe lived was not so far from the Jade City. Mr. Huang invited him to go there together. Meanwhile, they were already being watched by some bandits who were going to rob someone. When the guys came closer, they could not help but notice those strange silhouettes from which not the most pleasant dialogues emanated. The bandits tried to take the girl's money and threatened that if she did not give them everything, then they would conduct a thorough examination of her body. Pointing his finger at her, the brave thief said that he would begin his inspection from above. But within a moment, old man Huang appeared in front of them and politely asked them to stop, saying that they had already stolen enough. As soon as he appeared in front of them, the girl began to run, and the thieves nervously wondered who had intervened in their business. The gentleman introduced himself as the white dragon's bodyguard, after which he apologized for hurting their feelings, but warned that he would not let them go further. Hearing that the old man was a bodyguard, the leader of this gang became furious and declared that people like Huang should mind their own business and not stand in his way. After that, he declared that he was not a weakling and decided to hit the old man in the face. He could only do this with one hand because he had lost the other due to his previous theft. But Mr. Huang was not so simple and deftly dodged the blow, after which he directed his palm towards the opponent's body to push him away. But as soon as he touched the bandit's body, he instantly flew tens of meters to the side and loudly flew into the wall. Seeing this, the bandit's comrades were simply shocked. Mr. Huang himself was no less surprised, because he planned to simply push aside the daring bandit. Mu Wan couldn't miss such a sight. He couldn't believe that his uncle was capable of something like that. Seeing what the old man did, the rest of the bandits rushed to attack using their swords. The old man deftly pulled out his weapon and blocked both attacks at the same time without any problems. After that, he hit the bandits with the blunt side of his blade and they flew away just like their leader. The old man could not understand what was happening. He merely swung his sword to create a little distance, but something unexpected happened. Clapping his hands, Mu Wan gave him the answer and said that most likely, after circulating the qi to counteract the poison, he was finally able to break through the wall and advanced to the next level of skill. Mu Wan could actually feel how Mr. Huang's qi level had increased. He explained that since he had spent quite a lot of time protecting his internal organs, he had forgotten how to control the external release of energy. If he trains, he will reach new heights. At the end of the walk, Master Jin once again asked to show his respect to the great member of the Northern Heavenly Clan for remaining true to their heritage all this time. The spy Chun Ying, observing all these events, already knew everything about his target's uncle. Looking at the old man, he said that he was an example of how bad luck turned into good luck. The Master of Transformation was sure that Mr. Huang was a very lucky man. Meanwhile, important events have already begun in the Central Heavenly Alliance. One of the four dead heavens, Shim Wan Li, was ready to receive the long-awaited guests. This was the girl with whom they visited the Northern Heavenly Clan approximately seven years ago. Meeting her, Master Wan Li, as usual, showed his evil gaze and sly smile. The Lady of the Western Gate, named Heron, arrived as usual accompanied by her sister, who was her bodyguard. Seo Jung traveled with her, but did not join the visit as he continued to train in solitude. The stubbornness of that guy haunted Mr. Shim. He asked the lady to stop his brother and force him to return to the outside world. But Hiran replied that they both knew the reason why he refused to stop. It was about the legend of the invincible Dam So Chan, who passed the test of hundreds of people and won a hundred unconditional victories. 
seven years ago, after suffering through his first humiliating defeat, he swore to himself that he would become stronger than anything. He stated that as one of the main representatives of the Azure Dragon Association, he could not afford to be weak. He temporarily entrusted the association to the hands of his older brother and sister in order to retire for the sake of training. As Dam Seo Young left, he stated that he would appear again once he had mastered his final technique. Those events in the Northern Heavenly Clan were a time that Mr. Shim remembered with terrible anger, because then he lost his younger sister Su Ah. Of course, his father, who belonged to the Nine Heavens, the Crimson Demon King named Shim Mu Wa, was very unhappy with his son and shouted that he might not come back at all after what happened. He shouted that by hiding behind his name, his son had become an arrogant piece of shit who did nothing but bring trouble to their family. The man was ready to expel him from the family because he could not save his only sister. Calling the already depressed guy a real disgrace, the Demon King could not understand how his offspring could be so mediocre. He claimed that at his age he had already subdued the heavens themselves with his own hands and ascended to the position of the Nine Heavens. Of course, all this swearing changed the young master, and he was no longer the same as before. His despair knew no bounds due to his father's cry that those events took place in the Northern Heavenly Clan, which the Nine Heavens personally destroyed. Having said everything, the angry father already wanted to leave. But finally, filled with anger, he said that it would be much better if his mediocre son died with his sister, because this would bring less shame to his name. Mr. Shim was too ashamed to show his face to the other Nine Heavens because of those events. Considering himself a useless creature, Mu Wa began to lose his sanity. Even without his father's words, he could not describe the grief for his younger sister that made him suffer every day. At that moment, he became so distraught that he lost his left eye in the course of self-mutilation. Remembering the rumors, Hiran remembered that Mr. Shim had fallen into such deep despair that even the servants could not stop him from harming himself. For a long time, he spent his days in vain and only recently returned to his normal existence. His thirst for revenge was what brought him back to his senses. Shim Wan Li, the young master of the false heavens and the heir of the infamous demon king, decided to fight to the end. A real manipulator in the flesh, Hiran understood that he was the one she definitely needed to control the lesser seven heavens. Turning to the young master, she said that it was worth thinking about the fact that a terrifying storm was approaching the mainland in the form of the emergence of the Quiet Night Organization. The heir of the Shim family was already aware of the events that took place in the Jade City. He believed that the mainland would soon plunge into chaos, and that powerful, hungry individuals who had long been held back by the Alliance would soon begin to act. They had been preparing for this era for a long time. He understood that they needed a sacrifice to achieve a great goal, following the example of the Jade City. After these words, Hiran asked if he had heard the man who single-handedly dealt with that sensational incident. Shim replied that it is called the Northern Blade. After that, the lady asked if the mention of the swordsman's name being Jin reminded the young master. The young heir of the Shin family began to think, repeating in his head the name of that strange rising star of the world, Murim. He realized what he was talking about. As soon as Hair Young noticed that Mr. Shim understood what was going on, she directly said that this must be the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, Jin Mu Wan. Still, Mr. Shim was not sure of her words because on the day his death was confirmed, he personally received a report from the intelligence department. But it became clear that the time had come to see for ourselves. The lady asked the demon king's heir to send a person to verify the information. Realizing that Master Jin was still alive, young Master Shim was filled with anger, after which he declared that if he saw that troubled heir of the northern clan, he would do everything possible to tear him to pieces. After these words, Hiran decided to draw his attention to the creation of an invasion force, and said that if Lord Shim became a member of it, he would not only be able to summon the great factions, but would also be able to control and exercise his jurisdiction over their power. In fact, she was still surprised that the old men from Nine Heavens would take advantage of such a devious plan and try to establish this kind of power. To her, this meant that the Nine Heavens felt threatened by the recent Silent Night incident, or were trying to reduce the damage they received by trying to take full control of the young martial artists because there is nothing easier than seducing young warriors hungry for power and power. While Mr. Shim agreed with her every word, the lady added that soon the old people would start recruiting members of the invaders, so they should prepare for the opening of the Azure Dragon Association's recruitment campaign. She believed that they should pay attention to people who would benefit them. In response, Master Wan Li asked who else they would need, because they, the Lesser Seven Heavens, are geniuses who are already considered the best of the best. In response, Hiran replied that there was no need to be mistaken, because there was someone who was more suitable for the title of genius, and she was going to lure this person to their side. 
the lady said that this is a scientist of three minds named Ha Jin Wall. Hiran believed that he was the only person whose intelligence could be comparable to her own. Recalling past events with a cold look, she said that she met this man five years ago and was quite surprised. They ran into each other by chance while celebrating the birthday of a great scientist named Siok Day. The scholar of the three minds, Ha Jin Wool, was already known as the son of a farmer who had learned to their level with his own efforts. They exchanged opinions regarding celestial astrology, military tactics, and strategy, but it soon turned into a debate. Their views, philosophies, and personalities were completely opposite, but even so, she considered him a genius on her level. Hiran felt threatened, so she decided to test him by using her family's power to teach him the real meaning of doubting himself. Using all the strength and knowledge of the Westgate family, she forced him to realize his first humiliating defeat. Since he lost due to the use of 10,000 tactics of the Nine Points of War, he suffered some mental damage, which is why he became less of a threat to the lady. After that incident, she heard rumors that he had gone crazy, but Hiran believed that if he really was a genius, he had already fully recovered and again represented some kind of threat to her authority. After hearing the crazy story, Master Shim wanted to see if Hiran was sure that Hajin Wool would want to join their association after he was raped. The girl replied that if they could not achieve this goal, then they would simply eliminate the Master of Illusions. She stated that if he didn't want to help the Azure Dragon soar, then they wouldn't let him help the other dragon soar. Walking further around the outskirts of the Jade City, Mu Wan and Mr. Huang reached a pond. At one point, they noticed something strange. Mu Wan was a little confused the moment he saw a man he knew doing something too strange. Looking at the man who was splashing water while in the boat, Master Huang asked the young master if he knew that psycho. Of course, the madman in question is the scientist Ha Jin Wool. While the guys had an unexpected meeting, an equally unexpected meeting awaited the leader of the investigation bureau, who was in the Blue Flower Tavern. The ward of the Northern Heavenly Clan, loyal to the air, asked who came to visit their commander and what his purpose was for the visit. But the dissatisfied visitor began to scold him in response, asking how some low rank dared to stop a man who had come on the orders of the great master. After that, the stranger literally forced his way inside, despite the warnings of the soldier standing at the entrance. Seo Musang looked towards the door to see what the noise was. As soon as he saw the visitor's face, he was filled with rage at the appearance of his acquaintance, whom he sincerely hated. As it turned out, the arrogant and ill-mannered visitor is the former captain of a mercenary group that seven years ago was located on the territory of the Northern Heavenly Clan. The last time they saw each other was the night when all the members of their mercenary group died because of the cowardly captain. He was the one who abandoned them to save his own skin. And so, Chung Pasan appeared in front of the new leader of the secret detachment, greeting him as if they were good old acquaintances. He began the conversation by visiting this place, confirming the rumors that Seo Mu Sang had become part of the Heavenly Alliance. The impudent man admitted that he would never have thought that his former deputy would become the head of the secret group of the Special Intelligence Department. In response, maintaining an imperturbable calm, Master Seo replied that he had already heard that his former captain had become a dog of the False Heavens and the Western Gate family. Sneaky Cheng immediately became enraged at being called a dog and addressed without any manners. The stupid and nasty master called Master Seo a distraught vice captain. In response, with a serious and cold look, Seo Musang suggested that if such a mongrel knows about the existence of special intelligence, then his owners told him about it. After this, he asked what the purpose of his visit was. But his calm and cold speech caused a surge of rage in the fat, impudent man, and he, reaching for his sword, called Seo Musang an arrogant bastard. But in response to his aggressive behavior, Musang did not even bat an eyelid, because a moment later, many wards appeared in his room, ready to defend their leader. The cowardly Chung Pasan could not believe that all these fighters could appear so unnoticed. After the special reconnaissance forces appeared, Mr. Seo approached his former captain. Being in front of him, Pasan began to feel fear. He couldn't understand when his former ward had changed so much. Turning to the former captain, Musang asked if he still looked like the one who was his ward. Peerless Musang clarified that it doesn't matter if the cowardly dog's masters are the masters of the false heavens and the Western Gate family. For someone like him, whose meaning in life is to carry out the orders of those people, it is not a problem for special intelligence to come up with a reasonable excuse to get rid of his body. In front of his subordinates, Master Seo clarified that he could make sure that the existence and even the name of his former captain never existed in this world. Looking straight into his deceitful face, he asked if he was sure that his masters would care about a pathetic slave like him. After this, the leader of the Special Intelligence Service stated that Chang was useless trash and was only good at serving, but he could be easily replaced at any time. 
He further warned his former captain that if he did not want this to happen, then he should hurry up and go about his business without showing his face. Feeling incredible pressure, Chung realized who he was dealing with. Showing respect, he said that Hiran from the Western Gate family was looking for the head of the Special Intelligence Service. Stopping his charges, Master Xiu thought about what she needed from him. He understood that most likely it would be about his master, which meant that the Heavenly Alliance was gradually beginning to fear him. Meanwhile, Mr. Jin quietly jumped onto the boat in which the misunderstood genius was suffering from madness. The scientist Ha Jin Wool realized that he had miscalculated when he thought that Master Jin had already left the Jade City. He admitted that even at the moment when Mu Wan broke through his illusion, he realized that he was not dealing with an ordinary person. But despite this, he could not even imagine that he would be able to cope with the situation regarding the Quiet Knight and the Broken Fist Clan alone. While Mr. Huang was on the shore, the scientist was surprised that he was found while he was in the middle of the lake, after which he assumed that Mu Wan could fly or something like that. Receiving no answers, he concluded that the nickname of the Northern Blade was given to the Incredible Master for a reason. After that, he asked how Mu Wan felt about his fame as a new rising star. The modest guy replied that he never thought that he would be given such a nickname. But the scientist replied that it is quite normal when the person about whom there are rumors does not know about these very rumors. He reported that news of the Northern Blade had already spread throughout the mainland. After this, the scientist decided to treat his guest, but this time not with tea, but with alcohol. Ha Jin Wool said that alcohol is best when you are on a boat. In response, Mu Wan said that he clearly didn't come here just to swim. Realizing what was happening, Master Jin surprised with his powers of observation and said that the scientist used his tactical illusions to gather all the fish in one place, as if they were caught in large nets. Northern Blade admitted that this was quite impressive. While drinking sake, the scientist replied that this should not be praised because he was just playing around. After that, he took a serious look at the young master. He suddenly assumed that this was Jin Mu Wan, the fifth generation heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. In response, Mu Wan silently drank the alcohol. The scientist took this as agreement, considering his assumption correct, he said that therefore one should never rely on rumors. Next, he asked what the young master's plans were and tried to guess, saying that Mu Wan wants to take revenge on the Central Heavenly Alliance. Alternatively, he suggested that Master Jin was going to restore the Northern Heavenly Clan or go ahead and take over the heavens. After a series of persistent questions, Mu Wan remained silent. It was hard to remember the last time he drank, but after the recent history-altering events, he didn't mind drinking more alcohol. His first words in response were the remark that the scientist had very strong liquor. After these words, silence began in the boat in the middle of the lake, which was illuminated by the bright full moon. Lowering his eyes, Mu Wan still replied that he was not sure what he was going to do next. He said that based on recent events, you would think he was planning something big, but admitted that he wasn't really thinking about anything ambitious and was just trying to live each day to the fullest. But he knew one thing for sure. He would never betray his own voice. Wonderful words put even the mad scientist in an awkward position. Mu Wan continued talking about feelings and said that he was talking about the sound he hears inside himself. Master Jin planned to live by following his heart. The self-confident Northern Blade stated that if his heart desires to seek revenge, then he will do so. And if it is a desire to subjugate the heavens, then he will do the same. I asked my interlocutor whether he was too idealistic. The master decided to drink liquor again. Looking at the stars, the scientist thought about the words of his new comrade with extraordinary interest. In response, he suddenly began to laugh and said that Master Jin was funny, and most likely he had something on his mind after all. Still, he admitted that Master Jin was truly an idealist if he wanted to live his life following his heart. But at the same moment, he understood that his ideals made sense, which distinguished him from other idealists who were talking nonsense and did not have any basis for it. Looking at the Northern Clan heir, he thought it was because he had something on his mind, and even if what he said might seem frivolous, it at least brought a sense of confidence in his answer. Looking at his reflection in a glass of alcohol, the scientist thought about how attractive the simplicity of the young master is. Inspired by the ideals of the heir to the Northern Clan, he thought that he himself should learn to rest sometimes, because the search for truth leads him further and further from the happiness that the full-fledged experience. When he looked into the sky, he thought that every time this man appeared in front of him, the signs in the heavens began to change. He knew that there weren't many people who could achieve this just by showing up. With his hands folded importantly in front of him, he thought that those who influence the heavens themselves are either heroes who can lead the future generation or villains who seek to tear the heavens apart. He was curious to know which path the leader of the fifth generation of the Northern Heavenly Clan would take. Addressing the Northern Blade, the wonderful scientist said that he liked it. It seemed to him that they were similar because they both had a debt that they must repay.
After these words, he invited him to go to the Central Heavenly Alliance together. A little drunk, Mu Wan was surprised when he heard such revelations. Seeing his reaction, the man began to laugh and said that he should live following his heart. Pointing his finger at Mr. Jin, Ha Jin Wool said that from now on, he is ready to become a soldier for the fifth generation heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. In the morning, returning to the tavern after a walk, Mu Wan thought that the nickname of the Northern Blade had quickly spread and had probably already reached the Central Heavenly Alliance. So soon many would want to know who he really was. Therefore, I thought it would be better to come to them first. He was suddenly distracted from his thoughts by Mr. Huang, whom he had completely forgotten about. The man asked what the young master was talking about with the strange man that he thought so deeply after that. In response, Mu Wan told him about a mad scientist who has incredible skills. He admitted that Ha Jin Wall asked to become one of his soldiers and expressed his desire to go together to the Central Heavenly Alliance. Since the young master respected that scientist, Mr. Huang was sure that he was an outstanding person, but still asked if Master Jin could trust him too and whether his joining was a good idea. Thoughtful, Mu Wan replied that it didn't seem like Jin Wool had any malicious intent. Still, they did not go together, since they needed to make some preparations for the trip. Master Ha was quite good and knew how to have fun, so he said that he needed to finish things off with the young widow. Despite some plans, he promised that he would join them when they set out. So he asked Master Jin not to worry and go do what he planned. Even though he was strange, Mu Wan had confidence in him. Yet they had no idea how that amazing strategist would know when the heir's detachment would depart. As soon as the guys entered the tavern, they saw that the third son of the White Dragon Merchant Troop had already come to his senses. The man was glad to see the young master and assumed that this was Mr. Jin. Once he was convinced of this, he began to thank him for everything he had done for their organization. To give weight to his words, Leader Yan said that the third son wanted to meet in person, and therefore had been waiting for him at this place since he came to his senses. Addressing the third son, the eldest Tang said that for at least three months he would need to take the antidote that had been prepared. If the son of a great family does this, then his internal injuries will be completely restored. In response, the third son thanked the great owner of poisons and promised that he would repay his kindness. After this, the master asked bodyguard Huang to come to him in order to properly remove the poison remaining in his body. The old man could not believe that the day would come when he received personalized treatment personally from the greatest master of poisons himself. He admitted that it was a great honor for him. At that moment, Mu Wan and the daughter of the Tang family named Mirai were left alone, and the Northern Blade was relieved and asked how they were able to create an antidote so quickly. The girl was a little confused by his sudden address and thought about the answer. She said that when they were in the Broken Fist clan, they had the opportunity to investigate the madman. Therefore, they were able to prepare in advance the ingredients needed for the antidote. Since Jin provided them with the original source of the poison, they were able to thoroughly research it and make an antidote. When her uncle figured out how to suppress the effects of the poison, he was able to use the Tang family's special acupuncture technique, which is performed by two people. After this, Elder Tang drew out the poisonous key from the master's internal meridians. Mu Wan replied that he heard that the Alliance Investigation Bureau entered Unam province two months before the Tang family and then used them as bait in their future investigations. He admitted that after all this, he was impressed that the Tang family was able to make an antidote within a few days. Mirai replied that this was actually due to her uncle. She admitted that she was born with a body that rejects poisons, so she will never be able to learn poison techniques but can only mimic some aspects. Hearing this, Mu Wan noticed that she felt some resentment that she could not achieve such heights. To cheer her up, Master Jin said that even so, thanks to her, the great owner of poisons is still alive, because it was Mira who saved her uncle from countless dangerous situations, putting her own life on the line. Moreover, without it, it would be impossible to perform acupuncture. Looking at her with a pleasant smile, the Northern Blade said that she was truly impressive before thanking her for her hard work. Such pleasant words from an attractive young man instantly made the girl's face blush. Shyly looking away, she answered confusedly that this was not the case and that in fact she had not done much. The third son intervened in their conversation with his thanks for the work done. Younger sister Soin told him everything, so he promised that he would repay the Northern Blade for his kindness. Mu Wan calmly replied that he had not done much, because the bodyguards of the White Dragon Trade Association, like the Iron Squad, suffered more than himself. Therefore he asked to repay them. Jenkins said that he had already personally thanked them for their help, so he could not forget about Master Jin, being not one who quickly forgets about those to whom he owes money. Finally, he promised to do his best and stated that if the Northern Blade ever needed help, then he could always count on the White Dragon Trade Association. After this, he swore on the honor and name of his family.
Mu Wan once again replied that he did not do this in order to receive any kind of compensation, because his original goal was to search for his uncle. Despite this, he admitted that he was flattered by his words. Looking closely at the young master with a sincere smile, Mr. Jenkin was sure that he was destined to leave a big mark in the world of Murum. Addressing the bodyguard, the third son noted that he had gone through a lot, after which he promised that he would pay for his kindness. He didn't even forget about the young bodyguard Munjun. In fact, he found it hard to believe that his actions would endanger the child's life. After that, Leader Yon joined the pleasant conversation and shouted to the entire tavern that they had three more days before they went home. Meanwhile, the investigation bureau continued its operation. One of his informants arrived to the captain of the first squad and reported that Mr. Yoon from the White Dragon Trade Association had received treatment and had fully recovered from his illness. This was yet another tactical defeat for the Heavenly Alliance, and Chok Mu was furious that the Tang family had found the antidote before them, even though they had begun research months earlier. He regretted ignoring the famous family's knowledge. After this, he learned equally terrible news for the Alliance that the demon fist of Cho Chen Wu had disappeared, despite the fact that their gate was sealed. The captain was surprised, knowing that Heo John was in charge of spying on the Broken Fist clan. In response, he heard confirmation of the information about the successful sealing of the clan gate. But as it turned out, even after Yunkin became a hostage of the Alliance, while they were escorting him to the appointed place, the Demon Fist suddenly disappeared. The situation became even more tense and Chok Mu could not think what the stubborn Demon Fist was planning. Everything did not go as smoothly as they had planned. So the captain decided to finish the work in the Cave of Despair and asked his ward to begin preparing for the road. He was going to quickly reunite with the second detachment of the Bureau. Meanwhile, the bodyguards had already prepared for departure. Captain Cohn was surprised for a second when he saw a bodyguard he didn't know. But as it turned out, it was Chun Ying's spy who disguised himself as one of them in order to continue spying on his target. Mu Wan continued to flirt with the Tang family's daughter without taking his eyes off her. But at one point, he had to be distracted by the appearance of a strange man on the horizon. The leader of the Iron Dozen, Yang Musun, immediately asked what kind of wonderful master was approaching their squad with his arms outstretched. Of course, this was a mad scientist whose cart was pulled not by a horse, but by a real bull. With a sly smile on his face, he shouted to the Northern Blade that he should hurry up and hug his faithful comrade. Such an absurd appearance surprised the young master a little, as could be seen from his look. In response, with a crazy smile and a wink, Scientist Ha began to laugh quietly, anticipating an interesting journey. Ten minutes later, the scientist Ha Jin Wool completely forgot about his new master, as he got along well with the master of 10,000 poisons. Their conversation began about medical practice, but eventually came to astrology. It was clear that they would not stop there, but not everyone was given the ability to understand geniuses. Seeing a man about whom there were controversial rumors, Mu Huan, known as the Great Mind, was interested in talking with the scientist of the three minds. It was the first time he had seen someone who possessed an incredible amount of knowledge. When Mr. Huang approached Master Jin, she asked if he wanted to go to the place where the destroyed tribe had previously been located. It was not far from them, so it was the right time to satisfy the interest. Nevertheless, they decided to temporarily detach themselves, and Mr. Huang informed the captain of the bodyguards that they had temporary personal matters. Saying goodbye to his soldier, Mu Wan couldn't even attract his attention because he was engrossed in a conversation with a person with a mentality corresponding to him. Young Mu San could not help but notice that one of the strongest warriors in their camp had decided to leave them for a while. He had a bad feeling about this, but he hoped they wouldn't run into trouble for not having the Northern Blade. Mu Wan and his uncle quickly walked towards their destination. Within a few minutes, the old man was exhausted, but they had just arrived at the location of the camp of the destroyed tribe. The snow flower began to scream even more. Sensing this aura, Mu Wan only made sure that they were in place. The rocky terrain, where there was nothing living left, gave them a certain sadness and a feeling of emptiness. While Mu Wan and his uncle were looking for what the snow flower was so interested in, their student was idle. For unknown reasons, he drew some marks on the ground and trees. At one point, he was so carried away by his work that he did not notice how he got caught up with some fighter. Seeing that everyone was standing still, he asked why they stopped. The soldiers of the Iron Dozen came forward and it was clear from their faces that something wrong had happened. As it turned out, the premonition of the leader of the Iron Dozen turned out to be true and they were unlucky enough to meet the remnants of the army of the Broken Fist Clan. At their head was a demonic fist that had recently disappeared from the radar of the Central Heavenly Alliance Investigation Bureau. It was clear that this furious man did not come with good intentions. Looking around the wasteland, Mu Wan asked to tell what happened at this place. About ten years ago, Mr. Huang passed here during one of his travels. 
They saw only ruins and one of his familiar bodyguards who knew about this place said that the people who lived here praised the stone that fell from the sky. Since it was an unusual stone, he took it with him in the hope that it would be useful to the young master. Other than the fact that the Broken Fist clan was responsible for this destruction, he knew nothing else. It was unclear why the Broken Fist clan would do such a thing, since there was no obvious point in killing the innocent people who lived here. When they walked further, Mr. Huang offered to examine one of the caves. This was the place where he found the stone that fell from the sky. The rather spacious place was intended only for the worship of the gods. As they walked inside, the sword began to vibrate even more than before. Mu Wan felt that the snowflower's crying was only getting stronger. At one point, the powerful energy of the sword showed him what was causing her to suffer so much. Holding onto his blade, Mu Wan looked closely at the passage deep into the cave, which was blocked with stones. Watching the young master, Huang was worried because he didn't know what was on his mind. Mu Wan suddenly approached the blocked passage and began throwing stones. Together with their uncle, they completed the task much faster, and saw something that explained to them the behavior of the blade, created from a mysterious stone that fell from the sky. Meanwhile, the tension of the Iron Dozen detachment had reached its limit. The leader of the squad, Yong Mu Sung, did not understand why the demon fist named Cho Chen Wu purposefully came to meet them. Approaching the squad captain, a man with an incredibly heavy aura assumed that the man standing opposite him was a northern blade. Feeling the powerful pressure, Yang Musong realized that the demon fist was serious. He guessed that he was looking for Master Jin because of what happened in the Jade City. He thought that they were forced to seal their gate due to a warning from the Central Alliance, so he didn't expect to see them here. Cho Chen Wu was not in the mood, and Master Yang understood that this was dangerous. He immediately thought that they needed to get out of this situation as quickly as possible, because they had no reason to put themselves in danger, since their first priority was to complete the mission without any incident. The Iron Dozen were on edge. They all hoped that this was not a conflict with the Broken Fist Clan. Addressing his new comrade, the Master of Ten Thousand Poisons asked what the Demon Fist was doing here. He too heard that he had sealed the gate and had to stay inside his palace. It was Hajin Wall who understood the situation best. Recalling the recent events in Jade City and the actions of the Broken Fist Clan, he understood that they wanted to gain trust and respect in order to hide their brutal actions. He concluded that since Master Jin had single-handedly prevented the Broken Fist Massacre and dealt with the Silent Knight, the whole world had learned of their cruelty, and therefore, filled with rage, Cho Chung Wu decided to personally meet the culprit of his immeasurable shame. Realizing that the Demon Fist was like a wild bear with an innate bloodlust, Ha Jin Wool guessed that their situation would soon become even more difficult. Meanwhile, the leader of the Iron Dozen decided to introduce himself and stated that the person Mr. Cho was looking for was not among them. But in response, the man with a terrifying aura only remained silent. Worried about his reaction, Leader Yan was forced to explain that Master Jin had recently left the group due to personal matters, but did not say where he was going. He also admitted that the Master would join them as soon as he finished with his business. Even after these words, the Demon Fist remained silent and only sawed the mercenary leader with its gaze. Addressing Mr. Cho, Leader Yang Musyong asked if it would be possible for them to continue their journey, the purpose of which is to return to the White Dragon Palace. Meanwhile, Mu Wan and Mr. Huan saw the place to which the snowflower was so strongly drawn. As it turned out, here were the remains of members of the destroyed tribe. Mu Wan looked closely at their bodies to find clues. It became obvious that they were indeed victims of a broken fist. All these poor souls were sealed in this place. Mr. Huang could not describe the feelings he felt seeing the cruelty of the broken fist's actions. Taking a closer look, Mu Wan noticed that all these bodies belonged to women. When Mu Wan was little, he heard stories that could become the next clue to a crime. As it turns out, this is most likely a place of demonic art that uses women to increase the master's internal key energy. Since this method was too cruel, Murim banned and classified information about it. But the picture in front of them was proof that this art had been used in recent times. Meanwhile, the time came when Master Cho, filled with rage, spoke his mind. He considered the Iron Dozen leader's words to be threats as he said the names of the trade association and the Tang family. Leader Yong Musyong understood that the situation was difficult. So he apologized and said that he did not think to say something like that. In response, Cho Zhang Wu decided to speak directly, followed by words that he was not in a very good mood due to recent events. He said that if he couldn't vent his anger, he wouldn't be able to voluntarily follow the orders of the Central Heavenly Alliance. After this, he said that based on the situation, his anger would be directed at those who traveled with Master Jin for causing him too much trouble. He believed that if he did this, then the Northern Blade itself would come to meet him. With a sly smile, the vile Master Cho declared that when the Northern Fist found out what he had done, he would appear before him very quickly. A truly terrifying grimace appeared on his face. After this, he ordered his soldiers to kill them all. 
Hearing this terrifying order, Leader Yon asked in confusion what Mr. Cho meant. In response, the leader of the Broken Fist said that if there is power, then it is a sin not to use it. In such a difficult and wild situation, Yong logically assumed that Leader Cho had gone crazy, since he was organizing a rebellion against the world and trying to overthrow the Central Heavenly Alliance, turning the entire continent against himself. Usually, the great mind of the squad took a long time to make decisions and doubted all the time. But this time, without much hesitation, he informed the head that their enemy would not negotiate. In addition, the second deputy spoke about the same thing and called on the head to give the order to accept the combat formation. Having listened to his faithful charges, young Musong understood that they were right. Enraged by the absurdity of this dangerous situation, leader Yan shouted that Mr. Cho was crazy if he dared to do such a thing. After that, he repeated his words regarding Master Jin leaving and asked why the hell they wanted to fight. Following these words, the man turned to his squad. The fighters of the Iron Dozen assumed a battle formation. The zombie-looking followers of the crazed Broken Fist clan were ready to fight, pointing his sword at the enemy squad leader. Leader Yang asked if he was really the Great Four Northern Heaven's Demon Fist. In response, the proud man, dissatisfied with a disrespectful tone, suggested that everyone had already forgotten what it meant to be one of the Great Four of the Northern Heavens. He believed that this was stupid impudence for which they would soon pay. Clenching his fist, Master Cho Cheon Wu declared that he was chosen by heaven, so his honor should not be neglected, because his fist single-handedly killed hundreds of enemies from the quiet night. Looking at the leader of the Iron Dozen who decided to resist, the head of the Broken Fist Clan stated that the peace that all of Murum enjoyed was achieved because of their efforts and strength. He called his enemies arrogant for not silently accepting their fate. In addition, he also declared his hatred to the government, which was trying to punish him for his actions in the province of Unam, which he considered his own territory. The formidable enemy in the person of the Demon Fist Master said that he was not going to let everything take its course and would no longer turn a blind eye to the actions of the Alliance. With a terrifying smile, he announced in anticipation of his actions that once he dealt with the Northern Blade, he would take over the heavens. Pleased with his speech, the man admitted that it was a little worrying that he had to put in so much effort, but he believed that this was what it meant to be the fist of a demon. Looking at his enemy, he declared that this was the reason why none of his great deeds and words should be mocked. With incredible anger that caused veins to appear on his face, he declared that he was the embodiment of reason, justice, and strength. After these hypocritical words, Leader Yan called him a crazy bastard and rushed to attack. Let's return to the history of the settlement, the location of which was called the Cursed Mountains. In fact, the locals, who lived separately from the rest of the world, called the mountain sacred. Many years later, a star fell, leaving a large crater which the local shaman began to worship. For the safety of her people, she spent her days praising the stone. But one day, something happened for which their lives did not prepare them at all. A brutal attack was carried out on their peaceful and non-disturbing settlement. The well-respected shaman, hearing screams from the burning camp, ran out. She did not understand who would attack her people and why. Before her eyes, all the men of their settlement were killed. The shaman was in despair. She did not know what they had done wrong to deserve this punishment. Unlike men, the enemies did not kill women, but they did not let them go either. The madmen who created this horror laughed before her eyes. Approaching the enemies, she shouted for them to stop. But as soon as she got closer, she was unable to find out anything. Her enemies caught her just like the rest of the innocent women. After being hit in the face, she lost consciousness. After some time, she came to her senses, but everything that was around seemed like a place of execution. Hatred for what happened was the only thing she felt at that moment. The girl cursed them all and promised that she would take revenge. The respected shaman wanted to become a spirit that could destroy them for what they had done to her people. In her final moments, she witnessed a demonic ritual. All these events and all this hatred of the tribe were embodied in the form of energy. So the stone they worshipped absorbed the energy and soul of the respected shaman. Seeing these memories that the blade shared with him, Mu Wan could not contain his emotions. The man he used to lovingly call Uncle Cho has become a terrifying killer. Zhou Cheon Wu not only betrayed the Northern Heavenly Clan out of greed, but also sacrificed countless innocent people. He mercilessly killed the inhabitants of the Jade City, and also forced his followers to learn a forbidden art that shortens their lives. And now it has also become known that he destroyed an entire tribe in order to gain more power. Clutching his blade with incredible fury, Mu Wan turned to his uncle in a rage, not understanding how he dared take the lives of others as bargaining chips. Despite the fact that he used to be a proud warrior who protected many lives while fighting against the Silent Knight. The heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was furious at how low his father's brother had fallen. Now he shared the scream and the fury of his blade. 
The young master's aura created incredible pressure that Mr. Huang couldn't help but notice. Turning to his blade, he asked the snowflower to wipe away her tears and promised that he would fulfill her vengeance. Captain Cohn found himself in such a situation for the first time in his life. He understood that their enemy was consumed by rage, so they would not be able to come to an agreement with him. Addressing his charges, he gave the order to draw their blades and asked his guys to make their enemies regret that they attacked them. As expected, Master Mire, without any doubt, took out her twin blades in order to protect her uncle from even such formidable enemies. The very intelligent master of 10,000 poisons understood that their enemy was a beast who had been killing people all his life, and it seemed that after many years of calm, he listened to his desire. He was incredibly disappointed in the man who was considered a war hero. Analyzing the situation, the strategic genius surmised that if leader Yang Musan could hold his own against the enemy leader, then the others would have to deal with the martial artists from the Broken Fist clan. After looking around, he decided to assess the strength of both sides. There were about 20 people on the enemy side, and each of them reached the peak of the sphere. On their side, there were about eight capable warriors from the Iron Detachment. Less important were the 15 low-ranking bodyguards from the White Dragon Trade Association. Analyzing the future battlefield, he noticed that it was an open, flat area, surrounded on both sides by trees. Licking his finger, he found out that the weather here was good and the wind was weak. He also noticed that rain clouds were beginning to appear above them. Clear skies with a chance of thunderstorms seemed like the perfect conditions for his evil plan. After the calculations, he asked the young bodyguard to come closer. Munsden was surprised that the mad genius remembered his name. The master of illusion said that he noticed that the young warrior had marked 17 places as they walked here. The guy was surprised by his observation and only confirmed his words. He could not understand when the strange master managed to notice this, if all this time he was tirelessly talking with the great owner of poisons. Handing the bodyguard a whole bunch of seals, Mr. Ha asked him to go over the marked places and attach the seals. After Kwok agreed, Mr. Ha whispered another detail of the plan into his ear. Hearing this, Munjong was confused and asked if the scientist was sure that he would be able to do this. Putting his hand on the young student's shoulder, Mr. Ha confidently said that he could do anything, after which he declared that he believed in him. Meanwhile, the Iron Squad that had already formed a battle formation was thinking about whether they should wait or go on the attack. The mercenaries asked their deputies to make a decision faster. The frantic force understood that if they moved rashly, they would instantly meet death. The great mind was tense and tried to calm down in order to make the right decision. But within a moment, the strategist of the Iron Detachment received a mental message. Ha Jin Wool informed him that on his signal, their squad should attack with all their might. Mu Huan did not understand what the scientist of three minds had come up with. Meanwhile, Kwok had already set off to complete the task. He acted exactly as the scientist of three minds ordered him. After attaching the seal to the tree, he immediately ran to the next position. As soon as he finished, he immediately ran to Mr. Scientist and reported the completion. Ha Jin Wool thanked him and praised him for his efforts, while Kwok wasted no time in running to give his next instructions. The preparations were completed, and the strategic genius thought it was time to get started. Looking up at the sky, he felt that the time had come. Maddened by the power, the martial artists of the Broken Fist Clan awaited the actions of their enemies. The Iron Dozen Squad waited for the scientist to give them a signal. In order not to waste time, the enemies decided to take the first step and slowly approached. Mu Huan was alarmed because he completely trusted the scientist, not even knowing what he was up to. Within a moment, clouds of dust appeared around the battlefield and the enemies thought that the Iron Dozen had more soldiers. Looking up, one of the masters did not understand what was happening. He expected reinforcements, but could not believe what he was seeing in the sky. Hundreds of arrows were aimed at them, falling almost at right angles. Turning to his comrades, he shouted that they should strengthen their positions and block the arrows. He stated that thanks to the Hundred Days Fist technique, these arrows would not pierce their hands. All the martial artists of the Broken Fist Squad formed to create an arrow defense. It was at that moment that Ha Jin Wool gave the signal. Hearing him, Mu Huan called upon the Iron Dozen to launch an attack. Taking advantage of the moment, they instantly gained some advantage, as they were able to strike the first blow. Looking up, Mr. Tang immediately realized that the cloud of dust and arrows was just an illusion of the incredible strategist who went along with them. Thinking over the situation, Mr. Ha understood that if they fought the enemies in the open, they would simply be overwhelmed by the difference in strength. He believed that the only chance was to force the enemies to lose focus and attack suddenly. For the great strategist, it was obvious that this battle was not about victory, but about endurance. He did everything so that they could survive until Mu Wan arrived. At this moment, the enemy's defenses were weakened, but Ha Jin Wool understood that trained killers were fighting against them, and that they would soon recover and turn the tide of the battle. Before this happened, he wanted to create another opportunity for salvation, and Mun Jun was in charge of executing this plan. 
At the same moment, Leader Yan struck his first blow. But to his surprise, it did not bring any results at all. The enemy was able to block his attack with a slight movement of his shoulder. Addressing his opponent, Cho Qian Wu said that the leader of the Iron Dozen was making a lot of useless moves. With a slight movement of his shoulder, he sent Yong Musan flying and he crashed into the rocky surface with a roar. Having incredible and undeniable strength, Master Cho continued to notice his opponent's weaknesses and said that because of such sweeping blows, his attacks were easy to read. Looking at the place where Leader Yan fell, Master Cho thought about his next move. Like a ferocious beast, the furious Yang Musan again rushed into a frontal attack. This time, he forced the enemy to dodge, because he used the Dragon Fang Soul technique, which had impressive power. The leader of the Iron Dozen used a large amount of energy on this attack, but it did not bring any results, so he jumped back to a safe distance. Demon Fist noted that his opponent was a very bloodthirsty fighter, after which he admitted that he was even a little stronger than he thought. After that, he decided to take the fight seriously and said that it would be a good warm-up. Stretching his hand forward, he angrily declared that Yong Musyong was worthy of tasting his venerable fist. Rushing into another attack, the leader of the Iron Dozen turned to the enemy, calling him an old beast, and asked not to look down on him. The fierce battle of the rest of the detachment continued. Munjong tried to push his limits as he eluded his enemies while trying to complete his mission. He attached the first seal for the scientist's second plan to the largest tree in the area. But as soon as he did this, a terrifying fighter from the Broken Fist clan appeared in front of him who was also a user of that dangerous technique. From his terrifying appearance, Quack was confused. The enemy suspected something was wrong, and decided to strike the guy for doing something suspicious. At the same moment when the guy was just swinging and could have been hit by a heavy fist, the spy's dog attacked the fighter of the broken fist and bit him on the hand. While the enemy was trying to deal with the dog, Quack caught and saw this as a chance. The furious guy was ready to demonstrate the results of his training despite the fact that his opponent was a martial artist. As expected, his strike was stopped with his bare hand. Before striking back, the master asked if the young man was really sure that he could harm the body, which was strengthened by the iron yang energy and the hundred-day fist technique. A strong blow from the enemy threw the young student aside and he crashed into the stone surface with a roar. The landing could not be called soft and a column of dust rose. The young warrior's entire body began to tremble from just one blow from the martial artist. At that moment, he remembered the words of his mentor, Master Jin, who said that he should remain calm extend his arm more when striking, and not make decisions on a hot head. The advice of his elder brother and the faith of the scientist of three minds was what gave him a second wind in such a difficult situation. Kwok Munjong did not give up and rose to his feet, encouraging himself that his opponent was nothing compared to his older brother. Both fighters charged furiously at each other. Noticing the trajectory of the enemy's fist, Kwok slightly changed his stance and swung his heavy sword hard. Slipping to the side, he delivered a powerful blow to the enemy's arm. In response, the furious master prepared his other hand to strike and shouted with mockery that it would not work on him. But after a moment, it became clear that he was wrong. The martial artist was simply shocked that his strengthened body could be injured by some brat. Dodging the second blow, Kwok Munjong pierced his enemy's stomach. The martial artist was shocked by the guy's impudence for managing to seriously wound him. At that moment, when the young bodyguard did not find the strength to finish the attack, a dog named Earth came to his aid and, with the inertia of his body, pushed the sword deeper. Despite his lack of experience, Quok was able to cope with his first serious opponent. The excitement of his first serious battle clouded his mind, but as soon as he heard the dog barking, he immediately came to his senses. He couldn't stay here because he needed to hurry and finish the scientist's errand. While collecting information from the battlefield, the scientists of the Three Minds were surprised the moment they learned that Munjun was such a wonderful child that he was able to complete his task. It was time to once again shake the battlefield, releasing his chi. Ha Jin Wool began using another technique. Looking around, the highly intelligent deputy Mu Huan realized that it was time for their tactics' second move. Addressing the entire detachment, he ordered them to retreat. The enemies did not understand why the mercenaries suddenly decided to retreat even though there were no losses on their part. But as soon as they looked around, they realized that something terrible was approaching them. A huge and terrifying palm appeared in the air and was aimed directly at them. Remembering the last enemy trick, they decided that this was again just an illusion and that nothing threatened them. At the moment when they decided that there was no point in retreating, part of the detachment fell from a powerful blow. But as it turned out, they were partially right. The palm was not a physical object, and this illusion did not threaten them in any way. But at the same time, hidden in these palms were huge trees that were cut down and directed towards the center of the road. Addressing the deputy of the Iron Dozen, the scientist said with a sly smile that while the enemies were taken by surprise, this was the best time to get rid of them. 
This was their chance, and Deputy Mu Huan gave the order to the Iron Squad to continue the attack. Meanwhile, inside one of the caves of the Cursed Mountains, Mu Huan was emitting an incredible amount of energy, which excited Mr. Huang. At one point, he old man noticed the presence of a stranger. Mu Huan looked around as he also sensed his appearance. Mr. Huang turned to the stranger and asked him to introduce himself. It turned out that it was Chun Ying's spy. He was simply shocked the moment he felt that evil qi energy again. The man remembered that it was the same key that had taken over his mind while attempting to search the target's belongings. While Mr. Huang was preparing to take the fight, Master Jin approached him and said that this was his assistant, and he had been following in his footsteps for some time. As soon as Chun Ying decided to show himself, he declared that he was not an assistant, but was simply watching the rising star of Murma. At the same moment a raven flew towards them. The dancer was horrified to tell them the news that the Iron Dozen had met the Broken Fist Clan's army. Mu Wan was shocked that this actually happened while they were away. Realizing the danger of the situation, he immediately hit the road. The guys couldn't keep up with him, but Mu Wan didn't pay attention to them, because he had to arrive at the scene as quickly as possible, not only to protect his comrades, but also to carry out the long-awaited revenge, the desire for which he shared with his cursed blade. Within a moment, Master Jin made such a powerful leap forward that he destroyed the stone surface and disappeared from the field of view of the others. The strength of the Northern Heavenly Clan heir and his blade raged at the thought that they were so close to their goal. Using demonic dragon sword techniques, leader Yan Musiong continued to unleash an incredible number of attacks, regardless of the enormous expenditure of internal energy. But all these attacks were nothing to one of the strongest warriors on the mainland. Cho Qian Wu continued to stand in place, and instead of dodging, he threw a strong blow. By creating a powerful shockwave, he was able to stop powerful enemy combinations. Leader Yan was alarmed the moment he saw that the enemy was able to block his attacks with just the wind generated by moving his hand. Within a moment, Master Musin decided to change tactics and found himself behind his opponent to strike him with an unexpected blow. At that same moment, Leader Cho spoke to him and said that it doesn't matter whether the opponent can anticipate your attacks or not, as long as your strength is significantly superior to him. After these words, he launched a terrifyingly powerful punch towards the leader of the Iron Squad. Despite all the efforts of Musan, he was simply crushed by the brute force of the furious enemy. Although Leader Yang was able to partially weaken the enemy attack by blocking it with his sword, he was still seriously injured. Turning to his opponent, Musan was perplexed as to why the demon's fist had not become weaker with age. Ignoring the question, Cho Cheon Wu prepared his fist for the next attack and said that he overestimated his opponent when he thought he would be suitable for warming up. Then he delivered a lightning strike from which the surface began to collapse. Leader Yan barely managed to escape the deadly attack. Demon Fist was surprised that the enemy was still able to dodge. Trying to follow the leader of the Iron Dozen, he felt that he was caught on something. As it turned out, Musin managed to secure his cloak to the surface with the help of his blade. At that very moment, it was time to strike back. Leader Yang Musyong took advantage of the moment to launch one of his strongest attacks. The Chaos Demon's cutting technique destroyed everything in its path, and it was hard to believe that anyone could survive such a thing. After the final attack, Yen could hardly stay conscious because he had spent too much energy and came under several heavy enemy blows. But looking at the column of dust, he saw that the enemy was still standing. Cho Cheon Wu was able to defend himself with his fist, after which he admitted that he had aged, since he did not notice the primitive trick of a weakling. Releasing his power, the furious warrior began to destroy everything around him. Leader Yang understood that the situation could not be worse, since the enemy not only blocked the attack, but also changed his attitude towards the fight. The powerful energy of the enemy began to overwhelm the battlefield, and Leader Yang could not do anything about it, as he was already at his limit. At the same moment, the leader of the Broken Fist Clan closed the distance with the leader of the Iron Dozen Squad, and struck him with a furious punch. On the battlefield of their troops, everything was also tense. Mu Huan saw that the trees that fell on the enemies only slowed down the progress of the battle, because the enemies quickly recovered and began to return to the battle formation. Users of terrifying prohibited technology are back in action. Analyzing the situation, the scientist of three minds could notice some positive things, because wasting time on such tricks infuriates the enemies, and they begin to lose concentration. Based on this logic, he thought that if they continued such attacks, it would not only reduce the enemy's strength, but also cause confusion. After this, he asked Mr. Tan if he had completed his part of the preparation. Everything was ready. But the old man asked how the scientist planned to use his poison if it simply temporarily blocked the collection of qi energy. In response, the scientist only asked whether the master of 10,000 poisons would be able to spread this substance to the entire battlefield. As it turned out, 
Mr. Tan has the ability to control poison only within the radius of his arms, so it was impossible for him to achieve such a distance. Hearing his words, Ha Jin Wu thought about how to solve the situation. Observing the conversation, Master Tang Meyer offered to give her the opportunity to deliver poison to the battlefield. After some time, new traps were set. Having completed the task, Quok shouted to the scientist that everything was ready. With a crazy look of anticipation, the scientist of three minds invited the guys to shake the battlefield for the third time. Rising to his feet, he began using the illusory technique again. After that, the entire area of their battlefield was surrounded by an illusory sphere. The enemies were surprised by the next trick, and began to doubt whether it was a real illusion or not. Within a moment, they began to lose the ability to see. Enemies began to lose concentration and inform each other of their loss of vision. Even the great mind Mu Huan was shocked by what was happening. He recognized this illusion, which is called the Charm of Night Ghosts. The educated master knew that this was an illusion whose protective properties were considered the best in the world. He couldn't believe that Mr. Ha was capable of something like that. In fact, the deputy also had mastery of illusion, but it would take him four days to recreate something like that. The incredible potential of the scientist of three minds made him think that such a person could control a large army with his skills. The talent of a scientist named Ha Jin Wool shone like never before. To cope with the enemy illusion, one of the enemy masters shouted to his comrades that they should collect chi and direct it to the eyes. But at the same moment, they realized that they could not do this. The reason for this was the spread of poison, which Mirai was already dealing with. But at one moment, some fighter felt her presence and directed his hand in her direction. Moments before the impact, she was able to dodge the deadly attack, but her poison vessels were destroyed. Noticing the enemy, the Broken Fist Clan martial artist shouted that the poison user was right in front of her and was close to the ground. Sensing her presence, the furious warriors headed towards her with terrifying force. Just when it seemed like there was no way out of the situation, Master Jin appeared in front of her. The girl was already saying goodbye to life, and could not believe that this gentleman would save her once again from inevitable death. Mu Wan entered the battles, surprising everyone around him with his terrifying energy. With one cleaving blow of eternal darkness, he got rid of those warriors who threatened the daughter of the Great Tang family. After that, he saw young Musong, who was on the verge of death, being in the hand of the enemy leader. Experienced warrior Cho Qian Wu sensed a strong energy approaching. Within a moment, Mu Wan knocked out of his hands his comrade, whom the leader of the Broken Fist wanted to finish off. The appearance of the Northern Blade was unexpected and spectacular. Filled with the rage he had dealt with his blade, Mu Wan angrily addressed his enemy by name. Looking at the master he was trying to find, Cho Qian Wu immediately knew who he was. He felt that this was the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, so he called him by name. The shocked leader of the Broken Fist quickly returned to his senses. He began to shout with a crazed expression that no one else could become known by the nickname of the Northern Blade. He said that now it was no wonder why the mention of this master got on his nerves. Holding his blade in his hand, Mu Wan greeted the enemy, calling him uncle. Cho Qian Wu was surprised that his nephew did not die seven years ago. He suggested that he should praise the heir for surviving. But he was still worried about the question of why Wu Wan returned to this world. If it was obvious that it would be better if he continued to live in silence, choosing a calmer and easier path. The leader of the Broken Fist believed that Mu Wan knew that no one in this world would accept his existence. In response, Master Jin said with a cold gaze that he thought about living an ordinary life. But over time he realized that the people of this world did not want to leave him alone. Looking at the hated uncle, he called him one of them, and mentioned his sins when, after the betrayal of the Northern Heavenly Clan, he barely managed to capture the Onam province, and could not properly take care of its prosperity, because of which the people dear to Master Jin were in danger. Moreover, it was because of the irresponsibility of the former member of the Great Four of the Northern Heavens that Silent Knight was able to pull off his clan. Looking at his uncle with hatred, Mu Wan said that he once respected him. Master Jin said that when he was little, in his young eyes, Master Cho seemed to be a strong and reliable person. But it turned out that this was a mistake, even though even after his betrayal he considered his uncle a worthy person. According to him, Cho Chan Wu has fallen beyond belief. Lowering his head slightly, the leader of the Broken Fist admitted that his dear nephew had indeed matured. Hitting the surface with the scabbard, Mu Wan spoke about something his uncle did not expect, namely the extermination of an entire tribe and the murder of the people of the Jade City. Mu Wan did not understand what he wanted to achieve, and assumed that he started this battle to take out his anger on them. In response, Cho Qian Wu stated that in order to achieve a great goal, it is necessary to make a small sacrifice. He was sure that this was one of the basic principles of the world, which operated throughout his entire existence. Hatred and anger consumed Master Jin, but he was still able to continue the conversation and asked if it was worth it, after which he again asked his uncle to look at what he had become. 
Mu Wan was distraught that the uncle he respected was now indulging his disgusting greed and lust for power, becoming nothing more than a decrepit, crazy old man. These words offended the former member of the Four Northern Heavens, and he asked the master to watch his tongue, after which he said threateningly that his small and stupid nephew needed to be taught an important lesson. While Mu Wan and his disgusting uncle were getting closer to the battle, the leader of the Iron Dozen finally came to his senses. At that moment, Mr. Huang ran up to him to make sure he was okay. This question was unnecessary. The condition of the leader of the Iron Dozen was deplorable, and he felt that all his bones were broken. Mr. Huang picked up the wounded fighter, who was dissatisfied with his disgusting luck against Cho Chion Wu. He thought that after such an incident, the White Dragon Merchant Troop should double his reward. Still, Mu Wan arrived on time, and in addition analyzing the situation, the chief tactician noticed that he had gotten rid of three opponents. Now they found themselves in an unexpected numerical advantage. Nothing was holding them back because there were only four enemies left. For the first time in this battle, they took the lead. Meanwhile, Cho Cheon Wu was in no hurry to fight and shared the story that when he was young, the Northern Heavenly Clan was everything to him. He believed that he was prouder of the clan than anyone else, and the whole point of existence was to protect the people of the mainland from the quiet night. However, in the end, he erased this feeling from his heart believing that people had no idea how hard and painful it was for him. Addressing his nephew, Demon Fist said that his father and he spent half their lives fighting against the Silent Knight, and thanks to this, they were able to return the world. After this, all that remained for them was to pass the clan on to their heirs and rise to the heavens, having every right to enjoy their glory. Cho Cheon Wu couldn't accept the fact that they were the only ones who suffered while the scum of the Nine Heavens took all the credit for themselves. The former member of the Four Northern Heavens believed that the leader of their clan was to blame for all this, that he was afraid of something, and refused to leave the North. Zhou Qian Wu believed that the fact that Jin Kuang Ho acted like this while being so strong could only mean that he was going to take over the world alone. In response, Mu Wan said that his uncle was wrong because he only saw him this way because of his own inferiority complex. With a sly and nasty smile, he responded with a laugh that perhaps his nephew was right, after which he stated that despite this, it was Jin Kuang Ho who was the only one who wanted to sell the Silent Night mainland. After this, he stated that in this case, Mu Wan is nothing more than the son of a traitor. In response to these ambiguous words, Mu Wan said with a serious face that he knows that Qian Wu believes this, even though he knows better than anyone that it is not true. The truth hurt the pride of one of the greatest warriors of the Heavenly Alliance. After that, without further ado, he sent a powerful blow of the king's fist towards his nephew. The incredible shockwave destroyed everything in its path destroying the rocky surface and turning trees into splinters. Even the tops of the rocks that were in the path of his impact were destroyed. Despite this, Mu Wan continued his speech and said that his uncle threw away his honor to gain more power, which is why he strived for heaven, because they were basking in their glory, which he only wanted for himself. While the enemy was about to strike again, his nephew added that being part of the Northern Clan was only a burden for Zhou Qian Wu, because he was afraid that if he left alone, his reputation would collapse and no one would respect him. And this was not the one an image he wanted to preserve. Furiously shouting at the enemy that he should shut up, the demon's fist sent another blow in his direction. Although Mu Wan blocked the blow, the powerful shockwave threw him into the rock, which cracked due to such pressure. The northern blade was still intact. His opponent was instantly nearby. But Mu Wan, filled with anger, was not going to run away from the terrifying force and made a dash to meet him. With a cold gaze, he stated that his uncle had slandered his father, killed and abandoned the Northern Heavenly Clan, and then asked the traitor if everything was exactly like that. Within a moment, two incredibly powerful forces collided in battle. Mu Wan underestimated his opponent and missed his blow. Because of this, he flew into the surface with a roar, experiencing not the softest landing. While in the air, Cho Cheon Wu called his opponent Dear Nephew, which earned him the royal wrath. He believed that now he must get rid of him so that the false rumors about the death of the air would become true. But just a moment before the impact, he saw a bright purple flash at the place where Mu Wan landed. The darkness reached him before he could even think about how to avoid the counterattack. A huge amount of eternal darkness crashed into the leader of the Broken Fist. Having barely blocked this attack, Cho Chian Wu landed on the ground, shocked that his nephew was still able to stand on his feet. He couldn't believe that his armor was damaged and an unexpected scar appeared on his face. Cho Chian Wu realized that having underestimated his opponent, he had behaved too carelessly. With an arrogant and intimidating look, the serious Mu Wan stated that from now on, he will reclaim the Northern Heavenly Clan's former heritage one by one. The battle between two people with superhuman strength changed the landscape of the peaceful area of U200 BHU200 Bunham Province. Now the tide of the battle had changed noticeably and Mu Wan was moving forward. 
The heir of the northern clan went on the attack and rushed to take revenge both for himself and for the tribe that was destroyed by the hands of his cruel uncle. A battle of this level was not what Cho Cheon Wu expected. His nephew turned out to be much stronger than he expected. The previous blow forced him to concentrate on his balance, kicking the surface. He raised huge stone wings into the air. Mu Wan was eager to strike again, so the experienced warrior decided to resort to cunning. He aimed his blow at the stone that he pushed in front of him. A huge stone flew towards the swordmaster, who was in the air and could not dodge. But this move did not at all change the direction of the air to the northern clan. He decided to cut the stone that was flying towards him. As it turned out, this was a diversionary maneuver. And a moment later, the enemy aimed his destructive fist at the swordmaster. Possessing incredible speed, the master managed to dodge. After that, Mu Wan aimed his blow at the old man, who now understood why his nephew was nicknamed the Rising Star of the Murim World. The fierce battle between the young master and the experienced warrior continued. They exchanged a series of blows, which were constantly blocked and brought no results. If this battle had taken place next to a detachment of the Iron Dozen, it is unlikely that anyone would have been able to survive. During the battle, the old man thought that the head of the Jin clan had never taught his son martial arts. He was sure that Kuang Ho only forced his son to read books, so he assumed that the Heavenly Alliance had missed some scrolls with techniques. It seemed to him that this was nonsense, because the Great Lord of the Northern Skies had taken away all the techniques. The hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques were taken by Master Cho, while the sword techniques were appropriated by Yang Chen Hua. Because of these memories, the leader of the Broken Fist could not understand why his opponent was proficient in martial arts. While preparing for a serious attack, he thought that it did not matter where and how Mu Wan acquired this knowledge if he was still an inexperienced master. Despite this, he sensed its danger and intended to stop it before it became a threat to his future. After that, one of the Northern Heavens Four used the never-ending Fists of Destruction technique. Mu Wan did not have time to escape from this quick attack. The crushing force destroyed everything in its path. The hand-to-hand -hand martial artist believed that this was the end. But within a moment, he saw that Mu Wan was able to avoid serious injury. Only a few cuts appeared on his nephew's body, and he was ready to strike back. Filled with a desire for revenge, Mu Wan spoke the name of his Shadow Sword of the End technique. His enemy didn't even have time to block before the young master rushed past him. The Broken Fist Clan leader's rough armor, which no enemy had even been able to damage in the past decade, was completely destroyed. To do this, Mu Wan used the Bloody Rain technique. The crushing power of the Northern Blade brought back memories for the experienced fighter. The memories of the leader of the fourth generation Northern Heavenly Clan. He thought that Guang Ho was skilled with a sword, but was still better than him in fist fighting, even though he had been honing the way of hand to hand combat all his life. Cho Qian Wu always puzzled over how Clan Chief Jin always won. He truly respected him and envied his skills because no matter how much he trained, he could not surpass the leader's skills. To him, the results of the battles looked like Jin Kuang Ho knew a secret technique that no one else had ever heard of. After their last battle, Cho Cheon Wu wanted to know the next technique, but the leader replied that he was already one of the best martial artists in the realm of transcendence. Despite his words, Demon Fist believed that he still lacked the skills to match the head. Master Kuang Ho replied that his follower was already incredibly strong and would have won if he had concentrated a little more. He was sure that there was no one in this world who could match his follower in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He advised him to act wisely and curb his emotionless nature, because although it is good for a martial artist to have a thirst for power, he needs to know when to stop. Kuang Ho believed that when the student understood his message, he would surpass his limits and gain even greater power. After listening to his wisdom to the end, Cho Qian Wu thanked the clan head for the valuable lesson. Next he asked the master whether he had made a decision regarding his recent proposal to move to the mainland. In response, the leader simply waved his hand and said that he needed more time to think about it. Cho Qian Wu believed that Jin Kuang Ho not only did not want to move to the mainland, but did not even want to teach him the last stage of martial art. He was sure that the leader feared that the demon's fist would one day surpass his strength. It was these guesses that brought him into the ranks of the traitors who overthrew the leader of the Northern Heavenly Clan from the throne. Once he completed his dastardly plan, he went to the library in search of knowledge about the final stage of mastering the hand-to-hand -hand fighting style. He was desperate because he couldn't find anything. He began to realize that the leader had truly taught him everything about the Northern Heavenly Clan. Not accepting this information, Cho Qian Wu continued to look for something else that he was missing. He thought there was something else great hidden somewhere. But at the same moment, he met the eyes of Mu Wan, the son of the leader whom he betrayed because of his thirst for power. Realizing the disgusting act he had done, Master Cho justified himself by saying that it was too late for him to retreat and he needed to go to the end. When it came to this, 
he decided to develop his own martial art that could surpass the Northern Heavenly Clan's techniques. The moment Mu Wan dealt him a blow that destroyed his armor, Zhou Qian Wu was cornered and said that he couldn't believe that he would have to use his own martial art that he specially created to defeat the Nine Heavens. After these words, the incredibly experienced warrior breathed in a large amount of air. The clenching of his intimidatingly powerful fists began to emit a red light. Mu Wan felt that his opponent had become much more serious and began to use a huge amount of his energy. The broken Fist Clan leader's hands literally burst into flames. It was the shining fists of heaven technique. Now Cho Qian Wu looked completely different. Mu Wan already felt serious danger from the huge amount of Qi energy. Taking a stance, he realized that now his opponent was on a completely different level than before. Clenching his fist, Master Cho looked simply terrifying, steam coming from his mouth as his body temperature increased to the possible limit. Mu Wan immediately became alert and prepared to attack. A powerful stream of energy was directed towards him. Mu Wan could barely contain this power with his blade. Within a moment, his opponent moved. Using this technique, the enemy completely transformed and became incredibly fast. So much so that even the Northern Blade could barely keep up with his movements. The enemy was already striking, and Mu Wan realized that he was too slow. The powerful destructive force of the Shining Fists hit Master Jin directly. Mu Wan could hardly hold on after being so seriously wounded. Within a moment, the enemy put his hand on his face. Grabbing his head, Cho Qian Wu lifted his nephew into the air. After that, he swung high to hit it on the surface again. But the master of hand-to-hand -hand martial arts did not have time to complete this blow. Mu Wan managed to escape from his death grip. And preparing his fist for the next blow, Master Qian Wu was surprised that the guy still had strength after the blow of his shining fist of heaven. This only confirmed that he was the heir of the great master Kuang Ho. After this, the hypocritical uncle called his nephew a traitor and furiously swung a second blow. A huge flaming aura of qi energy appeared behind his left hand. A moment later, powerful energy was directed at the master who was in the air and could not dodge. From a strong attack, Master Jin crashed into the top of the rock and destroyed part of it with his own body. Addressing his nephew, who was seriously injured from the last attack, Cho Qian Wu said that it does not matter how much he denies that his father is a traitor. Because if he cannot do anything, then the whole world will believe it, and the information will become true. Rushing into a furious attack, Master Cho called the young master of the Northern Clan the son of a traitor and said that his time had come to join his father. Meanwhile, the ferocious fighters of the Iron Dozen finished off their enemies without experiencing difficulties due to their numerical advantage. The scholar of three minds diligently encouraged them and cheered for their victory with all his might. Mr. Tang stood silently next to him. He did not share the desire to destroy the enemies of his colleague and said that despite the fact that it was these killers from the Broken Fist Clan who destroyed a huge part of the population of the Jade City, they had already lost the will to fight, and now they could spare those who surrender. Hearing these words, Ha Jinwo looked at Senior Master Tang coldly. Addressing him, he said that he was confident that the Master of Ten Thousand Poisons knew that he despised the world of Murum. He said that the mainland despises those who are not capable of being strong. Therefore, the weak are not only disliked by the strong, but also become targets for the weak and are consumed by both groups. He believed that this might not be the right time for them, but it was still necessary to finish everything properly, because in the world of Murima, it is always better to get rid of something that has reached a level far beyond your own capabilities. The same logic was followed by Cho Cheon Wu, who tried to destroy the threat that called into question his future dominance. Using the Reign of Heavenly Destruction technique, he aimed it at his niece. Mu Wan could not evade in any way because he was in free flight. The powerful attack instantly created a huge crater in the surface, from which a powerful shockwave spread. The leader of the Broken Fist Clan launched an incredibly powerful attack. Even after her, he continued to keep his fist on the face of the air of the Northern Heavenly Clan. He was starting to feel a little tired from using so much energy, but he was going to see it through to the end. But at that same moment, he felt a sudden pain. Master Jin's sword pierced his side. Looking at the guy again, Cho Qian Wu saw that he was still conscious and continued to release his cold and terrifying energy. At that moment, he was horrified by what was happening. He was shocked by what happened. He thought he saw the silhouette of a woman. As he walked away, he thought that the son of his leader, whom he had betrayed, was using some strange martial arts, because despite his experience, he could not read his movements. They were quiet, like a shadow, and disappeared without a trace. Mu Wan began to get up little by little and thought that if it weren't for the snowflower, he would have lost consciousness due to such a dangerous attack. After these blows, it became clear that Cho Qian Wu's demon fist was much stronger than he thought. At the same time, the leader of the Broken Fist Clan began to panic a little due to the strange influence of the blade distorting his senses. At that moment, Mu Wan realized that the subsequent attack was the chance given to him by the Snowflower. 
He struck the hilt of his blade hard with his fist, driving it even deeper. Angry at the situation, Cho Chian Wu could barely move and felt unbearable pain. After that, Master Jin used the hilt of the blade as a support. Pushing away from the blade, he drove his knee into his enemy's face. The rage in the guy's eyes was simply indescribable. Grabbing the disgusting enemy by the hair, he slammed his elbow into his head. Holding on to his opponent, Mu Wan continued this series of furious strikes. He was the embodiment of the rage he shared with his blade and all the victims of this disgusting man. The great warrior of the Four Northern Heavens could not resist. He wanted to stop his opponent but could not do anything. No matter how he tried, he could not move. As Mu Wan struck furiously, the enemy's body began to be enveloped in ominous chi energy. Gathering all his remaining energy, Cho Chian Wu began to resist the darkness that was consuming him. Mu Wan immediately noticed that the time for unanswered blows was over. Having performed an epic somersault, he managed to dodge the enemy's retaliatory strike and even took the blade with him. For the first time in the last ten years, Cho Chian Wu was so seriously injured. He was furious at what had happened, but believed that his exhausted opponent was no longer capable of anything. But a moment later, Mu Wan rushed to attack again. Cho Chian Wu decided to meet him with a blow, but the heir of the Northern Clan dodged the attack. At the last moment, Mu Wan started doing something strange with his sword and ended up changing his grip. Suddenly, he pierced his enemy's supporting leg. Then he delivered a series of fist blows to the enemy's body. To deliver the next blow, he grabbed his clothes. It was a high knee to the stomach, right where he had wounded his enemy with his blade. A series of lightning strikes caused incredible pain to the enemy and he coughed up blood. At the same moment, the weakened Cho Chian Wu launched a menacing blow with his fist, but Mu Wan blocked it with one hand. After that, the guy instantly returned his sword. Then he thrust it into the enemy's right hand, with which he was trying to strike him. Filled with hatred, Mu Wan continued to shred the body of his enemy. His right hand was immobilized and the furious traitor nervously clenched his teeth and swung his left hand. Mu Wan did not have time to defend himself from this retaliatory strike. At the same moment, he took his blade from the enemy's right hand. Instead of blocking the blow, Mu Wan plunged his sword into his forearm. Having wounded his opponent's pride, his hands, Master Jin switched to hand-to-hand -hand combat and began to strike him with countless blows with his fists. The wounds were making themselves felt, and the demon's fist was already in a difficult situation. Filled with rage, he called his opponent names and missed again. In response, Mu Wan tried to strike vertically, but the enemy managed to dodge. Missing a second time, the demon's emotional fist missed the sword strike in the shoulder. The productivity of the battle was sharp, and it was worth regrouping. The leader of the Northern Heavenly Clan and the leader of the Broken Fist Clan jumped back a short distance. Mu Wan was ready to continue the battle with his disgusting enemy. At the same time, Cho Chian Wu was on the verge of despair due to losing to some petty asshole. His arrogance did not allow him to stop. Without sparing himself, he shouted his nickname and declared that this was not the end. Without sparing his own body, the head of the Broken Fist Clan once again began to release a huge amount of energy to use the Shining Fist of Heaven. His furious cry spread to the entire surrounding area. Arrogance and pride did not allow him to soberly assess the situation. The battle reached its climax and turning to his uncle, Master Jin declared that it was time to end this. With smooth and quiet movements of the blade, Mu Wan began to use the technique. Eternal darkness began to envelop his body. With an unshakable, cold, and bloodlust-filled gaze, he asked the enemy to remember his words that he would kill him. After that, Mu Wan used his concentration skill and struck. His dissection was completed before Cho Chian Wu could do anything. In a split second, a powerful stream of energy was directed towards the leader of the Broken Fist. Cho Chian Wu didn't even realize what happened. The cut by the blade of the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was not stopped by the enemy's body, and with its power created an abyss in the middle of the province. An incredible destructive force shook everything around and the guys who were with the Iron Dozen couldn't help but notice it. The enemy was defeated and fell to the ground. Turning to his nephew, he asked in a trembling and weakened voice where he had learned this art of swordsmanship. Pointing his blade at his defeated uncle, Mu Wan replied that he learned it from the Northern Heavenly Clan. The old man, on the verge of death, was surprised that this kind of art existed in the Northern Heavenly Clan. It became clear to him that Yang Chen Hua only took the husk and not the fruit itself. After this, Mu Wan asked why his uncle did not use the qi energy that he acquired through the bloody demonic art that uses the blood of women. Cho Qian Wu didn't understand what he was talking about. He said that even if he wanted power, he would never go down the path of the demonic arts. All he had were his fists of heavenly destruction. His journey began in the Northern Heavenly Clan. After another defeat from the heir of the legendary clan on the verge of death, he realized that he still could not surpass him. Without looking up at his nephew's cold gaze, he asked to finish what he started. In response, Mu Wan coldly asked if he should expect the last words. But the leader of the broken clan only laughed at his question, saying that this would be contrary to his entire conviction. 
Without listening to his speech to the end, Mu Wan finished what he started. The hideous fists of heavenly destruction fell and no longer threatened this world with their cruelty. The young master's revenge against the traitor was carried out. Chun Ying, who was watching what was happening, could not put his face together, being shocked by the battle between the two monsters. The Battle of the Iron Dozen Detachment was over. Mr. Tan tried to discuss something with his niece, but Master Meyer probably couldn't distract herself from thoughts about the beautiful Northern Blade. The Iron Dozen, with the exception of their leader, were almost unharmed. Less important fighters, such as the merchant troops' bodyguards, were tasked with clearing the battlefield. Among the bodyguards who eliminated the terrible consequences of the battle was Mr. Huang. The deceased martial artists they fought against were formerly members of the Northern Heavenly Clan. He still remembered them, and therefore he felt some sorrow and heaviness in his soul. At the same time, Captain Khan and the children of the Hui family watched one person in surprise. Their particular interest was the scientist Ha Jin Wo. They were surprised by his skill. Master Ha used his art of illusion to slow down his opponent's movements, while at the same time indicating how and when to attack. While the battlefield was in chaos, he maintained a barrier to protect those who were not proficient in martial arts. Captain Cohn considered him simply an incredible master. He had previously heard that the scientist Ha Jin Wool was traveling with Mr. Jin, so he was sure that if they wished for something, they would definitely achieve it. Ha Jin Wool himself could finally breathe a sigh of relief, because all the battles, including his young master's duel, were already over. Nervously biting his finger, he thought that he had begun preparing for various events even when he announced that he would return to the world of Murima. Even a genius did not expect something like this to happen so quickly. Now it became clear to him that there was no turning back and now he was officially in the same boat with Master Jin. Still, he did not understand when his young master would return. As soon as he thought about him, his view changed because someone appeared on the horizon. Mu Wan walked slowly towards them, but for some reason dust rose behind him. Everyone present looked excitedly at the one who was able to survive the battle with one of the four northern heavens. Within a moment it became clear that he was pulling the hair of the former clan leader with a broken fist. Having completed his battle, he only now returned the snow flower to its sheath. Stopping, he was surprised at how the members of the Iron Dozen and the bodyguards of the White Dragon Merchant Troop began to behave. They all suddenly knelt down and bowed their heads respectfully before the one who saved their lives. Many people were injured, so the guys could not continue their return to the White Dragon Palace and set up camp. Mu Wan had already received medical attention and his entire body was bandaged. Mr. Huang saw his attitude towards the gift of clothes for the first time and excitedly tried to help sew them up, realizing that he would have to find something new in the near future. Addressing the Northern Blade soldier, Mr. Tang invited them to stop at their residence and rest on the way to the Central Heavenly Alliance. Scholar Huo didn't mind, but was worried that it would affect the relationship between the great family and the government. The old man replied that he would decide it himself. Meanwhile, the wounded leader of the Iron Dozen recalled recent events with dissatisfaction and said that all he now wants is to leave this problematic province as far as possible. The White Dragon's bodyguards were in charge of protecting their camp. Captain Khan was responsible for their work and asked to immediately report anything suspicious. As soon as Scientist Ho approached the fire where his master was sitting, he said that nothing in this world can be hidden forever, because people simply do not have the will and strength to do this. He was worried that the Central Alliance was probably already monitoring all their actions. At that very moment, some weirdo appeared in front of them and said that they shouldn't worry about it. Of course, it was Chun Ying's spy. He was monitoring the surroundings and could definitely state that only the Dark Moon would have information regarding this incident. Hearing this, those present were surprised. Analyzing the situation and the reports of his animals, Chun Ying found it strange that none of the Central Heavenly Alliance spies were here. Although both the Broken Fist Clan and the Northern Blade were involved in what happened, he expected that there would be at least one person from the Alliance here to spy on them. Yet he was in incredible shock when he saw even more power from the mysterious heir of the Northern Clan that he was able to kill Zhou Qian Wu himself. Looking at the Master, he was even afraid to think about what would happen next. At the same moment, shocked by what was happening, Leader Yang asked what the Dark Moon was doing here. He even felt the presence of this spy and was sure that in front of them was a martial arts master. In response, Mu Wan only silently nodded to him. Mr. Tang was also in thought. He thought that if the Heavenly Central Alliance was keeping an eye on Unam province, then it was strange that no one was keeping an eye on the incident here. Yet, he also admitted that he did not expect the Dark Moon to be involved in all of this. Looking at Mr. Jin, he wondered who that mysterious master with incredible power was. The scientist came to the conclusion that when the gentleman said that there was someone who was helping him from the shadows, it was precisely the spy of the Dark Moon. 
which already seemed like quite good support. Taking a closer look at the strange master of transformation, scientist Ha Jin Wool understood that the Dark Moon always wants to monopolize important information. But despite this, Chun Ying revealed his identity to them, which means that he is already an ally of Mu Wan. And, the Iron Squad, which was responsible for protecting the White Dragon Trade Association, thanks to the young master, was not only able to complete the escort work, but also retained its fighters. They owed an indescribable debt to the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan. The same applied to the Tang family, since they prioritize honor and respect. The scientist was confident that they would do everything to repay the savior. He couldn't say anything about Mr. Huan and Master Kwok, who looked ridiculous, because in fact, they were the reason why Mu Wan went to the province. There is still a White Dragon Trade Association left. They also received quite a lot of help from the master. So they will probably also return the favor and become a big financial captain for the future Northern Blade Squad. Still, the surprise that no one was watching them worried the scientist, but he chalked it up to simple luck. After that, he walked up to Master Jin and whispered something in his ear. As soon as he told the gentleman his plan, he invited those present to introduce themselves properly before continuing to talk about anything. After that, the scientist pointed his hand at the young master and suddenly declared that he was the head of the fifth generation of the Northern Heavenly Clan, named Jin Mu Wan. Hearing this, everyone present was in indescribable shock. The spy was simply shocked, because information that only the Dark Moon should have had was revealed to a large number of people. The shocked old man Tang could not believe that this was true, because the whole world thought that the last heir of the North had died in an incident approximately seven years ago. Taking the opportunity, he turned to Jin and stated that their head of the family always regretted that ten years ago he could not help the Northern Heavenly Clan. After that, he stated that if this was the case, then Mr. Jin should come and meet the head of the Tang family in person. Realizing that this was none other than the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, Captain Khan realized that now all the miracles began to make sense. It was then that he realized that in this case, Huang Chul was also a former member of that legendary clan that saved Morim from a quiet night. Upon learning such unexpected information, Leader Yun began to shout in surprise that his dear comrade Jin could have said before that he was the head of the Northern Heavenly Clan. He stated that he always knew that the young master was not an ordinary person, but someone mysterious and amazing. After all these violent reactions, Mu Wan continued to calmly and silently sew up his clothes, while his soldier Ha Jin Wool asked everyone to calm down and remembered that everyone present had received some kind of help from the air. To make sure of this, he piercingly examined those present and asked if this was true. After this, he stated that the Central Heavenly Alliance had already begun to take an interest in the rising star of the Murim world, a master known by the nickname Northern Blade. He meant that they still don't know that this is the last heir and the head of the Northern Heavenly Clan. But once they find out the truth, they will do everything possible to capture him. The scientist admitted that, although he was quite strong, if the Alliance came at them with all its might, then Mu Wan would not be able to win. He meant that now is not the right time to reveal himself to the world, because the young master still needs more strength and help. Extending his hands towards those present and theatrically closing his eyes, Scholar Huo said that now it was their turn to provide the heir of the Northern Clan with their support. Justifying the risks, he said that after the recent incidents, they are all in the same boat and bound by the same fate. Since the identity of the heir would be revealed sooner or later, Scholar Huo asked everyone to complete a simple task and try to keep it a secret for a while. Stating that he trusted everyone present, scholar Hajin Wool suggested moving on to the next topic. Pointing his finger at the ridiculous spy, he said that they needed Chun Ying to start working as soon as possible. In his defense, he recalled the words that they are connected by the same fate. Moreover, the Dark Moon wants to monopolize important information. He doubted that the representatives of that organization would be willing to back down after they had come this far. Having no other choice, Chun Ying resigned himself and asked what they wanted from him. The scientist replied that rumors are known for causing confusion, so he came up with an incredible and probably crazy idea. As it turned out, he did not want to draw even more attention to the identity of the Northern Blade, and asked to give out information about the death of the leader of the Broken Fist for an unsuccessful attempt to pursue and destroy the Quiet Knight organization. The scientist was confident that if the Central Heavenly Alliance decided to personally investigate the matter, it would only be a matter of time before they learned the truth. But for now, it would be better if everyone accepted their story as the truth. Dissatisfied with outside instructions, Chun Ying had no choice but to call his animals due to the fact that they had a new job. The spy wrote letters, which, with the help of his faithful animals, he transferred to the Dark Moon organization. Taking this opportunity, the third son, Jankin, approached the heir of the Northern Clan 
and said that if he ever needed help, he could contact the White Dragon Trade Association. He assured that they would do everything possible to support Mr. Jin. Mu Wan politely replied that their words were more than enough. Worried, Mr. Huang was finally able to approach his young master. With a sincere smile on his face, Mu Wan told his dear one that everything was fine and he could take care of his personal task from Mrs. No Tay Tay. The old man simply did not think that their paths would diverge so quickly. He promised that he would do everything possible to be close to the master. But since Lady No asked him to complete the task, he would have to leave the heir of the northern clan for a while. After listening to the young master's gratitude, Huang promised that as soon as he completed his business with the White Dragon Trade Association, he would continue to hone his martial arts, and when he finished, he would do his best to join the heir of the northern clan. With tears in his eyes, the younger brother Kwok promised that he too would do his best to become stronger and surprise him the next time they met. After that, he suddenly rushed towards Master Jin and hugged him tightly one last time. He thanked him for everything he had done for him and asked him to take care of himself. Mu Wan was touched, and with a sincere and kind laugh asked his younger brother to also be careful, after which he assured him that they would meet again. Then the leader of the Iron Dozen approached them and asked if Mu Wan was really going to the Central Heavenly Alliance. Master Jin was surprised by his interest and replied that this was so, and on the way they would stop at the residence of the Tang family. As it turned out, Leader Yang wanted to share rumors that due to the unexpected appearance of Silent Night, the Central Alliance had decided to recruit countless young masters to create a powerful organization. Most people from small factions and trade associations want to join, so they all head to the Central Alliance to avoid missing out on the opportunity. The world of Murim does not focus on strength, but on a person's belonging to a family, so it is now quite noisy there. At the same moment, a scientist joined them and said that all this seemed strange to him. But the Central Heavenly Alliance would gain two things from this situation. The first is not only the liberation of Unnam province from the greedy tyrant, but also the sealing of the gates of the problematic Cho Cheon Wu. This allowed the government to freely recruit young martial artists hungry for power. The second thing is that they were able to turn the situation with the advent of a quiet night in their favor. In response, the great mind of the mercenaries said that the government's plan was impressive. And what he thought was even more incredible was that they were able to pull off all this, as if they had already expected this to happen. Mu Huan assumed that the Nine Heavens could predict the flow of this world. The scholar of the Three Minds agreed with him. He believed that there was a reason why the Nine Heavens had remained at the top of their world for centuries. They looked like a giant tree, whose roots reached to unprecedented depths, and whose branches hung above everyone. Without thinking about the scientist's wisdom, Yan assumed that most likely Mu Wan was interested in forming a new group. In response, Mu Wan said that he was actually heading to the Central Heavenly Alliance since their confrontation was inevitable, and it would be better to attack them first. As it turned out, the only reason why the leader of the Iron Dozen spoke about this was because he was going to go to that place after completing the mission. He believed that they would see each other soon and promised that he would never forget what Mu Wan did for them. After saying goodbye to his new comrade, the heir of the northern clan asked him to take good care of his mercenaries. Leader Young Musan replied that there was no need to worry about this and advised the head of the heavenly clan to look after himself, because a lot of danger awaits him. After these words, the squad split up and Mu Wan, along with Chun-In and Ha jin Wol, set off on the road on the Tang family's cart. Meanwhile, in another part of Unum province, something unexpected happened. The Central Heavenly Alliance reconnaissance team fell at the hands of a man who used the forbidden martial art of the blood of ten women. The leader of the squad, Chok Mu, also fell at his hands. Behind it all was a man who was not happy with the way he was being treated. Yunkin revealed his true identity. He was furious, believing that he had worked for many years because of his stupid father, not to become a hostage to the Central Heaven Alliance. The hypocritical and deceitful heir of the Broken Fist clan, Cho Yunkin could no longer contain his thirst for blood and power, which was even more terrible than his father's. Continuing towards the Tang family's residence, the scholar of the Three Minds continued to explain his views on the world, and said that a time would come when the past and present would mingle with each other. He wondered what Elder Tang thought about his words, that fighting for supremacy would open the gate to the world of martial artists. All this talk did not really bother the young master, because he was thinking about recent events. After slaying his bloodthirsty uncle, he learned that he was not the one who had drawn the wrath of his blade. Someone else was behind the destruction of the peaceful tribe in Unnam province, because Cho Cheon Cho stated that he would never have followed the path of demonic art. Thinking about who used the demonic blood art of ten women, Mu Wan began to think about the possible culprits of the incident. He correctly guessed that it could be Cho Yunkin, but remembering his identity, he doubted it. He was distracted from his thoughts by the daughter of the Tang family, 
Master Meyer once again thanked him for his help. Muan modestly replied that these were nothing, because they counted, since he himself was saved thanks to her. By saying this, he meant that the jade amulet given to him protected his heart from the blow of the spear of one of the lords of the quiet night. The girl of course did not know about this and asked what he meant. In response, Mu Wan only smiled charmingly and did not admit what really happened. Meanwhile, Chun Ying was going crazy as usual. As soon as he appeared in front of them, Elder Tang asked if he could find a suitable road for them. The incredible master answered displeasedly that of course he could, because he is one of the best pathfinders, for whom finding the road is nothing more than some trifle. Mu Wan thanked him for the work done, but this did not make the spy feel any better. He said that it would take them about ten days before they reached the small town, so Chun Ying suggested that they hurry up. One day of the trip they stopped next to a small rock where Mu Wan could enjoy the full moon alone. He found peace in solitude and an opportunity to talk to himself. Of course the scientist could not ignore him and joined him, beginning to preach his wisdom that despite the great disorder in the world, the sky is still beautiful, and it seems that they are all stuck in a crazy dream. Noticing the master's behavior, the scientist Ha Jin Wool suggested that he had something to think about, after which he suggested that living following the call of your heart is not so easy. Scientist Ha said that Murum has always been ruled by force, because predators are at the top of the food chain. But on the other hand, it seemed to him that the strongest masters are not always at the top, because those who rule for many years plan their ascension. He continued the assault with his thoughts on how life happens in Murim, after which he shared his opinion that as soon as only the strongest remain, the world will once again enter a new era. This whole story led to the fact that if Mu Wan wants to live following his heart, then he needs eyes that can see how the world is changing. He wanted his master to have knowledge and understanding of everything that was happening around them. He warned the master that this was only the beginning of their journey, and he needed to focus on his goals, while his faithful comrades would be happy to help resolve other obligations. In response, Mu Wan promised that he would remember his words. On the way to the residence, Chun Ying noticed a small town and suggested taking a break. The guys, tired from the road, didn't mind visiting some tavern and finally getting some sleep on a comfortable bed. It turned out that this city was even larger than they expected, so they had the opportunity to find a decent tavern. Looking around, Mu Wan did not pay attention to the people, of whom there were quite a lot. One of the residents passing by grabbed the master's shoulder and angrily asked him to watch where he was going. Mu Wan was not one to seek conflict, so he politely apologized to the disgruntled person. But the strange man did not immediately move on. He took a closer look at the weapon that was in the hands of the stranger. After that, he looked displeased into the eyes of his offender. As soon as he moved on, he said that there are always scum like this man who kill people without thinking for a second. He was sure that Mu Wan was from the nobility and lived a carefree life, and then learned the basics of martial arts. Looking around, Mr. Tan asked what happened. The master of reincarnation was surprised at such audacity and suggested that that impudent guy could have lost his life at such a moment if Master Jin had not been kind to him. After the incident, Mu Wan moved on as if nothing had happened. But after a moment, the realization came to him of what he had noticed. Mr. Tan has already noticed something important is missing. He didn't understand how it happened, so he looked around. As it turned out, that impudent guy managed to steal two bags from him. He noticed in advance that the old man had bags of a very convincing size, and therefore deliberately distracted the gentleman in order to steal them unnoticed. As soon as he moved further, he decided to see how much he managed to steal. He felt from the very beginning that the old man was very rich. As soon as he opened the bag, he saw some substance inside that resembled pollen. At the same moment, Mr. Tan shouted to him to be careful because there was poison inside. But it was already late and the pollen began to evaporate, completely covering the poor fellow's face. Mr. Tan called Mire and said that they had an emergency problem because the thief could die from a collision with his poison. He understood that such an amount of yang poison could instantly kill the poor fellow. But after a moment, he was simply shocked by what was happening. The thief was fine and began to cough unhappily at the poison he had accidentally absorbed. After looking around, he looked offended and dissatisfied at the master of 10,000 poisons. He decided not to apologize and moved on, saying that it was just a waste of time and he should find a new goal. But after a moment, Master Jin appeared in front of him. The daring guy asked what he wanted. Mu Wan politely extended his hand and asked the thief to return the stolen goods. His strange but well-mannered request took the thief by surprise. After that, he grabbed his head and sighed heavily. The strange, impudent guy hid the bag of poison in his pocket and refused the offer, asking what the master would do for him in this case. After that, he said that he had already dealt with idiots who carried a sword for show. According to him, people like Jin act so arrogant and noble, but as soon as you push them a little, they fall down like a bag of straw. This behavior of people belonging to noble families infuriated the thief, so he liked to beat the crap out of them. 
and considering Master Jin to be the same, he rushed to attack. But just a moment later, Mu Wan not only dodged his furious blow, but also struck back at the opponent's stomach using the hilt of his blade. The thief jumped back and was surprised that some arrogant bastard was still able to hit him. He realized that his opponent knew something about fighting after all. Addressing the daring thief, Mu Wan calmly said that all this could be avoided if he returned the stolen goods. He promised that if the guy complied with his request, he would be released and forgotten about this situation. But the impudent guy still perceived his speech as hypocritical, so he replied that now he would definitely not give him up. Rushing into a furious attack, he stated that he had lowered his defenses earlier, but would be serious from now on. But as soon as he approached, he received a warning blow to the back of the head with a scabbard. After this, the thief began to quickly move around his target, trying to confuse the young master. Watching him, Mu Wan was surprised by the strange position in which the thief moved. Master Jin understood that this guy did not know the basics of martial arts, but was just fighting fiercely. Although the thief had explosive power, he did not know how to use it properly. Mu Wan clearly saw that the enemy was relying only on his instincts, and his method of fighting was intended solely for survival. Despite the thief's efforts, no matter how hard he tried, he could not reach the body of his target. Moreover, at one moment he became convinced that the master was significantly superior to him in speed. In a split second, Mu Wan found himself behind the furious guy, who was unprepared to defend himself. After that he stabbed him in the stomach using only the sheath of his sword. The thief could no longer continue the battle and Mu Wan decided that now they could talk. Having prescribed him medicinal bream with a scabbard, he asked if he was sure that the master whom he wanted to beat was really from the nobility, who lived a carefree life, and then studied the basics of martial arts. To change his attitude towards martial arts a little, Mu Wan began to strike him with instructive blows and said that a good family means nothing, and he himself was never rich and did not have a comfortable life, because once upon a time his life was torture, and he did everything possible to survive. Mu Wan stated that even if they don't know each other's situation, that doesn't mean they should live by hating others and committing petty theft. Filled with hatred for the people around him, the talented thief asked his enemy to shut up, believing that he did not understand at all what he had to go through. One day, while still a child, this guy from a poor family began to wander around different clans with a small amount of money, begging to be accepted into the clan. Turning to the master of the next clan, he apologized for the fact that he could offer only a little money, but hoped that this would be enough for the entry fee. The little tramp said he had talent, but the arrogant look of the master of one of the clans spoke for him. The situation changed the boy's life forever. The vile and disgusting master disrespectfully knocked out all the money that a boy from a poor family could hardly get. Tears appeared in the eyes of the poor fellow from that attitude. Returning home to the slums in which he lived, he had to constantly hear apologies from his sick mother. She was seriously ill and feared for what would happen to her son. Turning to him, she was sure that he had talent. A woman who was on the verge of death apologized to her son for giving him a poor life, because of which she was unable to develop his talent. After those words, she handed over to him all the money that she had managed to accumulate during her miserable life. Before her death, she said that she hoped her son would become an outstanding master. The cruel master could not believe that some peasant had come to humiliate their clan by calling himself talented. At that moment, the arrogant master said that real talent is to be born into a noble family and have a worthy origin. The words of the disgusting representative of some arrogant family set the boy on the path of contempt. At that moment, he rushed at the arrogant bastard with hatred, and not knowing how to fight, fiercely bit his shoulder with all his strength. Mu Wan still stopped, seeing how the thief was behaving. The master guessed that this poor fellow had not lived the best life which made him think this way and feel resentment towards martial arts. At the same moment, Mr. Tan ran towards him and asked him to stop. The 10,000 Poison Master said that this guy has a special talent and is a very unusual person. Hearing such speech, the thief looked with disbelief at the gentleman from some great and, in his opinion, arrogant family. Still, even this run was not the easiest. Senior Tang thought that although he was born with an innate immunity to poisons, his body was unsuitable for martial arts. Unlike him, Mirei has good physiology which allowed her to study martial arts, but unfortunately, she is not immune to poisons. However, the boy they met in such a strange way had both qualities. Mr. Tang saw him display his martial prowess during his fight with Mr. Jin. In the Tang family, people who possess both qualities are incredibly rare. His personality might be a problem, but the 10,000 Poison Master believed it was fixable and definitely worth his time. As soon as he approached the thief, he extended his hand to him, and said that he was sure that he must have heard the name of the Tang family of Sashon. The great lord of the Tang family introduced himself to the thief as the owner of 10,000 poisons. After that, he said that it was a pity that the guy they had so awkwardly met lived like a street thug, 
and no one noticed his talent. He admitted that he looked everywhere for a person who was blessed with good physiology and chi energy meridians. After these confessions, he declared that the thief had excellent talent and invited him to become his student and master of poisons. The poor fellow, beaten for instructive purposes, could not believe his words. At that moment, he probably remembered his mother's last words and felt that there was still hope. Having respectfully bowed to the ground, the guy introduced himself as Miang Ryusen and stated that he was bowing to his mentor. Meanwhile, somewhere on the mainland, a single trading caravan was traveling. At one point, the merchant decided to stop, since the sun had already set and it was worth setting up camp. Looking around, he saw a man on the site of a long, defunct village. It was some girl with long hair who was sitting alone by the fire. The stranger was surprised and decided to approach her. He greeted the young lady and introduced himself as Yu Chang Huan, the head of some new trade association. They had planned to stay here, but suddenly they saw a young lady and wanted to know if she would be against their company. It was Eun Ha Seol. She looked around to see who had decided to disturb her. Seeing such a beauty in front of him, the man blushed and wondered why she was all alone in such a place. The girl shook her head that she didn't mind. The merchant thanked her for her kindness and decided to stay in the same place. After some time, his group set up a small camp here. They had enough provisions with them that they could even prepare a good dinner. Looking around, Chang Huan was surprised that the lonely girl was still sitting by the fire. He decided to give her a treat since he didn't see any food near her. The girl looked at the food with a calm gaze but said nothing. Seeing her reaction, the guy was a little confused and said that there was no need to worry. The food was not poisoned. It was meat soup. The merchant believed that it was not only tasty but also filling. Yun Ha Seol hasn't eaten something like this for a long time. She remembered that she had once heard similar words from a person who had vaguely returned to her in her dreams. Still, she accepted this soup and admitted it, that it is very tasty. After tasting this meat soup, she felt like she had eaten something similar before. Taking a closer look at the lonely girl, Merchant Yu was surprised that she was here. They were in the middle of a desert known for dangerous wolves and other animals. This was clearly not a place for walking, much less for a young lady to be alone. He was wondering why she was here, so he cautiously asked what her business was here. The girl replied that she had no business here. After that, the man asked where she was going. Enjoying the taste of the soup, Yun Hasol replied that she was heading to the mainland. Most likely they were on their way, and the merchant asked to clarify where exactly she was going. Instead of words, Yun Hasol simply looked at the curious merchant. While eating meat soup, she asked with a stern look why he was interested. The man was confused. He didn't want to arouse suspicion, so he justified himself by saying that it was quite dangerous here, and he wanted to invite her to join them. He convinced her that if she was uncomfortable, they would take it for granted. When the girl asked why he was interested in her, Trader Yu first complimented her on her appearance. But after that, he became embarrassed and said that she reminded him of his little sister, because they were about the same age. After these awkward words, a short silent pause began. After finishing the soup, Yun ha -sol replied that in that case she wouldn't mind being in their care for a while, after which she politely asked for more soup. The man was glad for such company and replied that in that case they would continue the journey together in the morning. Having had a good rest in a tavern with good conditions, Mr. Tang's detachment began to prepare for departure. They replenished their supplies and were ready to travel for several days without stopping. Former thief Meng Ryu San gathered all his things and was ready to go with them. His eye shape noticeably changed after Master Jin taught him a lesson in life. The scientist was surprised at how the appearance of the new disciple of the Master of Ten Thousand Poisons had changed. Senior Tang replied that in addition to the beating, the swelling around his eyes was also due to the fact that the guy had been telling his life story all night. He shared information that the future Master Mieng was a poor guy who grew up without adults on whom he could rely. Still, Mr. Ho asked if this guy was a good choice, because although he was born with talent, his manners were too wild. The scientist shared his opinion that people cannot simply be corrected and used again. The Elder Tan agreed with his words, but added that Mieng himself could always re-educate himself. The old man believed in him, and judging by Ryu San's reaction, he wanted to prove him right. Looking at his new mentor's niece, the guy blushed and noticed that she was very beautiful. At that moment, Mirai looked with particular interest. Sensing the right moment, Ryu San decided to show his affection and blew her a kiss. But as it turned out, Mirai was not looking at him at all. A moment later, Master Jin passed by him, whom she greeted with pleasant words. The guy with the incredibly puffy face was unhappy that Mu Wan continued to get on his nerves. He decided to demonstrate his determination and approached his offender, after which he shared with him the words that his mentor had told him the previous night. Ming stated that people looked down on him because they did not see his true talent. After this, he declared that this was just the beginning, and that he would soon surpass the master who had recently defeated him. In order not to drag out this conversation, Mu Wan invited him to fight again, but he reluctantly refused and apologized for his rudeness. Meanwhile, 
Inside the Central Heavenly Alliance, former mercenary Captain Chong brought the leader of the Special Intelligence Agency to his young lady, as she ordered. The girl allowed the visitor to go inside. It was Mrs. Hiran, and she still remembered the man she had seen seven years ago. Without showing unnecessary emotions at the sight of the daughter of the Westgate family, Master Seo only agreed that they had not seen each other for a long time. The girl first of all said that she wanted to visit him earlier, but she was postponing the trip, so they met only now. As before, Hiran was accompanied by her sister, who had mastered the art of using a spear. In response to the lady's apology, Head Seo said that this was unnecessary, after which he inquired about the purpose of their meeting. After that, the girl began to slyly remain silent. Then she suddenly said that the reason for their conversation would be Jin Mu Wan. Without showing any reaction, Master Seo was convinced that the conversation was really about his master. As it turned out, she was ready to assume that the master known as the Northern Blade was none other than Jin Mu Wan. In response, Chief Seo repeated his words that he personally saw Jin Mu Wan inside the burning house and continued to watch the place for several days, waiting for reinforcements, but did not notice any signs of life. After these words, he said that if he really survived the fire and escaped from there after it left, then perhaps the Northern Blade could indeed be the heir of the Northern Clan. In response to his words, the girl was only surprised that he agreed with her. Then Master Seo shared information that they had already begun to look for the Northern Blade. He admitted that the Secret Investigation Bureau was not as good as the Westgate family, and then asked if she wanted to hear what they had found out. In response, the girl said that learning something new would be very useful. Next, Seo Mu Sang shared some information, and since they finished, he said goodbye and promised that they would contact again soon. The polite and hypocritical Hiran apologized once again for wasting his time. As soon as the door closed, her gaze changed. She doubted that she was wrong as she felt that Chief Seo had kept a lot of information from her. At that moment, she thought about how to verify the veracity of the information. Without hesitation, she asked her ward to appoint someone to monitor the head of special intelligence, saying that he might be hiding something else. She warned her sneaky but loyal ward that this would not be an easy task, since their target was the head of the Secret Investigation Bureau. As he left Lady Hiryong, Master Seo remembered that whether it was seven years ago or now, the only one who is in the spotlight of the Muram world is the young warrior, the lone star of the East, Dam So Jong. The whole world knows that he went to live alone to study after defeating a hundred masters. Many of his followers believe that when he returns, the course of history will change dramatically. But the world does not know that he went into loneliness precisely after a humiliating defeat during an incident in the palace of the Northern Heavenly Clan. They had to keep it a secret because their plan requires everyone to believe that Dom So Young is invincible. Seo Musang understood that since his master had seen this defeat with his own eyes, the young Azure Dragon Masters were panicking that this information could come out and ruin their plans. The head understood that now he would be watched. This began to irritate him. The situation became increasingly tense, and Seo Musang decided that it was time to make his move. Divine Radiance of Enlightenment is a martial art that is far from complete and requires continued cultivation and development. 150 years ago, an abnormal martial artist who was obsessed with winning appeared in the world of Murama. After countless battles, he was able to lay the foundation for his martial art. He did this so that in a world filled with darkness and chaotic techniques of fighters, a force would emerge that would rise to the top and shine brighter than anything else. Those times were the birth of the divine radiance of enlightenment, but this martial art has always been passed down from one heir to another. Each heir was obliged to spend his entire life cultivating this art and developing it further than his predecessor. And now the sixth heir to the generation of divine radiance of enlightenment is none other than Dam So Jong. It took him seven years to improve his strength, which was once not enough for him. The world did not yet know about his first defeat in battle against the monster from Silent Night. The humiliation he experienced that day not only left scars on his body, but also changed him into a different person. Master Dam So Jong was going to repay his enemy a hundredfold and was determined to give him revenge. After this, it was time to leave the cave in the wasteland in which he was cultivating energy. His incredibly powerful force destroyed this entire mountain and a huge crater appeared in its place. Meanwhile, Old Man Tang began discussing the topic of poisons with his new student. Since Mieng thought that it was just a scary thing that could kill you, the master of 10,000 poisons added that although this substance is scary, it can also be used as a medicine. The guy who had been stealing all his life and never spent time studying did not fully understand what he was talking about. The old man understood that his student was still distrustful of his words. So he stated that they would first learn the restoration poison, which could strengthen the personality, while they would save the rest of the huge amount of substances for later. Having obtained such a disciple, he could return to the topic of the poison of rebirth, which would guarantee that a person would become much stronger than before. 
He personally created this poison and spent decades perfecting it. But he did not have the opportunity to use it without testing, because it was too dangerous. But now that he had Ming Ru San at hand, who had not only strong resistance to poisons, but also good physiology, he was confident that the effect of the substance could be tested on him. If successful, the Tan family would use their knowledge to medicine. To begin with, he decided to let the guy enjoy the poisons and offered to check how strong his resistance was. Closer to the morning, Mr. Tan spent his entire supply on the student and could not believe that the impressive guy had an immunity to poisons even stronger than himself. Mieng Ryu San felt that he was simply filled with poison, but did not experience any particular discomfort because of this. After a few days of travel, the old man noticed that since the disciple had been consuming revitalizing poisons for a long time, his energy meridians should also have opened, which meant that his key reserves had certainly increased. Now he invited him to familiarize himself with the basics of poison techniques and asked the incredibly talented student to focus energy on his fingers and then slowly draw out a small amount of poison. The guy tried with all his might to fulfill his teacher's request, and in an attempt to do this his whole body began to shake. After some time of persistent attempts to complete the initial task, he saw the result. The poison from the vessel began to slowly reach his fingers. The old man was simply shocked that he managed to master this basic so quickly, although not perfectly. Rejoicing at his student's success, the master of 10,000 poisons began to laugh heartily and shouted that he was right about his student having incredible talent. Ryu San showed tremendous progress in just one week of training. The lonely guy had never heard such compliments before. He began to feel embarrassed and covering his face, thanked his mentor for teaching, but did not forget about his pride and loudly declared that his talent was simply incredible. While Ming's student was enjoying his small victory, Mr. Tan continued to praise him and suggested that he finish his training, after which he asked him to focus on martial arts. Unexpectedly for his student, he said that the person who would be responsible for teaching him martial arts would be Mr. Jin, after which he noted that it was a great honor to study with a master of such a level. Apologizing to the heir of the Northern Clan, the old man regretted that he did not give him the opportunity to rest. But Master Jin didn't mind helping and replied that everything was fine. As expected, the only one who was not happy about this training was the student himself. Mu Wan walked up to him and asked him with an intimidatingly serious look to prepare himself before he was beaten badly. After a few days they finally arrived. Addressing his escort group, the 10,000 Poison Master thanked them for their work and said that after resting at the Tang family residence, they would head to the Central Heavenly Alliance. From the appearance of the Poison Master's disciple, one could definitely tell that his martial arts training had been very productive. Looking ahead, Jin Wool confidently said that this place is no different from an impregnable fortress. The Tang family's residence did look inhospitable to outsiders, but that was true for all the prestigious families in the Marima world. Addressing his master, he said that the clan's atmosphere, training hall, lifestyle, martial arts, and such things could be assessed, as could their future. Soon they will become familiar with their history, and this will give the young heir guidance on the path he will choose. At the same moment, Chun Ying approached them and stated that he could not visit the residence with them. He stayed on the battlefield too long, so he needed to visit the main headquarters. He also said that when they move out, they don't have to worry about him joining him, because he will find them without much trouble. Before saying goodbye, Mu Wan thanked him for all the help he provided. Chun Ying headed to the main headquarters of his organization to report on everything that happened regarding the Northern Blade. Even though they were able to survive such a difficult mission, Lady Meyer looked somewhat sad. The uncle understood what was going on. He assumed that the niece was worried about the fallen warriors of the Tang family who could not return home with them. Unfortunately, they could not even find the bodies of their comrades. Turning to Mira, he asked her not to consider herself to blame for this loss, because those fighters always lived on the edge, and there is nothing unusual in dying on the battlefield. Closing his eyes, he concluded that this is the fate that awaits all the warriors of Marim. The girl agreed with her uncle's words that they were able to survive only thanks to the valiant sacrifice of their comrades. Now it is their turn to repay this debt by continuing to live and glorify the family for their sake. After that, the guys looked at their guests and invited them to go inside the palace. A mysterious master of poisons was already waiting for them on one of the rocks. The head of the family was interested in his guests and looked forward to the productivity of their meeting. As soon as the main gate opened, many followers came running to meet the younger leader who were sincerely glad that he was okay. Having walked inside, the guys began to look around with interest. Tang Gimen first introduced his students to his disciple, after which he asked them to give him a medical bath. Ryu San did not show much admiration for this idea, and the followers of the Master of 10,000 Poisons had to drag him under their arms. Then Mr. Gimen introduced the honorable guests who saved his life more than once. 
he asked the followers to put them in the best room and provide them with everything they might need. As soon as the guys settled down in the provided rooms, Mu Wan went out for a walk to inspect the estate of the great Tang family. His loyal soldier postponed this matter until later, because he planned to take a good bath since it would be bad not to take full advantage of the Tang family's hospitality. While looking around the residence, Mu Wan noticed that the Tan family loves nature, and this place is truly different from other famous clans. The trees here were incredibly tall and Master Jin looked up. At one moment he felt something inappropriate for this situation. Somewhere near him one could notice the thirst for blood. In addition, Mu Wan noticed that the stranger possessed a huge amount of chi, but he could not find out the exact location of this person. Looking around, the guy realized that this energy had begun to spread. It became clear that he was suddenly trapped. The high level of stealth, due to which Mu Wan could not even calculate his location, told him that this was the work of a martial artist in a superior realm. The mysterious master must be nearby to maintain his trap. Mu Wan prepared to meet the enemy at any moment. Sharpening his senses, he began to control the area at a greater range. At that moment, he felt the presence of an enemy to his right. After that, surrounded by dense foliage, Mu Wan made a quick lunge towards the unknown, but very powerful key. Master Jin began to draw his blade, his energy directed forward. There was a man in front of him who did not expect to be discovered so easily. Within a moment, the young master's blade appeared at the alarmed old man's neck. In his defense, the master who set the trap said that he had gone too far with his joke. He mentioned that he wanted to do something similar because he knew someone similar to their surprise guest when he was young. When asked who he was, the old man replied that he had the highest position in the family. Of course, it was the Poison Emperor, the head of Tang Gong Wu. Looking at the young man, the man assumed that he was the last heir of the northern heavenly clan named Jin Mu Wan. Having hidden his sword, the young swordsman was surprised that he was seen through so easily and quickly. After that, the guy bent down to pick up the old man's cane. Returning it to its owner, he confirmed the assumption of the head of Tang. Then they went for a walk together, and the head continued to complain that even small movements hurt his body. Taking a look at the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan, the old man admitted that he was the first person to easily break through the twilight of hundreds of falling leaves. He was glad to see that the Northern Heavenly Clan's strength continued to live on. Having mentioned this topic, he had to pause before his next words. Feeling guilty, he said that he lived his life mourning and regretting what happened to the Northern Sky Clan. Ten years ago, he could not do anything to save the Northern Clan, and this continued to gnaw at his conscience. Addressing the air, he asked to be forgiven for simply watching as the Northern Sky Clan fell into ruins. He knew that this might seem like a simple excuse, but he said that he really couldn't do anything at that time, because his main priority was protecting the Tang family. Recalling the past, Lord Tan Gim Wu said that these were harsh times, because anyone could become the target of their mad desire to destroy, and if they stood up for the Northern Heavenly Clan, they would also become their target and suffer the same fate. A wise old man called this a problem of group mentality, because when a crowd is influenced, it will not accept any other opinion. He further mentioned that when you have many people under your responsibility that you need to protect, it is only natural to become weaker. He admitted that instead of rebelling against the crowd, he took the easy way out and remained silent. He didn't agree with what was happening, but he couldn't change anything. Having the strength to resist, he chose the path of silence and believed that this was his cowardly sin. When old man Gim Wee heard that the leader of the Northern Heavenly Clan was killed by those scum, the heaviness on his heart became even more palpable. And even after a while, he did not feel better. Speaking to Master Jin, he said that it seemed like he had no choice but to go along with the conflicts. He believed that his life would change the fate of many people, and his actions would also lead to the death of others. After these words, the old man asked if the heir of the Northern Clan was ready to withstand the treacherous fate that would fall on his shoulders. Mu Wan told him that he had no idea what awaited him, but he was not going to allow himself to be consumed by fear. Although he did not know what awaited him at the end of this journey, he believed that since he had chosen this path, he would go through it to the end. Hearing these words, the old man responded with a sincere smile. He went on to say that when he looks at the heir to his comrade's clan, he involuntarily remembers the words virtuous and just that illuminated the early years of his life. He was known as the fair hero of the Tang family. As the years passed, the words that had shone brighter than anything in his life began to fade, and after 60 years, they had no meaning to him. However, when he looked at Mu Wan, the flame of this meaning flared up again. The old man admitted that the young master was putting him in an awkward position, and he was again at a crossroads, but this time he would not turn away from his path. After that, he unexpectedly bowed and declared on behalf of the head that from this day on, the Tang family would fully support Head Jin. The old man promised in his name to protect the heir from any dangers that await him ahead. 
At the same time, recent news had also reached the Supreme Sword Castle. They learned that Cheon Wu was killed on a quiet night and his son disappeared. Having learned that the Broken Fist Clan was ruled by elders, the head assumed that they would soon have an internal conflict. Remembering his comrade, the man thought that even though Master Cho was a cruel evil beast that didn't stop and didn't think about the consequences, he was still too stubborn. While tending his sword, the illusory Cursed Blade believed that they, the Four Lords of the Northern Skies, must stick together to have the strength to face the Nine Skies. He was excited about what would happen next. The Tang family began paying their bills as promised. The old man asked the guy not to burden himself with thoughts of excess, because he saved his life. While Mu Wan was in the healing vat, the master of ten thousand poisons and his followers used their energy to restore his body. The heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan was pleasantly surprised by the effectiveness of their method. For him, it was simply incredible. He felt as if all his accumulated fatigue simply disappeared, and his blood circulation improved. For the first time since visiting Unam Province, he was filled with power. The Tang family's abilities were something he truly admired, but treating such an incredible master was not easy. Tang Gimwi was surprised by the amount of ki that the heir of the Northern Clan possessed. Because for most people, their therapy would have ended long ago. It was quite a difficult job. The followers were so tired for the first time after such a procedure. So the master of ten poisons asked them to take a short break and focus on restoring their key energy. After this, Master Gimvi shouted to his student that it was his turn. Mieng Ryusan enjoyed a pleasant healing bath and did not want to get out of there. A week later, Mu Wan was ready to depart. Although his body was covered in scars, thanks to the Tang family, he was able to recover from the last battles. The largest scar on his stomach was a reminder of the past when he fought the Demon of the Quiet Night. But in fact, Mu Wan didn't even think about revenge. Remembering that day, he thought about the girl for whom he fought. He missed her very much and would like to know how she was doing. At one point, he was suddenly asked to come inside. The guy returned to reality and began to get dressed, allowing him to enter his room. It was Master Meyer and her one of the family's maids, the niece of the Poison Emperor, who said that their head had prepared a special gift and wanted her to personally deliver it. Continuing to get dressed, Mu Wan was pleasantly surprised that the head of the Tang family decided to give him a gift. As soon as Mirai saw his body, her face turned red, and she was confused. The girl in love began to worry so much that she hastily and uncertainly clarified that this was the cloak that the head of the family wore when he was younger. It was made from the skin of a fire bear and the scales of a serpentine dragon, so it had high resistance to wind, fire, and rain. Embarrassed, Mirai looked away and also said that inside this cloak there are countless pockets where you can put personal items to save more luggage space when traveling long distances. The old maid noticed the young mistress's attitude towards such a respected guest and said in a whisper that it seemed to her that the young mistress was already ready to get married. In response, Mira asked her in a whisper to be silent. Mu Wan himself was confused, but not because of Mire, but because of such an unexpected valuable gift. He thanked them with a sincere smile for such a wonderful thing. On this day, his squad was about to leave the Tang family palace. As soon as he approached the main entrance of the palace, he suddenly heard a compliment that the cloak fit him just fine. These words belonged to the master of 10,000 poisons. He wanted to know if Mu Wan was ready to depart. At the same moment, the scientist was pleasantly surprised by the quality of this gift and said that it looked very reliable. At the same moment, Master Jin was surprised why Mr. Tang Sr. decided to come out to them before the main entrance. In response, Master Gimvi said that the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan is the type of person who does not worry about the health of his body. He stated that even if he was young, he would not be able to last long with such an attitude. That is why Gimvi believed that his squad needed a healer like him. He admitted that even though he had spent most of his life researching at the Tang family residence, he still believed that he still knew a lot about the world. However, after seeing the incident in the Jade City and meeting new people, he began to realize that the people of this world must learn the truth about the atrocities committed in Murim. He shared the feelings of the heir to the Northern Clan and wanted to do everything possible to fix the world. The old man had a premonition that Mu Wan could change this world so he firmly said that he wanted to follow him on this adventure. Mire's lover decided to join his words and added that wherever her uncle went, she was obliged to follow him, since he was worth looking after. And this is also what the head of the family wanted. In addition, they were also going to take that eccentric who was picked up as a disciple on the way from Unnam province to the Tang family palace. Mieng Ryu San was willing to continue training during the journey, even though it would be Mu Wan's squad. While Mr. Tan shouted at the little shit for wearing the wrong clothes for their family, Mu Wan asked what his fellow scientist's opinion was on this matter. Jin Wall had already heard that the head of the Tang family had sworn allegiance to his master. He believed that if this was true, 
then it would be a good idea to agree to their proposal, since having their power and knowledge at his disposal would be very useful. Having agreed on all the details, the guys accepted those from the Tang family into their squad and said goodbye to their followers with honors. As soon as Mu Wan walked towards the exit from the palace, he saw an old man watching him at the top of one of the trees. The head of the Tang family was excited about how the heir of the Northern Heavenly Clan would change the entire world. Noticing his presence, Mu Wan respectfully thanked him for all his support. Meanwhile, Yun Haseol continued her journey with the merchants. The girl seemed mysterious to the traders. She spent all her time on top of one of the carts, enjoying the wind. Driving past populated areas, merchants tried to sell their goods. But unfortunately for them, no one was interested in what they offered. Their journey was full of disappointments. After another failure, they silently returned to their cart, where a beautiful girl was silently waiting for them. Looking at her, Merchant Yu forgot that his business had no profit. Her mysterious appearance made him smile sincerely. While on the mainland, the girl continued to think about life. It was time for another dinner. Watching their journey, the White Witch of the Night saw that those merchants had not been able to sell anything over the past few days. They were refused wherever they went. The girl wondered why they continued to smile and laugh so much. The behavior of these guys seemed rather stupid to her. As soon as she remembered the words about stupidity, some forgotten memory seemed to her again. She realized that she had previously used this word in relation to some person whom she had forgotten a long time ago. She was curious about what connected them, and who the person was that gave her strange, long-forgotten feelings. After a hearty dinner, the merchants went to bed, but Yoon Hasol continued to look at the sky. Their camp began to be surveilled. Some guys saw the traders and thought that they must have a lot of valuable things. There were four brothers, but one of them did not come because, due to his unnaturally great libido, he went in search of a woman. Those madmen were known as the Four Tainted Monsters. These four brothers were born from the same mother. They are strong masters who have learned the demonic arts and are located near Qinghai province. They are also extremely cruel people who primarily plunder villages. Just as they decided to attack the sleeping merchants, a girl suddenly appeared on a rock behind them and asked what they were planning to do. The fact that someone appeared behind them so suddenly surprised the brothers greatly. Addressing the pretty thieves, Yun Ha Sol said that those merchants are hard-working and good people, although they cannot sell anything. She asked them not to even try to harm them. Still surprised by the appearance of the pretty girl, the brothers began to look at her in surprise. After that, they started getting embarrassed and talking about how cute she was. One of them thought that her older brother had sent her to them, but the smarter fool was sure and convinced them that she was with those merchants. Seeing a pretty girl in front of them, they could not resist and reached towards her, saying that they were not going to change their plans. Their pathetic behavior caused the white witch to smile evilly. Rising to her feet, she called the thieves vile. After this, Hasiel suggested that they would not want to die that day. Hearing her words, the brothers stared at the beauty in surprise. After a short silent pause, they began to laugh loudly, thinking she was cute, while one of them dared to say that he was ready to play with her. But a moment later, his head was divided into two parts right in front of the brother's eyes. Yoon Ha Sol, without further ado, struck the first blow. The brothers were shocked by what happened. They felt rage and understood that this pretty girl was a dangerous person who was not to be trifled with. As soon as these guys began to use their energy and took out weapons, the girl was surprised and said that she was disgusted to even think that she and such a rabble had the same weapons. With a cold gaze, the white witch, filled with bloodlust, said that this made her want to get rid of them even more. Because of what happened, the brothers rushed to attack with threats. Even though they are martial artists, they were unable to hit the unarmed girl, and she easily avoided their combination of blows. Right during the battle, the girl began to yawn, wondering if all people from the mainland were so weak. While dodging all the furious attacks from the demonic arts masters, she said that if the rest of the mainland masters were so weak, then she would prefer the assassins that her master sent every day. Glancing arrogantly at the disgusting scum, she said that they were not even worth using Moonlight Chakra. The brothers' furious attacks continued, and they asked the unarmed girl to shut up and tell her who she was and who sent her. Not wanting to answer their stupid questions, the girl carried out an instant attack and ended this disgusting fight. Looking around, she did not feel a bit of pity for those scum and thought that such people did not deserve the right to life. In the habitat of Silent Night, it was time for the meeting requested by the master of a thousand sounds of death, Yon Jung Hak. Next to him stood the lord known as the Spear of Black Wings. He supported the parasol so that the old man would not get wet in the rain. The first to come to their meeting was an intimidating big man who first of all asked which of them behaved like a little girl. As it turned out, he meant the demon of sound, because he was emitting a very sad melody. The old man with the huge axes on his back is one of the four great demonic lords, the axe of complete destruction named Manchu San. 
Seeing the ghostly spear in front of him, the warrior seasoned by fierce battles, said that thirty years had already passed since their last meeting. The terrifying lord of the quiet night, who almost killed the heir of the northern clan, was glad to see his old comrade. At the same time, a woman who thought she would arrive at the meeting place first also joined them. It was the lady witch of the white knight named Seo Jem Hyang. She came accompanied by her faithful ward, Master Sa Ren. Looking at the woman he called his elder sister, the axe master noticed that despite the fact that they had not seen each other for thirty years, she had not changed at all. Almost everyone was assembled. They were waiting for only one overlord, a master named Ye Sion Myun. Remembering the master with the nickname the Whirlwind of the Dark Spirit, the old man asked not to forget his life motto about his freedom, because of which he most likely hangs around somewhere and does not even think about the fact that his comrades are wasting precious time. However, the White Witch believed that when they made a decision, he would most likely be the first to come to their aid, because he had always been a sympathetic person. Continuing to play a sad melody, the Master of Sound said that it was unfortunate that their great gathering did not live up to its name, due to the fact that it was a quiet night in a pitiful state, and the demonic lords had lost some of their power. Remembering his great loss, Master Yong said that although Danny P was not his blood, he seemed like his own son, so he would not allow his enemies to get away with his death. The heir wanted Silent Night to awaken from sleep. He did not give up until the end, and did everything possible to save the organization. After these words, the old man asked the overlords to look at what they had become, saying that they had not only given up, but also accepted the reality in which they lived, refusing to change anything. He believed that they had all become useless adults who did not allow children's dreams to blossom. Addressing the old man, who was delivering his speech with pain, the White Witch noticed that, unlike such a life, his desire would lead to even greater sacrifices and many innocent lives would suffer because of the war. But the bloodthirsty master with the title of the Axe of Total Destruction believed that even if sacrifices had to be made, it would be better to at least try to return to the mainland rather than simply wait for death in isolated lands. He vehemently declared that the blood of the heir to the mastery of sound was on their hands, because it was because of their negligence and incompetence that he died. Everyone believed that Dan Yep was the one who revived the passion that they had long forgotten. He felt sad about their insignificance, because they threw their burden on him, calling the guy their last hope. But when times were hard for him and he needed their help most, they never did anything. Master Chun San's emotional words were a bitter truth, but the spearmaster asked him to let off steam a little later. But the old man disagreed with his comrades' words and asked them not to forget how they were expelled from their own land. After these words, silence began, which was interrupted by the master of ten thousand sounds of death. Pointing his hand towards the moon, he said that in any case, the final decision would be made according to the will of their leader. The old man declared that the Lord of the Night was already approaching. After the return of Silent Night, the Central Heavenly Alliance decided to create an organization of talented masters called the Invaders. By becoming a member of the organization, you will not only be able to have direct influence on the factions, but will also have the opportunity to control and regulate them. It is for these reasons that the organization has gained great recognition from many young but ambitious martial artists. The taverns between Sachong and Hubei provinces became very noisy as many masters headed to the Central Heavenly Alliance in hopes of joining the invaders. Among those interested were a pretty girl with an incredible appetite, which attracted the attention of the other masters. At one point they forgot about her charming appearance because a man entered the tavern, making them nervous. There were three iron rings on his blade, which immediately indicated that he belonged to a great family. The guys assumed that this was none other than the heir of a famous family in Shandon province, known as the Three Rings Clan. They believed that in front of them was the sword master of the fleeting falcon. Looking at him, they remembered the other promising heirs, namely the members of the Azure Dragon Association, an organization that was created by the Children of the Nine Heavens the leader of which was the infamous Dam So Jung. In addition, what was also interesting for their discussion was that all three of the key individuals of the Azure Dragon were also members of the Seven Lesser Heavens. They heard that other members of the Seven Lesser Heavens had also joined that organization. The first official member of the Azure Dragon Association was none other than the Swordmaster of the Fleeting Falcon that suddenly appeared in this tavern. Looking at Cha Moon Ho, the ordinary guys were sad because in their world, those in power were devouring each other, not allowing them to make a name for themselves. After a moment, they were surprised. Mr. Cha approached the mysterious girl they had been staring at before and assumed that they were traveling together. As it turned out, recently the swordmaster had been very persistent in some proposal, but the girl again replied that she was not interested in it. In response, 
the annoying guy from the great family asked the Mu Mountain Shaman named Namso Ren to think about this proposal again. As soon as the onlookers realized who she was, cold sweat covered their faces. Only the successor of the Mu Mountain Clan received the title of Shaman, and it was sure to be a skilled swordmaster who had reached the peak of the spiritual realm. Since they were also responsible for preserving the future world of Morim, the people from the mainland chose them to be part of the Seven Lesser Heavens. And so the Shaman of Mount Mu named Nam So Ren became one of the Seven Heavens. This was all that ordinary people knew about the mysterious organization. Previously, Miss Hirin, who manipulates the world of young masters, met with him personally and asked him to do his best to lure as many martial artists into their association as possible, especially someone from the Seven Lesser Heavens. She promised him a generous reward. Sitting down opposite the young shaman, Mr. Chamun Ho continued to pester her with stories about how the chance to join the Azure Dragon Association does not come often. Brazenly taking food from her bowl with his dirty hands, the Swordmaster also said that with him, the Alliance already had four of the Seven Lesser Heavens. He believed that even though they were already from famous clans, with the help of the heirs of the Nine Heavens, they would gain even more power, which would allow them to control the world of Morim. Seeing that the girl did not change her mind, he suggested that she look at it as just a meeting or reunion and not feel burdened by this membership. At that moment, the girl remembered the words of the head that he said during their last meeting. Addressing the heiress of the Mu Mountain Clan, the man said that they were once again entering a turbulent era, as with the advent of Silent Night, chaos reigned. He mentioned that they usually ignore what happens in the normal world, but now it was clear that they could no longer turn a blind eye to it. Therefore, Namso Ren was ordered to go to the outside world. As the daughter of the head, the girl without a doubt agreed with her mother's order. After that, she decisively went to the outside world, where the bloodthirstiness of the arrogant great clans awaited her. During the conversation, she realized that since the world was descending into chaos, the Azure Dragon Association would benefit from this and gather its own army of martial artists. After that, the girl put her hand under her head and moved closer to her interlocutor. Master Cha was happy and thought that her reaction meant that he had finally gotten through to her. But just a moment later, the girl with cold eyes said that Seven Heavens is nothing more than an exalted title that was forcefully imposed on her so that she would become part of the scum that belongs to the government. She insisted that she would never join their pathetic group of friends and asked not to distract her from eating and disappear from sight. His expectations were not met, and he was simply shocked by such a refusal of an incredibly profitable offer. He could not believe that he could not keep Lady Heron's promise. At one point the girl noticed that a group of some craftsmen was entering the tavern. It was Mu Wan, accompanied by his squad, and unfortunately for them, this was not the first tavern that was packed to capacity. As soon as they were about to leave, the shaman of Mount Mu decided to take advantage of the situation and shouted that she had been waiting for them, after which she called them to the table. The guys noticed that they were addressed specifically to them, but did not understand what they were talking about. At the same moment, the girl apologized to her interlocutor with an awkward smile and said that she was already a member of another association, which bears the name So Ren, which is why she rejected their offer. While the shocked swordmaster could not utter a word, Nam So Ren hurried the guys, whom she introduced as her comrades. Rising from the table, Master Cha said that he didn't even know there was an association with So Ren, after which he apologized for his arrogance, clinginess, and what had happened over the past few days. As he left, he wished her a good time in the company of his colleagues. As soon as he began to leave, the shaman of Mount Mu forcibly seated Mu Wan's party at the table. Leaving the tavern, Cha Moon Ho was angry that instead of accepting their offer, the girl chose some second-rate masters. He couldn't accept her answer, and believed that she was looking down on both him and their association. The guy promised to repay her for the humiliation that he experienced. The girl continued to feign the joyful reunion of her imagined association until the swordmaster left the tavern. As soon as she heard the door close on the other side, she stood up from the table and began to apologize to the people she had to distract and perhaps even scare with such actions. Calmly enjoying the food that came to his hands, the scientist replied that everyone knows that beautiful girls bring problems. After that, he said that there was no need to explain himself because they understood the essence of the situation, and whether they liked it or not, it was too late to do anything. Thanking the masters for not asking her unnecessary questions, she asked not to worry about the consequences, since she was sure that this man knew that her behavior was just a game, and fully understood that she had refused him. After that, she asked to be treated to food for her help, 
It seemed to her that they were all good guys, and only the look of one of them made her nervous. Miang never had time to learn good manners from his mentor, and ill-manneredly stared at the girl with a loving gaze. While enjoying the food here, the girl nevertheless told about what happened between her and the annoying swordmaster. Representing the entire squad, scientist Jin Wool was sympathetic to her situation, after which he unexpectedly announced that following his observation and based on the symbol of the girl's attire, he concluded that she was a disciple of the Mount Mu clan. In addition, he noted that since her sword had gold decoration on it, it was safe to assume that she was pretty close or even next in line to inherit the clan. After these words, he shocked the girl with the conclusion that she was most likely the infamous shaman of Mount Mu, Lady Namso Ren, one of the Seven Lesser Heavens. While washing down her meal with alcohol, the scholar of three minds admitted that he was even able to determine that her persistent interlocutor was none other than the swordmaster of the fleeting falcon named Cha Moon Ho. Realizing that this was an unusual person in front of her, the shaman politely asked who he was. In response, Jin Wool said that there was no point in saying his name, since only a handful of scientists would recognize him. After that, he suddenly pointed his finger at Senior Tang and introduced him as the owner of 10,000 poisons from the great Tang family of Sashan. Hearing this, the girl jumped up and introduced herself respectfully, after which she declared that she owed her respect to their great family. With a pleasant laugh, the old man asked to dispense with formalities, while the restless Miang intervened in their conversation and introduced himself as the old man's student. Looking to the left, the shaman assumed that in this case the first flower of the Tang family was sitting next to her. A little embarrassed, the girl replied that she was indeed Tang Meyer, after which she admitted that it was an honor for her to meet the shaman of Mount Mu. What followed was an exchange of compliments from the two beauties, who were delighted with each other's appearance. As soon as the shaman asked who the last master of their group was, the old man decided to go to the toilet. It seems that he once again took too much poison, and now he was so excited about searching for the restroom that he did not even notice how the next visitors were passing nearby. Not noticing or not wanting to notice him, one of the masters caught him with his shoulder. Tang Gimwi fell to the floor and instead of apologizing, one of the arrogant masters asked him to watch his step. Just a moment after their insolence, the insane Ryu San flew towards them. With incredible speed, he flew past them, because the two still managed to dodge his rough and sharp attack. Landing on the floor, the guy with a cold gaze stopped in the same stance in which he fought with Master Jin during their first meeting. Addressing strangers and calling them scum, the defiant Meng asked where their manners were and whether they even knew who they had pushed so disrespectfully. Without waiting for their response, he furiously shouted that if they had offended his mentor they should apologize. His impudent behavior could hardly be called timely. While everyone was trying not to attract too much attention, Mieng created a conflict. Mirai ran to her uncle who said that everything was fine and there was no need to worry about him. With a dissatisfied and defiant expression on his face, Mieng once again asked them to apologize for their rudeness. The guys who looked like brothers looked a little confused. After that, they avoided and started a sentence at the same time, trying to apologize. But just a moment later, those arrogant madmen simultaneously stabbed him in the stomach and said that they would not wait for this. Hearing the fight, the onlookers regained consciousness because they had been waiting for such a fuss for a long time. They shouted that in front of them were black and white bear brothers. Addressing the Tang family disciple, the dark-skinned guy asked who the vile brute thought he was and whether he knew who they were. After their joint blow, Ryu San flew into the wall and didn't even move. All the masters present began to praise the Guan brothers and rejoice that there was now going to be a decent fight. After this, Miang began to rise to his feet and asked in bewilderment what was happening. Scratching the back of his head, he asked in surprise if they were sure they had hit him. His words were perceived by his brothers as an insult. After that, they instantly rushed to attack and simultaneously struck with their knees, asking whether their opponent would be insolent after that. This time, both blows landed in his face. After falling on his back, Miang began to get up again and asked them to stop fooling around. His nose began to bleed, but despite this, he asked with a surprised face whether his opponents were serious in this fight. His calm demeanor began to get on his brother's nerves. They again furiously rushed to the attack. After several combinations of punches, Miang Ryusan found himself on the ground again. Despite this, he continued to laugh at his enemies. The Guan brothers were already tired of beating him and didn't understand what was wrong with him. Rising to his feet, the guy began to laugh loudly and shouted that they were too weak to be called masters. He pointed his finger at Master Jin and said that after being beaten every day by the devil known as the Northern Blade, all their blows looked like a joke. Mu Wan had no intention of revealing his identity in such a place and looked at Mr. Tan's student disapprovingly, as if he was going to teach him a lesson in politeness soon. As soon as the onlookers heard the mention of the current generation's rising star, whose popularity was already on par with the seven lesser heavens, they were so shocked that they couldn't say anything. 
It turned out that rumors about the Northern Blade even reached Mount Mu, where the shaman Namso Ren was from. Because of Mieng Ryusan's stupid actions, the scientist Jin Wol grabbed his head and regretted that he had agreed to take him with him. At that moment, the Guan brothers completely forgot about their daring opponent and were surprised that in front of them was really a Northern Blade. Considering their actions disrespectful, the unstoppable Miang again rushed to the attack, shouting and asking them if they were finally going to apologize. But even despite his unexpected attack, they struck him in the face again without much difficulty. At the same moment, daring and experienced in street fights, Miang managed to grab the dark-skinned guy's head. After that, he demonstrated a technique previously unknown to them, violently headbutting his opponent. As soon as the second brother tried to hit the impudent young man back, the boy jumped up and avoided his fist. While in the air, he took advantage of the momentum of the jump and kicked his opponent's neck. In front of everyone in the tavern, the Guan brothers missed some very unexpected blows. None of those present expected something like this. They had never seen anyone fight the Bear brothers in this style. It seemed to them that the strange and daring guy looked more like a fighting dog than a martial arts master. Calling him a mad bloodhound, visitors began to cheer for his victory. His incredibly chaotic but interesting fighting style delighted the audience. Hearing such a nickname, the scientist was not surprised because in his opinion, Miang had always been a good fighter. And thanks to training with Master Jin, he also gained quite good resistance to blows. At that moment, Jin Wool suggested that if they could correct the violent nature of this Tang family disciple, then he could become quite a valuable asset. After another series of ridiculous blows from the enemy, the Guan brothers became enraged and shouted that they were sick of the disrespect of the impudent enemy, and they would end it with their combined power blow. In response, the Mad Miang opened his vessels of poison. Calling them stupid weaklings, he invited them to try their fate. Seeing what the student was doing, Mr. Tang and his niece were shocked and asked him to stop immediately. But it was already too late for words, because the Guan brothers rushed to the attack first. Shaman So Ren understood that the situation was out of control, but did not know whether she should intervene. Mu Wan was able to save the situation. He suddenly appeared between the two sides of the conflict a moment before they exchanged blows. Stopping a member of his squad, he turned to his still hostile brothers and said that this affected them too. After that, he looked into their eyes with a cold gaze. At that moment, the brothers felt the incredible pressure of his aura. Realizing the terrifying power of the Northern Blade, they simultaneously made the decision to simply leave without risking their own lives and reputations. Addressing a member of his squad, Mu Wan said that he had done more than enough for them to have some difficulties. Despite his words, Ming, without thinking about the consequences, continued to defy the brothers that they decided to silently leave the tavern. Old Man Tang took off from his seat burning with anger. As soon as he approached the student, he shouted that he was a petty bastard and expressed his displeasure that his ridiculous student would use the poison technique for something so insignificant. But even despite him, Mieng did not understand what was wrong, so he made an excuse that they had insulted his mentor. As soon as the disgruntled Mr. Tang asked to repeat these words, the disciple humbly bowed and apologized for using the poison technique without the master's permission. And yet he dared to say that if such a situation were to happen again, he would do exactly the same. Mu Wan intervened in their conversation and said that in this case he would teach him a lesson in politeness during their evening training. After that, all the questions of the impudent student disappeared. Since the tavern was full, the guys could not find a free room to sleep in, but thanks to the help of Mrs. Nam, they still managed to have a good rest. The shaman of Mount Mu thought that this was nothing because the room was too big for her alone. In addition, she admitted that she was tormented by a sense of duty and it was the least she could do. After these words, Mirai embarrassed her new friend, saying that Miss Nam was also heading to the Central Heavenly Alliance and they could invite her to travel with her. Mirai's words seemed like a great idea, and the scientist Jin Wool supported her initiative. In favor of this decision, Mr. Tan turned to the shaman and said that they would be only happy because it was safer to go in a large group rather than alone. A little embarrassed, the girl began to remain awkwardly silent. Mu Wan looked in her direction with a kind smile, waiting for her answer. Not bad for his behavior, Mieng Ryu San grabbed the shoulder of his martial arts teacher, saying that traveling was cool and he would take care to protect the beautiful ladies. Because of such persistence, the shaman of Mount Mu felt some discomfort. But considering their squad to be good guys, she still accepted the good-natured offer. The masters passing by already recognized the instigator of the recent fight. Seeing the so-called Mad Dog, they noticed that they liked his fight. The guy was surprised by the excess attention. He didn't even think that it would create such interest in his personality. As it turned out, the Guan brothers and the fleeting Falcon Swordmaster Cha Moon Ho were traveling together. As soon as they met in the forest nearby, they expressed their dissatisfaction that he did not warn them about her company, consisting of members of the Tang family and the Northern Blade. The guys didn't know what to do, 
They planned to humiliate the shaman, but in the end they encountered some kind of psycho. Hearing this unexpected information, Master Cha was incredibly angry at the circumstances and, nervously biting his lip, could not understand what these guys were doing together with the shaman of Mount Mu that he hated. Despite their story, the master of the fleeting falcon sword did not feel any excitement about the famous northern blade in Murim. While they were discussing recent events, some mysterious master came to them with a large number of weapons on his back. Mr. Cha happily stated that he had made a good choice, after which he mentioned that four of the lesser heavens were now members of the Azure Dragon Association. As it turned out, a warmonger named Hong Gong Wei came to them. The swordsman stated that there were now five lesser heavens in the alliance. In response to his congratulations, Master Hong boldly said that he did not care, because he only joined so that he could fight their leader. The nervous guy asked to show him the way, after which Cha Moon Ho remembered their agreement. Taking advantage of the moment, the cunning Master Cha said that there was another member of the Seven Lesser Heavens nearby, and then asked if he would be interested in meeting this person. Soon they arrived at an unusual river, which ordinary people call the lifeline of the mainland. It could be said that whoever controls Yanze controls the entire mainland. It was no coincidence that the Central Heavenly Alliance was located nearby. The ship called Heavenly Vessel will sail along the river to Hubei province without stopping, so it takes them a quarter of a day to reach the heart of the Central Heavenly Alliance. Simply put, they needed to board this huge ship to arrive almost at the front yard of the Central Heavenly Alliance. The prudent genie Vol urgently asked all members of the squad to stay out of trouble and not weaken their defenses. He shared rumors that they were leaving tomorrow morning, so they needed to find a place on the ship in advance so that they could have a good rest before arriving. The guys went onto the bridge that connected the sky ship and land. At the same moment, someone turned to Mrs. Nam. Looking around, the girl saw the unpleasant Mr. Cha, accompanied by the Gayong brothers, and behind them stood a large fighter unknown to her. The girl was not happy to see him at this time in this place, while the scientist realized yesterday's situation from the other side because he saw all three problem guys together. Just as he began to talk about the pleasant coincidence, one of the strongest fighters of the younger generation, Murima, walked forward and asked the poor fellow to get out of his way. The behavior of the warrior from the seven junior heavens seriously angered the swordsman from the great family. His whole body trembled with resentment, but he could not do anything because he was afraid of his strength. A warmonger named Hong Gong Wei stepped forward and addressed the shaman calling her a little girl. As expected, the lady was unhappy with his inappropriate treatment. The daring warrior replied that he had heard that she was one of the seven lesser heavens. After that, he introduced himself and said that all this time something had been bothering him. He was surprised that they were called warriors of the same level. When the girl called him overly confident, Master Hong replied that he was more qualified than anyone else. Not wanting to show any respect, he said that if a girl wanted to deserve proper treatment, she should prove herself. Standing opposite him, the girl was clearly unhappy with such excessive insolence. But being a very smart and responsible lady, she turned around, saying that Mr. Hong was much stronger than her and she would obviously lose. The girl's refusal made it clear to the warrior that she did not succumb to his provocation. His plan didn't work, so he decided to resort to dirty methods. As soon as the mistress began to leave, the vile fighter said that she was like her mother, because she also knew how to escape well. Hearing such insolence, she asked to repeat it again with a terrifying look on her face. With ridicule, Mr. Hong said that this truth hurt her, because the title of shaman is just for show. He then stated that there was a reason her mother was hiding in the mountains, and that was because she was afraid of people finding out how weak they were. Resorting to dirty manipulation, the warrior stated that this is why he said that she looked like her mother, the current chief shaman of Mount Mu, because their entire clan is full of cowards. Hearing all these vile and disgusting words, Ming Ryu San was ready to stand up for his lady of the heart, but his mentor stopped him saying that this was not a case in which he could interfere. He asked him not to act on emotions because this only brings problems not only to him, but to the whole squad. The time came for an answer, and the girl said that she had planned to ignore the damn pathetic fighter. But once she realized that he really wanted to fight, she decided to accept the offer. Master Hong was happy with the result and invited her to follow him. He had already chosen a good place for their battle. The two immediately went to the battle site, leaving their comrades in place without telling them anything. Jin Wool was surprised that martial artists were so problematic and always looking for a reason to fight. In addition, the scientists believed that those guys who followed them would certainly cause trouble. Mu Wan asked him to worry, saying that he would follow them while the rest of the party should go inside the ship and take good places to travel along the river. Once they arrived at the battle site, Master Han admitted that he never liked the title of member of the Seven Lesser Heavens, because they had never fought against each other, and it was not very true to lump them together. In response, 
The shaman of Mount Mu said that until today she didn't care about it. But the fact that she shares the same title with such a bastard as Master Hong began to irritate her incredibly. With his weapons spread around him, the warmonger named Hong Gong Wei suggested getting down to business. The girl took her blade out of its sheath and pointed it towards the enemy, demonstrating her readiness for his attack. Using the Southern God climbing technique, Master Hong charged using his huge axe and heavy blade at the same time. In response, the shaman used the Thousand Swords hand technique. After their first encounter, they became convinced that they were worthy of each other. The strengths of these techniques were approximately equal, and none of them gained an advantage. After the first clash, the shaman decided to take the initiative and was the first to rush into the attack. But before she could strike, she saw that her opponent turned out to be very fast, despite his size, because in an instant he was behind her. Once the girl repelled his attack, Mr. Hong jumped back but was shocked by what she decided to do next. The girl found herself in the place where her opponent had left his weapon. After looking around, she made a very unexpected decision. Picking up one of his blades, she asked if he knew that she actually wielded two swords. After picking up the enemy's blade, she complimented her fighting style and suggested that in fact, if Master Hong knew about this, he would not have given her this sword. After these words, he warned the enemy that he was now coming through to attack. In response, the master with an incredible thirst for battles said that at least they didn't lie to him about her skills, because this was the fight he had been waiting for for a long time. He didn't mind lending her his sword and agreed that it was her turn to attack. As she charged, she shocked her opponent with her unexpected technique, which made her appear to move like a tornado. Like Zoro, Master Hong decided to use all three weapons simultaneously for defense, but the shaman's attack unexpectedly destroyed his weapon. The previously self-confident warmonger finds himself in a difficult position. Remembering his daring words, the girl quickly rushed to the attack. But after a moment, she felt a sharp pain and decided to jump back. At the last moment, she had to block the enemy's blow, because she was unable to carry out her attack. As it turned out, her hand began to tremble, and she realized that she was overexerting herself again. And it was because of this that she could not complete the battle after disarming the enemy. During her training, her mother told her that it would be better if she stopped using her left arm, because unfortunately, she was born with a weak left shoulder. As she continued her training, she reached the limit of using the dual sword technique. Her mother warned that if she continued on this path, she would soon be unable to use her left hand. With a feeling of guilt, she said that it was her mistake because she should have stopped her earlier, instead of allowing her to train two sword techniques. The fact is that when she trained with two swords, her face shone with joy, and her mother could not forbid her such joy. Then she began to plunge more and more into the outside world. Her fame as a swordswoman wielding two swords spread. The head of the clan regretted that she had turned a blind eye to this all this time. Trying to improve the situation, she promised that they could still change her fighting style and that her strong and talented daughter, So Ren, would be up to the task. During the battle with the fighter who also belonged to the Seven Lesser Heavens, the Shaman of Mount Mu understood that it would be difficult to fight him with the One Sword technique, because it was still far from complete. She hoped that her left hand would continue a little longer. She couldn't afford to fail. Meanwhile, the offender of her clan rushed into a furious attack. With some strange slap on his own ass, he made a distracting maneuver. After that, his spear, divided into two parts, headed towards the shaman with great speed. The girl repelled this ridiculous attack without much difficulty, but within moments she realized the meaning of his plan. This was a diversion, after which the Madmaster Hong closed the distance and was ready to deliver a terrifying blow. The girl decided not to injure her left hand even more and simply dodged. Fighting at such a distance was advantageous for her, so she hoped to catch him making mistakes and jumped a little further. At that moment, the enemy took one of his blades in his teeth and raised a small spear, after which he declared that he would no longer hold back. Lady Nam was angry, and with a serious look she stated that she would end this with one attack. Filled with the desire to fight, Master Hong shouted that it was time to demonstrate his true strength. Using one of her strongest dual sword techniques, the girl rose up. The furious warmonger named Hong Gong Wei shouted angrily. Using the technique of falling a thousand swords, the girl directed all her anger towards the vile opponent. In response, Master Hong poured a huge amount of energy into his weapon using a technique called Hundred Warrior Attack. The powerful collision between the two members of the Seven Lesser Heavens caused a massive explosion. The masters watching the battle between the two monsters began to shield themselves from the powerful flow of wind and stones that flew in all directions. As soon as this was over, the cowardly Guan brothers and their leader Mr. Cha looked in horror towards the epicenter of the battle. Shocked by what was happening, Fleeting Falcon Sword Master Cha Moon Ho had previously thought that Lady Nam had received a high status because of her noble birth and therefore could not even imagine that she had such incredible power. But looking at the huge crater, in the middle stood the exhausted participants in the battle. He thought that this was a defeat for both sides. After this attack, 
the left hand of the young lady of the Moo Mountain Clan became unusable. Her opponent was shocked by the strength of her dual sword technique. Due to the last attack, he lost his right arm and was seriously injured. Master Hong tried to say that he recognized her strength, but without finishing his sentence, he fell unconscious. In response, the girl, whose eyes were filled with anger, said threateningly that she should not look down on the Mount Mu clan. After these words, she also fell unconscious. Assessing the situation and seeing the fighters in this state, Cha Moon Ho decided that this was the best time to get rid of them. He no longer thought about them joining the Azure Dragon Association, believing that it would be better if he increased his reputation by killing them both. His eyes were filled with hatred towards them for looking down on him, so as he unsheathed his blade, he declared that they had run into the wrong person. But as soon as he decided to head towards the unconscious fighters, a mysterious man in a dark cloak appeared in front of him. It was Mu Wan, and his look only confirmed that he did not allow the idiot's plan to come true. At first, the brothers reacted impudently to his appearance and told him to get out of their way. But as soon as they realized who exactly had appeared before them, they began to worry and asked their leader to stop. The fair-skinned brother told Moon Ho that there is a northern blade in front of them and it would be better if they just leave here, because that guy makes him suspicious. The second brother confirmed his words, saying that it would be better to leave here, because he had a bad feeling about this mysterious master. But the arrogant swordmaster of the fleeting falcon boldly declared that this was an ordinary swordsman in front of them, which could not be truly strong since he did not belong to a prestigious family. He believed that his reputation was based on unfounded rumors, so he wanted to go all the way. Introducing himself as a swordsman from the famous Three Rings clan, the naive master angrily asked the enemy how he dared to interfere with the work of the Azure Dragon Association. In response, the calm Mu Wan asked if Mr. Dam knew what they decided to do. Hearing his words, Master Cha began to get nervous and asked how someone like him knew Master Dam. Mu Wan said that the Dam so young he knows is a decent martial artist and is unlikely to have fallen so low as to issue such orders. After these words, he again asked whether the actions of the association member followed the beliefs of their leader. Filled with rage, the arrogant and offended swordsman could not tolerate another humiliation. Rushing into the attack with the Guan brothers, he shouted that he would kill the Northern Blade in the name of the Azure Dragon Association. Instead of further words, Mu Wan only took his blade out of its sheath for a moment. After this movement, their hair, along with all the grass behind them, was cut off neatly and convincingly. Mu Wan demonstrated his incredible power without even moving or showing his blade to his enemies. His strength was so convincing that the fleeting Falcon Swordmaster and the Guan brothers lost any desire to continue the battle. They were simply shocked by his superiority. After that, Mu Wan freely took Lady Nam with him and returned to the Heavenly Ship. Heading to the Central Heavenly Alliance, Mr. Tan began to treat her. While Mu Wan and his team's scientists discussed how even if Dam So Young created the organization with good intentions, not all members share his beliefs. An example of this was Cha Moon Ho. Meanwhile, Heron of the Western Gate was getting ready for bed as usual. At one moment she felt that someone was approaching her room. As it turned out, it was Dam So Young. The girl was simply shocked that he had finally returned to the world after such a long training. Seeing him, she immediately rushed to meet him. After that, they continued to hug each other for several minutes. As soon as the girl realized that he had already returned for good, she decided to make sure of this and asked if he had finished his training. In response, Dam So Young confirmed her words and said that he missed her. Following this, they unexpectedly kissed because it turned out that they were lovers. The father of the leader of the Azure Dragon Organization was the head of the Valley of No Return family. He is also known as the fifth inheritor of the Divine Radiance of Enlightenment, Master Dam Chok Shim. He was part of the Nine Heavens. One of the three wives of that disgusting man was a maid, whom the others despised, considering her to be nothing more than a pretty face. The third wife, who was a simple servant with an ordinary background, was his mother. Observing her unhappy life, little Dam Chuck Shim shared her suffering. The children of his father's more noble wives despised him and constantly mocked him. They dragged him to training, where he showed no results, threatening that he would be beaten even more as a punishment for slacking. Together with their mother, they were weak, and even their father despised them, calling them pathetic. He said that they not only had no talent, but also no ability. Because of this environment, he became very timid and depressed, and his dependence on his mother only grew. And this is because she was the only one who gave her warmth and showed care. He felt safe in the arms of his mother, who was the only person dear to him. Mom was everything to him because one day she couldn't stand it. A fire suddenly started in their clan's palace, shocking everyone around them. His reason was precisely the third wife of the head of the clan. His poor mother, who had been through so much, was filled with anger. At that moment, she looked with hatred at those who despised her all the time while she was the wife of the head. But at one moment, her view changed. Then she saw her shocked son with tears in his eyes among the crowd. 
Addressing him for the last time, she said with a kind smile that he should never become as weak as she was. The only person dear to him disappeared right before his eyes. At that moment, his disgusting father did not even appear at the scene of the incident. After that horrific incident, little Damchok Shim promised himself that he would become stronger. This was his only way to survive, and soon those of his age were no match for him. Noticing his success, the hypocritical father began to show more attention to him, and promised that if he continued like this, he would most likely become the sixth heir to the divine radiance of enlightenment. Dam so young as a child despised himself. After receiving a confession from the father he had feared and hated for so long, he felt good for the first time in a long time. But he could not squeeze anything out of himself. He was devastated, because he missed his mother, who could no longer be returned. But at one moment, she appeared in front of him. The small and polite Mrs. Hiran is from the Westgate family. At the same time, he also met Shimwan Lee from the Deadly Skies, as well as his crazy little sister. While still small, they were distinguished by their cruelty, although they were not particularly talented. Among them, he attached importance only to Hiran. She politely complimented Mr. Dame's strength and admitted that she had always wanted to become a martial artist like him, but her body was too fragile. Therefore, having good intelligence and knowledge, she developed another talent. The girl was embarrassed that Master Dam was so silent, unlike her, but still called him incredible because, despite his young age, he proved his strength. This acquaintance changed his state of mind. Little Lady Huron and her words reminded him of the care of his mother, whom he missed so much. In response, the taciturn Dam So Young declared for the first time in his life that he was going to become the strongest in the world and promised the girl that one day she would see it with her own eyes. In response, he saw her kind smile, which again reminded him of his own mother. After that, they were distracted by the ridiculous heirs of the Shim family, who could not cope with the repulse of the ants, on whom they carried out a brutal attack. Seeing this, Hiran grabbed Mr. Dam and pulled him along. At that moment, Dam So Jung decided that he had found another goal in his life. He wanted to become the strongest for Hier Yong. And in return, he hoped that she would become his everything. And this is how he became the head of the Valley of No Return family as well as the sixth heir to the divine radiance of enlightenment. This was just the beginning, because he was going to absorb everything his father taught him and make it his own. The moment he learned his family's martial art, he immediately decided to go into battle. He wanted to fight with a hundred martial artists. Although he was called a talent, the whole world mocked his ambitions as a young man. However, he exceeded all expectations and defeated not one, not two, but thirty martial artists. Morim admitted that he was a rising star, and to his surprise, the whole world began to praise his name. But one day, he had to meet a terrifying monster. A mysterious demon in the Northern Heavenly Clan gave him his first humiliating defeat. Feeling his lover's concern, he wondered why they ran away seven years ago if he could continue. Heron replied that even though he was strong then, he still could not compare with that demon. She admitted that at that moment she was afraid of losing him. After these words, Master Dam promised her that this was his first and last defeat and he would never put her in danger again. He declared that he would become stronger than the Nine Heavens, the strongest in the world, so that she would no longer have to worry. Having called her lover incredible, the girl changed the topic and asked if he had heard of the Northern Blade. Hearing this name, he rose to his feet and asked, realizing that we were talking about some talented master. 